The Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Browsing through a book of quotations the other day, I came across the old Scottish prayer to ward off evil spirits. You remember, from ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night. (laughs) Well, isn't it strange how the coming of night can alter the whole shape, appearance, even the atmosphere of a house or a room? Sounds are different at night, too. Anyway, reading that old incantation, I was reminded of the tragic case of Raymond Hewson. It's an odd story, which I've called the waxwork. So let me tell you about it. Some years ago, I was working on a film in London. One evening after we'd finished, I decided to take advantage of a little free time before a dinner engagement and to walk back to my hotel, exploring London as I did so. I'd been walking for about an hour when I came across an inviting-looking pub in an alley just off Baker Street. I went in and ordered a glass of beer and a sandwich. No sooner had I got my drink, enjoying the early evening atmosphere of the place, than I was surprised to hear someone calling my name. Vincent! I say, Vincent! Oh, good Lord, Raymond Hewson. (laughs) I haven't seen you for years. Yeah, that's right, not since, um... Oh, not 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 since I, I did those extra bits of dialogue for that film. Yes. Um, what was it called? Um, oh dear! Uh, the, the thing without a thing, oh. or some such name. Oh. <laughs> well, well, well. I must say, it really, is the most amazing coincidence running into you tonight of all nights. I, in fact, in a, in a way, uh, you might say it's providential. Raymond was a spare, pale man with lank brown hair, and although he spoke plausibly, even forcibly. He had the defensive and somewhat furtive air of a man used to being snubbed. He looked, in fact, exactly what he was. A man gifted somewhat above the ordinary, who was a failure through his own lack of self-assertion. He made a living as a freelance writer, and like most freelance writers, he was always hard up. Indeed, when he spoke of our meeting as being providential, I half expected that he was leading up to asking for a small loan. But that night, Raymond had other things on his mind. You see, I've I've arranged to spend tonight, all night, (laughs) in the Chamber of Horrors at the waxworks round the corner. I'm hoping to write a piece about it and get it published. Now, if I could work one or two observations from you into the story, it'd be a great selling point. Um, Do you mind? Oh, no, not at all. Look, Vincent, I know you're very busy, but um, I wonder if you'd mind doing me a favour. Oh, anything, my dear chap, within reason... Well, all I want you to do is come with me to the waxworks and see me settled in. No, it won't take very long. It's only a few minutes' walk. Well, I do have a little time to spare, and I must confess that I I find the idea rather interesting. Oh, good for you. Well, now, look here. Let me buy you a drink, and then we'll go round to the waxworks. Um, Now, I have an appointment with the director, Miss Frayne, at half past seven, so we've just got time. You must realise, Mr. Hewson, that there's nothing new in your request. In fact, we have to refuse it to different people at least three times a week. Of course, in this case, you're being a writer, Mr. Hewson. We have something to gain. Publicity. Raymond, how do you intend to treat the story? Well, to make it gruesome, of course. <laughs> um, well, gruesome, but with just a saving touch of humour. But I don't have to tell you anything about presenting horror with humour, Vincent. Well, perhaps not. I think I get the general idea. Well, Mr. Hewson, I wish you good luck with the story. But first, I must warn you that it is no small ordeal that you're about to attempt. And I confess that it's not something I should like to do. May I ask why? So difficult to explain. But I'll tell you what. Come along now and see for yourselves. But I warn you, Mr. Hewson, that if you are at all susceptible to atmosphere, you are in for a most uncomfortable night. Oh, that's all right. Newspaper editors never stop telling me I've no imagination whatsoever. (laughs) Through here, gentlemen, please. Oh, before I forget, I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare here this afternoon. I don't know who raised the alarm, but whoever it was, it proved to be a false one. Mind your heads as we go downstairs. Miss Frayne led the way down an ill-lit stone stairway, which conveyed the sinister impression of giving access to a dungeon. 
On reaching the bottom, we passed along a small passage in which were displayed a few preliminary horrors, such as relics of the Spanish Inquisition and a pair of early English stocks. In turn, this corridor opened into a dimly lit room with a vaulted roof. It was by design an eerie and uncomfortable chamber, the very atmosphere of which invited its visitors to speak in whispers. The waxworks figures stood on low pedestals with numbered tickets at their feet. Seeing them elsewhere without knowing whom they represented, one would have thought them a dull, even a shabby-looking collection, but gathered together in that sinister room. Ooh. Well, here we are, gentlemen. Recent notoriety is rubbing shoulders with all the old favorites. Perhaps you recognize one or two of them. This, of course, is the famous Dr. Crippen. Insignificant little fellow, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Over there is Wilkinson, the strangler. And there you see a tableau depicting the murder of the two little princes in the Tower of London. It's a very dark Tower of London. Oh, yes. I'm sorry that I can't give you any more light, but that's all there is. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as murky as possible. Good Lord. Who's that over there? Ah, oh, yes, I was coming to him. That's one of our star terms. A present-day murderer who has never paid the price for his crimes. The figure which Hewson had indicated was that of a small, slight man, not much more than five feet in height. It wore waxed moustaches, spectacles, and a voluminous cape. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded me of a stage caricature, something out of one of those delightful bedroom farces by Fedeux. <laughs> I, I could not say precisely why that mild-looking face seemed so repellent, but I found myself instinctively taking a step backwards. Nasty-looking character, isn't he? <laughs> Who is it? That is Dr. Bourdet. Bourdet. I've heard that name recently, Bourdet. I can't remember in what connection. You'd remember better if you were a Frenchman. For a long time, he was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day and of throat cutting by night. Oh, yes, I remember now. Wasn't it said that he killed people for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him and always with a razor? That's and... right. After his last crime, he left behind a clue which set the police on his trail. In fact, they soon amassed enough evidence to send him to the madhouse or the guillotine, on a dozen capital charges. But I, I thought you said... That he was never caught. Oh, he was caught all right, and tried and convicted. But somehow he managed to escape and cheated the guillotine. One or two crimes of a similar nature have taken place in London quite recently. But then it's queer, isn't it, how every notorious murderer has imitators. Anyway, most of the experts believe that he is quite definitely dead. Well, I don't like him at all. <laughs> Oh, and those eyes. Whew. They seem to bite into you. Yes, don't they? This figure's a little masterpiece. It's excellent realism, really, for Bourdet practiced hypnotism and was supposed to mesmerize his victims before dispatching them. Oh, I see. I, I was wondering how so small a man could have managed to overcome his victims. Well, it was mesmerism. At least there was never any sign of a struggle. D do you know, I, I thought I saw him move. Oh, come on now, Raymond. No, he moved, I tell you. Oh. <laughs> oh, You'll have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect, Mr. Houston. But remember, you won't be locked in. You can come upstairs whenever you've had enough of it. There are watchmen on the premises, so don't be surprised if you hear them moving. I've told them you're here, by the way. Raymond, you quite sure you want to go through with this? Of course. And I think it very mean of you not to have offered to stay with me. Oh, oh that wouldn't be fair, Mr. Houston. You must be quite alone. Well, don't think I won't mention you in my story, Vincent. But I may as well tell you that I shall feature heavily as the hero. <laughs> Raymond, I assure you that even if I didn't already have a dinner engagement, I should still be only too happy to let you stay here all night by yourself. This place gives me the creeps. Well, Mr. Houston, I'll wish you a very good night. And so do I, Raymond. A very good night and a successful story to celebrate tomorrow. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. Thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> in 
so we left him, and after a quick, and I must confess, welcome drink in Miss Friend's office, I went back to my hotel to get changed for dinner. It must have been at about three o'clock the next morning that I received an urgent telephone call from Miss Frayne asking me to return to the waxworks immediately. And this is how our night watchman found him. He thought he heard somebody scream and came down here to investigate and immediately rang me at my flat. And I'm afraid that when I found what had happened, I rather, well, panicked and rang you. You see, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have his home number or anything. I understand. Have you notified the police? It's usual, you know, in cases of sudden death. I uh, did think of it, sir, but I thought it better to ring Miss Frayne first. I could see at once it was uh, too late to call a doctor. I'm afraid I didn't think too clearly. Oh, how awful. This is the sort of thing we've always tried to avoid. What will the directors say? Well, there's time enough to let them know later. Have you any idea of... How it could have happened? Not at all, sir. I just heard this scream like and came running. I noticed Raymond's notebook lying on the floor by the tape recorder, which had run out. I began idly turning over the pages. And what follows is my own interpretation of what happened from the time Miss Frayne and I had left him on that fatal evening. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Oh, thanks. Yes, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. And thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> right, now, let's get organised. Now, let me see. Um, notebook. Pencils. Tape recorder. Working order. Flask. Yes, mustn't forget that. <laughs> oh, God, it's cold down here. I wish I brought a blanket. Now, <clears throat> our rough notes first and then record. Yes, yeah, she'll get a nice, creepy, atmospheric piece. Might even flog it to the BBC. Right. Um, the dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures which were so uncannily like human beings. The air in the chamber was stagnant as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. <clears throat> good God, what's that? Oh, good evening, sir. Startled you, did I? I'm very sorry. Uh, Miss Frayne asked me to bring down this chair for you. She thought it might be more comfortable than the one you've got, sir. Oh, God, you made me jump. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does get you like that down here, sir. <laughs> Creepy, that's what it is, sir. Creepy. Uh, now, sir, where would you like this chair? Over here by Dr. Bourdet? Uh, no, no, not there. Um, no, just leave it over there in the gangway. I'll put it where I want it later. Oh, very good, sir. Uh, will this do? Yes, thank you. Well, sir, I'll wish you a good night. I'll be upstairs if you want me. Oh, and uh, by the way, sir, don't let any of them sneak up behind you, sir, and touch you with their clammy hands. <laughs> Good night, sir. Stupid old fool nearly gave me a heart attack. Now, where to put this damn chair? Um, by the little Frenchman. God, how those eyes dig into one. Now, I know, I know, I'll sit here with my back to him, then I won't have to look at his face. Why not? I'm not afraid of him. Or am I? Come on, come on, Houston. Come on, come on, come on, old son. Your nerves have started playing tricks already. He's only a waxwork. They're all only waxworks. What was that? Something moved. Oh, come on, come on, this won't do. <clears throat> now, where was I? Yes, yes, stagnant as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. Yes, that's good. Now... Uh, note here. Right. After a while, it seemed as if the figures moved when not being watched. But there was not a breath of air in the chamber to stir the curtain or to rustle 
a hanging drapery. There, good. Now it's fine. Now, clean it up and get this bit on tape. <coughs> the dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures, which... Hello, something moved again. I could swear it. It's Kruppen. Every time I take my eyes off him, he moves. Damn it, they all do. Oh, God, I better have a drink. It's oh, better. All the same, it's not good enough. I'm going upstairs. I'm not going to spend the night with a lot of shifty bloody dummies who move when you're not looking. Now, what's the time? Half past one. Oh, I've got six more hours. I'll never do it. <coughs> what's that? It's Crippen again. I nearly caught him that time. You better be careful, Crippen. And all the rest of you. I'll smash you all to pieces. Yeah? Do you hear me? Why don't I go? Why should I sit here scribbling when I can write all this up tomorrow? Oh, no. What's that? Oh, God. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Now. <clears throat> I'm Raymond Hewson, freelance writer. I've been here in this chamber of horrors for, what, a few hours. My nerves are beginning to play tricks on me. And that's what they are, tricks. Oh, I'm a living, breathing man. And all around me are statues. Dummies. They can't move. And they can't whisper. Neither can they breathe. God, one of them is. Somebody else in this room is breathing. You, Dr. Baudet, you moved. Yes, you did. Then I saw you. Good evening, monsieur. I was right, you did move. Quite right, my dear friend. And now... Let me get off this ridiculous... Platform. Don't come near me! Really, Mr. Yusson, let us not be uh, melodramatic, huh? Ah! Oh, that's better. One gets so stiff standing in the same position all the time. I need hardly tell you that I never expected to have the pleasure of a companion here for the night. Oh, what the devil are you? My dear sir, I have no illusions... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Boudet himself. But I, I don't understand. How, how, how do, do I to... come to be here? Let me explain. You see, for some time now, I've been living quietly in England. Well... Late this afternoon, as I was passing this building, I saw a policeman regarding me uh, somewhat too closely. So I uh, mingled with the crowd and came in here. And when I entered this chamber, I uh, saw at once my means of escape from the so inquisitive policeman. I don't understand. Ah, you have no imagination at all, sir. It was so simple. I raised a cry of fire, stripped my effigy of the cape, hid it, and simply took its place on the platform. Et voila! So you really are, Dr. Bourdette. What a scoop. A scoop? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, we shall see. And to think I nearly packed up and went. Fancy missing this. What a story. Dr. Baudet. The French Jack the Ripper. A slight exaggeration. But, but 
Why do it? Why commit these awful murders? Ah, you see, the world is divided into two classes. The collectors and the non-collectors. The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes. I collect throats. Uh, no, no, do not attempt to move. It is useless. You cannot move unless I say so. Uh, but, but my notes, I must get all this done. And I'll, I'll never have another chance like this. <laughs> Exactly. You have given me the opportunity of gratifying my uh, somewhat unusual whim. No, no. <clears throat> Just hold on a minute. Ah, oh, but you have a skinny neck, sir. If you will overlook such a personal way. Now, now you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Baudet. If, if you think I you can... never have selected you from choice. Oh, I like thick necks. Thick, red, meaty necks. Uh, but enough talking. Enough talking? I haven't even started yet. <laughs> I'm not alone here, you know. I've only got to shout, and the watchman will come running. And where will you be then? Uh, this is a little French razor. The blade you observe is very no, no, look, look, narrow. Look, look, here, look, look. look. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I promise not to say a word about you being here and not to use the story until. Does the razor suit you, sir? Well. We shall look, see. Look, I, I, I won't use a damn story at all. No, sir. Your appeals are useless. You are now completely no, no, no. under my I'll, control. I'll, 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 you I'll cannot even tree. speak unless I tell you to do so. Now, you will please have the goodness to uh, raise your chin a little. Huh? Uh, uh, ah. Thank you. Oh, uh, just a fraction more. Huh? Ah. <laughs> Merci, monsieur. Merci. That is... Parfait. Poor Raymond. When I had finished reading his notes, I turned my attention to the tape recorder. Of course, the batteries had run flat hours ago, but the ever-obliging Raymond had brought along his own replacements, which were lying conveniently at his feet, unused. Carefully, I rewound the tape and switched the machine over to playback. Standing there in silence, the three of us listened as the tape played hoping perhaps to find the answer to Raymond's sudden death. When it had finished, we stood there looking at each other, puzzled. Then I rewound the last few moments of the tape and played it again. And only then did I understand. Uh, now, you, you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Bordet. If you think... Enough talking, I haven't even started yet. I'm not alone here, you know. I've only got to shout, and the watchman will come running. And where will you be then? Look here, look, uh, <clears throat> look, I, pr I promise not to say a word about you being here and, 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 and not to use a story until... Look, I, I, I won't use a damn story at all. Waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places, waiting to be admired by the crowds who would soon wander fearfully among them. In their midst, in the center gangway, Raymond Hewson sat still, leaning far back in his armchair. His chin was tilted up, as if he were waiting to receive attention from a barber, and although there was not a scratch upon his throat, he was cold and dead. His previous employers had been wrong in crediting him with no imagination. If anything, he had an overabundance of that particular commodity. 
As I left that sinister chamber, I glanced back. Dr. Bourdette, on his pedestal, watched the dead man unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion, but then, after all, he was only a waxwork. One thing, however, still troubles me, that laughter on the tape. Of course, it could have been on the tape already... It has since, I confess, crossed my mind that perhaps Miss Frayne had added it, hoping for extra publicity. Perhaps I thought that was why she had not called the police at once. But these thoughts I dismissed as being both ungallant and impractical. But what else could explain it? The alternative is too awful to think of. Could it really have been the waxworks, those vacant, staring effigies laughing at the fate of Raymond Hewson? Could it? I wonder. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in the waxwork was Peter Barkworth with Cyril Shapps, Joan Cooper and Christopher Bidmead. The waxwork was first recounted by A.M. Burridge, dramatised by Barry Campbell and produced... Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello. I know there are those amongst you who will consider the old adage, every picture tells a story, as debatable as it is familiar. As a lifelong art collector and enthusiast myself, I have often speculated that the story surrounding a picture, the human drama, can prove infinitely more fascinating than any story in paint. Trapped within the confines of a frame, and the tale I'm about to tell you, which I've called An Eye for an Eye, will, I'm sure, convince you of the truth of this. Recently, I went to an important sale of Impressionist paintings. The auction room just off London's fashionable St. James was packed to capacity with art speculators from the four corners of the globe. Lot 23, Auguste Renoir, Anemones, oil on canvas 38 inches by 14, an opening bid of 25,000, and 5, 30... 35. Bidding at 35 against you, sir. 40. 45. Thank you. Now standing at 45. Renoir. Monet. Manet. Degas. 
Each in their turn glowed briefly down at us from the auctioneer's easel to be knocked down with almost indecent haste and returned backstage for crating and shipping. Lot 97, Camille. The auctioneer's voice was tiring now. The serious business of the day was over. Lot 98, study of a girl. Attributed to Pissarro, unsigned, unauthenticated, Oil on canvas, 20 inches by 12, from the estate of the Count Luigi della Santa. Opening bid um, invited, I think, ladies and gentlemen. Study of a girl. And there she was, smiling into the gloom of that near-deserted auction room. My old friend, Luigi della Santa, notorious acquisitor of yachts and palazzos and paintings and celebrities. Now here, this, his last prized acquisition, study of a girl. As I consulted the catalogue and smiled ruefully that even in death, Luigi steadfastly insisted on his beloved title of Count, it seemed ironically appropriate that the pedigree of his beloved painting should now turn out to be as unauthenticated as his own. But how long ago it all seemed. How, how long. Midsummer. I'd just completed a long stint of filming in and around Naples. After the sweltering heat of those studio arcs, Luigi's invitation to spend a few days with him on his yacht, anchored off of Sorrento, would have been eagerly accepted in any event, but... I remembered as the launch ferried me across the merest smoothness of that beautiful bay that it was the prospect of at last viewing Luigi's recently acquired Pissarro that made the invitation totally irresistible. Well, Cenzo, you like it? Well? Well, it's... it's beautiful. Quite beautiful. Of course. Mm. Uh, you see, Contessa, didn't I tell you that my very good and wise friend would come and that he would like it, didn't I? Yes, Luigi, you did. <laughs> and now, Vincenzo, you must tell me how much you like it. Five thousand dollars worth? Ten thousand dollars? Luigi, Luigi, she's exquisite. Exquisite? Oh, she is perfection. She is the perfection of perfection. She is the perfection of perfection. <laughs> you are spilling your wine, Caro. And yet, would you believe it, when I tell you, my friend, there are still those dilettantes, those ingrates, those whoremongers who have the gall to insult the intelligence by saying that it cannot be the work of the master. Oh, but Luigi, the master, did not think fit to sign it. What need for him to sign it when every line makes a signature? I tell you, this is not a painting. It is an experience. She is alive, vibrant. Oh, such passionate enthusiasm, Luigi. I shall begin to suspect I have acquired a rival. Vincenzo, if you will permit. It is not the wine of my country, but then it is not the wine of my choosing. Mm -hmm. The Count prefers to import. So instead of buona fortuna... Permit me to wish you bon chance. Bon chance. As she proposed the toast, the charms of Luigi's Contessa di Terra made those of the artist's model obvious, commonplace, and it was almost as though the Contessa were reading my thoughts. But I feel sure you will forgive dear Luigi's schoolboy enthusiasm for this new acquisition, Vicento. As a lifelong friend, you will doubtless have witnessed many such enthusiasms. Well, it isn't difficult to forgive. I so wholeheartedly share it. Ah, bravo, my friend. Perhaps. But between you and Luigi, the appreciation has always been different, I think. Oh? How different? Be warned, Vigenzo. It is not wise to encourage her. Because watching you see the painting for the very first time, there was peace. It was not hard to tell that for you, the appreciation was for the talent it contained, for the genius. You understood what had been attended and what had been achieved. And for me? Is it not the same for me? Prego, Luigi. Permit me to finish. You see, Vincenzo, 
Before Luigi permits me the time to make a point, he is so perfectly demonstrating it. It is not what the painting does inside of him that makes him so determined to possess it. It is simply because there are others who might wish to possess it even more than he does. The price is all that is important for him. He asks, how much you think it is worth? Five thousand dollars? Ten? And when you refuse to give him the answer... Am unable to. <laughs> See, how prettily he sulks. <laughs> oh, it's not his fault, you understand. It does not make me love him less, but... Everything in this so beautiful life is reduced to the level of price, status, possession. Everything which is bad enough, but every one worse, oh. much worse. But possession, life, cannot always be that simple. People, things, cannot always be caught in the net of our understanding. Just as it is not always possible to divorce the manner of our deaths from the manner of our lives. Ah, Tante Dante, much talk makes for much hunger. <laughs> ah, scuse, Count. Uh, la colazione è servito. Si, sì, Carlos, si. Sì. Come, my friends, we are to take luncheon on the deck. Besides, after so much play acting in the dark, Vicenzo. It is now necessary to turn the color to your cheeks. Well, eh? it's nothing I'd <laughs> like better. Also, and most important, Luigi has yet another treat in store for you. Another? See, si. <laughs> to mark the private viewing of his so beautiful painting, the great Luigi, master chef of all the Italias, has himself created a unique gastronomic masterpiece. Emil, worthy of a gourmet of such international repute as you. Oh, my dear Luigi, such flattery. At this rate, the color will be returned to my cheeks much sooner than you anticipate. <laughs> we shall see, Vincenzo. We shall see. Contessa? We shall see. Our lunch party looked like being a jolly affair, to begin with anyway. The wine and the sun went straight to our heads, and the Contessa's affectionate baiting of Luigi continued good-humouredly as the first course was served. The question of Luigi's title provided her readiest target of attack. As to his true origins, well, there were many who insisted that his father could still be found running a small trattoria in that straggling, impoverished town we now viewed across the bay. <laughs> so why doesn't he admit it? Be proud to admit it. <laughs> you see, it is always so. What he refuses to accept, he laughs away. Is that not so, Vicenzo? I think I'll just concentrate on this excellent wine. Oh, but you disappoint me. What? You tell me that you, too, are afraid to burst this ridiculous balloon. Perhaps because Vincenzo has the good sense to realize it is not a balloon. And that it certainly is not ridiculous. It is... It is... What is it, Bambino? What is it? It is an insult. Oh. It is a double insult of my lineage and breeding. Oh, 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 oh. oh I'm, I'm sorry, Luigi. Oh, so don't be my friend. It's good to laugh at such archaic distinctions. Uh, Vincenzo has seen the papers. Is that not true? I, uh, I have seen papers. Papers are for the forging. Oh. So, has Vincenzo seen my papers? Of course he has not. And why has he not? Because he does not need to. He has only to use his eyes to realize I am of the line just as you are of the gutter. Then why does the Contessa dishonor her line by sitting at my table? Oh, because even a penniless Contessa has to eat somewhere. And like his cook of a father and his cook of a grandfather before him, Count Luigi still makes the best fish soup in the whole of Italy. True, Carlo? True, my father and his father before him made the best soup... <laughs> Caught, Caro. Uh -huh. <laughs> the Contessa's high praise for Luigi's culinary skills were justified, certainly, whether inherited or not. 
After a lifetime of experience, I've come to the conclusion that there are only really two kinds of master chef. Those who have spent long years perfecting their skills and those who have added to this a simple flair, an ability to transform the simplest meal into something near approaching a work of art. But now, my good friends, your attention, your undivided attention, if you please. It is with the greatest pride and pleasure Luigi himself presents to you his own original creation. Oh! Speciality of the house. <coughs> Vincenzo. Luigi waited. As I peered into the deep serving terrine he set in front of me, I remember thinking that after the great build-up he'd given it, his specialty of the house turned out to be something of an anti-climax. The ingredients were certainly commonplace enough, served on a bed of rice, a veritable hotchpotch of, well, of all the kinds of fish native to the locality, something I'd frequently enjoyed with a bottle of ordinary vino at any harborside trattoria. So, you like it? But now, why don't you look even closer, my friend? He was waiting again. So, simply to oblige him, I did look closer. And then, I saw it. A large octopus sat squarely upon its bed of lobster pieces and king-sized prawns. To my best recollection, I'd never seen one cooked whole before. So, perhaps this was the special touch my Italian friend had in mind. And then it happened. The creature's great saucer eyes opened and gazed balefully into mine. My God, it was alive. <laughs> now he sees. So, how do you like my little beauty? I'm not sure. But I have created a new delicacy. A live delicacy? A live Vicenzo. Between us, we will set a new gastronomic trend, you see. Oh, purists like the Contessa may at first condemn it. A return to marine cannibalism, perhaps, eh? <laughs> but I tell you, Vincenzo, and you will agree for yourself, that in the gastronomic stakes, a live lobster boat screaming to the boil will prove strictly for the peasant. Now. Please. Well, taste it. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. At first, well, at first I, I just thought it was some kind of a joke. A joke? Well, as a matter of fact, I, I'm still not sure if you... But it, it isn't, is it? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, Luigi. You object? Well... Simply, let's say, decline. But why... I can't explain. Try. For Luigi's sake, why don't you try? Well, even for Luigi's sake... Well, I'm just not sure I can. It, it's something to do with the very aliveness of the thing, of course, but more than that, it's... It's the eyes. A sort of watchfulness in the eyes. You disappoint me, my friend. You know that? You disappoint me. I'm... I'm sorry. You object. But you cannot even begin to explain why you object. Uh, Luigi, please. Vincenzo is your guest. For which I'm sorry. Because not only does he show a singular lack of adventure, but because he stupidly finds the dish somehow objectionable on humanitarian grounds. True or not True. true. But why? The oysters you love, are they not live? A well-known scientific fact. All sea creatures are impervious to pain. Any ten-year-old angler will tell you, my friend, they have no brain, no mind, no nervous system, let alone the so-called uh, finer feelings which you and the Contessa would seem to attribute to them. Apart from which, the pathetic specimen you see before you is itself possessed of those same... Cannibal instincts, which you now accuse me of possessing. 
I accuse you of nothing, Luigi. Hourly sucking into the disgusting chasm of its stomach a million tiny sea creatures. To first digest, and then spew out the remains which are neither palatable or necessary to its uniquely selfish existence. Except that you have overlooked one thing, Luigi. Huh? We have no way of knowing. In spite of the sworn word of any ten-year-old angler, we have no way of really knowing. Whether the creature we see squirming in front of us is capable of feeling or not. Knowing, my dear Concessa, what is there to know? Everything. Anything. Simply because, perhaps, it chooses to reveal nothing. We shall never know. Not unless it were possible for one of us to take its place. At this very moment. To be... On the receiving end. Permit me to produce the evidence. With a single deft, circular movement of his knife, Luigi removed one of those enormous eyes. The creature attempted vaguely to scale the deep sides of the dish, but at last, realizing there could be no escape, floundered back stonily regarding Luigi with its one remaining eye. The mucus from its socket mingled now with the rich Madeira of the sauce that had replaced its natural element. Luigi regarded it dispassionately, then flicked the eye on the heavy silver of his embossed plate. That evening... Over after-dinner brandies, my squeamishness turned to embarrassment. An apology seemed in order, and I was happy to provide it. But, my dear Vincenzo, there is nothing to be forgiven. <laughs> Unless it is the weather. More brandy. Oh, thank you. I had planned on taking the launch to show you a few of the night spots across the bay, but uh, I'm afraid <laughs> until the storm decides to blow itself oh, out... Think no more of it. I'm really perfectly happy. Which is a good deal more than can be said for the Contessa, I think. Isn't that so, Caro? Oh, if you say so, Luigi, then I suppose it must be. But you've hardly said a word since lunch. Haven't I? You know you haven't. Oh, then I can only blame the storm. Unless it is that it's late and I'm tired. But I really would like to retire for the night. Oh, but of course. So soon, Contessa. But the night is young. No, dear Luigi. The night is never young. It is the same age at its birth as at its death. It is we who must inhabit the bright lights of day. We grow old. As old as we are allowed to grow. Good night. Good night, Contessa. <clears throat> A cigar, perhaps. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, Luigi. I, I wasn't... Now you're doing it again, my friend. Apologizing for one thing and overreacting for another. <laughs> Am I? Yes, you are overreacting to my Contessa. But then you have been all day. Well, then I'm... Well, I, I certainly didn't intend to. But found it impossible not to. Well, it is late, Luigi. You see, my friend, the effect she has on us is infectious. Oh, please. I, I only meant it's been rather a long day. But if you'd rather... No, no, I, I insist. Whatever our mysterious lady claims to the contrary, tomorrow is another day. We shall welcome it together. Well, good night, Luigi. Uh, by the way, it's macabre of me, I know... But what did happen You want to, to know what happened to our uh, one-eyed sea monster? Yes. <laughs> Thrown overboard with the rest of the garbage? Oh, not out of any finer sense of returning it to its own. I do assure you, its remains will attract the other sea creatures. The cycle of cannibalism perpetuates itself. Besides, it makes for excellent fishing. If you promise to get up before noon, I'll get one of the crew to fix us up with a couple of lines. Good night. I 
I lay in my cabin listening to the storm. It was strange how deeply Luigi's mood of the evening had disturbed me. The extrovert, arrogant Luigi. And then it had been a long day, so sleep now. Gently, gratefully, into sleep. Sleep. Isabella? Isabella, mon amore. Is that you? Oh, Isabella, don't tease me. No, please don't, Isabella. Oh, my God. No. No. Ah! It was the steward, Carlos, who found him. But having seen what he had seen, he would not again venture into the cabin. Straddled grotesquely across the bed, in a splatter of torn flesh and blood, was the thing that had been Luigi. There were the marks of giant tentacles about the doll snapped head. The tongue rolled gigantic from between those swollen purple lips. But overall, there was the unmistakable evidence that the whole head had been somehow inexplicably pulped outwards, as though it had first been sucked in under some enormous unnatural pressure, fed upon and the remains spewed out again onto the fine linen of those monogrammed pillows. But not all spewed back. Not all totally discarded. For when I could bring myself to look at the thing again, there was no mistaking the fact. Only one of Luigi's eyes stared back at me. The other socket lay seeping, empty. The Contessa was standing at my side. How do we know they have no feeling? How do we know they are not capable of understanding and of revolt? And if revolt, why not revenge? A revenge to be fearfully enacted by others of their own kind. Larger, stronger, more terrifying than anything we dare imagine. There is no evidence such monsters do exist. But is there any proof that they do not? I looked away from that single cyclops eye and leading from what remained a, a trail of slime much like the slime of some enormous slug I followed its course it climbed the French brocade wallpaper shattered the high chromium finish of the porthole crossed the deep teak polish of the deck beyond and from thence it slimed down the hull. The spume of it still floated out there, oil-like, on the calm waters of that beautiful Italian bay. Then it descended eternally into the dark depths that lay beneath. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear with Roger Snowden, Anne Jemison and Christopher Bidmead. 
An Eye for an Eye was first recounted and dramatized by William Ingram and produced really four days ago. Tonight's is the last story for the present, so turn the light down low, relax, and enjoy every moment of it. The Price of Fear Brought to you by Vincent Price. Train trips fascinate me. How about you? If the answer is yes, then this story, which I have chosen to call The Man Who Hated Scenes, might well appeal to you. Indeed, for some of you listening, even the notion of making a long train journey across the United States will conjure up a world of limitless possibilities. The world seems yours for the asking. Right from that first whistle blow, right from the first shudder as the giant locomotive grips the tracks and pulls its human cargo away from the commonplace and the familiar towards the romantic and the unknown. Others of you, of course, might prefer to regard such a journey as simply a a respite, a period of temporary seclusion, a chance to simply sit and think. My own inclinations vary, and I suspect come somewhere in between. In any event, be it in the diner of a train speeding across the States or in the kitchen of my own home, I have always considered conversation at breakfast as something of a chore. And so it was, as I watched the little man coming towards me, my feelings were a mixture of resentment and dismay. His voice proved as tentative and deferential as his general demeanor. You were... You won't mind if I share your table? The fact that the rest of the diner was still completely empty and the stranger seemed perfectly prepared for me to refuse ultimately made no difference to my polite reply. Will you? Oh, no, please do. I'd be glad for the company. Oh, many thanks. Uh, 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 Insomnia, don't you know? I've been a martyr to it all my life. Oh, I'm sorry Mm. about that. But still, it's nice to know I'm not going to be the only one coming in for breakfast this early. Oh? Yes, when I came in a few minutes ago, the dining car attendant looked as though he'd just got out of his pajamas. <laughs> and could certainly see no reason why I wasn't still in mine. That he... he wasn't angry, was he? Well, let's just say, not your usual service with a smile. I see. You, uh, you must forgive my asking... It's just that I could perfectly well come back later if it were more convenient for them. Well, there's no point in making a scene, is there? I do so hate scenes. He glanced nervously away as the same sleepy waiter approached us from the service area. 
He gave his order in an apologetic, hardly audible voice. Just coffee and lightly scrambled eggs, please. Are you going all the way to New York? Hmm? Oh, much further, much further. I'm traveling on the QE2. We embark on Thursday. Oh, home to England, then. Oh, no, no, not for a long time yet. Uh, Cherbourg first, then the sun, the Riviera, perhaps, Italy, the Greek islands... I haven't made up my mind. Oh, I do envy you. Then you shouldn't. No? No, it's just a case of doctor's orders. It's my nerves, you know. It's any kind of excitement to be avoided at all costs. Yes. Yes, I do understand. I think you really do. For some unknown reason, I'm, I'm sure you do. So my... My friend, you can imagine the kind of state I got myself into when I discovered my wife was being unfaithful to me, can't you? Your... your wife? Uh, Marilyn. So beautiful, so very, very beautiful. Oh, but perhaps you'd care to judge for yourself. I just happened to have it... It's only a snapshot, but it doesn't do her justice, really. But, oh, yes, here, here we are. It was taken at the side of the pool, don't you know? Our pool. It's very impressive. <laughs> Marilyn loved that pool. I'd accepted and studied the photograph. The sleepy waiter had returned and was grudgingly serving my companion's breakfast. Yes, the girl was certainly beautiful. There was no denying that fact. Even though the photographer had caught her just on the point of emerging from the pool, her charms were not only obvious but a trifle too obvious. The high diving board framed her head. <laughs> it reminded me somewhat disconcertingly of a gallows. I ordered scrambled eggs, didn't I? What? Yes. Yes, I'm sure you did, but they've brought you fried. So bad for the digestion, don't you know? Oh, well, these things are sent to try us. Oh, nothing of the kind. I'll ring for the serve. No, no, please don't. I do so hate scenes, you see. Please. Well, just as you wish. Thank you. I suppose it's fortunate for me. I've never been short of money. It really is a wonderful insulator, old man. It protects me from all kinds of anxieties the average man can't avoid. It's probably why I've never objected when I've been overcharged or anything like that. Far easier to pay up. Remain calm. Hmm? Mm. You, uh, you were telling me about your, your wife. Marilyn. Oh, yes. Beautiful. So beautiful. The most beautiful creature I've ever seen. Or I'm ever likely to see. I, I thought so right from the very beginning. Where was that? Mm -hmm. It was at a resort in Florida. She was a swimmer before our marriage. Almost made the Olympic team. Did she really? Yes, really. Anyway, she was doing some exhibition dives from the high board into the hotel pool. She was wearing a white bathing suit. I remember seeing her poise high above me. She seemed a positive... Goddess incarnate. Diana turned mermaid instead of huntress. Uh, does that um, sound fanciful? No. No, not at all. I didn't think it would. Do you? I, I never thought I was in with much of a chance, though. She was a, a good 20 years younger and always in the company of half a dozen bronze Apollos. But, well, we just seemed to hit it off right from the start. The difference in age didn't seem to matter. <laughs> uh, a case of mind over matter. I, I suppose you could put it like that. In any event, within a month, Marilyn and I became husband and wife and were off on our honeymoon. We were so very happy. And afterwards you, you returned home. Home? It's a, it's a big Spanish type of place just outside Santa Barbara. A truly beautiful spot. I don't think I ever wanted to leave that house ever again. It gave me the seclusion and peace my nerves required. I had everything I ever wanted. Mm. And uh, Marilyn? Oh, for a long time she loved the place too. 
We'd splash about in our pool every day, and often I'd just lie in the sun and watch her diving. And <coughs> sometimes... Yes? Sometimes we'd send the servants away for the day, and if you'll pardon the expression, we'd swim in the nude. <laughs> well, it was genuinely idyllic, my friend, in an age when all the graciousness seems to have gone out of life. Idyllic. So much so that when it finally came, Marilyn's outburst took me completely by surprise. What's so surprising about it, for God's sake? And you needn't think I'm so dumb as to not realize what you're getting out of this setup either. Getting out of getting, this Getting, yes. This place, miles from anywhere, perched on the edge of nowhere. Well, it exactly suits your ends, doesn't it? I thought you liked the house. A rich, eccentric, middle-aged recluse, comfortably ensconced in his 20 bedroomed ivory tower. I've always felt you shared my preference for the solitary life. But not the godforsaken. I don't understand what you're getting at, Marilyn. Don't, sure. Really. For a gentleman of your intelligence and breeding, I should have thought it altogether too obvious. However, I'll tell you. Quite simple. <laughs> Madeline, dear, do you think you ought to drink so much? You didn't have the guts to stay on here and go it completely alone. So, for once in his life, one hermit ventured forth. He took a little trip into the big outside world with the deliberate intention of trapping a little spouse to keep him company. I've never thought of our marriage as a trap. Ego being what it is, I'm damn sure you haven't. Oh. But take it from me, it was just an arrangement right from the start. An arrangement no. to suit your own ends. I've always tried to put your happiness first. Huh. Happiness? That's a word from the past. But I've given you everything you've ever asked for. Everything. I'll grant you the bait was acceptable enough at first. Bait? Of the very finest quality. There's no denying but bait, Harry. You made the whole arrangement seem irresistible, didn't you? But uh, the world was to be our oyster, remember? New places, new faces, forever and ever, world without end. Amen. Oh, you really had me believing it, too. Right up to the end of the honeymoon, you actually had me believing it. And afterwards? Well, the honeymoon was over, wasn't it? So was the new faces, new places routine. And in its place, this. A cage, damn you. Oh, well up to the standard you taught me to expect. I'm not denying that a cage for all that. Madeline, I love you. Right from that first moment. You knew that you wanted me, so you wooed me and you won me. You moved me into your millionaire's Alcatraz and then you threw away the keys. I still love you. Oh, maybe you do. Enough to go back? Back where? To where the arrangement started going wrong. To our original arrangement, Harry. New places, new faces, forever and ever world without end. It is not an arrangement. It never has been. It still is. And shall I tell you something else? It's never going to be anything more, Harry. <laughs> poor Harry. Poor, poor Harry. <laughs> Have some more coffee? Oh, thank you. So, uh, she got her own way, then? New places, new faces. If it had been in my power, she would have... She would have got her way. If it had been in my power, I'd have given her anything. Knowing what a person is doesn't necessarily mean you stop loving them, does it? No, I suppose not. So, uh, you left the house? Hmm? Oh, no. No, it never came to that. Oh, it was, it, it was what Marilyn had insisted upon and what I'd agreed to. A really long trip abroad... A chance for us to find each other again. Extraordinary how absolute naivety has a charm of its own. But as things turned out, it simply wasn't to be. Oh? Well, on the eve of our departure, I was taken ill. Desperately ill. As a, as a result of the quarrel? 
Well, my doctor called it acute emotional stress. You, you see, I've never been able to stand scenes of any kind, and in this case, well, my only defense was a period of total mental withdrawal, a self-inflicted coma, if you like. It went on for a long time, over a month. And then? It refused to go on any longer. Did, well, did Marilyn stand by you? Marilyn? Ah, yes, Marilyn. Marilyn? 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 It's all right. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, dear God. Easy now. You've been ill, Harry. Very ill. Yes, yes, I, I have been ill, haven't I? I'm so sorry, Mary. Oh, shush, sure, shush. Sure. The only important Stop. thing now is that you get well again. The doctor's been very worried for you. And you? Did you worry for me too, Marilyn? Oh, yes. I worried. Oh, thank you. Thank you for worrying. Oh, shh. No. No, you were quite right. I, I've been selfish and thoughtless, thinking only of myself. But I'll... I'll make it up to you. You'll see, I'll, I'll make it all up to you. Of course you will. By simply getting well again. Yes, that's it. Well again. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then we'll make that long trip together, eh? Just the two of us. Just, just as we've planned to do. Before. No. Pardon? There's not going to be any trip, Harry. Not just yet. Not for a long, long time. Uh, but uh, I thought that was what you, you, you wanted. It was. Well? And then you became sick. And I realized I wanted something else much more. I, I wanted you to get well again. So that we could always be together. Together here, Harry. I wanted this place for just the two of us. I wanted to look after you and care for you here in our own home, Harry. And I decided that the most important thing in the world for me was to make it into a real home. Not some kind of show place. What? Not some kind of domestic hotel either, where everything gets done for you at the press of a button. But I'm I'm not sure I understand. What... It's perfectly simple. I got rid of the servants, Harry. Surfants, you... We never really needed them. Don't you see? It was they that came between us, Harry. Our only real happiness came when we were allowed to be alone together. But how are we going to manage with that? Oh, easily, easily. I've already arranged it all and it's working wonderfully. A woman comes up from town every morning to take care of the heavy work. I can get anything we need by making a phone call and having it delivered. Well, what more do we need? What more can we ask, huh? Nothing, my love. Nothing. Just the two of us. Just the two of you. And tell me, did it work out like that? No. No, not quite like that. Well, how? As the weeks went by and I got steadily stronger, Marilyn thought the occasional change of scene might speed my recovery. Nothing too... Far afield, mind you, nothing too taxing. Just a little jaunt along the coast, the odd picnic in the hills. Well, my nerves being what they are, I've never felt competent enough to drive myself, and Marilyn didn't really feel up to it. We had got rid of my old chauffeur, along with the rest of the staff. And so... And so you engaged another one? Marilyn engaged one. His name was Charles. I had no objection to her choice. My own newfound happiness was such that I was scarcely aware of him. What was he like? Charles? Mm. Oh, he was in his mid-twenties, I suppose. I dare say handsome, in an obvious sort of way. But, as I say, I was, I was hardly aware. Not until that night. The night when... Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Dear God. Dear God, that night is still with me. I, I woke up 
with a start from a, a very deep steep. Hmm. Uh, Marilyn had taken care to give me my usual quota of sleeping pills, but for some reason on this particular night, they hadn't done the trick. Perhaps it was meant. Uh, well, for several minutes, I just lay there, perspiring heavily, getting my bearings, aware only of the ticking of the clock. Then I called out for Marilyn. Yes, I, I didn't want to disturb her, but I, I needed another sedative badly. But when she didn't answer, I, I, I got up and went to her room. She, she wasn't there. At first, I thought she must have got up for something, too. Until I saw her bed hadn't been slept in. It was almost two o'clock in the morning. I was a little alarmed, so I, I, I began to look for her. M Marilyn? Marilyn? It wasn't until I reached the downstairs living room, which opens onto the patio, that I heard voices. <laughs> I opened the patio doors. The voices were clearer now. My wife and our chauffeur, together at the pool. I understood at once. It was pitch black, and they'd taken the precaution of not turning on the pool light. But I could hear them laughing and talking in low, intimate voices. I heard them climb the steps to the high board and dive together into the deep water. I stood there, heart sick. The effort to simply hold on to myself was unbearable. My first instinct had been to rush out and confront them, but I, I couldn't bear the thought of such a scene. Uh, so instead, I, I waited until they eventually left the pool. They lay together in each other's arms, not ten feet from where I stood. I... Uh, listened... Why did you ever leave me? Oh, I don't know. I did then. At the time, it seemed the only possible answer. But I know I never stopped loving you, not for a single second. Which, in a funny way, is why I had to leave you in the first place. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Let's just say an instinct, shall we? Instinct? Yeah. And the kind of life we were living together must one day have killed that love. It wasn't so bad. Wasn't it? Diving exhibitions at second-rate summer resorts, the odd gala. Hardly enough to keep body and soul alive. Endless drag from one dreary hotel room to the next. So you sold out and settled for this instead. Oh. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to sound like that. I settled for both of us, Chuck. Oh, but you still don't know whether to believe that or not, do you? To believe that I only ever wanted this for us. All along. I don't know what to believe. <laughs> when I'm lying here with you like this... Well, it's just a sharing you with him, I suppose. Seeing you together. Catching the odd, unexpected glimpse of you both in that damn driving mirror. Oh. Seeing him look at you that way. As though you were really his. Seeing him reach out to touch Chuck. you. Seeing you smile back. Seeing you return the touch. Please, don't. But worst of all, knowing that though you're lying here with me now, in a little while you'll be gone. Because there's still some part of you that belongs to him. Not belongs. It never has. It never can. It, it never will. I wish I could be sure of that. He's a sick man, Chuck. Sicker than he even suspects. A year, two years, a little longer, maybe. But it's not so important, is it? We can wait. Because we know that one day there's only going to be us, Chuck. All this and us. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. Hold me. 
hold me close. What did you do? Do? Mm. Oh, the conventional thing, I'm afraid. The next day, I engaged a firm of detectives. To make inquiries about Charles. Mm. They only told me what I more or less knew already. That he was a swimmer who teamed up with Marilyn to do exhibition diving the summer before I met her. The rest was obvious. When I became ill, she had sent for him to solace her loneliness, shall we say. Then, as I grew better, she stumbled on the idea of employing him as our chauffeur. You... Can understand my dilemma. Yes, yes, I, I am beginning to. I was just recovering from a serious nervous illness, a breakdown, a scene, a quarrel would undo the weeks of convalescence. Now, of all times, it was impossible for me to have it out with Marilyn, to send Charles packing, to do what any other man would have done instantly. It was a weakness, but I couldn't overcome it. So? I dissembled. I pretended I knew nothing. I waited. I racked my brains for some way of letting Marilyn know that I knew, and yet avoiding that inevitable scene. Well, did you eventually find a way? Oh, yes. I saw how it could be done. Quietly. Without any fuss. Tell me about it. Oh. Well... Marilyn wanted to go to the movies in Santa Barbara. I declined, but said Charles should drive her, as I didn't like her to be out on her own at night. She... she saw me to bed and watched me ostensibly taking my sleeping tablets. I heard the car drive away and imagined handsome Charles, Chuck, sitting confidently beside her at the wheel... After a while, I... I got up. I had plenty of time. Plenty of time for what? To arrange the hint. The hint that would let them know when they got back that I was fully aware of what was happening between them. Oh, go on. It was well after midnight when they got back. Very dark. A hot, sultry night. Just the night for a swim. Marilyn didn't even come up to her room but went with Charles directly to his. And a few minutes later, I heard them laughing softly as they came out and went towards the pool. It was inky dark. But I knew they were climbing the diving tower. The high board creaked as they stepped out onto it. And creaked again, sharply as each one dived off into the pool. Marilyn first, then Charles right behind her. Their little game they enjoyed so much. It was too dark to see a foot in front of you, but of course to swimmers of their skill it made no difference. In fact, I rather imagine it added to their fun. And uh, your hint... Did it work? I, I mean, did it break up the affair? Oh, yes. It broke up all right. The affair ended that very night. A truly effective hint when I finally thought of it. You see, my friend, that evening, as soon as they had left the house, I opened each of the four valves and drained all the water out of the swimming pool. Hmm... The man watched me, waited. I could think of nothing to say. After what seemed an eternity of silence between us, the train entered a tunnel. It was like the fall of a curtain. That was Vincent Price, bringing you the last in this series, 
The Price of Fear. Also starring in The Man Who Hated Scenes was Peter Cushing with Diana Olson and Steve Preston. The Man Who Hated Scenes was first recounted by Robert Arthur, dramatized by William Ingram, and produced by John. in Is There Anybody There? by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. In Arcadia Avenue, the houses have names as well as numbers. Shangri-La, Dunroman, More Repose. They best sum up the avenue's air of nostalgic gentility. Built in the early 30s, all is very discreetly orthodox from the privacy of privet hedge and lace curtains at the front to the squares of handkerchief-sized lawn at the back. In later years, however, professional nameplates have appeared on several of the front gateposts. Brigadoon now houses Chetney, Chetney, and Chetney accountants. Higher up the avenue, there is an establishment for the fitting of ladies' foundation garments. But it is to the recently renamed Celestina that our attention must finally turn. The first thing one notices is that its brass nameplate is somewhat grimier than the others. It pronounces Miss Griselda Thorpe to be medium and clairvoyant, consultations and ministrations strictly by appointment only. Every Wednesday afternoon, promptly at three of the clock, Mr. Henry Jollett climbs the gravel path, presses the front door bell button, and anticipates, at the going rate of one guinea per session, yet another preview of eternity. Ah, my dear Mr. Jollett. Miss Edith, I trust I'm not premature. No, 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 quite the contrary. Punctual to the very second as usual. Punctuality, my dear Mr. Jollett, the prerogative of kings, in my books, whatever, or anybody else's for that matter. Edie! Yes, Griselda, stop catching blue bottles. <laughs> Assist me with a sacred pendant. Yes, Griselda. Uh, mm-hmm. I, 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 I can't quite no. see. Fingers and thumbs, fingers and thumbs. There. Mr. Jollett, drill us before, if you please. You there, in the hot seat. Thank you. I shall sit here with my back to the window. Better for vibes and less chance of spiritual dispersion, don't you know? And Edie, you... Edie, where have you got to? Here, Griselda, I've been here all along. Really, I have. But I don't want you here, dear. I want you there, in the third chair. Of course. How silly, Mm. Edie. There. You can begin now, Griselda. Thank you, dear. We will join hands in a circle of eternal light and harmony. Well, do it as though you meant it, woman, for heaven's sake. Hands, harmony. The man's not a flax fish. Oh, yes, Griselda. <laughs> Peace. 
Peace. Perfect peace. Peace. Perfect peace. Peace. It started, Mr. Jodick. You can always tell when it started. Are you there? Are you there, almighty oh, Manco Kapak, emperor of the Inca, beloved of the sun? Her spirit guide, you know. I have had the pleasure. Speak, almighty oh, one. Is there anybody there? He's there. Speak. Speak. It is I, Manco Kapak, Emperor of the Inca, beloved of the sun, God living, God incarnate, God of the infinite orb. This is where her breathing gets heavier. You'll see. Speak, O oh Manco Kapak, Emperor of your peoples, spirit guide to lesser mortals bound in bonds of common clay. Above the land of Cusco, the condor flies high in search of the lamb that has strayed. Oh, dear. Our fields lie fallow, our storehouse is empty. The living seed of promise has burnt itself to half. I don't like the sound of that at all. Prepare then, my people, prepare ye. Climb, oh, climb thy temple mountain. Annoying to his sacred unctions this. A human sacrifice. See, oh, see where the living god of the orb, the chariot of the sun, spins gold upon this holy place. Raise high the sacred blade. The time of the living blood is upon us. The time is now. Now! Stop daydreaming and pass Mr. Jolly the last of those chocolate digestions. Oh, yes. uh, uh, Mr. Jolly? Uh, no, thank you, Miss Edie. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> Piggy to the top? I'll have it. Uh, Edie, while you're on your feet, you can put Capac's sacred pendant back in the casket where it belongs. Uh, beautiful, isn't it, Mr. Jolly? Beautiful. Quite beautiful. Mm. <laughs> I'd let you take a closer peek, but I don't think the old boy would go for that. Even letting Edie get her chocolatey little paws on it is stretching the point. But at least in the family, if you take my meaning. Of course. Oh, at least let me top you up. I beg your pardon? Uh, oh, no, no, thank you. Most kind. Ah, oh, downhearted. <laughs> I don't blame you. Three Wednesdays in a row and still no contact with the dear departed, eh? Not yet, good <laughs> Though the Emperor did seem to have rather a lot on his mind. Oh? Mm. Still, if he doesn't pull his finger out soon, you'll be asking for your lolly back. Oh, dear lady, it never entered my mind. Odd, though. Odd? Don't have many failures, do we, the old thing? The first I can remember, Griselda. If your dear departed wife... Violet, Griselda. Violet. Quite. Well... Old Manco Capac can usually be relied upon to winkle them out. Not that there'd be much persuading needed, mind you. Huh? Or put yourself in Violet's place. Like being told there's a long-distance phone call. Not even bothering to find out who's on the other end. I never quite thought of it in that light. I wonder what light you had thought of it in, Mr. Jolly. I notice you've been admiring my sister's portrait, Mr. Jolly. What? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it had rather caught my eye. Splendid, isn't it? Edith. Oh, but it is, Griselda, dear. Such an excellent...
excellent likeness. Give or take 20 years. Oh, such fire. Such expression. Indeed. Cleopatra, don't you know? Oh, really? Not the old Vic, Mr. Jollett. Finsbury Park Empire. What they call in the business a bum week. And not the title role either. Though that's clearly the impression my sister wishes to give. Patata Tita. Patata Tita. Patata Tita. Patata Tita. Trusted and rather boring handmaiden to the Queen, don't you know? She's the one that brings that awful rubber snake on at the end. The trickiest part was getting the name right. Patata Tita. I still have nightmares. Painted by a fellow artist? Mr. Jolly. Better at painting than acting. But don't everybody in the company seemed better at something than acting? Of course, I had realized your background was probably theatrical. <laughs> Only probably. <laughs> oh, my dear man, such understatement. That isn't really The ham of all hams. Always was, always will be. Why, I eventually had the good sense to give it up. Anyway, 20 years on, water under the bridge... I'm sure you must have better things to do than go up at pathetic shortcomings of an aspiring Sarah Bernhardt. How interesting. Mr. Jollett? How very interesting. Twenty years. You did say twenty years. Give or take? Why do you ask? In the painting, you're already wearing the sacred pendant. Am I? Uh, uh, oh, oh, yes. Yes. So I am. Aren't I? Griselda's feeling of being caught out did not escape either Edie's or Mr. Jollett's notice. To begin with, Griselda half choked on her chocolate digestive, then lapsed into a granite-like silence, which made the gentleman shift uneasily on the edge of his seat, drop a spoon, and finally invent a previous engagement, and so beat a grateful retreat. Griselda? What are you doing? What does it look as though I'm doing? I am having myself a gin. But you've just had tea. They can fight it out between them. Please, Jessica. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have three gins. But isn't it a little early for From where start? I'm standing, it might already be a damn sight too late. <laughs> well, why the hell don't you join me? No, thank you. Suit yourself. Oh. Oh, damned fault. Pardon? Should have cottoned onto the blight along before this. I must be losing my grip. What a time I'd have got his number before he got his size tens over the front door, Matt. Are you referring to our Mr. Jollett? Jollett. Jollett. I wonder how long it took him to dream that one up. Or perhaps his super duper pulled it from a hat. Super duper? Superintendent, dear. What? Police. Fuzz. Oh. God knows why I didn't tumble. What did he say that ridiculous wife's name was again? Violet. <laughs> Violet Jollet. Well, have you ever heard anything more unlikely? Who in their right mind would ever want to be supernaturally reunited with someone called Violet Jollet? Mr. Jollet. Hocus pocus, pudding and pie. Not that she ever existed, but like... Like somebody opening the second half in old-time music halls. Oh. Violet Jollett and her performing love doves. Osprey Feather of the Tilt and her feathered friends dropping bird muck all over her velveteen and diamante ball gown. Not to mention half the stores. <sighs> I'm still not sure I follow you, Griselda. Well, God knows how much clearer I can make it. Phony. Through and through. Ah, uh, Mr. Jollett. And for God's sake, stop calling him that. And Mrs. Jollett, too. Well, how else was he going to get himself over the front door? Oh, but if our Mr. Well, the gentleman isn't what he pretends. I thought I put you in the picture. He's either one of the plainclothes brigade or oh. a hack. A hack? A scribbler. A scribbler? From one of those dreadful Sunday rags. All purge and true confession. Well, he doesn't look like a newspaper man. You've never seen a newspaper man. No. Well, then. They're not all trilby hats and dirty trench coats, you know. Well, I suppose they can't be. Still. Hmm. Had it coming. Had what coming? On the cards. That one day I'd probably get myself 
splashed right across the front page of one of the Sunday dreadfuls. Real life expose, life after death racket. The sinister truth. You know the kind of thing. <laughs> one of those dreadful photographs they always find to go with it. Out of focus and slightly blurred around the edges. Griselda, dear. It, it, it wouldn't be true anyway. <laughs> Would it? So what the devil do you think I've been prattling on about? The big phony. <gasps> Always knew it. So now it's out of the bag. Good run for our money. Our money, Sister Edie. But over. I don't believe you. Then turn a blind eye again. Your option. Always been your prerogative in the past. Truth. <laughs> Always true. Turn a blind eye to whatever you can't take. To you and Mumsy and dear dead Papa. The whole ridiculous charade of Arcadia Avenue. Over. Done with. Cuffwood. Thank God. Your spiritual gift, phony as hell. If you made it all up, all of it. Not my co-cupac. <laughs> it had a ring about it. Not the kind of thing they'd be likely to find in the telephone directory. But I heard him, Griselda. Your spirit voice. Mm, a fair stab at one, even if I do say so myself. First tried it out when I was playing one of the three witches in the Scottish play. By the way, did you notice how your Mr. Jollick turned somersaults when he heard of my theatrical associations? <laughs> It must always be a bit of a giveaway, I suppose. He was admiring the pendant, Griselda. Uh, uh, pendant to the Emperor Manco Capac, <laughs> ruler of the Incas, <laughs> from out of the land of Cusco. Spirit guide of lesser mortals, bound in the bond of common clay. Oh, oh, dear. Sorry, old girl. Bosch. Oh, Bosch. God knows why I even picked up that worthless bit of scrap iron. Probably with the rest of the junk in one of those sixpenny trays. Oh. I see. Easy? No. <laughs> Just a bit of a headache. An early night. I'll take one of my pills. Well, perhaps even two. Oh. Oh. What about your biddy buys cocoa? No, thank you, dear. I don't feel much like it tonight. <laughs> Not tonight. We had no way of knowing how long it was before Griselda followed Edie up the wooden hill. Gin had always been her tipple. It not only relaxed her, it gave her a, a warm feeling of righteous self-pity. And if she wasn't entitled to a large slice of that tonight, who the devil was? She could have been asleep for hours. She might just have closed her eyes. She lay fully clothed on top of the bed. She was perfectly aware of the distant town hall clock and that damn ginger tom making its caterwauling next door. She was cold reached down to pull the heavy eider down about her. But her hands lacked the strength, her intention, the purpose. She was pinioned, but not only by physical force, as though by hypnotism behind her eyes, dragging her backwards through time, place, to a scene she seemed to know, recognize, as in a dream but a dream that was about to become her reality. Hark and then, no sacred children of the sun. Let it be known through our infant land that her denial of us, of our blessed sacred symbol, shall be avenged. Let the time be now. Ready? 
even now upon the altar of our forefathers. Even now. Even now. Even now. Even now. It was always Edie who coped with the ritual of early morning tea. She'd carefully avoid Griselda's pom-pommed carpet slippers, then set the cup gently down on her bedside table, draw her curtains to exactly the width she demanded, and then shake her gently, but firmly, by her shoulder until she got the first grunt of awakening and recognition. But no grunt came. It took Edie a long time before she finally would accept that Griselda was dead. Oh! It's Edie. But, but, but it's not even Wednesday, Mr. Jollett. No, it isn't, is it? May I come in? I, I, I don't know. Are you alone? Of course. But only for a minute, then. It's a terrible mess. I'd offer you some tea, but I'm not really up to it. Oh, I quite understand. If there's anything... How did you find out about my sister... Miss Griselda's passing? A small paragraph in last evening's paper... Oh, but only a small paragraph, you say. Oh, I'm not sure she'd have been too happy about that. Notices, even the obituary kind, were very important to her. Banner headlines, a photograph, a bit out of focus, blurred around the edges, was the way she put it. When I opened the door to you just now, I quite expected popping camera valves and a black mariah. I've almost hoped for it. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, there's really no need to keep up the charade, you know. No need at all. Now, Mr. Jollett. I see. Uh, she saw through you all right. Right from the very start. Edie, she said. Edie, dear, the man's an imposter. Jollett. <laughs> Such a ridiculous name. Isn't it, sir? There never was a late Mrs. Jollett either, was there? No. <laughs> she roared her head off at that. Like somebody opening the second half in old time musical. <laughs> she roared her head off at that. <laughs> How else could I have got to see her? False pretenses. It was important to me. So why assume a false identity? Oh, no, the identity, at least, was my own. I, uh, I do have a card. Professor Henry Jollett. The letters will mean nothing to you. The National Institute of History. Ancient history. South American, to be exact. Specializing in early Incan cultures. Hmm. It really means nothing to me, Mr. Jollett. No. But, for what it's worth, I'd like you to explain. Now, where to begin? I, I'd never ventured into the spiritual world, but that didn't prevent me thinking I'd heard it all before. The substitution of an Incan emperor instead of your usual Indian chief gave it a certain twist. But I really had no intention of coming until I found myself here. Go on. It wasn't until she summoned the emperor by name I, I started to take an interest. Ah, yes. Her great Manco Capac. Not exactly the kind of name you find in a telephone directory, is it? It's why she chose it, Mr. Jollett. Made it up? If you like. Except that she didn't. Mm. Manco Capac. The predestined one. Founder of the Inca dynasty. Founder of the city called... Cusco. Exactly. Well, she could have researched it, of course. Except that she didn't. No, she didn't. As I listened to her, there were many details of the emperor, his 
port city at Cusco, that no amateur, that, that, that even I, after a lifetime of study and only now beginning to alight on, a new world, long dead, but through her awakening again with a vigor and intensity I could never have aspired to. And yet, I doubted. Right up until... Until? The very last time in this room. Uh. We were having tea. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I spotted it. Final proof of all I'd been so stupidly skeptical about. Her portrait? And about her neck, the royal seal pendant of the Incas. You'd seen it before? Only in the gloom, at a distance across the table. She'd refused to ever let me handle it. But suddenly, here in her portrait, 20, 30 years earlier, a very competent artist with all the time in the world to capture every detail. Will you permit me to see it? The pendant? If you wish it. She was wearing it when I found her. The clasp was broken, as though it had been torn from her neck. The autopsy was a necessary legal formality. In view of her age, excess weight, some kind of heart condition seemed the likeliest bet. In the antiseptic whiteness of their 20th century morgue, they made their preparations. There were no scars on her body, not even an appendectomy. But when her cadaver was eventually opened, they found no heart, only the severed aorta and the cavity where it had once lain. Miss Edie was offered a fortune for her pendant. She refused to sell it. It's now on permanent loan to Mr. Jollett's museum. She often drops in to see it. And there's usually tea and chocolate digestives in his office afterwards. And she's never taken down that brass nameplate on the gatepost. Consultations and ministrations strictly by appointment only. Whenever her finances get a bit tight, she consoles herself that she can always take up where Griselda left off. And why not? She does have connections in high places. That was Is There Anybody There? Starring Dillis Lay as Griselda Thorpe, Sylvia Coleridge, Edie, and Norman Bird, Mr. Jollett. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William Ingram, and directed by John Dyer. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. My little story for this week, I want to call Come As You Are. You know that uh, meaningless concession that gets added onto invitations to a party? You see, it's because the endless business of dressing up is such an integral part of my professional life that among my friends, my very positive reluctance to attend any kind of fancy dress party or costume ball is not only well established, but understandingly accepted. On a recent trip to London, I was genuinely delighted to find an invitation from my old friend Charles Vane awaiting my arrival. It wasn't until I'd reached that key and, to me, ominous phrase, fancy dress will be worn, that my heart sank. The fact that my would-be host had crossed it through and substituted the words, come as you are, afforded little by way of consolation. (laughs) There can be few experiences so desultory as to find oneself sober-suited in the midst of a determined company of let's-pretend Casanovas, paunchy Tarzans, and moth-eaten King Kongs. As I put Charles's invitation back in its envelope, 
I'd already instinctively decided to decline. But even as I mailed my politely phrased refusal to his kind invitation, I had the distinct feeling that I was not to be let off the hook so lightly. The 2 a.m. phone call confirmed my misgivings. Oh. Uh, hello. Vincent, uh, it's damn well not good enough, do you hear? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Who is that? It's not only not good enough, I'm damn well not going to take no for an answer. Charles. Oh, Charles, is that you? Surprise, surprise. Of course it's Charles. If Mohammed won't go to the mountain, the mountain needs must. <laughs> anyway, who the hell else did you expect it to be? Well, believe it or not, old thing, there are alternatives. Parents, relatives, friends, acquaintances. Oh, you'd be surprised. Oh, would I? Well, yeah. I just hope you're not in the habit of treating them in the same shoddy fashion, mm. that's all. Oh, Charles, delighted as I am to hear from you. You know it is the middle of the night. Wrong again, Vincent. The early hours of the morning. But what's that got to do with anything? Nothing. Nothing at all. Except that we mere mortals do rather count on a certain uh, quota of sleep. Mere mortals bore me. Oh, yes. It slipped my mind. Please forgive the lapse. I'm forgiving you damn all. Are you still there? Still here. Uh, it's on account of that damn stupid fancy dress bit, isn't it? So why do you think I changed it to come as you are in the first place? Out of the question. The intimacies of my sleeping attire must remain a closely guarded secret. Don't be skittish. In a way, all I hope is you had sufficient sense to keep the damn thing. The damn... What? The invitation? Yes, of course the invitation is what you're keeping me from my beauty sleep about. I'm keeping you? Yes. Well, on the back you'll find a simple set of directions for getting here. A child of five could manage it. I marked the priory with a damn big cross in the top right-hand corner. The priory? The house. My house. You will love it. Oh, yes. I'm sure I would, Charles. But as a matter of fact, I have another appointment. A scriptwriter friend uh, of mine is coming... hell with all scribblers. I shall expect you at eight. But, Charles, I honestly don't see how will I can... Will you let me get some sleep, damn you? <laughs> Charles? Are you there? Charles? Charles? Oh. Blast. Put to the test, Charles's simple set of directions might well have been comprehensible to a five-year-old child. But not having one of them with me in the passenger seat, I spent hours exploring the same piece of countryside in ever-decreasing circles. I was just on the point of returning to London when I spotted the entrance to his drive. And within minutes, I was standing in the hall of one of the most remarkably beautiful houses... It has ever been my pleasure to enter. The party was obviously in full swing. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Let the festivities commence. <laughs> Vincent, you're late, damn it. Oh, Charles, how good to see you. Oh, I've been ringing that ridiculous hotel of yours for the best part of the evening. What? Thought you'd gone and funked out at the last minute. Oh, I am sorry about that. Your directions weren't as explicit as you cracked them up to be. Huh? As a matter of fact, as a cartographer, your talent seemed to be singularly lacking. Nonsense. If Columbus had had me aboard, he'd have found the new world there one hell of a lot sooner <laughs> than he did. Anyway, seeing as how you finally made it, uh, come along into the library. All right. Uh. We'll fortify ourselves with a brandy or three before I introduce you to the somewhat dubious delights of the snake pit. All right. Uh. There you go, then. Bye. Oh, I am sorry. Thank you. Hey, you're miles away. Yes, I'm just taking it all in. The house? Yeah, impressive, isn't it? Beautiful, Charles. Cost me a pretty packet, I can tell you. Really beautiful. <laughs> Point taken. Yeah, you're quite right, of course. The heathen financier in me. Hmm. Always been under the impression they amounted to much the same thing. <laughs> anyway, here's to it. And to your health and to your house. Tell me about it. The Priory? Mm. Well, don't expect me to go into the full historic bit. But for all that, mentioned in the Doomsday, one of the gems of early English monastic architecture, you know the kind of thing. Well, I'm more than prepared to believe it. Yeah, the domestic conversions came later, but it's uh, still pretty exceptional. Anyway, I first fell in love with the place about five years back when I was a guest here at a party. Oh? A rather bizarre junkyard given by the wife of the then owner. Oh, I see. Well, I think she realized I rather coveted the place from the word go. And last season, we met up again in the south of France. 
She told me her lifestyle had changed somewhat since our last meeting, and uh, judging by the bevy of young Apollo she had in tow, I was more than prepared to believe it. <laughs> well, I eventually got round to the house, and she said that providing the figure was right, the place was mine for the asking. Well, it obviously was, then. Let's just say the contract was concluded to the mutual satisfaction of both parties, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> You're the same old child. So, here we are. Nine months later, and it's housewarming night on the old corral. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Are you um, thinking of settling here? Mm, nothing, mm. sure. No, you look skeptical. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. My eye. Well, you do have something of a reputation to live down, you know. Well, you must give me five marks for effort, <laughs> at the very least. I've already got so far as settling into the place. Even quite a genuine English butler and a stable of splendid hunters... Yeah, every reason to be proud of my new country gentleman image, don't you think? Well, all you need now is a genuine English rose to complete the picture. Hmm. I'm working on it. You being serious? I am. The question is, is she? Oh, who am I to meet her tonight? <laughs> oh, my dear fellow, here tonight, her blue-blooded parents would have 40 blue-blooded fits. Oh, then this is something of a, a last fling. Let's just settle for the last but one, shall we? All right, if you prefer. I most certainly do. Right, uh, let's be having you then. Uh. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the snake pit. <laughs> My original misgivings about accepting Charles's invitation proved well justified. Along with the disguises I'd anticipated... In a matter of minutes, I'd been introduced to a somewhat bibulous archbishop, an emaciated Theda Barra on the decline, and the oldest bunny girl in the business. Charles's come-as-you-are concession proved a somewhat dubious advantage. My conventional business suit seemed to generate the same degree of cool hostility as if I'd elected to wear it at a convention of nudists. It was with a very positive feeling of relief that I eventually escaped the throng and sought out some corner strategically removed from the general merrymaking. The minstrel's gallery seemed perfect. Suitably fortified with a private bottle of Charles's excellent Dom Clico, I climbed to my remote perch as eagerly as any canary in its gilded cage, a positive refuge where I could ponder the idiot antics of my fellow man and consider myself well out of it. And so you are, old fellow, so you are well out of it. In the gloom of the gallery, I, I'd almost stumbled over the man. I managed a rather startled apology, but even when my eyes had grown accustomed to the darkness, the details of his physical appearance remained extremely vague, the quality of his voice, the spare, angular outline of the silhouette he presented, suggested someone of middle age, but then he could just as well have been a great deal older. Only for the briefest of instants was I positively aware of his pale, watery eyes, opaque behind the glint of his old-fashioned pince-nez. I hope I didn't startle you. Well... <laughs> Somewhat, I, I must confess. I, I didn't realize I was intruding. A temporary refuge from the madding crowd, eh? Yes, I, I know it must seem ungracious. Oh, to some it might. For my own part, well, given the option, I'd have been abed and asleep hours ago. <laughs> oh, won't you take a seat? Oh, thank you so much. Allow me to introduce On these my... occasions, formal introductions always strike me as superfluous. On top of which... I can't offer my hand. Oh? A somewhat unfortunate accident. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. If I were to fetch another glass... Oh, it could... doesn't agree with me. But, but why don't you? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad to observe that one of us at least had the courage to refuse being bullied into dressing the part. Fancy dress. <laughs> As in some ways it might have been easier to oblige. <laughs> the proverbial sore thumb, eh? <laughs> <laughs> In my own case, well, well, there was little option. Oh? My wife, you know. Huh? She positively revels in this kind of revel. <laughs> but possibly you've already observed her. Hmm. Titania in all her glory. Oh, yes. 
Yes, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. It would be difficult not to. Well, extremely effective. Ridiculously pathetic. What? I can think of few sights so ludicrously tragic as a middle-aged siren aping the appearance and manners of a young girl half her age. Mm. Do I embarrass you? Well, I... Oh, you must forgive me, but her penchant for youth is so notorious, I now feel little reluctance to talk about it. Her companion this evening, for instance. Oh, you mean the young man in the costume you of have Harlequin? Him. Yeah. Uh, though yeah. the appurtenances of a gigolo might have been more appropriate. Oh? Her darling boy of the moment, hmm. Luigi del Potrello. The name means nothing to you? Del Potrello. Oh, yes, it does sound familiar. In most circles, it has a certain notoriety. Ah. The Potrellos are Italian merchants. Oh, yes. Extremely wealthy, hideously flamboyant, and totally without any distinction, taste, or breeding. Mm. Right from the outset, my home seemed in a perpetual state of siege. Billet doux by every post, secret assignations ridiculously extravagant floral arrangements. Uh, and then the ultimate indignity of having the scoundrel pay court under my very roof, to be made constantly aware of their asinine sniggerings, their barely concealed whisperings, their grotesque fondlings, the middle-aged lovebird and her twittering young chick. But... It wasn't until he started implanting his obscene influence on the house itself that my anger and frustration reached full spate. Uh, how uh, obscene. Yeah, yes, yes, obscene. Isn't it extraordinary how something as seemingly insignificant as a mirror, a mirror. can underline the absolute bathos of one's situation? Underline it with far greater emphasis than any of the indignities and infidelities that have gone before. Well, I'm... I'm not sure that I understand. You, you did say a, a mirror? Yes, yes. One of his many gifts to her. A hideously ornate creation in the fashionable Florentine manner. You know the kind of thing. All gilt cupids, intricately entwined vine leaves. Yes, I'm afraid I do. <laughs> exactly, my dear fellow. Mm. Needless to say, quite out of keeping with the sober antiquity of my own furnishings. But a token of regard from her own darling boy, don't you see? and, as such, to be blatantly hung in a place of honor. It seemed suddenly as if he were trying to destroy the very fabric of our lives. Would it um, be impertinent of me to inquire... What happened? Yes. No, but why not? It's probably common knowledge. The inevitable scene mm. is the phrase that most readily springs to mind. But somehow... More significant than anything that had gone before. Oh, you're exaggerating as usual. I honestly don't think you realize the... the... gravity of the situation. <laughs> oh, come on, darling, say it. You can always be relied upon to trot out the obvious on these tedious occasions, can't you, my pet? The occasion, as you choose to call it, might be a good deal graver than you think. <laughs> you're beginning to sound much more like the old dodderer you really are. Well, come on, darling, don't stop now. It's the well-known visit to the headmaster you had in mind, isn't it? If so, you are achieving it to perfection. <laughs> the darling boy really has excelled himself this time, hasn't he? Such an appropriate gift. A direct invitation to see yourself as you really are. So why the hell don't you tell your darling boy he can take his bloody mirror right back where it came from? We'll have to see, won't we, my pet? And was the mirror taken back? I presumed it must have been. I, I certainly don't recall seeing the damn thing again. But then, quite suddenly, I... That's to say, we both had more important things on our minds. Oh? I'd spent the day at the British Museum doing oh. some research. I got home to find my wife had been taken seriously ill. In effect, a minor heart attack. Oh. I could only conclude it was a direct result of trying to keep up with her dissolute gadfly. Oh. The doctor advised that complete rest was absolutely essential. He also emphasized that there must be no undue excitement or shock. 
Yes, he particularly stressed the last bit, or shock. Mm. Even as he said it, it sounded strangely significant. Why significant? Well, as it turned out, I... I had stayed up reading very late one night. I must have dozed off. Because I was suddenly startled awake by a noise. It came from the head of the stairs. What kind of a noise? Uh, difficult to describe, but a sort of bump, I suppose. Mm. Uh, a slight trip, perhaps. The servants had retired hours before. There was only my wife. At least I believed that to be the case. Until... Until... I heard their voices coming from my wife's bedroom. I recognized Luigi's laughter immediately. Then, after a while, there was only silence. I think that silence was the most difficult thing to bear of all. For the first time, I admitted to myself that I had lost my wife to Luigi forever. And your reaction? How can one describe Resignation, love, jealousy, hate, yes. all at the same time. I wanted her dead. What? I needed her dead, but had no notion how I could achieve it. I'm not a courageous man, not even an artful man. I returned to the study, and there I saw something that seemed to suggest the perfect solution. Yes, go on. Shortly before her illness, I'd drawn my wife's attention to a book dealing with the medieval history of the house. Yes. Well, needless to say, she discarded it halfway through. But there was one particular section that not only claimed her interest, but held it in a state of shocked disbelief I'd never witnessed before. It concerned a ghost. A ghost? <laughs> Most historic homes seem to lay claim to one. Knowing my wife's somewhat nervous disposition, I'd previously kept ours, something of a closely guarded secret. But now, no undue excitement or shock, was what the doctor had said. There and then, I determined my ghostly inhabitant should serve his turn. Well, what kind of a ghost? The ghost of a Franciscan friar. <laughs> oh, the costume wasn't too difficult to improvise... A burnous, one of those Arab nightdress affairs, complete with hood, served my purpose to perfection. I put it on, lit a candle, left my study. I crossed the hall. The stairs creaked as I began to climb. I didn't mind. It only added to the theatricality of the scene I was about to enact. I could already imagine slowly opening the door of my wife's bedroom, hear her call out, Who's there? See the expression on her face as she watched in terror the spectre of the Franciscan friar loom towards her. Perhaps one brief, terrified scream. And then... I just reached the top of the stairs, was about to cross the landing, when I saw it, the actual specter there, confronting me, the face shrouded in its hood, the candle flickering in its hand, the eyes deeply socketed, stared accusingly into mine. For a long moment, there was only disbelief at what I saw. And then, panic. I, I tried to move, but couldn't. I tried to scream out, but no voice came. Then, with a newfound volition of its own, my arm lashed out with the heavy brass candlestick I was holding, lashed out at the ghastliness of that grizzled face. <laughs> God help me. In the name of Christ, somebody help me. Ah! For God's sake, man. Oh, my God, Charles. Charles. What the devil do you mean by slinking off like that? I'm, I'm sorry. Well? I turned towards my distraught storyteller, but he was gone. 
probably realizing he was in imminent danger of being forced back into the swinging multitude below. Oh, come along, man. Don't just hang around in the gloom. There's somebody special I want you to meet. From the far end of the library, Titania herself confronted me. She sat there enthroned in one of Charles's splendid high-backed chairs. Captain of our fairy band, mortals, darlings, close at hand. As she misquoted from the bard, Titania made very short work of a very large brandy. In view of my so recent conversation with her husband, I... I must have looked somewhat taken aback. She was not slow to notice the fact. Something worrying you, darling. Well... Uh, Charles, Charles, be a dear. Titania's running low on nectar. Mm. Well, darling, you were saying... Well, I, I do apologize. It's pure coincidence, of course, but I've had the pleasure of making your husband's acquaintance. My husband... Yes. You did say my husband? Yes. Oh, damn you, Charles. You haven't gone and told every Tom, Dick and Harry my little secret. You know I particularly asked you to keep it strictly entre nous. Luigi would be furious. Luigi? But that isn't your husband. <laughs> oh, what a damn fool I am. Now I've gone and let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> oh. You must have been referring to that dreadful old dodder I was imbecile enough to spend the best years of my life with. Now, darling, we mustn't speak ill of the dead. The dead? Thank God. The best part of two years, isn't it, Charles? Even at the very end, the old dodder approved as parsimonious and mean-minded as he'd been all along. Still, he paid for it. One of the few comforting things in life is that one can always depend on getting exactly what one deserves. Or deserving exactly what one gets. Oh, Charles, darling, you are being cynical. Anyway, I must away. Luigi has gone missing, don't you know? It isn't that I don't trust the darling boy, darling. It's simply that I don't. Goodbye, Mr... Goodbye. Charles, darling. Oh, it's been bliss. But <laughs> Titania, darlings, must away to live and fight another day. Well, what the hell was all that about? Charles... Tell me about him, her late husband. Edward. Was that his name? Well, I only met the old stick once, and then very briefly, on my first visit to the place. This place? Well, of course. This was his house. He died here. Where? Where exactly did he die? You know, you look really peaky. Answer the question, for God's sake. Please, Charles... Well, as a matter of fact, uh, at the head of the stairs. The stairs leading to the minstrel's gallery? Yes. And the circumstances? Oh, a bit unusual, really. It was Helen who found him. Apparently the old fool was on his way to bed, or got up in this ridiculous dressing gown thing of his when he spots this mirror. The mirror? At the head of the stairs? It was Luigi's mirror, wasn't it? Oh, has darling boy been telling you all about that? Wasn't thing? it? Yes, a uh, gift to Helen. The old boy raised such a stink about it, she locked it away at the back of a cupboard. Anyway, one night, after a somewhat torrid meeting with her darling boy, Luigi raises cane and insists on hanging it out in the open. Directly at the top of the stairs, so that anyone coming up them would be bound to see his own reflection, wouldn't he? Which is exactly what happened. Edward spots it, loses his temper, and smashes the thing to smithereens. Yeah, it was that that caused the heart attack, of course. Not to mention his hand. What about his hand? Well, severed. Quite severed. Extraordinary the violence that can be generated through a fit of jealousy, isn't it? I wish you'd have another brandy. Will you tell me what he looked like, Charles? Oh, it would. Oh, do even better. Charles handed me a snapshot. It was faded, but I spotted him immediately. 
one face among many, but I'd have recognized it anywhere, not because of any particular feature, but because there, staring out at me, were the same pale, watery eyes, opaque behind the glint of his old-fashioned pince-nez. I handed the photograph back. Oh, thanks. But might as well get rid of it. Oh. Not much point dwelling on the dead, is there? No. Not much. Charles invited me to stay the night. I automatically refused. Some weeks later, he suggested we meet up again before he left on a business trip to the continent. The Priory was again suggested as a rendezvous. But in view of what had gone before, at the very last minute, I switched it to my hotel dining room instead. The decor hideously modern, the food bad, the waiters rude, the place positively bulging with people. I wouldn't have had it any other way. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Co-starring in Come As You Are was Maurice Perry with Betty Huntley Wright and Peter Williams. Come As You Are was first recounted and dramatized by Bill Ingram and produced by John Dyers. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Glancing through my morning paper over breakfast today, I noticed that an enterprising gentleman in the catering business has invented a musical hot dog called, would you believe, a Humburger. Isn't it amazing the things some people will eat? Food, by the way, is something of a hobby of mine. And I never cease to wonder at the incredible results that can be achieved by a good chef with a few basic ingredients. A little meat, a few vegetables, a glass of wine, sprig of parsley, and voila. You know, there are few more interesting experiences than being allowed into the kitchen of a really first-class restaurant to watch a master chef at work. And, of course, this uh, privilege is rarely extended to anyone, which reminds me of an experience I had a few years back. And to give it the right flavor, let's call it speciality of the house. I was staying in New York at the time, and a friend of mine, Harry Laffler, knowing that I was interested in good food, invited me to dine with him one evening at his favorite restaurant. Harry was by way of being an international advertising man, and knowing the size of his expense account, I had imagined that I was in for an evening at one of New York's plushier night spots. Imagine my surprise, therefore, when I found myself being ushered towards a, a shabby brownstone building in an almost deserted downtown back street. Well, here we are. This is Bureau's. What do you think of it? Well, Harry, it's... I must say, it's not quite what I expected. It, it is rather dismal, isn't it? And have you noticed Bureau's is the restaurant without pretensions? It is the one place in these ghastly neurotic times that has refused to compromise. When you enter Spiros, you lead the insanity of this hour, of this day, of this year. And you find yourself, for a brief span, restored in spirit. You make it sound more like a, like a cathedral than a restaurant. I wonder, I wonder if I've done the right thing in bringing you here. Oh, come on now, Harry. I, I was only joking. You see, you are the one person I know with the knowledge of good food. Thank you. Knowing about Spiros and not having an appreciative friend to share it with is like having a unique work of art locked in a room where no one else can see it. Anyway, let's not stand here talking. 
Let's go in. Good evening, sir. Mr. Laffler and a guest. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, please come this way, gentlemen. Uh, the waiter led us through a mirrored foyer into a small dining room. It was no size at all, but the half dozen or so guttering gas jets which provided the only illumination threw such a deceptive light that the walls flickered and faded into uncertain distance. There were no more than eight or ten tables in the room, and all but one were occupied. The few waiters serving moved amongst them with quiet efficiency. It really was very pleasant. And as soon as we were seated at the vacant table, I said as much to Harry. There. I knew you'd like it. Wait till you taste the food. By the way, did you notice that there are no women present? Yes, I, I did. Isn't that rather odd? Spiro doesn't encourage them. Oh. And I can tell you his method of getting rid of them is very effective. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, do you wish to be served now? Uh, tell me, is the special being served tonight, waiter? Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. There is no special this evening. But it's been a month already. And I had hoped that my friend here... I'm sorry, sir, but you do understand the difficulties. Sir. Oh, well, what the hell. Uh, but I was hoping, Vincent, to introduce you to the greatest treat that Spiro offers. Oh, never mind. I'm quite sure that whatever we decide upon will be delicious. Uh, shall I serve at once, sir? Uh, yes, please. Mm. Very good, sir. Well, uh, Harry, have you ordered in advance? <laughs> no. No, I should have explained. Spiro offers no choice whatsoever. But suppose we don't like what we're given. Oh, don't worry. No matter how exacting your taste, you will relish every mouthful. Uh, just think a moment about the advantages of such a system. For instance, instead of a hurly-burly of sweating cooks trying to prepare a hundred different dishes, here we have a chef who stands serenely alone, bringing all his culinary arts to bear on one task. Oh, then you, you've seen Spiro's kitchen. Tell me, what's it like? Unfortunately, I can't. I've never seen it. Oh. Believe me, I've tried. In fact, I admit that my desire to see the inside of this particular kitchen... It's become almost an obsession with me. Well, have you ever mentioned this to Spiro? At least a dozen times. But he just shrugs his massive shoulders and smiles. Still, I've never given up hope. At this point, the waiter reappeared, bearing two soup bowls and a small tureen, from which he slowly ladled a measure of clear, thin soup. I must confess that I tasted this soup with some curiosity. It was delicately flavored, bland to the verge of tastelessness. Automatically, I reached for the salt. Well, what do you think of the soup? Mm, excellent. If you'll pardon me for saying so, you don't. What? You do not find it excellent. <laughs> you find it flat and badly in need of salt. But how, did uh, you... how do I know? Yes. Because that was my reaction when I first dined here. But I'm confident that you will make the same discovery as I did. By the time you've finished your soup, your desire for salt will be non-existent. Well, Harry proved to be quite right. And before I had finished the soup, I was relishing every mouthful of it. It was really wonderful. Harry smiled at me across the table. Well, do you agree with me now? Mm. Wasn't I right? Yes, you certainly were. You will find that the absence of condiments is only one of several noteworthy characteristics which marks bureaus. I may as well prepare you for the rest. For example, no alcoholic beverages of any sort are served here. Oh, really? <laughs> also, there is a ban on the use of tobacco in any form. Oh, but good Lord, is this a restaurant or a temperance hotel? You don't understand. By alternating stimulant and narcotic, you seesaw the delicate balance of your taste so violently that it loses its most precious quality, the appreciation of fine food. Not another word was spoken until we had both finished our main course. Nor was there any need for words in the presence of such food. It was delicious. And it was only with a great effort that I prevented myself from wolfing the lot at one go and establishing myself as a grade-A glutton on my very first visit to this amazing restaurant. When we had both finished eating, Harry and I smiled at each other contentedly. We were both aware that we had enjoyed an exceptional culinary experience. Harry, if I had any doubts about Spiro's, I apologize unreservedly. In all your praise of the place, there is not a single word of exaggeration. Ah, uh, that is only part of the story. 
You heard me mention the special, which mm. unfortunately was not on tonight's menu. Well, what we've just eaten is as nothing when compared to the absolute delights of that special. Oh, good Lord, what, what is it? I mean, nightingales, tongues, fillet of unicorn? Neither. It is lamb. Lamb? Oh, come on, you've got to be joking. If I were to give you in my own unstinted words my opinion of this dish, you would think me insane. <laughs> that is how deeply the mere thought of it affects me. It is a select portion of the rarest sheep in existence. Lamb Armistan. Armistan. A remote and almost unknown place on the border which separates Russia and Afghanistan. From chance remarks dropped by Sbiro... I gather that it's hardly more than a plateau which grazes the pitiful remnants of a flock of superb sheep. Spiro, by some means or other, has obtained exclusive rights to this flock and is therefore the only restaurateur in the world ever to have lamb armistan on his menu. I can tell you, the appearance of this dish is a very rare occurrence indeed and nobody ever knows the exact date on which it will be served. But surely Spiro could provide some advanced knowledge of this event. Well, huh? the only objection to that is simply stated. Should advanced information slip out, then the professional gluttons, in which this city abounds, would get the opportunity to taste this dish and sooner or later drive out the regular patrons. You don't mean to say that these few people present are the only ones in the entire city who know of the existence of Spiro's? In the entire world. Oh, that's incredible. It's kept a secret by every single patron. A solemn obligation. By accepting my invitation this evening, you automatically assume that obligation. I hope you can be trusted with it. Well, if that's the way you want it, Harry, of course I can. It may sound strange to you indeed. It may board on eccentricity. But I'm a solitary man. And I feel to my depths that this restaurant is both family and friend to me. I must confess that until that moment, I... I had never really thought much about Harry's private life. To me, he was a pleasant friend and dining companion, and his private affairs had never really concerned me. Now, hearing him refer to Spiro's in this manner, I almost came to feel sorry for him. By the end of two weeks, Harry's invitations for me to join him at Spiro's had become something of a... of a ritual... Now, I am by nature one of those people with a lean and hungry look, but I began to notice that I was rapidly putting on weight. I was, to tell the truth, becoming plump. I began to wonder whether Harry, by no means a lightweight, had also been lean before he started to dine at Spiro's. Thinking the whole thing over, I decided that I would not refuse to eat at the restaurant until I had both tasted the lamb armistan and also been introduced to the amazing Mr. Spiro. And then one night, a few weeks later, I achieved both these ambitions and both, I may say, exceeded my expectations. Ah, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Tonight is the special, sir. What? Well, this is it. The culinary triumph of all times. And face bad, you are embarrassed by the very emotion it distills. Yes, I must confess that my heart is certainly beating faster than usual. Tell me, Harry, the, the other diners, do they feel the same way? Well, of course they do. Look around you and judge for yourself. Yes, you're right. Anyway, there's comfort in numbers. It's nice to know that we all have the same basic animal feelings and can anticipate, or, or should I say, <laughs> slobber over our meat. <laughs> oh, look, uh, one of our number appears to be in for disappointment. Hmm? Uh, over there, at the end table, the empty seat. Oh, yes, the stout bald man. Hmm. He's not here tonight. I do believe it's the first dinner he's missed here in weeks. Rain or shine, crisis or calamity, I don't think he's missed an evening at Spiro's in ten years. Imagine his disappointment when he finds that he's missed the speciality of the house. <coughs> oh. Mr. Laffler and friend, I am so pleased, so very, very pleased. Ah, oh, Mrs. Spiro. Uh, tonight, gentlemen, the lamb armistan will be an unqualified success. 
I myself have been stewing in the miserable kitchen all day, prodding the foolish chef to do everything just so. The just so is the important part, eh? Uh, but I see your friend does not know me. An introduction, perhaps. The words ran in a smooth, fluid eddy. They rippled, they purred, and I found myself hypnotized and could do no more than stare as Harry performed the introductions. Spiro's mouth, the mouth that uncoiled this sinuous monologue, was alarmingly wide, with thin, mobile lips that curled and twisted with every syllable. He had a wide nose and wide-set eyes. It was an amazing face, and somehow I had the feeling that I had seen it before. It was somehow familiar. I am so very pleased to meet you, Mr. Price. So very, very pleased. Oh, thank you. How do you do, Mr. Spiro? You uh, like my little establishment, eh? Oh, yes. You have a great treat in store for you today, I assure you. My friend is by way of being a great admirer of yours, Spiro. It's true. A very great compliment. You compliment me with your presence, and I return the compliment with my food, eh? <laughs> But I assure you, the Lamb Armistan is far superior to anything of your past experience. All the trouble obtaining it, all the difficulty of preparation is truly merited. You know, I've wondered why, with all these difficulties you mention, why you even bothered to present Lamb Armistan. Surely your other dishes are excellent enough to uphold your reputation. Yeah, perhaps it is a matter of psychology. Someone discovers a wonder and must share it with the others, eh? Mm. Or perhaps it is just a matter of good business. Well, then, in the light of all this, and considering all the conventions you impose on your customers, why don't you turn it into a private club? <laughs> so perspicacious. Ah, I will tell you. Because there is more privacy in a public eating place than in the most exclusive club in existence. Here, no one inquires into your affairs. No one desires to know the intimacies of your life. We are not curious about our guests. We welcome you when you are here. We have no regrets when you go. That is the answer, eh? Yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had no intention of prying. No, 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 you are not prying. On the contrary, I invite questions. Uh, don't let Spiro intimidate you. I've known him for years, and I assure you his bark is far worse than his bite. But before you know it, he'll be showing you all the privileges of the house, except inviting you into his precious kitchen, of course. <laughs> now, for that, you may have to wait a little while, I'm afraid. What did I tell you? Come on, Asmira. The truth. Has anyone except staff ever stepped into that kitchen of yours? You see on the wall over there the portrait of one to whom I did that honor. Hmm? A dear friend and a patron of long standing. Where? Oh, yes, there. Oh. Who is it? Oh, it's, it's Andrew Herring, the, the writer. You know the one, Harry. He used to write those marvelously cynical articles for the New American. And then he took himself off some to Mexico, I think it was, and, and disappeared. Of course. Here I've been sitting, staring at that picture for years without recognizing it. It must have been a blow for you when your old friend disappeared, Spira. It was, I assure you, gentlemen. But I like to think of it this way. He was probably greater in his death than in his life, eh? Hmm? Oh, a most tragic man. He often told me that his only happy hours were spent here at this table. Pathetic, is it not? And to think the only favor I could ever show him was to let him witness the mysteries of my humble kitchen. <laughs> you seem very certain of his death. I, after all, as I remember, no evidence has ever turned up to support it. None at all. Remarkable, eh? Ah, but no more talk, please, gentlemen. For here comes the speciality of the house. Lamb Armistan. Spiro served the meal himself, taking great care not to lose a single drop of gravy as he sliced the joint, underdone to perfection. He filled the two plates with the chunks of dripping meat. Ah, gentlemen, bon appetit. With great deliberation, I took a mouthful of the lamb armistan. It was magnificent. Good, eh? Mm. Better than you imagined? It is as impossible for the uninitiated to imagine the delights of lamb armistan as... Uh, as for a mortal man to look into his own soul? 
Perhaps. Perhaps you have just had a glimpse into your own soul, eh? <laughs> yes, perhaps. And a gratifying picture it made, too. All fang and claw. Well, I must be going. But sometimes, my friend, when you have nothing better to do, sit perhaps for a little while in a dark room and think of this world and what it is and what it is going to be. Then you must turn your thoughts to the significance of the lamb in religion. It will be so interesting. And now, gentlemen, I have interrupted your meal for too long. Au revoir, gentlemen. Au revoir. Au revoir. Hmm. He's an interesting man, Spear, a very interesting man. You know, Harry, he, he reminds me of someone I... I just can't think who... You, you don't think I offended him in any way, do you? Offended him? No. Goodness, no. He loves that sort of talk. Lamb, I understand, is a, a ritual with him. Get him started, and he'll just go on forever. It was a month later that it finally came to me exactly who it was that Spiro reminded me of. And when it did, I, I laughed out loud. <laughs> of course, Spiro reminded me of the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. You remember, the cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked very good-natured, she thought. Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth, so she felt that it ought to be treated with respect. <laughs> I, I mentioned this to Harry that night as we were walking along that dismal street that led to Spiro's. Uh, you may be right, but I'm not a fit judge. Anyway, it's a long time since I read Alice in Wonderland. A very long time. Help! What? Help! Look, look there. Outside Spiro's. Isn't that one of the waiters? Yes. Looks as though he's in trouble. He's being attacked. Come on. Help! God damn them. Pickpocket. Push me, would you? You're looking for a goddamn fighter. Well, you, you got one, mister. Let me go. Let me go. Not yet, you lousy little creep. Well, what's going on here? Help me, sir. Yeah. This man, he, he drunk. He tried to stab Oh, me. drunk, am I? Oh, well, we'll... we'll hey, you drink. Hey, grab him, Harry. Uh, Quick. Uh, Look out for that uh, knife. Let, let, let go of him. Do you hear? Let go. Hey, what, what, what the hell's happening here? Oh, oh, I'll cut your goddamn oh, throat, oh, mister. Oh, oh. No, you... you don't. Oh. 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 Boy, is he, is he all right, do you think? That was some punch, Harry. Well, he, he, I think he's stunned. He banged his head as he fell. Yeah, well, in any case, it's a job for the police. No, no, sir. What? No police. Mr. Spiro does not like police. Oh, now, wait. I beg you, no police. Uh, Aye. Uh, anyway, it's coming around. Uh, oh, you'll be all right. But what started all this, anyway? I, I, I push against him accidentally, and he accused me of robbing him. He's, he's drunk, sir. Uh, you can say that again. Well, now, you go inside and get cleaned up. We'll see to him. Thank you, sir. To you, I owe my life. If there is anything I can do to repay you... Uh, you just cut along, and if Mrs. Vera has any questions, you tell him to see me. Yes, sir. You saved my life. Thank you, sir. And with that, the waiter disappeared into the restaurant. Well, after all the excitement and kerfuffle of that incident, I must confess that I found I had quite an appetite... And as soon as we were comfortably seated in the restaurant, Harry and I debated with some trepidation as to whether or not we could expect the special lamb armistan that evening. Soon our regular waiter appeared and carefully set two tumblers on the table. We almost simultaneously inquired after the special. Uh, no, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. No special tonight. Oh, hell, just my luck. And I'll probably miss out on it next time, too. Why, Harry? You going away? Yes, damn it. I'm off to South America for a month or two in order to mount a new campaign for some very rich clients. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. When do you leave? Tonight. I managed to wangle some reservations. This was intended to be in the nature of a farewell celebration. Oh, and no <laughs> special. What a shame. <laughs> Just my luck. Uh, well, I I'm going to miss you, Harry. I have enjoyed our evenings together, and these little dinners of ours have, well, they've come to mean a great deal to me. Uh, shall I serve now, sir? Uh, of course. I didn't realize you were waiting. Shortly afterwards, the waiter served us, and we turned our attention to our dinner. 
Harry finished his quickly and continued to bemoan his fate and to regret loudly the thought of missing Lamb Armistan during his trip. Then, just as I finished my meal, a waiter leaned over to take Harry's plate. It wasn't our usual waiter, but the man who we had rescued from the drunken sailor. I asked him how he was feeling, but to my surprise, he completely ignored me, and with the air of a man under great strain, he whispered to Harry... My life, I owe it to you. I can't repay you. Well, you have repaid me with your thanks. Please, let's hear no more about it. But I will help you, sir, even if you don't want me to. Do not go into the kitchen tonight. Huh? My life for yours, sir. Tonight or any night. Do not go into Spiro's kitchen. Why shouldn't I go into the kitchen? <laughs> Don't be absurd. What's going on here? Is everything all right, gentlemen? Ah, oh, good evening, Spiro. Uh, this man is a little unnerved, I think. Ah, uh, yes. An unfortunate experience. He's saying something about my not visiting your kitchen. What's it all about? Do you know what he means? But of course. He was giving you good advice. It so happens that my two emotional chef heard some rumor that I might have a guest in the kitchen tonight. He flew into a fearful rage and even threatened to give his notice on the spot. Hmm? However, have no fear. I have succeeded in showing him what a signal honor it is to have a true connoisseur observe him at his work first hand. That is all. No, Sancho, you are at the wrong table. See that it does not happen again. The waiter slunk away without daring to raise his eyes, and Spiro drew up a chair to the table. He seated himself and drew his hand lightly over his hair. My invitation for you to visit my humble kitchen, I, I had hoped, Mr. Laffler, to be a surprise, but now the surprise is gone and all that is left is the invitation. Are you serious? Do you mean that at last we really are to witness the preparation of food in your kitchen tonight? Uh, no, Mr. Laffler, not both. I am faced with a dilemma of great proportions, gentlemen. You, Mr. Laffler, have been my guest for ten years, but our friend here... Oh, Mr. Spiro, I, I, I really understand perfectly. I, I mean, this invitation is solely to Harry here, and... Naturally, my presence is embarrassing. Well, look, no, wait a minute. As it happens, I, I do have another engagement for later, and I must be on my way anyhow. So, you see, there's no dilemma at all, really. Absolutely not. That wouldn't be fair at oh, all. No. Surely, Spiro, you can make an exception on this one occasion. I'm very sorry, sir. Harry, I am not going to sit here and spoil your great adventure. Believe me. And, and then just think of that ferocious chef. I'm sure he's just dying to get his cleaver into you. <laughs> <laughs> so humorous. So I'll just say goodbye now and leave you to Spiro. I'm sure he'll take pains to give you a good show. Well, that's good of you, Vincent. Thanks. I hope you continue to dine here while I'm away. Oh, and have a have a good trip, Harry. Thank you. Bye now. I will expect you, Mr. Price. Au revoir. Au revoir. And so I left them to it, the smiling Spiro and Harry Laffler, about to realize his greatest ambition. On the way out, I stopped in the foyer to collect my coat, and as I was straightening my tie, I caught a glimpse in the mirror of Harry and Spiro already at the kitchen door. Spiro was holding it open, invitingly wide with one hand, while the other hand rested lightly on Harry's plump meaty shoulder, squeezing it ever so gently, almost lovingly, rather in the way a housewife squeezes a prime fat turkey before she puts it into the oven. I've never seen or heard of Harry Laffler again. Shortly afterwards, I left New York in order to do some filming in England. I've not been back since, and therefore I have never had the opportunity of dining again at Spiro's, nor of renewing my acquaintance with its mysterious owner. In the intervening years, however, my interest in food and its preparation has increased, and I, I can now create and experiment with recipes of my own. <laughs> but I must confess that even in my wildest flights of culinary fancy, I... I have never yet dared to attempt Lamb Amistad. The 
that was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Co-starring in The Speciality of the House was Hugh Burden with Francis de Wolf, Vernon Joyner and William Slay. The Speciality of the House was first recounted by Stanley Ellen, dramatised by Barry Campbell and produced by John Dyers. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello there. Do you own a cat? Or rather, I should say, does a cat own you? Doesn't it strike you as strange that despite centuries of domestication, cats have never really lost their independence, their ruthlessness? To cats, life is still the lore of the jungle. Just try taking liberties with your cat. Be he never so tame, and you'll soon be put in your place. <laughs> I've always had a healthy respect for cats, despite that one time when I was forced to... Oh, but let me tell you about it. I think I'll call the story Cat's Cradle. Several years ago, I was making a movie in Germany, and there was some sort of hold-up during shooting, a tiresome and boring state of affairs that happens all too often, and I found myself with some days on my hands, so I decided to visit some of the beautiful old castles of Bavaria. High on my itinerary was Sonderberg in Franconia, near the Württemberg border. Sonderberg tends to get overlooked by the main tourist trade. Yet it is one of the most complete examples I know of a medieval market town which has survived comparatively intact. I checked in at one of the local hotels late one afternoon, and while they were getting my room ready, I sat down at one of the little tables near the door and ordered a drink, a large tankard of their local beer, actually. At the next table sat a young couple, whispering intently, but their voices were angry and out of control, and as I sat enjoying my beer, it was impossible not to overhear that they were deep in some childish tip. Beth, for God's sake, stop talking nonsense. How dare you say it's nonsense? It is nonsense, and you know it. I never even looked at the damn woman. I don't know how you can be so callous. Did you see how disgustingly fat she was? I tell you, I didn't notice her at all. Liar. Oh, shut up. Oh, God, what a start to married life. Oh, look, Beth, you're tired. I'm tired. It, it's all been a strain. Let's not say things we'll be sorry for. Let's have an early night. The next best thing to your German housefrau. Oh, for the last time, I didn't fancy her. If you're going to carry on like this every time I look at another woman, you'd better tear my ruddy eyes out. Ah, so now you admit you looked at her. Oh, for heaven's sake. The young man glanced uneasily in my direction, obviously wondering if I'd become an involuntary eavesdropper. Of course I had. And I certainly had no intention of making myself scarce. Isn't this a charming town? Yes, charming. Delightful. Are you on vacation? No. Yes. <laughs> that is, we... Uh... We're on our honeymoon. Oh, are you? Are you indeed? Well, what an ideal place to spend it. We haven't exactly succumbed to its charms yet. We've only just arrived. Well, give it time. Sonderberg is a step back into the past. It takes a while before its, its charm begins to work. It's certainly quiet enough. Mm, I was here once years ago, and I always promised myself a return visit. Then it seemed like an oasis in a desert of insanity. Yes, I, I suppose so. Except, of course, that Sonderberg has had its own fair share of horrors, you know. Mmm. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> what delightful beer this is. So refreshing. Uh, do go on, please. Well, the castle, do you see it up on that rock? Yeah. Look through the window there, see? Oh, oh yes. yes. Well... That was taken over as a headquarters for the Inquisition. 
Oh, the poor wretches who were incarcerated and tortured up there. I saw the castle as we drove in. It was beautiful, but it made me shudder. It's not surprising. The Inquisition left several pleasant little mementos, all in as good a state of preservation as Sonderberg itself. You must visit the place while you're here. Well, that is, if you're not squeamish. Squeamish? Look, I've got an idea. Why don't we join up and go round the castle together tomorrow? Well... Please uh, do. Oh, unless that is you're already busy. Well, no, but... uh, We'd love it, wouldn't we, Beth? Yes. Yes, of course we would. At first, I couldn't understand the young man's enthusiasm. Uh, I mean, after all, a honeymoon is a a honeymoon. (laughs) Then it struck me that he needed a a defense mechanism, and I would be there to guard him from the kind of row that I'd stumbled upon just now. (laughs) Well, at any rate, we agreed to meet in the hotel lobby at ten o'clock in the morning. As events turned out, I needn't have worried about breaking the idyllic atmosphere because as we were about to set off... Good God, it can't be. (laughs) Price, it's you. It really is. Hello, Malcolm. (laughs) Now, what are you doing in this neck of the woods? Uh, Don't tell me they forced you out of the rat race at last. Malcolm Rivers was one of the world's prize boars. If the first prize in a competition were a part in one of Malcolm's movies, the second prize would have been a part in two of Malcolm's movies. Scouting locations, old son. You see that castle up there? That's just right for a new horror picture we've got. I'd love you to read it. It's a great script. Now, come on. I'm on vacation. Can't we discuss this later or, or better still see my agent, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. But look, just let me tell you... At this point, our taxi arrived... It was as battered as its driver, but we had all agreed to leave our own transport behind. Trouble was, when Malcolm heard the driver announce that he had come for the castle party, he insisted on coming with us. Castle? Well, you don't mean to say you're actually going there? Yes. Oh, well, that's great. I can actually show you where it all takes place while I'm telling you about it. Malcolm, I... Oh, come on, don't be so coy. You're worse than a virgin on a wedding night. (laughs) I just couldn't shake him off. You never could with Malcolm. That's how he'd hustled his way to the top. Now he attached himself to us like an incubus. The film's all about the Sonderbergs. You know, the family. A sort of pageant of atrocity. I want to step back and look objectively at what each one did. Take Elisa, for instance. Well, I can't speak for the others. I was doing my best not to listen. The castle, for those who don't know it, is built on an immensely steep rock dominating the town. And on its northern side is surrounded by a moat, which has long since been filled in. At the foot of the wall is a very pleasant garden with little sheltered seats. Sitting there is a good way of recovering from the rather overpowering tour round the castle. The girl was right. There still was a sinister aura clinging to the place, which even a hot and cheerful summer's morning couldn't entirely dissipate. And they broke in and found the girl strung up by the wrists over the hot coals. Incredible story. Of course, we can't actually put all that into the picture, but we can imply a hell of a lot. You've got to admit, it's a... Damn good commercial plot line. Now, that's why it's so important to get the feel of the place where it happened. We want to get right away from the studio look. Well, they can go out and shoot a police picture in real locations, or why not a horror picture? Now, the seventh count was a real character. This, this you've got to hear. They say Mr. Rivers, uh, do you mind if we change the subject? Huh? My wife is feeling a bit faint. Uh, Oh, oh that, that's too bad, Mrs. Uh, right? And we haven't even seen the torture tower yet. Uh, now, sir, would your lady wife like to wait for us out here? She could sit down there in the garden. Oh, no, I, I don't want to miss anything. I'm quite all right. I think it was probably just that steep hill uh, and the heat. You go on, Malcolm. Hmm? We'll catch up with you later. Uh, oh, no, no, I wouldn't dream of it. Stick together through thick and thin. That's my motto. <laughs> oh, I know. Look at that. Ah, isn't it sweet? It it can't be more than six weeks old. It was a tiny black kitten, which was playing with its mother near one of the seats in the garden just below us. 
The cat, a great sleek creature whose coat shone in the sun, lay stretched on the grass and the kitten romped around nearer. The mother would wave her tail for the kitten to try to clutch with its paw or raise her feet to push the little one away as an encouragement to further efforts. It was a charming sight. Beth has been on to me to buy her a cat as soon as we were married. Now I'll get no peace. Oh, Jack, I'd like to take them both. I wonder who they belong to. Oh, they're not strays, and that's for sure. Look at the condition of the mother's coat. Well, they probably belong to the castle. It'd be great for the picture. Man, a touch of atmosphere. Here, 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 puss. Oh, oh puss. Malcolm, leave them alone. <laughs> they can't get up the wall anyway. It's far too steep. <laughs> yes, yes, you're right. Oh, look at the size of the mother. We don't grow cats like that in England. No, wait just a minute. Ah, uh, ah, uh, here we are. What are you doing? Well, I'll just throw this stone to attract their attention. No, don't do that. Don't do that. You might hit the kitten. Oh, not a chance. What do you take me for? I may produce uh, movies, but I'm not all that bad. I'll just aim it so it lands near them. Make them look up. You ever seen the expression on a cat's face when it's startled? Well, well, watch. <laughs> Oh, good God, old oh, man, no. look what you've done. Uh, I, I, I never meant never meant to do that. Maybe the wall wasn't as sheer as it looked. Maybe there was a concealed angle at its base which we couldn't see. Whatever the reason, Malcolm's aim wasn't as true as he thought. I truly believe that he only intended to startle those cats. But when he leaned over the wall and threw the stone, it landed with a sickening thud right on the kitten's head and shattered out its little brains <laughs> there and then. Oh, poor thing. The mother cast a swift upward glance, and I saw her eyes flash like green fire as she stared for an instant at Malcolm Rivers. Then her attention was given to the kitten. After one quiver, it lay still, while a thin red trickle oozed from a gaping wound. Well, I, I wouldn't have had this happen for the world. I, I, I can't understand it. Yes, darling. The cat was assiduously licking the kitten's wound. And then suddenly she stopped. She must have realized that it was dead and that her ministrations were useless. For all at once she appeared to lose all interest in the pathetic little body... Instead, she looked again at Rivers, and in that look was all the concentration of primitive hate. Her green eyes blazed, and the blood which dabbled her mouth and whiskers made her look for all the world like an avenging fury. There, Malcolm, I hope you're satisfied. That's something for your horror film. And you have the consolation of knowing it's real blood and not vegetable dye. Oh, don't rub it in. I feel bad enough as it is. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Of course you do. I, I love cats. I really do. Although my outburst was a relief, I I felt slightly ashamed. I, I realized how painfully vulnerable the man really was. I turned my attention to the cat. She was now attempting to claw her way up the wall. When this failed, she tried to launch herself into the air, eyes blazing, claws distended... And then she fell back. Let's go on. I can't bear any more. Do you want to go home? We can come back tomorrow. I, um, I think a brandy would do you good. I think a brandy would do us all good. No, I don't want to go back to the hotel. I want to see the castle. Let's go on. In face of her obvious determination, there was nothing else we could do. At least the tour would divert her mind, or so we hoped. And we also hoped that Malcolm would be deterred from prattling on about his inane script. But no. I really expect to pick up some great vibrations in the torture tower. It's just over there. You see, you see, you, you can't expect to involve your audience unless you're involved yourself. Now, that's, that's the basic rule. You've got to be convinced. And that's why so many movies are just laughable. Nobody is convinced, least of all the makers. <laughs> I remember one crazy scene. <laughs> this will kill you. <laughs> there, there was this As Malcolm laughed, I looked back at the cat. She too had heard, and her whole demeanor seemed to change. She no longer tried to jump or run up the wall, 
but instead began to lick and fondle the dead kitten as if it were alive. Then she took it in her mouth and began to follow us until we reached the limit of the wall's boundary. I thought I was the only one who noticed, but I was wrong. Mr. Rivers, I know this may sound silly, but I think that cat means to do you harm. <laughs> Oh, now that I love. Oh, let's keep a sense of proportion about this. Oh, I'm terribly sorry about what happened, but I refuse to avoid dark alleys over a damn cat. <laughs> Besides, she probably has a litter of others under some bush. Yes, Beth, I think you're being melodramatic. Do you? Look, Beth, are you sure you wouldn't rather call it a day? Oh, for heaven's sake, stop fussing. I said I was all right, didn't I? Or are you trying to get rid of me? Oh, now, don't start that again. All I was trying to do was to give Mr. Rivers a perfectly reasonable warning. I think all are afraid. Well, here's the tower entrance. Shall we go in? I tried to sound unconcerned, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I had a sneaking feeling that the girl was probably right. first we could see nothing. The darkness seemed incarnate, surrounding, stifling us like a blanket. The four of us just stood there, waiting for the use of our eyes to return. We were in the lower chamber. The thin sunlight, filtering in through a tiny window, seemed to lose itself in the thickness of the walls, which were coated with the dust of centuries. Here and there were patches of dark stain... Only rivers, naturally, remain comparatively unmoved. Not much room for cameras down here. Still, I suppose we could manage. Uh, excuse me, but you are English? Yes. Uh, no. Well, three of us are. I think you are English are interested in tortures, yes? Yes. Uh, you would like to see our collection? Yes. It's yes. the best in Germany. Uh, thank you very much. Perhaps you could show us around. You will uh, follow me, please. You are my first party of the day. The main collection is on the floor above. I think you will find them interesting. I remembered the wealth of stories about the legendary cruelty of the Counts of Sonderberg and, of course, their ladies. It was said that they had found a legitimate outlet for their bloodlusts by channeling them into the service of the officers of the Inquisition. None of your half measures here. Wow! Look at all that. Oh, oh, Jack. We found ourselves in a room full of torture instruments. Chairs full of spikes which gave instant and excruciating pain. Steel cages in which the head could slowly be crushed into a pulp. Racks, belts, boots, gloves, collars, and all around the walls great headsmen's swords evil, keen-edged weapons that would decapitate with one slash and nearby blocks where the victim's necks had lain with deep notches where the steel had bitten through the guard of flesh and shored into the wood. We all found ourselves speechless in the face of this bestial evidence of man's inhumanity to man. All that is except but Malcolm this Rivers. Is unbelievable! Just what we need! It's too good to be true. It really is. You see, it's perfect for a setup just here. It's a question of getting permission to use this stuff, but well, I wonder what the formalities are. Hey, let me just sit in that chair a moment. Wow! <laughs> Rivers was behaving with his usual insensitivity, but there was something more. I think the others shared the feeling with me that it was sacrilegious. An odd word to use, I know, but there was something sacred about the place. It was a... a temple, but a temple to evil. Now, over here, uh, sirs and madam, is a famous instrument of the Inquisition. Uh, one might almost say the most famous, and still in perfect working order. The old man pointed to the main object in this chamber of horrors... The Iron Virgin, a copy of the famous one at Nuremberg. The contraption was covered in rust and dust, except for the face, which was oddly fresh-looking, as if the custodian had scrubbed it. 
While the figure was curved in the shape of a woman, it was just broad enough for a man to fit inside, as we could see when the door was opened. The door itself was enormously thick and was worked open and shut by a thick chain running through a pulley attached to a heavy beam in the roof. When the weight was released, the door would slam shut. The devilish nature of the Iron Virgin was truly revealed when you examined the inside of the door. A number of iron spikes were fixed there, and when the victim was placed inside it and the door closed, the upper spikes would pierce his eyes and the lower ones his heart and vitals. What a charming toy. Oh, God, look at the blood stain. <laughs> it's hard to wash out blood completely, man. And there are some who say it comes back anyway. I think I can believe this place is haunted. And on that happy note, I vote that we make a hurried exit. That suits me. Well, let's go and have that drink we promised ourselves, shall we? Right now. No, 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 wait. What's up this time, for God's sake? Hey, you, old man. Now, how big is that space? What, sir? Uh, the space inside. I want to see if I can get in. Oh, well, I told you, I'd like sampling your experiences. Now, Malcolm, realism is one thing. Nonsense. Courage of your convictions and all that. Now, come on, Squire. I need your help on this. Very good, sir, if you insist. You're not serious. Well, sure I am. Yeah. Yeah. That's a <coughs> tight fit. We've <coughs> grown some since those days. But I'll manage. Here. See? You are not really allowed to do this, sir. If anyone found out, I might get into trouble. Why should anyone find out? I might even lose my job. Okay, okay, I get you. A price, uh, give him something, will you? Oh, well, I'll... I'll settle with you later. I think this is all very silly. All in the cause of art. Well, I, for one, won't go and see his beastly film. That, my dear, makes two of us. Hey, what's all the whispering about? Oh, here you are. Two, four... Six. <laughs> thank you, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Do you think that will square your conscience? Oh, yes, sir. I, I think it squares it very nicely. And now that you've had your little game, can we all go? Go if you like. I'm not stopping you. I'm, I'm staying here. Oh, come on, Malcolm. Malcolm, nothing. I'm really enjoying this. Live dangerously. That's my motto. <laughs> Oh, right, Charlie, now unfasten the door. But, sir... Can't somebody stop me? Malcolm, you've had your little joke, but enough is enough. Enough hell. You, Charlie, do as I tell you. Now start letting that door down. But slowly. Very, very slowly. Despite his reluctance, the old man did as he was told. He worked the machine with a deliberate and excruciating slowness in which the outer edge of the door hadn't moved half five inches in as many minutes. The whole ridiculous charade had a kind of macabre thrill about it. <laughs> it was a scene from Malcolm's horror film played exclusively for our benefit. And then I saw her. The cat. I don't think the others noticed at first. They were too intent on watching the progress of that door. Even Rivers had ceased to chatter. In the far corner of the chamber, dark, untamable forces were gathering. Her green, baleful eyes shone like danger lamps. And as I peered at her, I could see that their color was heightened by the blood, which still smeared her coat and reddened her mouth. And still, slowly, inexorably, with the precision of an expert, the old man went on working that door. Even then, I wasn't sure what the animal intended to do, or even if she intended to do anything, until suddenly... <coughs> the cat! Look out for the cat! The cat launched herself, not at Malcolm, but at the luckless custodian. Her eyes blazed with ferocity. Her hair bristled till she seemed twice her normal size. Her tail lashed out like a tiger's when the quarry is before it. The cat's claws found one of his eyes, and I actually saw her tear through it and down his cheek, leaving wide bands of red where the blood seemed to spurt from every vein. Oh, Jack! Oh, God! 
Look out! He can't hold it! With a yell of agony and terror, the man leapt back. Dropping the chain which held back the door, it ran like a lightning through the pulley block, and the massive door slammed shut! In the instant before the door had closed, I saw Malcolm's face. His eyes stared as if dazed, and for once in his life, he was speechless. Jack, help me get the door open. For God's sake, help me. I'm coming. Beth, stay where you are. For God's sake, don't look. The end must have been quick, for when we managed to wrench the door open, the spikes had done their work. They had pierced right through the skull, so that as the door opened, the body came with it, and he fell to the floor, face turned upwards. Get your wife out of here. She needs air. I'll attend to the old man. Right. Uh, oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> the old custodian was leaning against the wooden pillar, holding his reddening handkerchief to his eyes, while on the face of poor Rivers, there sat the cat purring loudly as she licked the blood which trickled through the gashed sockets of his eyes. I pushed her away from her ghoulish meal and, well, I hope no one will call me cruel because I seized one of the old executioner's swords from its rack on the wall and with one slash, shore her in two on the spot. Poor Malcolm. He'd had his total experience, a good deal more total than he'd bargained for. Cozy, wasn't it? You see what I mean about cats? You never can tell. That was Vincent Price, bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in this story, Cat's Cradle, were Kenneth J. Warren and Frederick Schrecker, with John Sampson and Bonnie Harron. Cat's Cradle was first recounted as The Score by Bram Stoker, dramatized by Richard Davis and produced by John Dias. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Do you ever wonder what life will be like in, say, 50 years' time? I know I do, especially when I find myself becoming annoyed at some piece of modern tomfoolery. You know, the sort of thing, loud, mindless music being played unnecessarily in stores and restaurants. Checks long overdue because somebody's latest computer has made a mistake. This never seems to happen with bills, I notice. Well, I suppose we all have mm, little likes and dislikes connected with various aspects of modern living, but most of us forget them after a brief flash of annoyance. That is, until the next time. The point I'm making is that we don't dwell upon them continually and become obsessed by them, for that way lies madness. Take, for example, my story this week, which I've called The Ninth Removal. It concerns the case of Amelia Sidgwick. These modern young girls, their clothes are an outrage. Short skirts, low-cut blouses, lipstick, disgusting. My first, and thank goodness, my only encounter with Miss Sidgwick occurred when I called to see an old friend of mine, Peter Jarvis, in connection with some research I was doing for a film script I hoped to write. Peter was the head of a psychiatric clinic, and as I needed some background material on psychiatry, I had arranged to call on him one day at his office. 
I had expected a cold, cheerless, institutional building, but when I arrived, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the clinic was more like a well-appointed country house. I was greeted by a pretty receptionist, told to make myself comfortable, and that my friend Peter Jarvis would be available in a few minutes. Accordingly, I settled back in an armchair and picked up a magazine. Suddenly, I became aware of someone hovering over me. Good afternoon. Are you being attended to? Uh, why, oh, yes, yes, I am. Thank you. I'm, I'm waiting to see Dr. Jarvis. Oh, that's all right, then. She was a tall, thin, scrawny woman of about 55 or so, dressed in a severely cut suit of dark grey material. She had a thin, white face with pinched lips and the most penetrating bright blue eyes that I have ever seen. Perhaps we would never have exchanged another word, but at that moment I happened to turn over the page of my magazine and in doing so revealed a full-page advertisement which showed a pretty, if overdeveloped, young lady wearing an incredibly low-cut dress. Disgusting. I beg your pardon? That girl, completely shameless. Just look at her. I must confess, that's just what I was doing, <laughs> looking at her. Now... You know, there are some people who have the happy knack of getting rid of bores and other awkward customers easily. Well, I don't. Perhaps I just don't like hurting people's feelings. You remember the rhyme of the ancient mariner where the old sailor stoppeth one of three in order to tell him his long and complicated tale? Well, I'm the one of three, and Miss Sidgwick, having held me with her glittering eye, just took off. Of course, you know, the men are every bit as bad. They encourage that sort of thing. Why, only the other day, I was travelling home in the underground when... God, how I hate the underground, crushed together in this awful atmosphere. I sometimes think that hell isn't a matter of fire and brimstone at all, but simply travelling forever on the underground, surrounded by awful people. Those men sitting there so smug and oily looking. Not one of them would dream of offering me his seat. Oh, pigs sitting there reading their newspapers. And what newspapers? Full of salacious muck. A headline there. Another sex murder victim found on common. Is it any wonder the way these modern girls dress? That one over there, crossing and uncrossing her legs. Oh, and that short skirt. Disgusting. Oh, she's smiling. Oh, yes, she's noticed that young man ogling her. I'd teach her. I'd take a whip to her. My dear father would never have allowed me to carry on like that. Dear father. The devil's army is all around us, my child. Never forget it. You must fight it. Fight it with all your might. Never cease to fight for God. I have fought, Father. Oh, how I fought for your stern God. I sat there fascinated as Miss Sidgwick rambled on and on. At times she spoke clearly and precisely. At others she was almost incoherent with rage. Having at length described to me the trials and tribulations which she had suffered on the London underground system, she then went on to tell me about her work. Miss Sidgwick's employers had, it seems, been many and various. Her typing plus her sense of duty were beyond reproach. Employers might appreciate her work, but it seems to a man they were lovers of peace taking unkindly to criticism, and at length Miss Sidgwick was cast out, and with each casting out, her hate grew. One day, however, she joined a company run by a retired brigadier who had inherited his father's tea-importing business. The atmosphere was middle-aged, quiet, and respectable, and the office staff adhered to the old ways of dress and deportment. As for the brigadier himself, 
You see, the brigadier was a tall, distinguished, grey-haired gentleman with both good looks and charming manners. He was not married, he did not smoke, and he was always extremely respectful towards his female employees. He was what I should call a gentleman of the old school. From her manner, I guessed that Miss Sidgwick was not in love with the brigadier. It was just that she worshipped him. Sometimes in my dreams I saw him standing a long way off on a hill. I saw myself running towards him, but the distance never seemed to shorten. In the same way as Father's God, he was always unreachable. And so matters stood. Miss Sidgwick had at last found employment which suited her ideally and an employer whom she could more than respect. And then one morning... Miss Sidgwick... Yes, sir. Will you come in a moment, please? Uh, certainly, sir. That's right, dear lady. Just come in and shut the door, will you? That's the ticket. Now, just take a seat. Mm -hmm. I have something to say to you. Now, the point is that I've decided to expand our little team. Indeed, sir. Yes, in fact, I've engaged the young lady. Excellent character. She's to join us on Monday. Well, I was not aware, sir, that you'd interviewed any applicants or even advertised the position. Uh, no. No, no, you're quite right. But this young person was strongly recommended. Most strongly. I see, sir. Needless to say, dear lady, I will look to you to see that Miss Franklin... <laughs> that's her name, by the way. That she, uh, settles in happily. Uh, I shall do my duty, sir, as always. Of course you will, dear lady. That goes without saying. The following Monday morning began very badly for Miss Sidgwick... On the underground, a large man stood on her toe. He was rewarded by a sharp kick on the shins. But there was worse to come. When she arrived at the office, she found her fellow workers in a buzz of curious excitement as they awaited the arrival of the new girl. It was a tradition in the company that newcomers did not start until ten o'clock on their first morning, so there was plenty of time for speculation. Miss Sidgwick, however, refused to join in the speculations, even when approached directly by Mr. Parsons, the firm's junior filing clerk, a jovial man of about 45. Well, miss, what about the new girl, eh? Do you think she'll be nice? No, indeed. I shall be greatly surprised if she is nice, as you put it. Oh, dear. However, as long as she does her work efficiently, I hardly think it matters whether she is nice or not. Well, I was only wondering what she'd be like, what... What class of person, you know. At least I expect her to be tolerable. Good morning. Uh, yes. Uh, miss, can I help you? I hope so. I'm Anne Franklin. I'm coming to work here. I see. Oh, look at that. It's going to be a pleasure showing her the ropes. Mr Parsons, I suggest that you get on with your work. After all, you are being paid to do it. Uh, miss Franklin, may I ask if that is your normal business attire? Attire? Oh, the gear. Well, it's all I've got. I mean, I've got lots of clothes, but they're all like this. It's all right, isn't it? My last place didn't mind. This is a respectable office. I should hope so. Otherwise, I shouldn't have come to work here. Ah, Miss Franklin, so you've arrived. Good morning, sir. My word, how fresh and smart you look. <laughs> like a breath of spring, eh, Miss Sidgwick? If you say so, sir. Yes, I do, dear lady. And now I'll leave Miss Franklin in your capable hands. Yes, sir. During the next few days, Miss Sidgwick could be likened to a lion in a cage with a succulent but stupid lamb, which the laws of creation had for some reason forbidden it to eat. Oh, that stupid girl, flaunting herself, smiling at every man who comes within range. She even took to applying her lipstick during working hours. To this day, I do not know how I managed to restrain myself. All these things might just have been bearable if it had not been for the girl's work. It was awful. There we are. How's that, then? No, mm, oh, no, 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 no. This will not do, I'm afraid. There are six mistakes in this one letter alone. Oh, dear, you are fussy. And here, look. Three misspellings. And last year's date. I'm sorry, but this will also have to be done again. <laughs> God, I've certainly made a hell of a bloody mess of that one. What did you say? Well, I mean, I've made a mess of it, haven't I? 
Let it be understood, Miss Franklin, that foul language is not tolerated in this office. Neither is blasphemy. Do I make myself clear? Yes, miss. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but you are a funny old stick. What? Nutty as a fruitcake. This has gone quite far enough. I am going to see the brigadier. Suit yourself. And so Miss Sidgwick stormed into the brigadier's office and there presented him with the full catalogue of her complaints against the pretty young newcomer. His reaction, however, was not quite what she had expected. Alas, the youth of today, Miss Sidgwick, does not adhere to the principles we treasure. But you do not see, son. Blinded by your own goodness, you do not see... She bears her flesh, she paints her face, she encourages men. Why, Mr. Parsons has hardly been himself since she came here. In addition to which, she cannot type. I too, Miss Sidgwick, deplore the lax morals and lower standards of this permissive age. But, dear lady, you and I can't fight the world. Oh, correct me, sir, if I am wrong, but surely a soldier who believes in his cause never ceases to fight. True, very true. But when defeat is certain, he changes his tactics. He pretends to surrender, infiltrates the enemy's ranks, and becomes an underground force. Oh, but that... that... She insulted me. She should be... she should be cast out. That, dear lady, would be to admit defeat. Now, I'll tell you what. Ask her to come and see me, will you? You will chastise her, sir. Appealing as the prospect is, dear lady, I fear that I shall have to content myself with a reprimand on this occasion... Uh, thank you for bringing the matter to my attention. Thank you, sir. And Miss Sidgwick? Uh, yes, sir. You are my strong right arm. Never forget that. Oh, uh, sir. And remember, infiltrate the enemy's ranks, dear lady. Infiltrate the enemy's ranks. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed, sir. I'll remember. For the rest of that day, Miss Sidgwick, it seems, basked in a golden haze, remembering the brigadier's words. You are my strong right arm, dear lady. Oh, oh, I am. I am. By tea time that day, Miss Sidgwick had even unbent sufficiently to spend a few moments chatting with Mr. Parsons and Miss Franklin about the latest topics of interest. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Parsons. I don't think that sort of thing could ever happen here. We breed a much better type of politician. There's so much more background. Listen to this in the paper. Another of those sex murders. A girl of 19 found brutally murdered on Wimbledon Common. This is the eighth victim to be struck down in the past two years. Ugh, gives me the creeps. Whoever does it must be kinky. Poor girl. I wonder why so many of these attacks take place nowadays. Well, I can tell you. It's because these modern girls ask for it. Short skirts, lipstick, low-cut blouses. Is it any wonder they get assaulted? <laughs> Assaulted, I can understand. <laughs> but murdered. Ugh. Miss Sidgwick was about to launch herself upon a lengthy and angry tirade concerning Miss Franklin and all girls like her when she remembered the brigadier's words. Infiltrate the enemy's ranks, dear lady. Isn't it strange how great disasters often have humble beginnings? A smouldering cigarette end tossed carelessly aside and an entire building burns down. Or a, a cat runs across a busy street, a bus swerves and someone is killed. Well, that night on her way home, Miss Sidgwick suddenly realized that she had forgotten her umbrella. Now, Miss Sidgwick without her umbrella was like a d'Artagnan without his sword. Her umbrella, apart from its proper use, was also invaluable on occasions for shin-cracking or rib-poking. And so, muttering angrily to herself, she retraced her steps to the now-deserted office. But was it deserted? That's strange. A light in the brigadier's office. But I wonder, can he be working? He didn't say anything. No, no, silly of me. Perhaps he's just forgotten to turn off his light. Oh, what's that? Oh, dear... Dear, perhaps I'd better investigate. Whoever it is has left the brigadier's door open. I wonder if I can see. <laughs> oh. Charles, this is cosy. <laughs> Just the two of us. Just the two of us. <laughs> Kiss me again, Anne. Greedy. <laughs> Miss Sidgwick stood there and stared in horror. 
The brigadier and Miss Franklin were far too occupied to notice the white face staring at them through the open doorway. To say that Miss Sidgwick was in a state of shock would be to put it mildly. She left the building quickly and began to walk. I walked a long way that night, through Panton Street into Leicester Square, back again into Piccadilly, through the seedy streets of Soho, and everywhere, everywhere the voice of corruption screamed at me from hoardings, bookshop windows, cinema posters, from the white leering faces of men and the painted faces of the women. At last I... I came to a small square surrounded by iron-backed seats. I sat down. By now, the numbness I had felt since leaving the office had passed. I remember I sat there, sobbing, feeling like a lost child in a strange land, alone in a city peopled by my enemies. I thought of my father. The devil's army, fight it, my child, fight it. And of the brigadier as he used to be. Infiltrate the enemy's ranks, dear lady. I heard the laughter of the men and the women, the noise of the traffic passing by. I, I cried out, why am I forsaken? Then, then an awful thought came to me. Could it be, could it possibly be that I was mad? Hurriedly, I pushed the thought to the back of my mind. Then I... I imagined I saw rows and rows and rows of faces laughing, leering, grinning faces. <laughs> and I wanted to smash them! <laughs> smash them! Smash them! The next morning, I gather, saw Miss Sidgwick back at her desk as usual. She rebuked Miss Franklin for her bad typing and greeted the brigadier with reserve. From that time on, she watched both of them, much as a stoat watches a pair of well-fed rabbits, keeping meticulous note of their movements. Each day, she carefully examined the brigadier's desk diary. At last, her vigilance was rewarded. She discovered in the diary an entry for the following Wednesday evening. The brigadier had written A.F., followed by an exclamation mark. The question was, where would they meet? Miss Sidgwick decided to make certain. On that Wednesday evening, she followed Miss Franklin almost to her front door. Then she hid in the shadows and prepared to wait. To wait, if necessary, for hours. In fact, her vigil lasted barely half an hour. Then Miss Franklin came out of the house and began to walk towards the nearby underground station. Miss Sidgwick followed. I remember she was hurrying, but it was quite easy, really, to keep up with her. I followed her along the passage and along the tunnel that led to the ticket office. I can see her now. She was wearing a blue two-piece costume with an incredibly short skirt. She wore high-heeled shoes and she carried a white handbag, which she swung as she walked along. When she reached the platform, she almost stood at the edge doing a little impatient jigging dance as she waited for the train to arrive. The platform was fairly crowded, and I was able to get so close to her that I could smell the cheap perfume she'd obviously drenched herself with. As we waited for the train to arrive, the platform became more and more crowded. I moved closer to her. I began to feel strange, warm excitement. Then, as the train drew nearer and nearer, I leaned forward... You little slut! You have corrupted God! At the same time, I pushed her hard. <coughs> Nobody saw me do it. The platform was too crowded. And then I stepped back and was immediately lost in the crowd as it surged forward. I left the station, made my way back to the office where I knew the brigadier would be waiting. Waiting for her. So here you are at last. I... Miss Sidgwick, what are you doing here? Is something wrong? No. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Is there something you want to tell me? Yes, uh, yes, yes. I see. Sit down, won't you? Uh, no? Well, I'm afraid whatever it is, we'll just have to wait until morning. I have an important engagement tonight. No, sir, you have no engagement. Miss Franklin, that slut, 
will will not be coming here tonight. What the devil do you mean? I saw you, both of you, that night. And since then I've watched, watched and waited. (laughs) Then tonight I struck. I see. Miss Sidgwick, I think perhaps you'd better sit down... But first, I suggest that you put down that obviously lethal weapon you've been trying to conceal beneath your coat. Oh, but, now, but please I... please do as I say, I've... at once. I'm not accustomed to having my orders disobeyed. Thank you. Hmm. A dangerous-looking knife, dear lady. Where did you get it? I... I bought it at the Ironmongers. Nobody knows I've got it. Nobody saw me. I take it that you did not use it on poor Miss Franklin. no. I pushed her under a train. Ah. Did anybody see you? No. Well, that is, I don't think so. It will look like an accident. Well, I suppose we must be thankful for that. Miss Sidgwick, I'm very displeased with you. Did I not say to you in this very office not so long ago that you were to infiltrate the enemy's ranks, act as they do? Uh, Yes, sir, but I'm not interested in your excuses. I only want to know why you took it upon yourself to make what I can only describe as managerial decisions. I am the general in this army, Miss Sidgwick, and I and I alone make the decisions. I decide who is to be removed. Do I make myself clear? I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't understand. Being sorry would not have been much comfort if you had brought disaster on my entire campaign by your thoughtless and ill-conceived actions, dear lady. I had great plans for you. Great plans. In time, I might well have allowed you to work in the field with me. But now, how can I ever trust you again? Oh, please, please trust me. Oh, please. It's been a glorious campaign so far. Eight of them I've removed, the last one on Wimbledon Common. And the fame of my work has been proclaimed throughout the country. Front page stuff, too. They came to me, flaunting their bodies, young, eager. For a while, I became as they were. Then I struck... I took them to lonely places. And then... And you, Miss Sidgwick, have interfered. You have destroyed the ninth removal. Oh, I'm so very sorry, you see. I I didn't know. Please, please forgive me. Oh, please. I do forgive you, dear lady. For I see now that you only acted with the very best intentions. Oh. Yes, I, I forgive you. We have a great task before us, you and I. For you see, dear lady... There are so many, so very many more to be removed. I sat there in that comfortable, warm waiting room, listening to Miss Sidgwick pouring out her dreadful, monstrous, unbelievable story. I sat there stunned, not daring to look her in the face. Then, suddenly, I I was roused from my daze by the arrival of my friend, Dr. Jarvis. Hello, Vincent. Oh, <coughs> hello, Peter. So sorry to have kept you all this time. I got held up on a difficult case. I... Hello, Miss Sidgwick. You here? Oh, yes, sir. I'm just going. I only looked in to see that everything was some um, was as it should be. Well, goodbye. It's been so nice to have someone to talk to. Well, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, g- uh, goodbye. Bye-bye, dear lady. Peter, that, um... That woman, is she safe? I mean... uh... (laughs) Miss Sidgwick? Yes. Yes. Safe as houses. Interesting case, though. I must tell you about it sometime. Yes. Yes, you must. I say, you all right, old man? I say, you you do look a bit seedy. (laughs) Fancy you getting stuck with old Ma Sidgwick. (laughs) Excuse me, Dr. Jarvis. We were suddenly interrupted by the arrival of a very pretty young blonde... As she came towards us, I experienced, for a moment, a strange sense of unreality. For I saw that she was wearing a blue two-piece suit with an incredibly short skirt. She was carrying a white handbag and wore high-heeled shoes. Sorry to disturb you. Yes? I've left the papers for the Peabody case on your desk... But I wonder what you wanted to do about these two, Fredericks and Wilkinson. You did say they were urgent. Good Lord, so I did. I've forgotten all about them. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, I'm not going to have any time today. I'll tell you what. 
And it's all right with you. Why don't we stay on late this evening? Get him cleared away. Who knows? If we get finished quickly, I might even reward you by taking you out to supper. I know a nice little restaurant out near Wimbledon Common. Hmm. That would be nice. Thank you. Right, Miss Davis. That's settled then. Well, come along, old man. You can't stay here ogling our Miss Davis all day. I'll have some coffee sent into my office. We can talk in peace there. Come on. We've got work to do. And work we did. Peter proved a mine of information concerning psychiatry, and I listened to him carefully and made copious notes. But somehow, after that visit, I didn't feel that I had the heart to carry on with my film script. I felt, <laughs> to put it mildly, out of my depth. And so, having thought about the whole thing carefully, I decided that all things considered, it might be better if I stuck to something simple. It might, I thought, be safer to write a, a, a cookery book, for example, and that's exactly what I did. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in The Ninth Removal were Frida Jackson and Richard Pearson with Claire Sutcliffe, Michael Siegel and Alan Rowe. The Ninth Removal was first recounted by R. Chetwind Hayes, dramatized by Barry Campbell and produced by John Dyers. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwantedly. Hello, and welcome. That poem by Edward Thomas will, I feel sure, be familiar to some of you. But for myself, well, let's say it evokes a very particular occasion. A story so bizarre and so horrendous, I, I still find it difficult to decide whether it actually happened or not. I've called it Blind Man's Bluff. <laughs> but to begin at the beginning, then. I was on my way to visit some friends in a remote part of the West Country. The train was certainly no express, but we were jogging along quite nicely through the lovely Cornish countryside when suddenly we braked and stopped. An unscheduled stop at, no, hardly a station even, at its best a country halt, so insignificant that it was not even considered worthy of a name board. The window was already lowered to its full. I looked out on a single small shack, which obviously served as ticket and parcel office combined. But no activity there, or for that matter, anywhere else. Discarded and rusting milk churns, a mongrel dog panting in the sun, the drone of bees, and far off over the fields, a glimpse of a church tower. But no life, no apparent reason for what seemed a simply endless delay until, at the very moment when I'd all but decided to investigate the reason, we began to pull away. It was then I saw him. Wait, my friend! the name of God, wait! A man rushing through the entrance along the platform towards the now fast-moving train, rushing so heedlessly that it seemed he actually intended to throw himself under the very wheel. Wait, have you? Instinctively and probably against my better judgment, I opened the compartment door, called out, offered a hand, and finally managed to haul him aboard. <laughs> but it wasn't until I'd subsided into my seat directly opposite my rescued companion that I realized how truly foolhardy we had both been. The man was blind. Quite blind. I knew you were truly kind to risk yourself like that. Truly kind. Oh, no, the least I could do. Anyone would have done the same. Oh, they wouldn't. 
wouldn't take a room, hey, they wouldn't. <laughs> not anyone, not most neither. Most would have stood and watched and maybe even hoped for the worst. <laughs> How about that, eh? Hey? The worst were you surely not suggesting... Missed foot in, the sudden top of a screeching the brakes, and then they all had climbed out to see, my God, to fill their putrid eyeballs, by God, the thing under the wheels, by God. I know, you see... By God, how I know. His knuckles were white about the stick, gnarled white knuckles about the white, peeling paint of his blind man stick. He wore a long, old-fashioned raincoat, reached quite down to his ankles. In spite of the stifling heat, he'd buttoned it up tight around his throat, and a black beret pulled down almost to his eyebrows. But most of all, the spectacles, so deep and black, they seemed like like the sockets of the dead, fathomless, with only the reflection of my own curiosity staring back at me, my own reflection, and the sudden and uncomfortable conviction that I, I was being watched, watched and assessed inexorably. Oh, to think I don't know why they wish it. I know fine why, all right. I beg your pardon, my dear. Misfortune, calamity. It gives them this feeling of power, do you see? It gives them the feeling of being one up all the time, of being superior all the time. Oh, but surely the majority of us must be allowed some feeling of compassion. Compassion, he says. Oh, well, I, I certainly never intended to suggest that we're all alike. And foolish to presume. Still, you did offer a helping hand at risk of life and limb. I'll grant you that. But smoke, then, if you must. Why? Well, are you damn well going to light up around? How <laughs> did you know that I wanted a cigarette? Perception. <laughs> There's a toughy nose word for you, isn't it? <laughs> but bang on target, all right. Yeah. Get done with it, then. Oh, I think. Perception. <clears throat> it's the gift God gives us specials, you see, oh. to make up for the things. He's taken away. God. Or the devil. Or whatever. Will you smoke too? No. There's no good looking put out. Never could abide the damn thing. Well, look, if you'd rather I did... I didn't I'd... say that, did I? Suggested it in the first place, didn't I? Yeah. But kind of you to ask. Kind of you to offer. Mm. Perception. No sight. No, never have done. Oh, I am sorry. But smell, touch, read your mind like a book and no mistake. <laughs> so don't ever get round to thinking different. Mm. No, I, well, I'm sorry for that. Not wanting to say that, just by way of protecting myself, you see. Sure. Oh, t- but most... On account of him. Of him? Boy, Con. Con be name. Con be nature. Eh? Never told him to his face, of course. It would have been the end of me to tell it to his face. The blind man's knuckles tightened about the handle of his stick again. But a sudden tautness about the shoulders, too. A, a feeling of violence so suppressed, so pent, I... I hesitated to ask the next question, but there was no need. Again, he anticipated me. <laughs> Read you like a book. Oh, but I told you that once already, and I... Yes, yes, yes. Calm. <laughs> Don't think about him anymore. Not a thing to be thought about, you see. Your friend, then? No, 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 for no friend. Never a friend. Oh, oh. Time passing and all begins to wonder if he wasn't sent hmm? a means, maybe a means of getting me on back. Uh, revenge? People, the world, the way it was decided for me. 
happy once before come. Mother, home, just a small farm worker's cottage, only home I'd ever known. Familiar to me, you see. Familiar. Familiar as the back of this hand. Important, that. No innards. Every corner, every stair. The way every stick of furniture was arranged. And her never changing anything around. Give you a feeling of security I couldn't have found nowhere else. She gave me that. My mother gave me that. I, I can see what it must have meant to you. You can see. She paid for it, mine. Worked up at the big house, not the mansion exactly, but in the way she described it as me, yours makes no difference. Hard work, bad pay, long hours. Again, the uh, ruddy power of the strong or the weak in it. But at least the stinking pittance they allowed kept the thatch over our heads. A sacrifice I was glad to make. I never did get over her death. Bad enough sitting by the side of the bed and watching somebody die. But when all you got to go by is the feel, the pulse, the listen to their breathing. <laughs> Hard, that. Mm -hmm. Well, what did you do after? First off, seen mm. no answer. Bit she managed to say, put on the side, well, soon gone, in it. Mm. Then one day I, I get this idea, almost as though it meant me to get it. And a damn sound and it seemed at the time. Oh? oh. Well, there's this still her old room standing in the end there. Oh, yes, a lodger, you mean. And why not, I think. Still plenty of harvest labor being taken on up at the estate, all crying out for a place to lay their heads. And me, with no barn loft neither, a fair share of home comforts besides. So, so I put this, I put this card stuck up in the post office window to die in, and I waits. I waits. But not for too long. Convoy saw to that. <laughs> home from home, he has a ruddy gall to call it. This was my mother's room. Yeah, we still don't make it a suite at the Waldorf, do it? Yeah, junk. You well, never see such junk. Please be careful. Oh, not to worry. Can always have it written in the lease, can't we? Some kind of inventory, hmm? Uh, did you ever get round to your actual inventory, Pops? Mm? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, well, there's one that light and we won't have to be worrying our heads about. Please, I... In the name of God, let's have this window open. The whole ruddy place stinks of mothballs. Oh. Uh. You could make some changes. Uh. The room would be yours, so you, you've been tightly make some changes. Yeah, there'll be some changes, all right. Have you... Think the rent too high? We could discuss. Well, look, the asking price can wait. Uh, but uh, there would be changes. Yes, changes, all right. I see. Well, love of God, you didn't honestly think I'd be moving in and just taking your old lady's place, did you? Did you, Pops? Taking over the nurse companion bit just where she left off. Oh. <laughs> if it's the white stick and Alsatian dog kit you're after, no. you should have tried getting it straight from the start. As far as my Mandicap goes. Well, then? I think I'm self-sufficient. <laughs> oh, sure you are. I noticed that. The way you groped yourself across that landing just now. It's eh? <laughs> been some time <laughs> since me mother's death. Uh, well, some time. Eh. How about the way you tumbled across that chair the minute we get through the door? Hey, eh, just a, a touch of the old circus act for my benefit, I suppose. When she was ill, there was this nurse. Uh, rearrange some of the furniture uh, in view of the <laughs> special circumstances, you understand? Yeah, well, I understand, Pops. The $64 question is, do you? Oh, um, sorry. Dumb as well as blind, eh? <laughs> well, I'm asking you, Pops. 
If you finally got round to persuading me to move into this rat-ridden garret, do you honestly know what you'd be letting yourself in for? Eh? Pot luck at the best and at the worst. Uh, you're making it sound like... like some kind of threat. Change, Pops. <laughs> but it all comes down to that, in the end. But you still agreed to take him? Not at first. But the weeks passed. There were no other offers. Oh. They took the card from the post office window. The people up at the big house were getting pressing. Threats, eviction, legal action. Only roots I had, you see. Mm. No choice. So Khan moved in. Oh, oh I, He moved in all right. Yeah, and... Uh... I did me best for him. Mm. At first, I... I was even glad, just for the sound of another voice uh, about the place. Well, well uh, natural, isn't it? Sure. The past can be good, but it's funny how eager we all are just to be alive in the present. Well, any kind of present. And it didn't work out then, huh? He took over completely. Not just his own room. Completely. His friends from the estate up drinking all the hours God made. No notion about paying the rent. And, and then early one morning yeah, my mother's things clothes, photographs the brick of brack of a lifetime really. A pathetic pyre at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> you ruddy what stink pops that's all you got going here well then I'm blind as a rotten mole maybe but can't you smell the stench of her eh uh, enough to drive the starlings off the trees in it in it though eh stink and pus and a maggot ridden old biddy's garbage that's all we've got here <laughs> you you no right come no right Whose bleeding nostrils have they been getting up every hour of the day and night, eh? Look, space to expand, you see, Pops. That's what Con needs. I'm never going to get it with his ragbag of mildew cluttering up the place now, was he? You could have asked. <laughs> oh, go on. So it's asking terms we're after now, is it? Yes, sir, no, sir. Three bags full, sir, now, is it? If you just asked first, I could have moved them, couldn't I? Somewhere out of your way. So look at it this way, my dear old mum. Convoy saving you all that extra trouble, isn't he? Eh? Hey? <laughs> I'll tell you something funny, though. A couple of weeks back, I damn well goes putting myself out trying to sell the stuff. You tried to sell my mother's. Well, of course. That shark of a scrap dealer, the outside of the village. You had no rights. Oh, back to rights again, are we? No! Now go easy, Molly. Oh, unless you'd like to join the pyre, that is. Mm. Oh, right, old scarecrow, you'd make of it. Fancy your guy folks a bit early then this year, eh, Pops? They were hers, damn you. Yes, so now they're hers again, ain't they? Ashes to ashes, all that garbage, eh? You should be hanging out the flags, Molly. Really, you should. Doing you a favour, convoy is. I mean, it's say better than settling for a feast day for them moths now, ain't it? Uh, and what about them tarty little cherubs up there, ruddy mm. green with envy when Mumsy gets all these nice new drags for the post? Why, oh, hey, con? Why? Oh, kicks. Pleasure. Yeah. You haven't got a clue in here what I'm getting at, have you? Something you're never going to get round to, Molly. Oh, like tonight, for instance, uh, me and my mates regular old booze up uh, my place, Pops. Round about eight. Make yourself a bit scarcish, hmm? Uh, you will do that, won't you, Molly, with Con doing the asking? Always depend on blind old Molly when it's Con doing the asking? <laughs> oh, the fire's nearly out. Nothing left to save. Oh, you could always try spitting into the wind, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and yet you you did nothing I, I could have gone to the police should have gone to the police I see that now but, but when you independent on the strength and decisions of others for a whole lifetime there comes a time when you need so desperately to feel the power of 
self-assertion. The ability to act. I... I found a thing to do. Winter was coming. The cottage was fitted for gas. I just got Con a gas fire for his bedroom. Very sensitive to cold was Con. It burned all hours of the day and night. And sometimes... Sometimes he even let it burn while he slept. So? One night I, I simply turned it off. Oh, you mean you, you went into his room and turned it off? Oh, no, no. The mains of the downstairs mains. Well, then? But well, then, when the flames had been extinguished, I turned it on again. I blanketed the crack beneath his door. Uh -huh. Stood there a long time, listening to the hiss of the gas as it escaped into the room. Con sleep in this drunken stupor become deeper, ever deeper, till I decided it had enough, sufficient to me purpose. You mean you, you gassed him? You, you murdered him? Well, that, that would have been a kind of revenge, but no, too, too simple. I, I, I hated him. But there's a need beyond the hate. He was quite unconscious when I went into him, as deep unconscious as if he were under anaesthetic. Now, underneath the cottage, we had a cellar. In the old times, it, it had been used for storing apples, vegetables. And now it was quite empty. The only entrance was through a trap door set into the flags <laughs> of the kitchen floor, but long, long hidden by a big chest used for storing firewood. I, I pulled the chest aside. <laughs> Open the trap. <laughs> Lowered the body in the dank smell of damp. Scurry of a rat. And you... You left him there. In the... well, not at once. No, one more thing to do, you see. To give him a taste of the affliction he'd mocked and made fun of over all these long months. I returned to me. Mother's neat front parlor. Her work basket was always on a small window table just where I'd left it. Long... Steel bodkin, the stout thread, just right. I returned to the cellar, and there, there, in the eternal dark, I sewed up his eyes, oh, my. stitch by <coughs> stitch, neatly, methodically, upper lid to lower. I sewed up his eyes. And then... I left him there. What... What happened when the effects of the gas wore off? Oh, it allowed for that. It was to be the final irony. My final irony. Where... Where am I? Wait. It's not my room. Wait. Light. Light, damn you. Wait. Light. There isn't any lights. It's all dark. My eyes. They were chase you. Eyes. Tight closed. It stuck. Final irony, my final triumph in the deep, dank, dark, 
He'd search for the door. He'd search, unseen, screaming with the searing pain of his sewed-up eyes, groping, panicking round the damp, lichen-covered walls, searching, ever searching for the door that would let him out. Out. To the light. To the help. He'd always taken for granted. Not knowing, not comprehending that there... There was no door. But the only way out was not in the walls, but through the trap door, not three feet above his head. A trap door, securely bolted, but weighed down by the heavy oak chest. I left that night, and I never went back. But they, they'd be bound to miss him. I, I mean, up at the estate. Over a few you... days they'd miss him, but he was on your... Traveling casual labor, they come and went at will. For a few days they'd miss him, then they'd forget. He was only worth forgetting. The train had stopped at a small halt. The blind man pulled himself to his feet. I opened the door and helped him down onto the deserted platform. For a single brief moment, he seemed to study me, and then he raised the opaque blackness of his glasses, and there seemed to be a smile in the milk-white clouded eyes, the ghost of a smile. Then he turned and pulled that dirty raincoat even closer about him and tapped his way towards the exit. The tap-tap of his stick mingling with the bird song. We pulled away into that green, bright world of trees and fields beyond. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear with Freddie Jones and Geoffrey Collins. Blind Man's Bluff was first recounted and dramatised by William Ingram. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. My little story for this week, I want to call Come As You Are. You know that uh, meaningless concession that gets added onto invitations to a party? You see, it's because the endless business of dressing up is such an integral part of my professional life that among my friends, my very positive reluctance to attend any kind of fancy dress party or costume ball is not only well-established, but understandingly accepted. 
On a recent trip to London, I was genuinely delighted to find an invitation from my old friend Charles Vane awaiting my arrival. It wasn't until I'd reached that key and, to me, ominous phrase, fancy dress will be worn, that my heart sank. The fact that my would-be host had crossed it through and substituted the words, come as you are, afforded little by way of consolation. <laughs> there can be few experiences so desultory as to find oneself sober-suited in the midst of a determined company of let's pretend Casanovas, paunchy Tarzans, and moth-eaten King Kongs. As I put Charles's invitation back in its envelope, I'd already instinctively decided to decline. But even as I mailed my politely phrased refusal to his kind invitation, I had the distinct feeling that I was not to be let off the hook so lightly. The 2 a.m. phone call. Do you hear? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Who is that? It's not only not good enough, I'm damn well not going to take no for an answer. Charles. Oh, Charles, is that you? Surprise, surprise. Of course it's Charles. If Mohammed won't go to the mountain, the mountain needs must. <laughs> anyway, who the hell else did you expect it to be? Well, believe it or not, old thing, there are alternatives. Parents, relatives, friends, acquaintances. Oh, you'd be surprised. Oh, would I? Well, yeah. I just hope you're not in the habit of treating them in the same shoddy fashion, mm. that's all. Charles, delighted as I am to hear from you, you know it is the middle of the night. Wrong again, Vincent, the early hours of the morning. But what's that got to do with anything? Nothing, nothing at all, except that we mere mortals do rather count on a certain uh, quota of sleep. Mere mortals bore me. Oh, yes, it slipped my mind. Please forgive the lapse. I'm forgiving you damn all. Are you still there? Still here. Uh, it's on account of that damn stupid fancy dress bit, isn't it? So why do you think I changed it to come as you are in the first place? Out of the question. The intimacies of my sleeping attire must remain a closely guarded secret. Don't be skittish. In a way, all I hope is you had sufficient sense to keep the damn thing. The damn... What, the invitation? Yes, of course the invitation is what you're keeping me from my beauty sleep about. I'm keeping you? Yes, well, on the back you'll find a simple set of directions for getting here. Oh. A child of five could manage it. I marked the priory with a damn big cross in the top right-hand corner. The priory? The house, my house. You will love it. Oh, yes, I'm sure I would, Charles. But as a matter of fact, I have another appointment. A scriptwriter friend to of mine hell is coming... with all scribblers. I shall expect you at eight. But, Charles, I honestly don't see how will I can... Will you let me get some sleep, damn you? <laughs> Charles, are you there? Charles! Charles! Oh, blast. Put to the test, Charles's simple set of directions might well have been comprehensible to a five-year-old child. But not having one of them with me in the passenger seat, I spent hours exploring the same piece of countryside in ever-decreasing circles. I was just on the point of returning to London when I spotted the entrance to his drive. And within minutes, I was standing in the hall of one of the most remarkably beautiful houses... It has ever been my pleasure to enter. The party was obviously in full swing. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Let the festivities commence. <laughs> Vincent, you're late, damn it. Oh, Charles, how good to see you. Oh, I've been ringing that ridiculous hotel of yours for the best part of the evening. What? Thought you'd gone and funked out at the last minute. Oh, I am sorry about that. Your directions weren't as explicit as you cracked them up to be. Huh? As a matter of fact, as a cartographer, your talents seem to be singularly lacking. Nonsense. If Columbus had had me aboard, you'd have found the new world there one hell of a lot sooner <laughs> than he did. Anyway, seeing as how you finally made it, uh, come along into the library. All right. Uh. We'll fortify ourselves with a brandy or three before I introduce you to the somewhat dubious delights of the snake pit. All right. Uh. There you go, then. Bye. Oh, I am sorry. Thank you. Hey, you're miles away. Yes, I'm just taking it all in. The house? Yeah, impressive, isn't it? Beautiful, Charles. Cost me a pretty packet, I can tell you. Really beautiful. 
<laughs> Point taken. Yeah, you're quite right, of course. The heathen financier in me. Hmm. Always been under the impression they amounted to much the same thing. <laughs> anyway, here's to it. And to your health and to your house. Tell me about it. The Priory? Mm. Well, don't expect me to go into the full historic bit. But for all that, mentioned in the Doomsday, one of the gems of early English monastic architecture, you know the kind of thing. Well, I'm more than prepared to believe it. Yeah, the domestic conversions came later, but it's uh, still pretty exceptional. Anyway, I first fell in love with the place about five years back when I was a guest here at a party. Oh? A rather bizarre junkyard given by the wife of the then owner. Oh, I see. Well, I think she realized I rather coveted the place from the word go. And last season, we met up again in the south of France. She told me her lifestyle had changed somewhat since our last meeting, and uh, judging by the bevy of young Apollo she had in tow, I was more than prepared to believe it. <laughs> well, I eventually got round to the house, and she said that providing the figure was right, the place was mine for the asking. Well, it obviously was, then. Let's just say the contract was concluded to the mutual satisfaction of both parties, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> You're the same old child. So, here we are. Nine months later, and it's housewarming night on the old corral. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Are you um, thinking of settling here? Mm, nothing mm. sure. No, you look skeptical. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. My eye. Well, you do have something of a reputation to live down, you know. Well, you must give me five marks for effort, <laughs> at the very least. I've already got so far as settling into the place. Even quite a genuine English butler and a stable of splendid hunters... Yeah, every reason to be proud of my new country gentleman image, don't you think? Well, all you need now is a genuine English rose to complete the picture. Hmm. I'm working on it. You being serious? I am. The question is, is she? Oh, am I to meet her tonight? <laughs> oh, my dear fellow, here tonight, her blue-blooded parents would have 40 blue-blooded fits. Oh, then this is something of a, a last fling. Let's just settle for the last but one, shall we? All right, if you prefer. I most certainly do. Right, uh, let's be having you then. Uh. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the snake pit. <laughs> My original misgivings about accepting Charles's invitation proved well justified. Along with the disguises I'd anticipated, in a matter of minutes I'd been introduced to a somewhat bibulous archbishop, an emaciated Theda Barra on the decline, and the oldest bunny girl in the business. Charles's come-as-you-are concession proved a somewhat dubious advantage. My conventional business suit seemed to generate the same degree of cool hostility as if I'd elected to wear it at a convention of nudists. It was with a very positive feeling of relief that I eventually escaped the throng and sought out some corner strategically removed from the general merrymaking. The minstrel's gallery seemed perfect. Suitably fortified with a private bottle of Charles's excellent Dom Clico, I climbed to my remote perch as eagerly as any canary in its gilded cage, a positive refuge where I could ponder the idiot antics of my fellow man and consider myself well out of it. And so you are, old fellow, so you are well out of it. In the gloom of the gallery, I had almost stumbled over the man, I managed a rather startled apology, but even when my eyes had grown accustomed to the darkness, the details of his physical appearance remained extremely vague. The quality of his voice, the spare, angular outline of the silhouette he presented, suggested someone of middle age, but then he could just as well have been a great deal older. Only for the briefest of instants was I positively aware of his pale, watery eyes, opaque behind the glint of his old-fashioned pince-nez. I hope I didn't startle you. Well, somewhat, I, I must confess. I, I didn't realize I was intruding. A temporary refuge from the madding crowd, eh? Yes, I, I know it must seem ungracious. Oh, to some it might. For my own part, well... Given the option, I'd have been abed and asleep hours ago. <laughs> oh, won't you take a seat? Oh, thank you so much. Allow me to introduce oh, On these my... occasions, formal introductions always strike me as superfluous. On top of which, I can't offer my hand. Oh? 
A somewhat unfortunate accident. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. If I were to fetch another glass... Oh, it could... doesn't agree with me. But, but why don't you? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad to observe <sighs> that one of us at least had the courage to refuse being bullied into dressing the part. Fancy dress. <laughs> As in some ways it might have been easier to oblige. <laughs> the proverbial sore thumb, eh? <laughs> <laughs> In my own case, well, well, there was little option. Oh? My wife, you know. Huh? She positively revels in this kind of revel. <laughs> but possibly you've already observed her. Hmm. Titania in all her glory. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. It would be difficult not to. Well, extremely effective. Ridiculously pathetic. What? I can think of few sights so ludicrously tragic as a middle-aged siren aping the appearance and manners of a young girl half her age. Mm. Do I embarrass you? Well, I... Oh, you must forgive me, but her penchant for youth is so notorious, I now feel little reluctance to talk about it. Her companion this evening, for instance. Oh, you mean the young man in the costume you of have Harlequin? Him. Yeah. yeah. Though yeah. the appurtenances of a gigolo might have been more appropriate. Oh. Her darling boy of the moment, hmm. Luigi del Potrello. The name means nothing to you? Del Potrello. Oh, yes, it does sound familiar. In most circles, it has a certain notoriety. Ah. The Potrellos are Italian merchants. Oh, yes. Extremely wealthy, hideously flamboyant, and totally without any distinction, taste, or breeding. <laughs> right from the outset, my home seemed in a perpetual state of siege, billet by every post, secret assignations... Ridiculously extravagant floral arrangements. Uh -huh. And then the ultimate indignity of having the scoundrel pay court under my very roof. To be made constantly aware of their asinine sniggerings, their barely concealed whisperings, their grotesque fondlings, the middle aged lovebird and her twittering young chick. Uh -huh. But it wasn't until he started implanting his obscene influence on the house itself that my anger and frustration reached full spate. Uh, how uh, obscene. Yeah, yes, yes, obscene. Isn't it extraordinary how something as seemingly insignificant as a mirror, a mirror. can underline the absolute bathos of one's situation? Underline it with far greater emphasis than any of the indignities and infidelities that have gone before. Well, I'm... I'm not sure that I understand. You, you did say a, a mirror? Yes, yes. One of his many gifts to her. A hideously ornate creation in the fashionable Florentine manner. You know the kind of thing. All gilt cupids, intricately entwined vine leaves. Yes, I'm afraid I do. <laughs> exactly, my dear fellow. Mm. Needless to say, quite out of keeping with the sober antiquity of my own furnishings. But a token of regard from her own darling boy, don't you see? And, as such, to be blatantly hung in a place of honor. It seemed suddenly as if he were trying to destroy the very fabric of our lives. Would it uh, be impertinent of me to inquire... What happened? Yes. No, but why not? It's probably common knowledge. The inevitable scene mm. is the phrase that most readily springs to mind. But somehow... More significant than anything that had gone before. Oh, you're exaggerating as usual. I honestly don't think you realize the... The gravity of the situation. <laughs> oh, come on, darling, say it. You can always be relied upon to trot out the obvious on these tedious occasions, can't you, my pet? The occasion, as you choose to call it, might be a good deal graver than you think. <laughs> Oh, you're beginning to sound much more like the old dodderer you really are. Well, come on, darling, don't stop now. It's the well-known visit to the headmaster you had in mind, isn't it? If so, you are achieving it to perfection. <laughs> the darling boy really has excelled himself this time, hasn't he? Such an appropriate gift. A direct invitation to see yourself as you really are. So why the hell don't you tell your darling boy he can take his bloody mirror right back where it came from? We'll have to see, won't we, my pet? 
And was the mirror taken back? I presumed it must have been. I, I certainly don't recall seeing the damn thing again. But then, quite suddenly, I... That's to say, we both had more important things on our minds. Oh? I'd spent the day at the British Museum doing oh. some research... I got home to find my wife had been taken seriously ill. In effect, a minor heart attack. Oh. I could only conclude it was a direct result of trying to keep up with her dissolute gadfly. Oh. The doctor advised that complete rest was absolutely essential. He also emphasized that there must be no undue excitement or shock. Yes, he particularly stressed the last bit, or shock. Mm. Even as he said it, it sounded strangely significant. Why significant? Well, as it turned out, I... I had stayed up reading very late one night. I must have dozed off. Because I was suddenly startled awake by a noise. It came from the head of the stairs. What kind of a noise? Mm, difficult to describe, but a sort of bump, I suppose. Mm. A, a slight trip, perhaps. The servants had retired hours before... There was only my wife. At least I believed that to be the case. Until... Until? I heard their voices coming from my wife's bedroom. I recognized Luigi's laughter immediately. Then, after a while, there was only... silence. I think that silence was the most difficult thing to bear of all. For the first time... I admitted to myself that I had lost my wife to Luigi forever. And your reaction? How can one describe? Resignation, love, jealousy, hate, yes. all at the same time. I wanted her dead. What? I needed her dead. But had no notion how I could achieve it. I'm not a courageous man, not even an artful man. I returned to the study. And there, I saw something that seemed to suggest the perfect solution. Yes, go on. Shortly before her illness, I'd drawn my wife's attention to a book dealing with the medieval history of the house. Yes. Oh, needless to say, she discarded it halfway through. But there was one particular section that not only claimed her interest, but held it in a state of shocked disbelief. I'd never witnessed before. It concerned a ghost. A ghost? Most historic homes seem to lay claim to one. Knowing my wife's somewhat nervous disposition, I'd previously kept ours something of a closely guarded secret. But now, no undue excitement or shock was what the doctor had said. There and then... I determined my ghostly inhabitant should serve his turn. Well, what kind of a ghost? The ghost of a Franciscan friar. <laughs> oh, the costume wasn't too difficult to improvise. A burnous, one of those Arab nightdress affairs, complete with hood, served my purpose to perfection. I put it on, lit a candle, left my study. I crossed the hall. The stairs creaked as I began to climb. I didn't mind. It only added to the theatricality of the scene I was about to enact. I could already imagine slowly opening the door of my wife's bedroom, hear her call out, Who's there? See the expression on her face as she watched in terror the spectre of the Franciscan friar loom towards her. Perhaps one brief, terrified scream. And then I just reached the top of the stairs, was about to cross the landing, when I saw it. The actual spectre there, confronting me. The face shrouded in its hood, the candle flickering in its hand, the eyes, deeply socketed, stared accusingly into mine. For a long moment, there was only disbelief at what I saw. And then, panic. 
I, I tried to move, but couldn't. I tried to scream out, but no voice came. Then, with a newfound volition of its own, my arm lashed out with the heavy brass candlestick I was holding, lashed out at the ghastliness of that grizzled face. <laughs> God help me. In the name of Christ, somebody help me. <laughs> For God's sake, man. Oh, my God, Charles. Charles. What the devil do you mean by slinking off like that? I'm, I'm sorry. Well? I turned towards my distraught storyteller, but he was gone, probably realizing he was in imminent danger of being forced back into the swinging multitude below. Oh, come along, man. Don't just hang around in the gloom. There's somebody special I want you to meet. From the far end of the library, Titania herself confronted me. She sat there enthroned in one of Charles's splendid high-backed chairs. Captain of our fairy band, mortals, darlings, close at hand. As she misquoted from the bard, Titania made very short work of a very large brandy. In view of my so recent conversation with her husband, I, I must have looked somewhat taken aback. She was not slow to notice the fact. Something worrying you, darling. Well... Charles, Charles, be a dear. Titania's running low on nectar. Mm. Well, darling, you were saying... Light, I do apologize. It's pure coincidence, of course, but I've had the pleasure of making your husband's acquaintance. My husband? Yes. You did say my husband? Yes. Oh, damn you, Charles. You haven't gone and told every Tom, Dick and Harry my little secret. You know I particularly asked you to keep it strictly entre nous. Luigi would be furious. Luigi? But that isn't your husband. <laughs> oh, what a damn fool I am. Now I've gone and let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> oh, you must have been referring to that dreadful old dodder I was imbecile enough to spend the best years of my life with. Now, darling, we mustn't speak ill of the dead. The dead? Thank God. The best part of two years, isn't it, Charles? Even at the very end, the old dodder approved as parsimonious and mean-minded as he'd been all along. Still, he paid for it. One of the few comforting things in life is that one can always depend on getting exactly what one deserves. Or deserving exactly what one gets. Oh, Charles, darling, you are being cynical. Anyway... I must away. Luigi has gone missing, don't you know? It isn't that I don't trust the darling boy, darling. It's simply that I don't. Goodbye, Mr... Goodbye. Charles, darling. Oh, it's been bliss. But <laughs> Titania, darlings, must away to live and fight. Another day. Well, what the hell was all that about? Charles, tell me about him, her late husband. Edward. Was that his name? Well, I only met the old stick once and then very briefly on my first visit to the place. This place? Well, of course. This was his house. He died here. Where? Where exactly did he die? You know, you look really peaky. Answer the question, for God's sake. Please, Charles. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, at the head of the stairs. The stairs leading to the minstrel's gallery? Yes. And the circumstances? Oh, a bit unusual, really. It was Helen who found him. Apparently the old fool was on his way to bed, all got up in this ridiculous dressing gown thing of his when he spots this mirror. The mirror? At the head of the stairs? It was Luigi's mirror, wasn't it? Oh, has darling boy been telling you all about that? Wasn't thing? it? Yes, a uh, gift to Helen. The old boy raised such a stink about it, she locked it away at the back of a cupboard. Anyway, one night after a somewhat torrid meeting with her darling boy, Luigi raised his cane and insists on hanging it out in the open. Directly at the top of the stairs, so that anyone coming up them would be bound to see 
his own reflection, wouldn't he? Which is exactly what happened. Edward spots it, loses his temper, and smashes the thing to smithereens. Yeah, it was that that caused the heart attack, of course. Not to mention his hand. What about his hand? Well, severed. Quite severed. Extraordinary the violence that can be generated through a fit of jealousy, isn't it? I wish you'd have another brandy. Will you tell me what he looked like, Charles? Oh, Edward. Oh, do even better. Charles handed me a snapshot. It was faded, but I spotted him immediately. One face among many, but I'd have recognized it anywhere. Not because of any particular feature, but because there, staring out at me, were the same pale, watery eyes, opaque behind the glint of his old-fashioned pince-nez. I handed the photograph back. Oh, thanks. But might as well get rid of it. Oh. Not much point dwelling on the dead, is there? No. Not much. Charles invited me to stay the night. I automatically refused. Some weeks later, he suggested we meet up again before he left on a business trip to the continent. The Priory was again suggested as a rendezvous. But in view of what had gone before, at the very last minute, I switched it to my hotel dining room instead. The decor hideously modern, the food bad, the waiters rude, the place positively bulging with people. I wouldn't have had it any other way. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Co-starring in Come As You Are was Maurice Perry with Betty Huntley Wright and Peter Williams. Come As You Are was first recounted and dramatized by Bill Ingram and produced by John Dyer. Vincent Price presents Morris Denham and Liz Fraser in The Family Album by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. Meet my friend Arthur, Arthur Goodby. Arthur is your ordinary, very ordinary, ordinary man. The kind of man one simply passes in the street. The kind of man at a ticket barrier one squeezes past and perhaps ever so gently... <laughs> curses that. Such a man is Arthur Goodby. Only a few very intimates are even aware of his existence, and yet in his home life even this ordinary, very ordinary, ordinary man has his hidden depths. Depths too deep to fathom. Well, to my man's liking, was it? First box. I hope you haven't robbed your Arthur, though. You let me worry about my Arthur. Well, say thank you nicely, then. Oh, I just did. Nicely was what I said. Rose. I see. Why, that is it. Oh, don't start, Rose. You have known what I was letting myself in for right from the start. Oh, everything in the garden when you first moved in here. Uh, your invitation. A carpet invitation. <laughs> Poor, simple, good-natured Arthur, eh? Rose. Meet my good friend, Harry, one of the very best, but presently without a roof over his head, and with that spare room of ours just collecting cobwebs. Well, I was very grateful to Arthur. I bet you were. But I wonder how grateful Arthur would be if it ever got out that that spare room wasn't the only thing that took his young friend's fancy. What? He may seem simple, but I shouldn't count on his good nature running to that extent. You wouldn't dare. Who said anything about daring? <laughs> Not a word from these lips, I should hope. Not a single little word. Rose, he could walk through that door any minute. Oh, not a chance. Oh, for God's sake. Friday night, isn't it? So? So, always an hour later of a Friday. His usual little stop-off, it is, Mr. Martin. Oh, I was forgetting. <laughs> Creature will have it, my Arthur. 
Thank God for creatures of habit. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Mr. Martin? Oh. Uh, you there? Anyone at home? Come in. Come, come in. Ah, oh, there you are, my good friend. Yeah, I hope it's not inconvenient. No, no. I have just about given you up, though. Oh, the rush hour, I'm afraid, even worse than usual. You, you're a lucky man not to know it firsthand. Oh, you know? I am. I know I am. Just me and my shop, and as many beautiful reminders of the past as I can afford to lay my hands on. Mm. And I know which particular beauty brought you visiting. You spotted it in the window, eh? Yes, but the reserve tag is... Uh... you, my good friend, who else? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> who else? But my good friend, Mr. Goodby, shall have first refusal. Well, that's very kind. <gasps> Let me show you. A large country house sale this very morning. And though I say so myself, as fine a family album as you've ever likely to see. <laughs> well... A beauty, eh? Ah, oh, beautiful. You feel the weight. Hmm? There. Ah, oh, yes. Real gilt lettering on the hand tooth leather. Mm, family album. Draftsmanship, eh? You see the solid brass cloth? Yes. Yeah. That's to keep out the nosy body intruders. Oh, oh, oh may I look inside? <laughs> oh, for you, I think I can make the exception. Oh, the family album of William James Willoughby. And so it's only fitting his photograph should have pride of place. Yes, how proud he looks. Fine mm. figure of a man, yes. Yeah. Rest for the hunt. Understand? Shotgun, crooked in his arm. Yeah, like he'd put a bully to do anybody that dared to venture further. <laughs> oh. And then, just empty pages. Yes, Seems those nosy body intruders got their way after all. Oh, as you say. Well? Well, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Just what you'd set your heart on for so long. Oh, certainly that. Sure. You're for a knockdown pack. Oh. Oh, well, that's very good of you. But... I tell you what. You take it with you now and work out what you think it's worth. And then drop the money in next time you're passing. Well, if you're sure... No trust between old friends. No trust at all. Besides, high time to put the shutters up. And your lovely wife at home waiting your return. Dinner waiting to be served. Slippers by the hearth. If you'll allow an old bachelor the liberty of saying so... A man to be envied. Oh, yes, Mr. Martin. <laughs> I suppose most people would consider me a... Very lucky man. Good night. Yes, yeah, well, I think he's very nice, Arthur. <laughs> Something, well, uh, well, a bit different. Know what I mean? Leave it, Harry, for God's sake. Makes enough of an idiot of himself without you trying to put him in the right. Sorry? Talk about a load of rubbish. Well, I just took a fancy to it. I bet you did. No wonder old Martin keeps that junk shop of his open every Friday night till God knows what hour. But his face lights up every time his shop bell tings. Oh, I never quite considered it in that light, dear. Considered? <laughs> considered is the last thing that comes into it from where I'm standing. Pass us your plate. Hmm? I, uh, I suppose I could always take it back. You can do what you really like, Sonny Jim. Either that or it's down that shed with the rest of the rubbish. One thing's for sure, you're not catching me giving it house room. I see. It is a lovely bit of craftsmanship, Rose. And the last thing I need is you ganging up on me. Oh, it's just remarkable. Then don't. Morbid is what I call it. Family album. But mine is the family, it would seem. Ah, uh, well, uh, I had thought, uh, well... We could always start taking some of our own. <laughs> oh, no. Not watch the birdie time again. Do you know, Harry, last time he tried that caper, he spent a fortune on snaps that either didn't turn out or looked as if they'd been taken down the wrong end of a telescope. Morbid is what I call it. My final word on the matter. Well, if you've quite finished, I'll make a start with the washing up. So I'll give you an As you like. Uh, no, no, um, not, not yet. No. Uh, something, um... I've got something to tell you. Not 
two surprises in one night. Oh. You know Harry's got a weak heart. He'll never stand it. Go on, then, Arthur. Well, I've got me a... Well, <laughs> that, that's to say, I, I, I've got us. A car. A car? Mm. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. I honestly don't. A car, Arthur? But, well, nothing special. Uh, not new, but not that old, neither. Oh, yeah? Yeah, just a little runabout. <laughs> but you can't even drive, Arthur. Drive? The old fool's as blind as a bat. Have us up the nearest tree before we got as far as the corner. Harry can, though. Me? Well, you want me to go along with you? Well, yes, Harry, of course. Did you think different? Now, trips, you see, trips. Just the three of us, a regular family outing, eh? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sure we'd all enjoy that. And Arthur was right about that. Though they must have appeared a somewhat odd threesome. Poor Arthur, relegated to the back seat, rose, head scarved and bubbling up front, and young Harry at the wheel, showing off a bit like any kid on the fairground bumpers. <laughs> young Harry. But quite old enough to know better. Oh, it all seemed a very civilized arrangement in theory, anyway. The most cordial of relationships, with Rose always at the center, a feeling of sharing, each after their fashion, some prized possession. They never referred to it directly, of course, nothing is blunt. It was enough to bask in the secret knowledge of it, like the sun and the sea on that warm summer's day. Arthur, she's waving. What? Well, uh, well, Rose. Look, can you spot her? Uh, no, I can't say. I, uh... here, here, have a go with the glasses. Oh. No, 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 no. More to the right. Mm. Hey, she must be halfway to the point, for God's sake. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so she is. She's waving. <laughs> well, way back then. She had expect you to wave back. <laughs> uh, that's right. Uh, coffee? I'm oh, so. What the hell did she want to go all that way for? Out of her depths, eh? <laughs> Quite right, young Harry. You should never get out of your depth. Anyway, panic over. She's swimming back now. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, worries, were we? Oh, you must never worry, Harry. Not as far as my rose is concerned. Never pay to worry. <laughs> well, if you say so. Oh, I do, I do. Well, should know her by now, I should hope. Should know my own wife by now, eh? <laughs> After so many years. Ten, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Anyway, you must know pretty well all there is to know about Rose and me by now. Well, <laughs> mm, ups and downs, young Harry. The difference in age bound to happen, wouldn't you say? Well, if you say so. I oh, think. I do, I do. You take my word for it. <laughs> Still, knew what I was letting myself in for when I popped the question. <laughs> oh, she took a bit of persuading, I can tell you. Well, if you look at it from Rosie's point of view, not much on offer. Hmm? Not much to write home about, as the saying goes. <laughs> Comfortable little nest egg in the bank, regular job, prospects even, hmm. if I played my cards right, eh? Hmm. But never a great one for card playing, young Harry. <laughs> Not enough skill, a bit short on deception. Now, much better stick to your limits, leave the high stakes for them that can afford them, eh? Hmm? Wouldn't you agree, young Harry? Oh, uh... Oh. Tucker's a towel, one of you, I'm thrown. Oh, that's my hey, old rose bag. <laughs> Quite the mermaid, eh? I hope you haven't seen all the coffee off. Look, we'll pour it for her, will you, Harry? I'd like to get a snapshot when she thinks we're not looking. <laughs> oh, okay. Lovely when you get in. God only knows what state my hair's going to be in. A rose here, watch the birdie. Uh, <laughs> I got you. Oh, ruddy hell. That's another one for that damn family album. And another for the album it was. There were many, many more other ones. Rose sometimes prinking and preening straight into the lens, sometimes deliberately pouting away from the shutter. Harry beside her, his expression seldom changing, pleasant but set, resigned. Almost part of the furniture. As for Arthur, Arthur clicked away quite merrily, regardless of mood or circumstance. But the surprising thing was... He never showed them the result. If badgered, he'd just shrug it off and smile. Patience, patience. When the great day dawns and my album is complete, 
you shall be the first invited to its unveiling. In the weeks that followed, Arthur's shed became a kind of refuge. This increasing absence from hearth and home, if noted at all, caused neither concern or comment. It was as he wanted it. Is Rose with you? Oh, no, no, she's up in the house. Raising out about our supper's getting cold. Arthur? No, just a minute. I'll let you in. <laughs> Lord, talk about a Bank of England. Well, just in case the uh, vandals. Yeah. So, what particular interest kept you burning the midnight oil tonight? No, nothing in particular. I would just... Oh, no, no, no. No need to explain, old mate. See for myself. Well, well. Another session on the old family album, eh? <laughs> Catch it up on the rogues' gallery. Anywhere near publication date, are we? How about a bit of a preview, eh? I'd rather you didn't. Oh, just a little peek. No, please. Oh, be a sport. Not a word to Rose, promise. Well... Uh... Thank you, please. Well? Well, indeed. Yeah, I did warn you they won't... You see, you're still letting Squire William James Willoughby keep his pride of place at the front. It is his album. Was? Seems a pity to disturb it. Oh, as you say, as you say. Well? Oh, gets better as you go on. Well, uh, got to admit, made a bit of a botch of these early ones, Arthur, mate. Uh, double exposure. No. Well, it's something to do with the printing. <laughs> if I were you... I developed them myself. <laughs> <laughs> Could explain it. <laughs> no offence. Look closer. Touch it. Ooh. Yes. Take your point. Unpleasant. A bit like uh, fungus. Yeah, fungus. <laughs> but only on these early ones, eh? So far. Yeah. You uh, keep it up here on the shelf, do you? And just where you're looking. Oh, it explains it then, doesn't it? You got damp up there, Arthur, old mate. Damp? But yeah. wrap it in newspaper, tuck it away in a cupboard. That should do the trick. You really think so? Sure, so. Where the devil have you both got to? Just coming! Oh, Harry, huh? no need to let Rose in on all this. It's still supposed to come as a nice surprise. <laughs> Mum's the word, old mate. Mum is the word. Thank you. The last little outing they ever took was a visit to a bird sanctuary. As a matter of fact, it was Arthur's idea. Though it seemed an obvious choice. Besides, the seclusion of the place was bound to have its advantages. Daffy old Arthur could plod off with his government surplus binoculars to spy on his feathered friends, leaving her with Harry and more personal intimacies. It preoccupied them. In fact, it wasn't until early evening they began to think something might be up. Well, Your Honor, we called and called for him, but no joy. Joy? Uh, results, Your Honor. This is a coroner's inquiry, Mr. Blake, not a court of law. Your Honor? Sir, will suffice. Oh, yes, sir. So then what did you do? Well, we thought Arthur, uh, Mr. Goodby, uh, might be playing a lark on us at first. A lark? Well, just at first. And then we went looking, didn't we? Uh, the gold knows. Uh, Heaven knows uh, what chance we thought we had. I mean, all that undergrowth, reeds, not to mention the lake. You could find no trace, sir. Uh, no, sir. No sight, no sound out of the ordinary? Nothing at all. Except for... For what? <laughs> Gunshots. Uh, one right after the other. A double-barrel shotgun. Are you sure of that? Uh, not sure. Far from it. It's just the way it sounded. But as Rose, uh, Mrs. Goodby said, not very likely. Oh? Well, it's not the kind of thing you'd expect to hear in a bird sanctuary, is it? 
N- not the kind of thing at all. Well, please continue. Well, nothing else. Uh, by then, it was nearly dark. Uh, there was nothing more we could do on our own. So we got to the nearest telephone and, and called the police. You may return to your seat. Your Honor. <clears throat> Therefore, having given due and careful consideration to the evidence concerning the sudden, unexplained disappearance of the said Arthur William Goodby, and in view of the fact that no remains had ever been recovered, or evidence to suggest intent or willful act of malice, I shall herewith return an open verdict, but not totally dismissing the inherent possibility of death by misadventure. This coroner's court is adjourned. Poor tragic Rose. But dear listener, I'm sure you can well imagine the scene. The most wonderful of husbands in all wide world. Yes, Rose. Nothing I wouldn't have done for my Arthur. You know that. Of course, Rose. He'll have left me the lot, of course, you'll see. <laughs> Nothing but the very best for my Rose. A number of times I've heard him say that. And now that he's gone, stands to reason. Well, great expectations time, eh, Harry, love? <laughs> great expectations. <laughs> But the mutual expectations proved short-lived. Rose was right about copping the lot, of course, but she certainly hadn't bargained on a recent hefty mortgage Arthur had saddled her with. His bank account also seemed to indicate dear deceased Arthur had treated himself to something of a spree in his latter years. The ruddy, hey timing Oh, really been doing himself proud, hasn't he? Know what? He probably had some fancy woman shucked away under my very nose. Arthur, come off it, love. How the hell would we know? Explain why he was always back late every Friday, wouldn't it? Splashing out on some damn cart while dear darling Rose held the fault. And found whatever poor bit of consolation she could. What? Uh, Nothing. Nothing that matters. But it did. Amazing how Rose's change of circumstances affected Harry. His little treats, the odd preze, became fewer and fewer. It eventually got so bad, she even suggested he get himself a job and help out with the housekeeping. The writing certainly seemed on the wall. What Arthur had spent the loot on continued to puzzle him, though. The secret affair Rose credited him with? High in the sky. There'd been no sudden change in lifestyle, so where the hell? Then it dawned on him. The shed. The stuff in the shed. They'd seen bits and pieces, but for all anybody knew, they could be sitting on a fortune. But why they? It didn't take Harry long to drop the plural notion of things. Well, he'd earned it, hadn't he? Had it coming to him, didn't he? His chance came a couple of nights later. The night of the storm. Such a storm. There'd been nothing like it since the night he'd barged in on Arthur in the garden shed. It was the memory of that night that took Harry to the living room window now. And as he peered through into the night, he saw it. A light on. Down there in the shed, slanting through the dirty panes onto the lawn. And even at this distance, Harry could see the door was ajar, almost invitingly ajar. It could be he'd underestimated Rose. Perhaps she had come to the same conclusion as he had, was down there now, taking stock, making plans, about to leave him high and dry. Under the swinging lamp. 
in the very center of Arthur's work table. The family album. It drew Harry to it like a magnet. Oh, my God. My dear, dear God. Open at the first page. And the eyes of the original owner, long dead but caught forever, staring out at him. The eyes of the dead, straight from the grave. Staring out at him from a slime of maggot-ridden putrescence. And from those eyes, a fungus-like growth, smearing itself, obliterating the snapshot images of those strangers who had dared to invade the rest of its pages. Harry and Rose at the seaside. Harry and Rose at picnic, Winter Castle. Harry and Rose. Harry and Rose at the birds. At the bird sanctuary? But how? I made that very last day, but how? They never even found his damn camera. So how the hell... It was the click that made Harry freeze. The unmistakable double click of a shotgun being cocked. In the age it took him to turn, he saw the thing that had once been a man. Slowly raising the gun now, staring down the sights at him. A man in an old-fashioned hunting costume, Norfolk jacket and trousers tucked into gaiters. That dead socket of an eye staring down the sights at him. A dribbling mouth, the cheekbones thrusting through the gray parchment of putrefied flesh. Oh, no. There was no mistaking the album's original owner. William James Willoughby! No! <laughs> no! In the name of Jesus! No! It was as far as Harry got. His heart beat now like some great animal trapped in his chest. A great insurmountable sea pounding, roaring through him, and finally dragging him down, ever down, into his unknown depth. Then it was over. He lay quite still, done, all done. Arthur waited a full minute to be sure before he lowered the gun and removed the mask. And the figure that now knelt beside his dead friend's body bore no resemblance to that mottled harlequin of death. I'm glad you didn't make me pull the trigger, Harry. Anyway, I, I doubt if I could have found it in me. But the album, the mask... Quite works of art, wouldn't you say? No violence in me, though. No real violence. Not against you, dear friend. Not against Rose. Not even when I was forced to watch the two of you together. Me? Always cast in the role of poor old Arthur, eh? So gullible. So naive. So... Easy trick. Until that day at the sanctuary. <laughs> oh, poor, poor Harry. Arthur climbed over the garden fence and took a shortcut over the fields. He buried his grotesque mask and period costume in a carefully prepared plot. From there, he continued on foot to a small suburban station where he took a train heading north. A very ordinary little man. One of the faceless ones. The powers that be decided Harry had suffered a heart attack, which he had. A year later, Rose found herself a new fancy man, sold the house, and moved to a different love nest. One day, the new owners will find the album, mildewed, past saving. They'll make noises of disgust, handle it with gloves, and finally burn it on a bonfire. It's of no account. It had served its purpose. 
That was The Family Album, starring Morris Denham as Arthur Goodby and Liz Fraser, Rose, with James Kerry as Harry, Aubrey Morris, Mr. Martin, and Anthony Newlands, The Coroner. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written... The Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello there. Do you like fish? To eat, I mean, not to look at or catch. <laughs> well, I do. I am, in fact, one of the world's most compulsive piscivores. I find there is an almost ritual purity about fish. The Japanese, you know, eat their fish raw, shredding and flaking the flesh and dipping it into piquant sauces, soya, horseradish, that sort of thing. The effect can be delicious. A delicate point and counterpoint, air and descant, plucking at the palate. The taste can be exquisite. And yet if you should think too hard about those raw, gelatinous strips of fish, you may find the feel of them, the sight of them even, is somehow obscene. But then my attitude in these matters is colored by a most unnerving experience I underwent in Australia. I'll call this story simply Fish. Because as each stage of the episode unfolded, it was impressed on my memory by some piscatorial piece of gastronomic delight. It started in a Sydney restaurant about five years ago, with a dozen of the celebrated rock oysters with lemon and cayenne pepper and all the usual trimmings. I was lunching with Greg Rossmark, an aspiring actor who wanted to come to work in London. We were just debating whether another half dozen would be sheer bliss or pure greed when suddenly... Vincent? It is Vincent, isn't it? Vincent Price? Well, yes. yes. Jane Willemsey? I don't suppose you remember. But we did once actually work on a, a film together. Well... Yes, I, I believe I do remember. It, it was a long time ago. At Elstree, wasn't it? That's right. <laughs> I strangled you, didn't I? <laughs> oh, what a charming <laughs> fellow. But I only strangle <laughs> the nicest people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jane. Let me introduce you to Greg. Greg Rossmark. He's also an actor. An eminently unsuccessful one. Hello. How do you do? Won't you join us? No. No, thank you very much. I must be going. Are you, uh... Working over here now, Miss uh, Willemsey? In the theatre, I mean. Oh, no. No, the theatre gave me up for dead, right after Vincent strangled me. <laughs> well, I, I can't believe that I was that realistic. <laughs> well, it was probably just symbolic of something or other. Don't you miss it, the uh, theatre? Maybe. But you can't have everything, can you? Sure you won't join us. Oh, there seems so much we might talk about. No, no, really, I can't. Richard's already waiting at the table, and he's due to start glowering any moment now. Oh, that's a shame. Look, how long are you here for? Oh, just a week or so. I start filming in Hong Kong at the end of the month. Uh, why don't you come over to lunch with us on Sunday? Well, I... We're only over at Manly, and I'm a much better cook than I ever was an actress. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd uh, love to come. Oh, well, very well, then we'll both come. Oh, oh well, fine. <laughs> well, uh, it's number six, Sandy Avenue. Six it's right Sandy. on the beach. You can't miss us. Oh, right till Sunday, then. Any time after 12? We'll be there. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> Lovely woman. I do apologize, Vincent. Whatever for? Morning in on your invitation like that, it uh, obviously threw you. Well, I suppose it did. I just wasn't expecting it somehow. No, neither was she. I was, uh, I was trying to stampede you into accepting. Well, you succeeded admirably. I, I don't see why, though. Well, I thought that you were going to refuse. Well, would that have been so disastrous? Not to you, maybe, but it, uh, it might have been to her. But I don't see how it could have been. I hadn't seen her for years, and 
I barely knew her even then. Yes, I know, I know. But there's just something about her. It's, uh... Well, it's sort of difficult to put your finger on, but... The eyes were out of phase with the voice. All the while she was talking, the eyes looked, um... Well, they looked hunted. Oh, come on, Greg. Don't let your imagination run away with you. Imagination be damned. Imagination. What is imagination? A mental trick. A simple piece of sleight of mind that projects facts into fantasy. Or fantasies into fact. Anyway, the following Sunday, Greg picked me up at my hotel and drove us out across the Sydney Harbour Bridge towards the North Shore and Manly. The other day in the restaurant, Vincent, when Jane Willemsey introduced herself, uh, did you really remember her right off just oh, like that? Yes, yes, she wasn't the sort of woman you'd forget easily, especially after her performance in that film. Was she good? In it, very good. On it, positively scandalous. Are you serious? Oh, yes, quite literally so. She brought the picture to a grinding halt about halfway through the schedule. <laughs> well, how'd she manage that? She ran off with the director. <laughs> oh, yes, she took off just like that. Left us, her husband, everybody flat and just took off. <laughs> Believe me, it was no laughing matter. Oh, it couldn't have been. <laughs> well, at least it wasn't at that time. <laughs> We had to get a new director in and a new lady for me to strangle. And we reshot every scene that Jane had been in. Oh, it was an absolute nightmare. And, uh... And what happened to her, Jane? Well, she just disappeared. They both did. Off the set, out of the business, off the face of the earth, for all I knew. Her husband hired some inquiry agents to find them, and for a few weeks we were all up to our ears in private eyes. <laughs> I sometimes wonder why he bothered it. Could hardly have come as a surprise to him, not with a woman like that. A woman like, uh, what? Well, she was younger then, of course, a lot more arrogant. She seemed to generate a sort of, uh, sexual electricity. She had an almost animal magnetism that could... Devastate a man. I'll tell you something, Vincent. Right. She still got it. I wonder what her husband's like. Well, more important, I wonder if he's a film director. <laughs> or or even an ex-film director. <laughs> I guess we'll soon find out. We did, and he wasn't a film director. Jane's husband turned out to be a broker on the Sydney Stock Exchange. But even that turned out to be more of a sideline. His real occupation was swimming, surfing, yachting, all the classic activities of the professional outdoor type. Richard was a good outdoor cook, too. And what he could do with an open fire was beyond belief. It's coming on nicely. Won't be long, Vincent. You always eat al fresco like this, Richard? <laughs> uh, we only make a thing of it at the weekends. Well, I can think of worse ways of passing the time. I'll race you back. Right, you're oh. up. Come on. Come on. Nice to see Jane enjoying herself so much. Oh. God, I'm exhausted. Uh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> the surf takes it out of you. <laughs> Especially when you're not used to it. Greg was... He was teaching me to ride the surf. <laughs> yes, I saw. Greg, what's that mark on you? What? Where? Out there on your leg. Oh, oh, that, that's a birthmark. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right, it's almost a family crest. Oh. It occurs at least once in every generation in our family. What, always in the same place? No, but it's usually on an arm or a leg somewhere, and it's always, but always the same shape. What? You see? An open rose. Oh, yes. <laughs> Now you pointed out, it is like a rose. My uncle, my grandfather, theirs were identical. That's extraordinary. How, how far does that go back? Well, you see, my family's name is uh, Rosmark. Uh, and uh, I suppose originally it was uh, Rosemark. But, uh, well, God knows when that started. Yeah. Oh, that really does smell delicious, Richard. It's coming on. What is it inside the tin foil? I mean? Hmm? It's a whole baked tie. It really is very good eating. 
Richard carves it off in great chunks and you dip it in the shoyu sauce. Well, I can hardly wait. Tell me, where on earth did you learn to cook food Japanese style, Richard? Uh, I find any style of cooking absolutely fascinating. Uh, we were taught this by a party of Japanese stockbrokers that we took fishing. Hmm? What, what sort of fishing? Tuna, barracuda, marlin, if you're lucky. Oh, the big game bet, huh? Richard has his own boat down the coast at Bermagui. We charter it out most of the time, but uh, we reserve a few odd weeks for ourselves. You go fishing, Jane? No. He prefers to stay here. Hmm, I can imagine. It must be a far cry from Elstree to Bermagui. Don't drag all that up, Rosmark, for Pete's sake. Drag all what up? The theatre, the bright lights and all that crap. She's much better off where she is. Aren't you, Jane? Yes. Did, uh, did you two know each other before, uh, uh... Before what? Well, before... Before Jane gave up the theater. Why, uh, Why, yes, of course. I married her when she was still a, a drama student. And in the end, it was me who made her give it all up. Wasn't it, darling? could hardly believe it. This was the husband that she had left on her runaway romance. What could have happened? Had he found her, or had she come back to him? And what about the flyaway film director? What had happened to him? <laughs> well, when I got back to London, I mentioned his name around a few times to see if I got any response. I didn't. People remembered him, but no one had seen or heard of him since he had run off with that uh, actress, as they put it. <laughs> They'd both run off, of course, but only Jane had come back. I wondered, so dark a thought, so dark a thought, it lodged unnoticed in the shadows of my memory until last year... When I went back to Australia, back to Sydney. Perhaps it was the same unnoticed thought that made me phone the one time Jane Willemsey and her husband and to invite them both to dinner. I remember the occasion well. We had a quite extraordinary Australian hock with a quite excellent lobster a la Morica. How long? Will you be in Australia this time, Vincent? Oh, only a few more days, then I go to Japan for eight weeks of filming. Might come back here after that, though, just for a short vacation trip. Oh, well, then you must come up to stay with us in Brisbane. It'd be lovely to Brisbane? see you in... Yes. Uh, didn't Richard tell you? But tell me what, Richard? We're moving house. Well, what will you do in Brisbane? Fish. Mostly. I've sold my business interests here in Sydney and invested in a couple of boats. Uh, powerful engines, properly fitted out, you know, chair, rods, harpoons, flotation barrels, a lot. We can take anything. Sailfish, black marlin, or the big sharks, the tigers and the great whites. Yes, but why do you go all the way up to Brisbane? I mean, why not stay in Bermagui? That was Richard's decision. The, uh... Charter rates are much higher up in Queensland. Oh. Better fishing all the year round, too. Richard's going to skip a one of the boats himself. Well, what will you do, Jane? I'm sure there'll be a great deal to keep me occupied. Uh, you'll probably enjoy it once you get settled in. We'll see. Have you seen Greg? Greg? Oh, Greg Rossmark, you mean. Now, have you seen anything of him recently? No. Yes. Uh, not recently. Uh, how is he? Hi. Right. Is he working? Uh, no, no. Um, he, he gave up the theatre. After dinner, I saw them to their car with a promise that I would visit them in Brisbane on my return from Japan. I watched them out of sight and turned to walk down to my hotel in the cool night air. Suddenly, I became quite chillingly aware that Someone was walking almost at my shoulder, following me. I stopped. Suddenly, I 
had to turn and face him out. Vincent. It is Vincent, isn't it, Vincent Price? Yes. Do you remember me? Greg. Greg. With the rose mark on his leg. Greg, Greg Rosmark. Of course, I hardly recognized you. <laughs> I... Are you all right? Well, let's just say that I'm, uh, sort of sick. You were with her, weren't you? You mean Jane? Yes, I, I've just had dinner with her and Richard. Yes, I saw you. Did she mention me? Well, she said she hadn't seen you recently. No, no. He won't let her, not since he found out. Found out, huh? Well, is that why you never went to England? <laughs> yes. It, uh, happened again. You see, we, uh... Oh, uh, you wouldn't understand. You mean you ran away together? No. Everything but that, funnily enough. She wouldn't come with me. She... She was frightened. Frightened of what? Of him, of course. She's terrified of him. Uh, then, when he found out about us, she refused to see me again. She sends my letters back unopened. Every time I phone, she uh, bursts into tears and uh, keeps saying, well, moaning, stay away, for God's sake, uh, stay away from me. Oh, the way she says it, uh, it tears the heart out of you. And I, no, it's, it's not what she wants to say, I can tell. But Greg, maybe she's right. Oh, no, otherwise uh, he, he wouldn't be taking her away from here, far away where he thinks I won't follow. <laughs> well, he's wrong. You can tell him from me that he's wrong. I'll follow wherever he takes her. I'll follow to the ends of the earth, if need be. You tell her that, will you? To the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. He shuffled off backwards into the night until the shadows seemed to engulf him completely, leaving me with only the recollection of the desperation in his eyes and the strained emotion of his voice. As I turned into my hotel, I knew that I would need a vacation after my work in Japan had finished, knew that I wanted to try my hand at big game fishing. And so, nine weeks later, I found myself on the open patio of Jane and Richard's new house, eating homemade croissant and drinking fresh ground coffee in the pale sunshine of an early morning in Queensland. Like some more coffee, Vincent? Oh, please. And, by the way, I congratulate you on your croissant. They're delicious. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can face the day with just that inside of you. It's a woman's breakfast. Well, I certainly couldn't face a day at sea with a stomach full of bacon, sausage, eggs. <laughs> and tomato. Ooh. Don't forget the tomato. Ooh. It keeps the corpuscles coming the right color. At least that's what my old granny used to say. Well, mine said they gave you appendicitis. Have you ever been fishing before, Vincent? <laughs> no. No, I never seem to have had the time. And I've never been convinced that I had the patience. I, I know what you mean, but uh, this is nothing like ordinary angling. You see, you don't just sit around and wait for the fish to come. You have to go out and look for them. Well, you have to know where to look, presumably. Well, I seem to know where to look for shark. Richard's landed more sharks in the past fortnight than anyone can remember. He's making quite a name for himself. What's, uh, uh, what kind of sharks do you get in these waters? Oh, all the worst sorts, sir. Or best sorts, according to your point of view. Tigers, mako, hammerheads. I've even taken a couple of whites, uh, small ones, of course, but but even the small ones are man-eaters. Well, what happens if you meet a big one? <laughs> <laughs> then you've got a fight on your hand. <laughs> that could be real sport. Uh, yes. Well, I'll uh, I'll just go and load up. Oh, the I'll car. give you a hand. Uh, uh, Richard will see to it. You you finish your coffee in peace. Yeah, uh, yeah. You you stay put. I know where everything goes. Vincent, uh, What? 
Have you seen anything of Greg? I saw him that night that I had dinner with you both in Sydney. Not since then? No. Why? Did he say anything about me? Well, he did say he'd follow you. Follow me here? Anywhere. To the ends of the earth. That's what he said. Oh, God, no, not again. What's the matter? He's here. He's in Brisbane. You've seen him? Oh, he phoned me. When was that? Uh, two... N- no, n- nearly three weeks ago. And you haven't heard from him since? No. I-, I told him to keep away, to go back to Sydney and forget me. Well, perhaps he did. Do you really think so? Do you? No. Go on, Vincent. Time to get moving. Why didn't you come, Jane? Was only us two fishing. You could try your hand. No, thanks. Anyway, I want to go into town today. Oh. Yeah, okay. Drive carefully. I will. Have a good day. You too, Vincent. Have a good day. Have a good week. Have a good year. Have a good life. What does it mean? As if you can wish anything on anyone. Or induce even the most marginal change in patterns of events that have been irrevocably precast in the unyielding concrete of too many yesterdays. A good day it was then, in the sense that the sky was blue and the sun was warm and the swell of the ocean was at its most pacific. Good boat and a good crew in the shape of Jack, a laconic ex-swagman from the Northern Territories. All it needed was good fish. I wish that had been all we'd got. Patience, Mr. Price. That's what's needed out here. But they're not biting today, Jack. They will. They always do. Give the bag another bang, Jack. Right up. What is that thing? A dubby <coughs> bag. A bee bag. Yeah, just hang it over the side of the boat and uh-huh. it leaves a trail behind you for miles. As soon as anything finds it, it turns and follows it right onto the hook. Uh-huh. <laughs> At least that's the theory. <laughs> what have you got inside it? It's what we call chum. That's a sort of a polite way of saying smelly bits of fish and meat and awful. Especially awful. Anything that'll lose blood and oil into the water. Well, I wonder what'll turn up today. Shark. That's all he seems to be interested well, in. Well, he'll have to take what comes, though, won't he? I mean, he can't pick and choose. Well, he does. At least he seems to. Well, how can he? That's just not possible. You can't just whistle up which fish you want. No, but uh, you can't take all the bait fish out of the dubby bag and just leave bloody meat in there. Then what you put into the water is not so much an oil slick as a blood trail. Uh, That'll bring the sharks running. But you know, Jack, I I don't understand this obsession of his with sharks. I I really don't. You can't say I do. Ah, they're not as good as marlin or sailfish. They don't have the heart. You know, the skipper's set on fighting the big, great white. Well, I only hope that's not a death witch. We got a visitor, Jack. What's that? Ah, a big one. Who? What is it? Tiger. About ten foot of him. Oh. Better get into the chair, Mr. Price. Yes, Price. sir. <clears throat> there we go. Right. Hurry up. He's circling for the Ooh. strike. Steady. Yeah? Here he comes. Okay. Now, let him run. He's only holding on to it yet. Uh-huh. Don't strike until he stops and starts to bite on it. Right. And strike hard and don't stop to pick the daisies. <laughs> I'll tell you when. Okay. He's slowed. Uh-huh. Wait for it. Uh-huh. He's turning. Now, hit him! <laughs> I got him this way, it's fun! <laughs> oh. What was Oh, what happened? The line broke. Oh, what was the breaking strain on that line? Yeah, around 1,000 pounds. Oh. Right, there's some fish you had there, Vincent. Shall I rig another hook? Yeah, Jack, might as well. Well, do you think he's still around? Uh, depends if he's still got the hook in him. Hey! Hey, there he is. Where? Right under the stern. Oh. What's he doing that for? He's circling. Why? We've got nothing else. Here he comes. He's going to attack the boat. Yeah, hold on a second. Oh, he's crazy. He's mad as a bloody meat ass. 
Get the harpoon! I've got it! Get off! You crazy bastard! Get off! What the hell was all that about? <laughs> I've never known that happen before. Well, whatever it was, I'd prefer it not to happen again. Struth. He was after the dubby bag. What? See for yourself. We looked over the stern of the boat. The shark had indeed attacked the dubby bag. He'd torn over half of it away from its rope. The grisly, gory bait, or chum, as Jack called it, was already dispersing through the water. And then I saw the canvas, a shredded piece of the bag that had been torn away from the rest. It was floating precariously just below the surface of the water. On it was a piece of meat, a small piece of meat with a yellowish, bloodied skin. And on the skin was a mark, a distinctive mark in the shape of an open rose. And then the movement of the sea washed it off its canvas raft and committed it forever to the deep. Well, next time you eat fish, you may care to remember this little episode, but I hope it doesn't put you off. I'm uh, still a committed piscivore, with the single exception that I will never, never eat fish and chips in Australia. <laughs> flake and chips, as they call it. It's a great favorite out there. But flake, of course, is shark meat. Goodbye. Bon appétit. was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear with Bruce Beebe, Louis Fayander, Amanda Murray and Bill Kerr. This story, Fish, was first recounted and dramatised by Rennie Basilico and produced by John... and Daphne Heard in Goody Two-Shoes by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. The story I'm about to tell you is a love story. If not of perfect love, at least the perfecting of it. Something difficult to achieve. Something which can often lead to disastrous, indeed horrific results. David and Anne Fordyce, Mr. and Mrs., both mid-thirties. They'd been married for five years, known each other for ten. They were, well, what you might say, meant for each other. Everybody said so. Attractive, personable, identical tastes, interests, meant. And yet, a feeling of growing apart was the way David eventually put it. The reason for this growing apart neither knew or even understood. Both finally blamed it quite simply 
on the rat race. They thought about it a lot. It preoccupied them. A need to get away out of the rut. A chance to find themselves and each other again. And they both believed it. Really believed it. Once decided, the move wasn't difficult to arrange. David's credentials as a junior partner in one of the city's most reputable law practices, a fine mind, excellent connections, it was all there just for the asking. Their best friends, Charles and Victoria, said so at the time. They even said so after my little story was told. But at the time, there was no sense of sacrifice, of giving up anything. Anne was, quite simply, the most important thing in David's life. So, fresh fields and pastures knew it had to be. The city chambers lost him to a small country practice their stylish Georgian Terrace house in London to a temporary flat above the office in that distant market town in deepest Devonshire. And it was from there, every weekend, they'd drive deeper, ever deeper, into the surrounding countryside in search of... Well, at the time, they'd both have found it impossible to put a name to that. It was late evening when we got that first glimpse of Ty's cottage. Just a glimpse at first. Briefly, between the hedges and high elms. Only the roof, really. Torn flat. No smoke rising from the lopsided old chimney. Neglected. But oh, strangely beckoning. Darling, hold on. Have a heart. You need a flamethrower to get rid of these brambles. Oh, it gets better once you find the path. It certainly couldn't get worse. What? You do realize we're trespassing. Whatever happened to your spirit of adventure? I left it at the gate. <laughs> oh, come on, then. Come on. Anybody at home? And if there were, I'd like to hear you talk yourself out of it. <laughs> Hello? God, what a well, not exactly house and garden. I'm whacked. There's a three-legged chair if you want to bring it. Now where? Oh, the living room is huge. I'll take your word for it. Oh, open heart, an ingle nook, a twisting little staircase. It's not very safe, but then right up to the bedroom. <sighs> Reluctantly, I have to take your word for that too. And love. Anne? Darling. Hmm? Now what are you pondering? Only the possibilities. Come on, Anne, I'm starved, and it doesn't look as though we're going to get invited to dinner. What possibilities? Oh, only possibilities. <laughs> there aren't any. Use your head. The, the roof leaks. But can be reset. That, that staircase. We'll obviously need a bit of fixing. But, but it's a positive slum. So what are an elbow grease, me own dearie? And um, You're not mad about the idea, are you? No. Um, you're obviously not. Well, you're quite right. It, it's getting late. No, oh, to hell with that. It's just that you know, I thought getting away from it all was part of the general idea. We'd as good as settled for something on that new estate. Estate? Yes, there's always that. But who the hell wants to live in a boot box when there's the challenge of something like this? Challenge is right. Please. Oh, please, David. It might not even be on the market. It might, though. What? At least think about it, please. Mm -hmm. Please. Idiot. All right, I'll think about it. But for God's sake, don't set your heart on it. I already have. Anne needn't have worried. Ty's cottage was on the market. It had been for a very long time. And at the price, even David found it impossible to resist. They spent their first night there on a borrowed and very uncomfortable pair of camp beds. Anne slept like a top. David, hardly at all. Breakfast was served amidst the debris of the old cottage scullery. Uh, 
And just as I was dropping off, those damn birds started their manic twittering. <laughs> Piccadilly in the rush hour I can take, but those damn birds... Oh, not to worry, darling. You'll get used to it. Have to, won't I? God, look at the time. I must be off. <laughs> What's on the agenda? Soap, water, and elbow grease. Oh, can't do much else till the furniture gets here. Well, they did promise midday, latest. Yeah, so we all know what that means. Anyway, I've arranged for a Mrs. Perkins from the village to come in and give me a hand. Mrs. Perkins? How rude. <laughs> Ain't it just so? Now, what about lunch and dinner? Oh, I'll pop in and do a shop once I've got things organised. Oh, don't worry, darling. When you get home, you won't know the old place. <laughs> Somehow, I think I might. And what happened? From the start, nothing but hitches. By midday, no furniture van and no reliable Mrs. Perkins. Anne decided to cut her losses. She left a note explaining her absence and set off across the fields to the village and the small general store. At least David wouldn't have an empty larder to add to the list of discomforts. It was early afternoon by the time she got back to the cottage and the surprise that awaited her. Not only had the furniture been delivered, but Mrs. P. had already got things very much in hand in the living room. The carpet down, the three-piece suite arranged very much as she would have chosen. And upstairs in the bedroom, her dressing table was just in the place that she would have chosen. Well, well, well. Clever old Mrs. Perkins. It wasn't until an hour or so later when that clever lady called up to her from the bottom of the stairs that she realized that something was amiss. Hello? Anybody on? Mrs. Fordyce? Yes. Oh, you're there then. Is that you, Mrs. Perkins? We'll do it in a second. Oh, that could do it. Hello, Mrs. Perkins. Talk about the morass of centuries, hmm? I bet they hear me, Mum. You find it getting chilly? Just give me a hand to pull this tea pot in a bit, and we can slam the door on it. Oh, there. Oh, Ooh, that's better. That's a lovely old clock there, Mum. Yes, my husband will have to rebalance it. Come on through to the living room. Would you like some tea? Uh, no, thank you, Mum. It's no trouble. I, I hadn't mastered that stove, but we scrounged up a primus, so... No. Really? Uh, thank you, Mum. No. Oh. Well, later, then. I... Is something the matter, Mrs. Perkins? I just come to say how sorry I am, I am. Sorry? Well, Jack, that's my husband. He says no need... No need to go apologizing for someone that's not really of your making, he says. But like I says, far as that poor woman's concerned, all water under the bridge. None of it her doing. Will her not to know, I says. Least I can do is to get out there now and say I'm sorry I am for not being able to get here at all, Mum. Not able to get here at all? Mrs. Puckers, you did say... Come on up, then. Ah, uh, no. No, it's just that I had to go into the village for a few things, and I left you a note, but if you just got here, you won't know about the note. No, Mum. Anyway, it all took rather longer than I expected, down in the village, I mean. But when I got back, most of the furniture neatly stacked in the front garden, and... and this room arranged, just as you see it now. I just took it for granted it was your doing, you see. Oh, my dear Lord. Mrs. Perkins? My dear Lord. Oh, look, are you all right? Oh, sit down for a minute. Well, yeah. there, there should be some brandy. I... No. I'm all right in a minute, ma'am. So, started already, I she? she? I might have known. Should have expected it in view of what's gone up for. But it been such a long time now since the last couple moved out. Always townies. One foot inside the door and it's love at first sight. But no sooner settled than moving on again. And always 
of a sudden light. It didn't make any reason. Most locals never got that close. None of our business, was it? So what call us to ask the ways and wherefores? Just a moment ago, you said, start it again, has she? Did I mean she? You did say she. Two shoes. I'm sorry? Goody, two shoes. <laughs> now, you can smile. Just a name, Father. Good as any other. Nursery rhyme name. No telling for it why they first give it to her. But when I were a little maid, I used to listen to the old ones talking in the village and telling the tale and smile. Just smile. Tell me about her, Mrs. Parkins. Huh? Well, the right to know. The right to know. Well, abandoned on her wedding day at the church, according to your say. Oh, nothing so much thought in these days, but in Goody's time. Well, even now, possible to imagine the snidings and the whys and wherefores on every tongue. This cottage is already unprepared, seemingly. So tis here she come and stays and never ventures. Swearing never to be seen again by another living soul. Out the night and in the day was what they reckoned. But not even the night poachers and the light ever caught a glimpse of her from wedding day on. Long dead when they finally notices no smoke from her chimney. Long, long dead. So no face to be put to her, even in death. But seems... Grave all arranged and paid for. Even something in her own hand wrote for her stone. Accept the gifts I offer. Accept them, come what may. But see but once their gifts, sir, and live to rue their day. How, how did you know that, Mum? I don't know. But you've never even seen the grave, have you? No. No, I haven't. Mrs. Perkins. Oh, I'm sorry, Mum. I, I must leave you now. Oh, but please. You must. Oh, Mrs. Perkins, you please. Must, I say you must. Oh. And as Anne turned back into the passageway, something different. The tea chest had gone. It now stood on the landing at the top of the stairs. The bedding, if it contained, was already neatly stacked in what she'd only just decided should be her linen cupboard. Even before she'd opened the door, she knew it would be there. It didn't really worry her. She'd already decided not to tell any of it to David. And then, several weeks later... Happy? Need you ask? Just as... Well? As I always imagined it might be. More. Much more. Didn't I always tell you? The place had possibilities. I just hope you're not overdoing things, that's all. I've loved every minute of it. Wait, it's almost as though... Well? As though we owed it something. Which is why we came here. It meant. Now it's loving us back in return. Idiot. Dear idiot. <laughs> I'll just take these coffee things through. Is the woman from the village still coming in to give you a hand? No. N not anymore, darling. Oh? Well, her husband was taken ill. Quite suddenly. She says she can't manage it anymore. When did she drop that on you? Oh, just recently. How recently? A week or so back. Then you'll have to look around for somebody else. No, we don't need anybody else. But... We don't, do you hear me? We don't, darling. Really, we don't. She didn't, of course. If there had been any initial terror, it had long passed. She'd grown to depend on her good fairy to take her for granted. It no longer even surprised her to leave the kitchen to return a few minutes later and find the dishes washed and stacked away, to find a fresh supply of logs in the polished hearth, freshly baked bread and cakes when she entered the pantry. If there was any motive in her continued silence, one had to look no further 
than David's praise of her. And yet, as the months passed, she felt the need of a wider, less captive audience. Their old friends, Charles and Victoria, proved the obvious answer. The way we got your invitation, Vicky and I had an each-way bet. No such thing. <laughs> Don't fib, my love. Well, do tell, then. <laughs> Take my word for it, she said. Either they've decided to throw in the rural sponge, or... <laughs> or... Yeah, oh, poor David's gone over the orchard wall on his own and is beseeching us to get the spare bedroom. Oh, kill him! <laughs> Not that far from the truth. Oh, do tell. Oh, come on, darling. Don't mind admitting it. But you already asked Oh, I agreed with the getting away from it all and to hell with the rat race bit. But, uh, I wasn't too keen on ending up as world or gummage while better half put on the old mop cap and got on with the jam making out back. Mm, <laughs> we did have our doubts. If you'd seen this place when we first set foot through the door... They'd have been more than justified. Bad as ever, sir? <laughs> Worse. I still thank God for a telephone in the village and a hotel within striking distance, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> you see how it's all come out? Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> I'll take your word for it, old sir. God, looking at the condition it's in now. It's just about six months, isn't it? Just. Just about. Hmm? Positive miracle. Yes. Yes, I suppose it must seem like a bit of a miracle. You all right, darling? <sighs> Fine. Everything's fine. I just felt a bit stuffy in here for a moment, that's all. Charles, Victoria, can I get you anything else? No, oh, not another crumb for me, darling. You sentenced me to a six month fast, as it is. Uh, some blowout there, girl. Oh, it's superb. Mm. This is that country pie of yours. You know, I can't remember ever having sampled it before. <laughs> It'd be damn surprising if you had. Oh? Huh? Mrs. Beaton, did you say, darling? Oh, previous to that, kind sir. Ever so much previous to that. Go on. Well, can we share a dark secret? But there's no dark secret, Mum. It is common in these parts. Partridge, wood pigeon, lark, sweet Jenny Wren, if you've a mind to it. Cider soaked truffle, dill, peppercorn, fennel, and butter margarine that have stood one year around. Um. First catch your lark, eh? <laughs> I wonder if we can order it from our local takeaway. No. <laughs> uh, Anne came across an old recipe book when she was clearing out the attic. Receipt, my sweet dear. Receipt. God knows how long it had lurked there. Handwritten. Oh, fascinating. Crabbed like you'd never believe. Crabbed, you say? Well, it seemed easy enough for you. Anyway, before you could say Mrs. Beaton's grandmother, we resurrected the old herb garden, flirted with the local gamekeeper... And I've been playing your 18th century guinea pig ever since. <laughs> <laughs> You're not finding your fault, my sweet dear. So far from it. Um, shall I give you a hand with this? You don't stay out of there. You hear me? You hear well what I'm telling you? It is my place. Mine, no others. No damn call for her to go meddling in. You hear me? Ann. Oh. Darling. <laughs> It happened several months later. Summer had gone. Autumn was in the trees. Anne had started out to the village when she remembered her shopping list on the kitchen table. As she passed the half-drawn curtains of the living room windows, she caught her first glimpse of her. Small. Very small. Much older than I... Oh, how very old she looks. Not at all frightening, so. Such white hair. Pulled neatly into a tight bun at her neck. Made to seem even whiter, I suppose, by her long black dress. Reaching right to the ground. From any age. And yet, if I stretch just a little higher over the sill, I can just about see the stone floor. And on tiptoe, peering over the window ledge, Anne saw, peeping out from under the hem of the long dress, a pair of black kid shoes, polished to brilliance. On their front, two very large, silver, shiny buckles. Then Anne looked up. For just the briefest of moments, their eyes met. Then, the old lady was gone. Accept the gift 
I offer, accept them, come what may. But see but once their giver, and live to rule the day. For God's sake, darling, haven't you made a move yet? Oh. Here. Oh, Have to be a beaker, I'm afraid. Come to that, about the only clean crock in the house. What? And why the hell didn't you let me give you a hand with the dinner things? Dinner things? Your gourmet specialities certainly go through one hell of a lot of pots and pans. It's ruddy chaos down there. But I did. What? No, nothing. They won't take me long. The way things are going lately, it'd be a damn sight better if we cleared the decks before we turned in. On top of which, that damn cat must have knocked the sugar bowl over. It's all over the ruddy place. The fire won't catch because the sticks are damp and it rained in the night. So? So one of us seems to have left the living room window off the catch. Oh, hell, love. I don't even have a clean shirt. It was that first morning Anne began to realize things were not as they had been. That something was amiss. Much as she tried, the shambles continued. The more she tried, the worse it got. Untidiness became chaos. Chaos turned to silk. She tried, but could do nothing to prevent it. Nothing, my dear, darling David. Nothing in the world. Simply too much. Out of my hands. You see? You see? But why, love? Why? The change. There must be some reason. Beyond reason, my old dearie. <laughs> All right. Perhaps I shouldn't have depended on you so much. Hmm? Taking things for granted. <laughs> if that's why. <laughs> if it's something that can be put right. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, damn you. Give me that. <laughs> Don't laugh. should have told you before, confided in you, but you've suddenly grown so proud of me, too proud, see, I've grown to depend on it, she, she must have realized that, counted on that, right from the very first moment we walked through those doors. All those long years before. Just waiting for us. Who, my love? Her. But I don't understand. No. No, you, you could never understand. Too late to understand. Oh, hold me closer. Oh, please hold me. I saw her, you see. never have done that. It was the briefest glimpse. But I should never have caught her. She hated me for that. That evening, even as David walked up the path, he sensed a change in the place. The smoke curling up from the chimney, the brass knocker again worked to a brilliant shine, just as he'd remembered it. It was in the kitchen he found her, dear Anne. She was wearing her favorite dress. She was smiling at him, so tender and sweet a smile, as she swung gently back and forth from the heavy oak beam. There was one other detail David took in in that first horrendous moment. The chair she must have climbed on and then jumped from was back in its usual place, below the recently polished window. And then beneath the chair, something as incongruous as it was bewildering. A pair of shoes of the old-fashioned kind. 
Much too small for Anne, tiny. Low-heeled, kid leather, polished to brilliance. And in the front, two heavy, silver, shiny buckles. And reflecting in their shine, the swinging court. David married again. The new Mrs. Fordyce was quite the opposite of Anne. Sophisticated, poised, almost glossy. She ran her own advertising agency, far too well for her male competitors. On the domestic front, and only in a crisis, she could just about manage to top up a coffee percolator. Thatch cottages gave her hay fever. And yet the match seemed to work well enough. David probably prefers it this way. That was Goody Two Shoes, starring Michael Jaston as David Fordyce, Sandra Clark, Anne, and Daphne Heard, Mrs. Perkins, with Francis Jeter, Victoria, and Nigel Graham, Charles. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William Ingram, and directed by John Dyer. Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. I expect some of you may know of my interest in and love of painting. My wife calls it a passion. Indeed, I have very fond memories of my early years in London when, as a student of art history, I shared a flat in Baker Street with... (laughs) That's another story. I'll I'll tell you about it sometime. Actually, I paint a little myself, but primarily my interest has always been in buying paintings, some for my personal pleasure, but even more for galleries. Sometimes I've traveled across a continent from one end to the other in pursuit of a painting. In the early days, especially, half the excitement lay in the chase and half in the gamble, the backing of one's own judgment. As you may imagine, this passion of mine has led me to some very strange places and into situations one would never have thought possible. There was one such situation so bizarre, so frightening, so disastrous as to be almost unbelievable. Oddly enough, I was reminded of it only last week when I was driving through Winchester, for it was here, twenty years ago, that I unwittingly triggered off an awful chain of events. I shall call my story Lot 132. It was a cold day, I remember, and probably as much to keep warm as anything else, I'd strolled into a small auction room just off of the high street... The auction was about halfway through. Lot 132. A portrait of a man. Early 19th century. English school. Artist unknown. I moved forward to take a closer look. The portrait was of a man in a crimson riding jacket. He looked about 45. With black hair. A large, bony face. And small, closely set eyes. Now, at that time, I had an interest in a modest gallery in London, and although this was clearly a painting of some quality, I I felt no desire to buy it. Besides, there was something oddly unnerving about that face, particularly the eye. What am I bid? My gaze continued to be drawn to the portrait. It was an... An uncomfortable sensation. Fifteen pounds? Fifteen pounds. Eighteen? Eighteen? And there I was, against my will, bidding for lot 132. For an unknown man in a riding jacket. Twenty-five pounds. Twenty-five. The portrait was mine. 
but I, I, I didn't have my usual elation about the purchase. I decided it must be my own illogical hypersensitivity to the face that was, well, that was at fault. When I got back to London, I put the painting in a small anteroom of the gallery and forgot all about it. Until a few days later, when an old acquaintance, Michael Emsley, called on me. Oh, Michael, it's so good to see you. And what a surprise to find you here. Why aren't you in New York? Oh, that's next month. <laughs> I can never give up with you. How are the children? Marvelous. Simon away at school yet? No. At the last minute, we decided against it. Oh, why was that? It's very simple, really. Neither Marion nor I wanted some frosty matron to have the rest of his childhood. <laughs> right. You know, as a foreigner, I've never understood why the English take the trouble to have children, only to banish them for eight months of the year to some... Bastille of learning. <laughs> well, Marion's always been opposed to the idea. How is that beautiful wife of yours? Beautiful? Actually, Marion's the reason I'm here. She has a birthday soon. And you'd like to buy her a painting. <coughs> that was the idea. <laughs> uh, but uh, something modest, of course. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Now, <laughs> why don't we have a conducted tour? We walked through and talked about the paintings that interested Michael. Suddenly he stopped and said... That portrait over there. Yeah? I don't know. It seems to draw me to mm. it. I must say, I don't particularly like the chap's face, but I feel compelled to look at him. I'd noticed that throughout the conversation of the past hour, no matter where Michael had been standing in the gallery, he turned round time and again to stare at the face. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, I, I do know what you mean. I, I bought it in Winchester last week. Winchester? Mm -hmm. That's Marion's hometown. Well, then perhaps he's an ancestor. Vincent, what a good idea. Sorry, I'm not with you. Well, she's often said she'd like a few family portraits <laughs> to sport on the wall. Oh, <laughs> I see what you mean. But, but supposing she doesn't like him? Yeah, that's a point. Look here, why don't you take him on April? Hmm? Would you mind? Not at all. I've known you long enough. And so, after we'd exchanged a transaction slip, Michael Emsley took the portrait, promising to give me Marion's answer in a couple of weeks. I must admit, I... I... Well, I wasn't sorry to see it go. One evening, about two weeks later, I was sitting in my study at home, browsing through a recently acquired folio of early 19th century drawings and engravings. I was delighted when halfway through... I turned up an engraving based on that very portrait. What was more, I found out it had been painted by one Jacob Robertson in 1825. He was a painter just now being rediscovered. And the sitter was identified as Nathaniel Jeremiah Blackwell, 1782 to 1830, cloth merchant. The name <coughs> rang a bell, but... That was all. I was about to telephone Michael the news of my discovery when I noticed the time. It was almost 10.30. Well, I don't know about you, but I dislike being disturbed by the telephone after 10, so I decided to leave the call until morning. So the next day, I called the Emsley household. Yes? Michael? No, sir. Oh, uh, could I speak to Marion, uh, uh, Mrs. Emsley? I'm afraid not. Uh, would you mind telling me who you are, sir? I didn't recognize the voice, but, well, very briefly, I explained who I was and about the whole portrait business. You say you're a friend, Mr. Price? Yes, yes. How long have you known them, sir? Oh, about seven or eight years. Why? Uh, who are you? Chief Inspector Lowther, sir. Murder squad. Within minutes, I was in the car, heading for the Berkshire village where the Emsleys lived. All I could hear, all I could think about were the words, Murder Squad. What in God's name had happened? My heart was pounding as I drew up at the house. Chief Inspector Lowther met me at the door. Come into the sitting room, please, Mr. Price. Uh, oh, my God, Inspector. This, this room, it, 
It looks as if it had been ratched by a madman. Madman's the right word, sir. Well, uh, the the Emsleys, Michael, Marion, where are they? Mr. Emsley's at headquarters, taken into custody. Custody? Why? He gave himself up, Mr. Price. Well, uh, and Mrs. Emsley's dead, sir. Murdered. M- murdered? But... What about the children? Oh, for pity's sake, Inspector, where are they... Let, let me take them. Let me look after They're them. They're dead too, sir. At this point, I... I felt physically sick. My knees seemed about to give way, so I sat down in the only chair left undamaged. As I did so, I noticed lumps and streaks of blood spattering the walls, the curtains, and the carpet... The inspector must have thought I was going to pass out because he poured me a brandy and we went outside into the fresh air. Gradually, he told me the details. It happened about 10.30 last evening, sir. It seems that Mr. Emsley, for no apparent reason, suddenly went berserk and attacked his wife with a hatchet. Then threw her body into the swimming pool. But, Inspector, it, it, it simply can't be true. Marion... He adored her. Uh, the children, what what happened to them? Poison, Mr. Price. Oh, my God. Weed killer in their milk. Forensics say they were both dead by nine o'clock. Oh, Did Michael Emsley do this, too? I'm afraid so, sir. It's just about the most hideous murder I've ever known. After that, the inspector questioned me about Michael... But not being a really close friend, I, I couldn't tell him very much, except that he was, well, he was the gentlest of men and appeared to be completely devoted to his wife and family. There seemed to be no clue to this sudden, unaccountable violence. When I spoke a little later to their old housekeeper, Mrs. Thomas, the poor woman looked deathly white and was clearly distraught. I keep telling them how kind he was, but I don't think they believe me. There was nothing you... cruel about Mr. Emsley. It was you who raised the alarm, wasn't it? Oh, yes, Mr. Price. I heard this strange sobbing oh. noise, you see. More like more like an animal in pain. What time was that, Miss Thomas? Oh, it must have been about midnight, midnight, sir, so... Well, I jumped out of bed, and, and that's when I found him. Where? By the swimming pool, sir. But it was too late to stop anything, Mr. Price. He'd already thrown poor Mrs. Emsley's body in. Yes, yes. But the, look, did, did he try to attack you? Oh, no, 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 sir. Crying like a baby, he was. And when he saw me, see, he told me about the children. Yes. Oh, my poor little loves. Oh, it's all my fault, Mr. Price. If only I hadn't let him take up their bedtime drink. I... Well, didn't he... didn't he usually? Oh, no, sir, no. I did that, you see, always. But last night, he insisted. Insisted? How do you mean? Well, he... Well, he fairly snatched the mugs off the tray and told me to get out the way. Well, that, that doesn't sound like him. Oh, no, sir, it wasn't, but... Well, he, he had been a bit funny for about a fortnight. Funny, you, you mean bad-tempered? Then? Yes, yeah, with the children and with Mrs. Emsley, sir. Oh. Well, perhaps he was worried about his no, work. I or... couldn't say that, but I know Mrs. Emsley was worried about him. The way he'd sit in his study for hours, just brooding. Not himself at all. And he'd been like this for about two weeks. Just about, sir. Oh, dear, oh, dear, I can't believe it, Mr. Price. I can't believe it. Before leaving, the inspector reminded me about the portrait. When he saw the transaction slip, suggested that I take the painting back with me to London. It was hanging in Michael's study. For a moment, we looked at it together. A thoroughly evil-looking so-and-so, isn't he? Evil. That was it. I didn't know that you could actually smell evil, but you can. That study stank of it. 
Nathaniel Jeremiah Blackwell seemed to dominate us, and I, I felt an aura of what I can only call satanic triumph emanating from that canvas. But I, I tried to put this down to imagination in my own wretched state of mind. As I left the house, the police had started to empty the swimming pool of its red water. It was a sickening sight. Within hours, the portrait was once again in the back room of the gallery, and although privately I decided either to lose it or even destroy it, I, I said nothing to my partners. I, I could hardly tell them that I destroyed a painting of quality simply because I had a, a, well, a, a feeling about it. The next morning, I flew to New York on my prearranged business trip, and a month later. I found myself in a library in Washington, D.C. Idling away an hour or two, I, I came across a newly published encyclopedia of criminals and criminology. Flicking through the pages, I found this entry. Nathaniel Jeremiah Blackwell, 1782 to 1830. Hanged in London for the murder of his wife and children. Brutally assaulted wife with hatchet throwing body into river. Poison put in children's gruel, nicknamed Killer Satan. So that was it. Blackwell's evil. It must still be alive. How else could one account for Michael Emsley's behavior? But despite instinct, I couldn't logically dismiss the possibility of coincidence. However, I I didn't intend to take any chances. That portrait had to be destroyed. Immediately, I cancelled all further engagements and the next day flew back to London. Can you imagine my horror? When on arrival at the gallery, I found the portrait had been sold three weeks previously. I had to work quickly. The record showed it had been bought by a Peter Smythe living in Haywards Heath. I telephoned and spoke to his wife, telling her that there had been some confusion over the portrait, that my partner was unaware that I'd promised it to another client. Do you want to buy it back, Mr. Price? Uh, Mrs. Smythe, it, it would save me a great deal of embarrassment <laughs> if that were possible. Well, so far as I'm concerned, by all means. I can't stand it. It gives me the creeps. Uh, what about your husband? Well, he seems quite fond of it. Uh. It's hanging in his study. I see. Do you think I have any chance of persuading him to part with the painting? You could come over and try, if you like. Thank you. This evening? Yes, but um, could you make it about 8.30? I'll have got the children to bed by then. We'll have more of a chance to talk. Yes, I understand completely. 8.30 then. Thank you, Mrs. Smythe. Goodbye. Coincidence? Imagination? I couldn't take the risk... This time I had to back my instinct. I had to get to the Smythe house before the children were put to bed. I arrived at about eight and left the car parked outside the front gates. As I walked up the long drive, sheer natural curiosity urged me to peer through the window of a small garden shed. Standing on a workbench was a large tin, clearly marked weed killer, poison. I quickened my steps to the house. Approaching the front door, I, I could now see the gardens which lay at the back. When I saw a large ornamental fish pond, my stomach turned over. Weed killer? Water? Coincidence again? I rang the bell. Good evening. You must be Mr. Price. Uh, yes, that's right. I, I'm sorry I'm a little early. Oh, that doesn't matter. I haven't quite got the children settled yet, but do come in. Thank you. Actually, I'm rather glad you are early. Oh. I haven't had a chance to tell him about this portrait business oh. yet. But I'd I'd like to explain about my husband. Well, is he ill? Oh no. No, not physically, but but he's well, he's become depressed. Oh. Uh, about life in general, so so he, he may give you the wrong impression. But, uh, how, how do you mean? Well, he's always been such a happy, easygoing person. No temperament at all. Not like me. And he's changed? Oh, yes. Yes, totally. 
he's moody, he's irrational, and... Uh, he's never been bad-tempered with me and the children for no reason, but now Miss he... Knight, how long has this been going on? Oh, about three weeks. Three? I, I can't understand it. it. It happened almost overnight. Three weeks, I see. But uh, does he want to talk about it? I mean, communicate... Oh, or... no. No, that, that's just it. He, he takes himself off to his study and sits there for hours, alone. Well, perhaps he's overworked. Maybe he needs a holiday. Oh, we tried that a week ago. Was he any better? Much. But within a few hours of being home, he, he was just the same. Oh, I'm so worried about him. Do forgive me, Mr. Price, letting my hair down to a complete oh, stranger. Please, not at all. You, you've actually been a great help. If there's anything I can do... Well, I... as a matter of fact, I hope things may be improving. Oh? Yes, just before you arrived, Peter insisted he took the children's bedtime drink to them. <laughs> he almost threw me out of the kitchen. Mr. Smythe, where is he now? <laughs> He's in the kitchen making it. The kitchen door opened and Peter Smythe walked out, carrying a tray. There were two mugs of milk on it. I knew that I had to stop him, so I edged to the foot of the stairs. Quickly, I thought, if I held out my hand as if to shake his, I could easily send the tray flying onto the floor. Darling, this is Mr. Price. He wants Get to... out of my way. How do you do, Mr. Smythe? Oh, you stupid bloody Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, what must you think of me? Oh, please. please. Please, it was an accident. Don't you give me. Don't you, don't you. Uh, may I help clear up the mess? No, I... no, no, really. I oh, I'll I'm do it. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Smythe. Look, I, I know this is hardly the time, but I I really must talk to your husband about that portrait. Yes, of course. Where did he go? Into the study. There's the portraits there, too. Thank you. We crossed the hall to the study. The door was closed. Darling. Darling, someone to see you. Peter? Peter Smythe was sitting at the desk, his back towards us staring up at the portrait of Nathaniel Blackwell. In a second, I recognized the same smell of evil in that room, and I... I suddenly felt afraid. Peter, do you feel all right? He sprang out of his chair and turned to face us. In his hand, he held a small hatchet. Peter, what is... He moved swiftly like an animal around the desk. You bitch! You whore! I hate you! Peter! What's the matter with Quickly, you? Quickly, I moved between him and the desk, and standing behind him, grasped both his wrists. Whore! Whore! I hate oh, you! Peter, please! You struggled with me, but I clung on. Finally, I managed to wrench the shit out of his grasp. As I swung round, my eyes met those of Nathaniel Jeremiah Blackwell, and in a split second, I knew either that portrait must be destroyed, or we should be... His evil was still alive, dominating, commanding. Then Peter Smythe, with a lunatic strength, threw himself at me. I shouted to his wife, hold him, hold him, keep him back. It's the portrait. I must destroy that portrait. Hold him. Oh, God, hold God. You fool. Leave that portrait alive. Peter, stop him. He ripped his hands around her neck. Quickly, I struck the portrait. With the first blow, Peter Smythe released his wife cried out in pain and reeled around the room. I struck at Blackwell's eyes, his nose, his mouth, his chest. I felt possessed, overwhelmed by anger and hate. But Smythe, his strength ebbing away with each blow, began to whimper like an animal. Finally, the picture cord gave way and Nathaniel Jeremiah Blackwell slid to the floor. <laughs> No, no. No, Mrs. Smythe, he's not dead. Just wait a moment. Be patient. No, no we must... We must get a doctor quickly, No, please. no, no. There's no need for that. Your husband has simply been... released. Mm. Oh, Peter. Oh, thank God. Oh, darling. What... What happened? You... You... Nothing happened, Mr. Smythe. Oh. Hmm? Will he... Remember, do you think? Only as one remembers a nightmare. At first, a few details will remain clear. And then gradually, in time, all will be forgotten. 
And by you too, Mrs. Smith. Uh, I haven't hurt you. Have I done it? No, my love. You haven't. Not you. What strange powers a painting can have. Sometimes good. But in the case of Nathaniel Jeremiah Blackwell, evil. Hours later, after I'd burned what remained of the canvas, I I told the Smythes the whole story. There was one thing I didn't tell them, however, but I'll, I'll tell you. When the portrait crashed to the ground and Peter Smythe lay exhausted in his wife's arms, just the vermilion paint of Blackwell's hunting jacket had come off the canvas and lined the knife edge of the hatchet. That was understandable. But why had so much appeared on my hands and streaked my wrists? Old paint should flake or powder. But this was wet, very wet. When I washed my hands a few moments later, I knew why. It wasn't paint. It was blood. Do any of you listening at home have portraits hanging on your walls? Are they of unknown cities? (laughs) Be careful how you look at them. You never know. Goodbye. was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear with Elizabeth Morgan, Douglas Blackwell and Alexander John. This story, Lot 132, was first recounted and dramatized by Elizabeth Morgan and produced Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello. Let's call our story Meeting in Athens. So, how better to evoke the right atmosphere than with a little Greek music? It was August, and I was in Athens. In high summer, with the blazing heat battering down on the city, Athens, this 5,000-year-old capital, the pride of that bygone ancient world whose wonders had gone to make up the glory that was Greece. I'd been in Yugoslavia on location working on a film, 
another of my excursions into the cinema's fantasy celluloid world. One more story of blood, horror, and the grotesque. But I'd thoroughly enjoyed myself playing in it. And when it was over, I decided to travel south to spend a little more time in the city which had taken its name from Athena, the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. That morning, like other tourists, I'd braved the heat to climb the height of the great limestone rock of the Acropolis, and I'd been strolling among what was left of the splendors of Greece's golden age. As I stood for a moment, looking over towards Mount uh, Hymetus, I, I heard someone approaching. Mark, I don't think we should. He won't mind. Excuse me, sir. I turned to see a young man and a young woman. I a guess so in their mid-twenties and a very good-looking couple. I hope you won't think we're intruding. Even though we are, of course. She was a tall, honey blonde, and although she was wearing one of the shortest mini-dresses I'd ever seen, there was an air of elegance about her. You probably don't remember me. There was something about him which seemed familiar. <coughs> he had dark hair, broad shoulders, and a muscular build shown to advantage by the denim shorts and open neck shirt which he wore. I'm Mark Haxton. Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, at, at times like these, I always believe there's just one thing to do. Be honest and apologize for my bad memory. I'm sorry. Oh, dear, we've embarrassed you. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, there's no need to be. None at all. Well, this is Gillian Gilroy. I'm delighted, Miss Gilroy. <laughs> I know for sure that you and I have never met before. I couldn't possibly have forgotten it if we had. What a nice thing to say. No, I'm just being honest, as I told you. Now, as for you, Mark, I... Well, I know we have met, but where was it exactly? In England, about four years ago. In England, huh? At Denwood Studios, when you were making that uh, film, Theatre of oh, Blood. Yes, of course, I've got it now. You worked on the picture, too, didn't you? That's right. Yeah, well, that's one way of putting it. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You were second assistant on it, isn't that so? Yes. Or in other words, messenger boy and general dog's body. <laughs> the lowest form of life. <laughs> oh, we all have to start somewhere, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Well, it's nice to see you again. What are you doing with yourself these days? Are you still in the film business? Uh, no. I'm working in television now as a floor manager. <laughs> Which I've heard called the second lowest form of life. So I imagine you could say it's a step up for him. And that is spoken from a great height, you'll notice. The rarefied atmosphere only breathed by doctors' receptionists. Sarcasm will get you nothing, except perhaps a clip over the ear. <laughs> <laughs> I found them two very likable young people. They were in Athens on holiday, I learned. In fact, this was their last day. So I invited them to have a drink with me and took them back to my hotel, the Grand Bretagne, on Constitution Square. Well, here's to your safe flight back to London tomorrow. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> what time did you plane leave? Oh, after lunch. Around three, isn't it, Mark? Uh, hang on and I'll check. I've got a note of it here in my diary. Um, ah, yes. A quarter past three, to be exact. You and your diary. I've never known anyone like him, Mr. Price. Oh, please, Vincent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Do you know, he makes notes of absolutely everything. You should see what he's got in the front there. Name and address. Car registration number next of kin, his national insurance number, and Lord knows what else. Even his blood group. It's just a safety precaution, that's all. Well, supposing I'm in an accident sometime and need a transfusion. Oh, yes, of course. That's very sensible of you, Thank as a matter you. of fact. Let's hope it never happens. <laughs> hmm? And especially not tomorrow. Oh, don't say anything like that. She's always a trifle nervous about flying. Oh, it's too bad, though, having to go back on Wednesday. Why? Is uh, Gillian nervous about Wednesdays as well? <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. It's only that next Sunday would be better. The point is that neither of us is actually due back at work until the Monday. Oh, I follow. Mm. Oh, three more days here would be great. There's so much to see, we've hardly scratched the surface. Well, then why do you have to leave? Needs must when the money runs out. Jill has put us on a very tight budget. Now you know what we agreed, darling. Oh, sure. Economy is the watchword, all in the interests of next spring. And what <laughs> happens next spring, if I'm allowed to ask? <laughs> Church bells and orange blossom, the full bit. You're getting married. <laughs> well, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yes, I finally got him round to it. I have a suggestion to make. I, I think we might celebrate next spring a little in advance. Hmm? With a bottle of champagne. Champagne? Oh, that's a 
sweet thought, but well, no, we no, couldn't possibly. No, of course not. We can't allow you My to. dear Mark, you can't stop me. I insist. Waiter! Waiter! The champagne was good, and their company was lively. And the next hour passed by most agreeably. All in all, a very pleasant chance encounter. When they got up to go, I expected that to be the last I'd see of Arthur of them. But I was to be proved wrong. Later that afternoon, Gillian and Mark wandered into the National Gardens. They found themselves a bench by a small, secluded pool where the broad leaves of water lilies lay floating on the sun-speckled surface of the water. Oh, this is the life. Champagne at midday and then just blazing in the sun. Oh, lovely. It's so peaceful here. You're right. Actually got the place to ourselves. Except for that one chap on the next bench along. And the pigeons. <laughs> Listen to them. Do you notice? They've got their own accent. Nothing of the sort. Pigeon talk is international. No, it's not. Can't you hear the difference? These birds go... Carol? Carol? The ones in London say, Q, Q, hip your cockney. <laughs> you know something, you're a nut. <laughs> ah, but no, mister. The young lady's completely correct. The man from the nearby bench had leaned forward. He was clearly Greek, of middle age, inclined to stoutness with a balding head, a round face, and a neat, clipped moustache. He rose and came towards them, fanning himself with his straw hat. Uh, forgive me, but I cannot help hearing what you say. And you agree with me? Certainly. These are Greek pigeons. Naturally, they speak their own language. All right, I'll go quietly. Besides, it's too hot to argue. Yes, very hot. Uh, you like the heat, eh? Uh, you are tourists. That's right. This is your first time in Athena. Uh, in Athens. Yes. You like our city? Well, that's putting it mildly. We're only sorry to be leaving. Ah, uh, you go so soon. Mm. Tomorrow, more's the pity. But perhaps there will be another time, eh? And you will come back. Just give us half a chance. I wonder if we could ask you for a little advice. We'd like to find somewhere to have dinner tonight. And ah. Nothing expensive. Just a genuine Athenian place. Where there's real Greek dancing. Yes, I understand. Uh, let me think. Uh, yes, I know of such a tavern. Oh. Right. I will make a proposal. I will take you there tonight to eat with me. You are my guest. Oh, no, we couldn't hear of that. It's very nice of you, but... Uh, but I do not give you the choice. Or else, I do not tell where it is, you see. Oh, now, please. Oh, the young people today, always so proud. Please. Very well. Then we are going, uh, uh, how do you put it? As the Dutch? <laughs> okay, we go Dutch. That's a deal. Excellent. Now we fix up where we will meet and the time. Eh? The hospitable stranger arranged to pick them up in his car outside the gates of the gardens at nine o'clock that evening. His name, he told them, was Yanis. That was his first name. The rest of it, he said, was very Greek, very long, and far too difficult for them to pronounce. Oh, it certainly was. There's no doubt about the Greek men when it comes to dancing. So you like this place, eh, Miss Gilroy? Oh, yes, Yanis. We're terribly grateful to you. And the meal? You enjoyed it? Fabulous food. And I love your custom of going into the kitchen and making our own choice of what to eat. Oh, yes, I'm all for that. I I'll tell you what else I like. All the ornaments they've got around the place. Those little statues and carvings. They look terribly ancient, but I don't imagine they really are. <laughs> oh, oh, you are right. All of them are fake. In this city, it is a flourishing industry. The fake and the illegal, the black market, you understand? For a price, anything can be obtained. Uh, yes, whatever you wish, you can get it. Let us say a false passport. Or counterfeit coins, mosaics, figures, statues, 
anything that you desire. Good heaven. I say we finished our wine. Let's have another bottle, shall we? Mm. Look, I have a better idea. We will go to a party. A party? Yes, a friend of mine. He has a fine villa by the sea. Tonight he's giving a party. We will go. Oh, I don't really think we can. You will like. Plenty of people, interesting people. Writers and doctors, students, actors, all kinds of people. With plenty of music, plenty of pride. Oh, sounds like fun. But, Mark, it's getting quite late already. And we're leaving tomorrow, don't forget. There's all that packing to do. We'll have tons of time for that. And a party is the perfect way to round off the holiday. Now, you're not going to be a wet blanket, are you, Jilly? No. No, of course I'm not. Yanis, we'd love to come. Good. Very good. Here, Jilly. Oh, there you are. I wondered where you'd got to. I'm just circulating. <laughs> Quite a party, isn't it? Yes, but we oh, ought to be going. Singer. Oh, she really is something. Not only that, but she can sing, too. Oh, it sounds as if I'm just in time. <laughs> what do you mean? To drag you away. No, no, there's no hurry. Oh, darling, do you know the time? It's nearly three in the morning. But I've got a headache, all that noise and cigarette smoke. Poor old Jilly. Look, why don't you go back to the hotel, take a couple of tablets and get yourself to bed? I'll uh, roll up later. Ma. And I won't be drunk, that's a promise. But, darling, aren't you forgetting that tomorrow we have don't to pack and get... Don't you worry about no. tomorrow. You know something? That stuff Yanis was telling us about in the taverna. Well, according to a couple of fellows I've been talking to in there, he was dead right. Mm -hmm. In this celebrated cradle of civilization, there's a market for just about anything. Even something I could offer. You? Yes. You name it, they've got a market for it. Oh, what of it? Just that I've got a notion that we can have those three extra days after all. I think we'll be able to stay till Sunday with no cheese pairing either. What do you mean? Uh -huh. Ask no questions and you'll be told no lies. Hey, you're not going to get mixed up in anything illegal. I said no questions, Jilly. Or could it be something to do with that girl? The singer. Nothing like love for sale, <laughs> my dear. Don't you trouble your beautiful head about it. Now, come on. Let's find Yanis and organize some transport back to the city for you. There are bound to be people driving back in the next few minutes. It was the following day, Wednesday, at some time after half past twelve, that the phone rang in my room at the hotel. Hello. Mr. Price? Yes. Vincent? Y yes, who's that? Oh, it's Gillian. Gillian Gilroy. Oh, hello, Gillian. How nice hearing from you. I'm terribly sorry to ring you this way, but I just don't know what to do, who to turn to. Oh, my dear girl, what's the matter? Oh, may I come up and see you? Please. I'm phoning from downstairs. I'm in the foyer. But of course. Come straight on up. When I opened the door to her, I... I hardly recognized her as the self-composed young woman I had met only the day before. Oh, please. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me bothering you like this. Look, don't be silly, Jillian. Come along in and tell me what's wrong. It's Mark. I'm nearly going out of my mind. I don't know where he is or what's happened to him. He's disappeared. I sat her down and gave her a large brandy and listened while she told me the whole story from the beginning. When I left the party, some woman gave me a lift and dropped me not far from our hotel. I took a couple of pills and fell into bed. And when I woke up, Mark wasn't there. There was no sign of him. But, Gillian, I... It was I... quite late, half past ten, and his bed hadn't been slept in. Well, but if it was one of those all-night parties, perhaps he just stayed on. But if he'd done anything like that, he'd have phoned me, certainly by half past ten. Did you check at your reception desk in, in case he left a message? Well, of course, not a word. I stayed there in our room, waiting. And then I realized that last night, everything that happened was like a complete blank. I, I don't understand. Well, can't you see? I don't know a thing about where we went or who any of the people were. The taverna, the villa, everyone who was at that party. I have no way of finding them. But surely you were introduced to some of the other guests at the party. Oh, some of them, yes, but only by their first names. Well, now do you understand what I mean? Yes, I, I think I do. Oh, I'm so frightened. Now try to take it easy, Jill. Oh, I can't. It's been growing and growing on me. It's what made me come to you. Well, I'm very glad that you did. There's no one else I know here. 
I can't speak the language. What am I to do? I even thought of the British consul, perhaps. Yes, yes, yes. But all they do, I think, is to get in touch with the local police. And we can take a shortcut there. How? Well, as it happens, there's a police officer in Athens whom I know rather well. I, I met him a year or so ago when I was making a film here. His name is Costas Pelides. He speaks very good English. Hmm, yes, I... I think he's just the man we need. Costas Pelides was younger than you'd expect a police officer to be. He was tall and lean with dark, watchful eyes and a polite but cool manner. While Gillian went through the whole story again for him, he made notes with a gold pen in a small Moroccan leather notebook. And that is all, Miss Gilroy? Yes. Thank you. You have given me a description of Mr. Haxton. Do you have, perhaps, a photograph? No. Uh, wait a minute. I've got his passport here. Ah, very good. Thank you. Hmm. That doesn't really do him justice. Passport photographs never do, do they? Costas, what do you think this is all about? It is too soon for thinking, my friend. Uh, Miss Gilroy, what was he wearing, please? Oh, just a shirt and a pair of slacks. Uh, the trousers were sky blue and it was a floral shirt. Pink. Very colorful. You have any other documents, papers, anything of it? Well, there's his diary. I put it in my handbag along with his passport. Here you are. Ah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Haxton had no old friends in Athens, to your knowledge. No, none at all. No, it was their first visit to Athens. Ah, so. What about that man they met, Yanis? Any chance of getting a line on him? <laughs> Try to answer that for yourself, my friend. Oh, yes. Yes, I see what you mean. Just a first name. And it is a very common one in Greece. Yeah. But we will make our inquiries. We will give out a description and check with all the hospitals. Hospitals? Oh, God. It is routine, Miss Gilroy. I understand you've cancelled your flight. So where will you be that I can contact you? At the same hotel? No. No, she'll be here with me. Oh, no, really. I, I couldn't of ask you. Of course you can, Jim. And we'll keep in touch with your hotel in case Mark shows up. Very good. Yes. Uh, then I will go now. Well, I'll see you out. Goodbye, and thank you. Costas, what's your opinion? Of what? Well, that business about the boy having found some way for them to stay here a bit longer. The black market. This is a big city, my friend, like any other. It contains bad people, like any other. Cheap and tricksters and criminals. Yes, of course. It also contains many young women, often very beautiful. And he is a young man. The singer at the party, you think? Who knows? But he talked about having something that... Well, something that he could offer. Just so. Oh, no, no, no. He didn't give me that kind of impression. Oh, well, perhaps not. But we of the police, my friend, we live in a strange world, and in it, people are the most strange things of all. I have seen much that is extraordinary. Much that you would not believe if I told you. The time dragged by, each hour stretching out till it seemed like a day, with no news of Mark and no word from Costas. I could see the fear and tension mounting in Gillian at every passing moment. Suddenly she announced she wanted to go to the National Gardens. I went with her. It was here, by the pool. We were sitting on that bench. So that's why we were here. You were hoping to find that man, Yanis. I thought maybe... No, I don't know what I thought. Well, it was worth trying, and at least it's pleasant here in the sun. Oh, no, it's cold. It's so cold. Oh, Jillian. That's the most awful thing of all. To stand here in the bright sunlight and know all the time... That something horrible has happened to him. But you can't know that. Not for sure. But I do. I know it. I can feel it. You don't understand. It's not just that Mark and I were going to be married. It's more than that. In what way exactly? The last two years we've been living together. We've been so close. Closer than anyone could imagine. That's why I know, you see. Take my hand. Feel it. It's like ice. You poor child. Do you believe me now? Come on. I'm going to get you back to the hotel. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. Whatever's happened, it's something terrible. 
It's something I can't even put a name to, but that... <laughs> it was close to midnight that the telephone call came from Costas Pelidis. A body had been taken out of Prius Harbor an hour before. It fitted the description of Mark Haxton. I offered to go alone to make the identification, but Jillian insisted upon coming with me. The small room at the mortuary was tiled in white. A hard white light shone down on a rubber wheel trolley covered with a white sheet. Costa stood beside it, a corner of the sheet, held in one hand. You are ready, Miss Gilroy? Yes. Well? Yes. It's Mark. His eyes were closed. His dark hair made an incredible contrast to the rest of him. For the motionless body was pale, not just with the pallor of death, but a chill, terrifying whiteness, which echoed the white of the tiles and the light and the sheet. He looked like a waxwork. Perhaps you had better go now, Miss Gilroy. No, not yet. Cost. What in heaven's name has been done to him? Look at the forearms, my friend. You see? The punctures? Yes. Needle marks, is that what you mean? Just so. On the bend in the inside of each arm. It is the usual place. For junkies, drug addicts? Is that what you're saying? No, my friend. For blood donors. Oh, my God. But... Normally, it's just a pint or so, isn't it? With him... Yes, yes. With him, they must have drawn four and a half liters. That would be eight pints. Every drop that it was possible for them to take. In other words, they... They drained him. Yes. I have seen... Many dreadful things. But never anything so horrible as this. But why? For what reason? Look in his diary. Oh, gee. Oh, my dear, forgive me. Uh, for a moment, I... You forgot I was here. Yes. It doesn't matter. I told you that. The reason is in his diary. His blood group. Isn't that it, Mr. Pelides? Yes, it is a very unusual group. AB rhesus negative, very rare. From a special clan with the same group whose life could be saved by... It, it would fetch big money. Very big money, my friend. And this city, like any other, contains those who need such money to buy drugs to satisfy their craving. And that... That is what he had to offer. They must have told him that it would be only a pint. Perhaps two at the most. But you see... All he wanted was another three days here. Just three more days. And it cost him his life's blood. Oh, Mark. Mark. I took Gillian Gilroy back with me to the Grand Bretagne. She was given a room and put to bed with a sedative. In my own room, I found an urgent cable waiting for me from my agent, asking for an immediate reply. I was offered the title role in a new film to be called The Blood Master. I threw the cable into a drawer. Just then, I'd had more than enough of the subject. That was Vincent Price, bringing you The Price of Fear, with Kate Coleridge, 
Steve Plytus, Michael Deacon, and Robin Brown. Meeting in Athens was first recounted by Charles Birkin, who called it so cold, so pale, so fair. The story was dramatized by Morris Travers and produced. Hello and welcome. Just one simple adjective would suffice to sum up the character of Henrietta Forsyth, dominating. To control, to have dominion over. It was her lodestone, her raison d'etre. Immensely wealthy from birth, an heiress in her own right, she possessed an unswerving instinct for multiplying that wealth. It would have been a foolhardy stockbroker indeed who did not keep at least one wary eye on Forsyth Holdings. Holdings. The term was as appropriate as it was all-embracing. She held in the palm of her hand shipping, printing, textiles. These were the makings of her empire. An empire over which she yielded despotic control. She was also a cripple. The exact nature of her disability was a mystery. Her enemies, and they were legion, claimed she simply indulged herself in her wheelchair image. It became her throne. For those of her loyal subjects forced to look up to it, just one more symbol of her power and despotism. But for her own more immediate entourage, particularly her recently acquired husband, Carlos Mendoza, it stood for something more. Half her age, South American with an aristocratic background but no private means, Henrietta had simply indulged herself in him. A thoroughbred stallion. For his part, Carlos had reckoned he could accept the terms of the arrangement, but it was not to be. With the passing of time, he could only dwell on his own inadequacy, his own pathetic dependence on her. It was a throne that had to be toppled. Evelyn, I thought we'd arranged to slip down to the village for a drink. Well, as you can see, her highness arranged otherwise. But she had no way of knowing, surely. Do I detect a certain panic in his mind? All voice? I meant was, as far as we're concerned... As far, but no further. How do I it sums it up? Oh, well, doesn't it? It's just that well, I'm... Put your I... mind at rest, she doesn't know. A certain instinct, perhaps, hence the chores... There's nothing that couldn't have waited, but idle hands. Idle work, I know. Hello, the company. Mm hmm? The damn great roars parked outside the front. The oh, Harley Street Brigade. Sorry. Oh, the medical fraternity come a visiting. I thought she'd booted oh, out. Oh, please. This one comes highly recommended. He also has a knighthood, which probably means he'll last at least a fortnight longer than any of the rest. <laughs> Ring for tea, will you? Yes. The great man must just have about earned his hundred guineas worth. You know the hell she pays if it isn't served promptly on the stroke of four. Come here. I said come here. Yeah. Oh, hasn't God us being just a trifle foolhardy? Yeah, yeah. Caution to the wind. 
There are times when there just doesn't seem to be any alternative. No choice. As far as Henriet and I are concerned, for God's sake, you know the way things stand. Oh, as well as anybody. Better than most. Signed, sealed, delivered. For God's sake! You're making it sound as damned official as one of those dreary contractual agreements I've just been sifting through. If you want to put it like that... Well? Well, it doesn't hurt anymore. How could it? Henrietta spent half her waking hours reminding me of the fact. Come in. Thank you, Lucy. Shall I pour? No, better wait. Thirty seconds to count down. Hello. Seems we're to lose our illustrious medical gent. We're certainly not to be invited into the menage. Send Dr. Crippen packing and think what we'll save on the Darjeeling. Carlos. Yes, Ingrid. If we'd met. Before. Oh, yes. Do you think things might have been. Stop. You can start boring now. Get on cue. Open the door, then. Or are you under the impression you're working for an ox Go, then. Go. Leave me to my own pathetic devices. Let me bring you to the table, dearie. Your tea, Mrs. Mendoza. <laughs> Think so, too. <laughs> All right, darling. Too much sugar, too little milk, given up expecting. <laughs> Why the extra cup? We thought the doctor might be joining us. No, an urgent summons. Some dreary duchess with a tempting migraine. How did the consultation go, anyway? <laughs> consultation, no <laughs> less. My, aren't we being grand? Well, he was suitably solicitous, come of sequence. The usual quack twaddle. A change of scene. Get away from it all. Well, he could be right. He was. That's why I'm following his instructions. Oh? Did you know they just couldn't a liner after me? You did mention. The SS for five. He doesn't, wasn't he? Of course, the fact that I own the line might just have had something to do with it. Anyway, a maiden voyage bound for South America sails in a week. <laughs> Even will make all the arrangements. South America? Oh, Carlos, darling, such a glum little face. I should have thought you'd be delighted. <laughs> a chance to reacquaint yourself with your roots. Essential we never forget our roots, isn't it? <laughs> ah! Now I can see Evelyn has something on her little mind. Only to ask if you'll be wanting me to accompany you. What? Oh, it'll be top priority, my dear. One of the family. Just me, you, and Carlos. All the comforts of home. <laughs> Carl and you? Yes. Stop looking like a little boy just caught filtering the dram and uh, pass me one of those patty sandwiches. Hmm. I am sorry to have to trouble you with such wearisome domestic arrangements, Captain. I realize what I have to say is probably very much a purse's territory, but at my wife's insistence, say I... Say to the top man. Well, in Miss Forsyth's case, I'm sure we can make the exception. Thank you. As I expect you've been made aware that my wife is in, uh, shall we say, a somewhat delicate state of health? Well, I'm sure we'll be able to cope with any medical eventuality. But you may still remain unaware that the nature of her condition has in recent years made her into a, shall we say, something of a recluse. Privacy and anonymity are of the essence. I see. For that reason, she has asked me to decline her customary place at the captain's table, preferring to spend the voyage almost exclusively in the confines of her own suite. As she prefers. My wife is constantly attended by her personal secretary, Miss Vincent, so the need for steward service will be minimal. If you would prefer, we could change the original arrangements and offer Miss Vincent accommodation on the same deck, an adjoining cabin even. No, no, no. One deck below will be perfectly adequate, Captain. Availability without proximity. 
The cruise being in the nature of a second honeymoon, my wife and I would prefer... But then I'm sure you'll understand. Perfectly. <laughs> it's almost as though she isn't aboard my ship at all. Yes, it is. Isn't it? Which I find utterly unnecessary and faintly ridiculous. Self-imposed exile, my pet. And why on earth should you? If only because I predicted it would happen right from the outset. Did you really? I don't recall. Even on our honeymoon. Ah. <laughs> Special circumstances. You know how you hate this damn stupid sheepball ritual. So I can enjoy myself all the more when we arrive. Oh, now, stop pouting and let me fix your tie. Bend down. Uh. Besides, not as though for one moment I expect you to incarcerate yourself as well. Far from it. I'll be perfectly happy on my little own while you can... <laughs> what? Well, now, how would the glossy brochure put it? Enjoy the vicarious delights of this floating pleasure drone. Ah, there we are. And come back here to suffer the petulant consequences? Your jacket needs brushing. Anyway, nothing of the kind. Why? I brought Sweet Evelyn along. I don't see where the hell Sweet Evelyn comes into it. Why did you bring her along anyway? We can't always be thinking only of ourselves, darling. God knows I worked the poor girl hard enough. Think of it as a reward. A golden opportunity to bring her out of herself. Knock some of the edges off her somewhat dowdy image. (laughs) I'm relying on you for that, darling. Are you? But you know I am. I'll just finish dressing. Come. I hope I'm not intruding. Well, the dinner call went some time ago. So it did, my dear. Carlos, you're keeping Evelyn waiting. Your supper tray. <laughs> will you have it now? Oh, just put it down. Any old place will do. <laughs> but you seem rather nervous. You what? Yes, I suppose so. Well, you've no need to be. <gasps> that new dress suits you to perfection. Quite the bell of the ball. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree, Carlos? Of course he would. <laughs> Carlos, mm. be a pet. Get my silly trinket box from the bedroom. If I might suggest, I think something at the throat. Oh, no, no, I couldn't <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. Now, what about this? The very thing. <laughs> Carlos, dear, mm. fix the glass for Evelyn. <laughs> I insist. Now, stand back and let me inspect the pair of you. Oh, perfection. Positive perfection. Good evening. Ah, good evening, Captain. Good Good evening. evening. May I inquire after Miss Forsyth? She's fine. Uh, decided on a supper tray and an early night. But everything to your own satisfaction. Perfect. If you'll excuse me then. Perfect. Really is. Isn't Perfect. Whereas the liner moved south to Carlos and Evelyn, so it seemed. Humanist day, intimate evening. Perfect. Because... This is what Henrietta had allowed it to be, meant it to be. Oh, the young couple might have felt a certain sense of suspicion, guardedness to begin with, but Henrietta was far too wily a trapper not to have allowed for that. As the relationship blossomed, she seemed to grow even less aware that anything was amiss. Carlos was encouraged to invite Evelyn back for a nightcap before retiring to her own quarters. A chance to catch up on the evening's excursion, the shipboard gossip. It became a ritual, and when Henrietta started retiring early, leaving the young things to their own resources, well, that became ritual too. But of an altogether more intimate and dangerous nature. Mm. 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 No, no, Carlos. Mm. Not in the corridor, not here. What's dangerous? Then invite me in. Just for a minute. 
Only to do oh, good. Yes, I want to. Oh, no. Well, then. Well, then. Oh. She'll be expecting you back. Sleep. No way of knowing. How has it go? Shh. Here, let me. Darling will forgive my inexcusable lap. How? I walked. Oh. I quite simply put one little foot in front of the other and walked. Well, no way I could have maneuvered that ridiculous wheelchair down several flights of stairs. What there? No, of course there wasn't. You knew that. Counted on that. So, I walked. Oh, my God. With the aid of... Well, no, I don't even need the aid of this ridiculous tick any longer. Here, dear Darling boy, you have it. Catch. Congratulate me, then. How long have you been able to? Several weeks before embarkation. The moment I despaired of doctors, I cured myself. Nothing miraculous. The motive, you see. Motive? To keep an eye on you, darling. And your very own dear, dear darling, of course. Uh Why, I suggested, insisted on the cruise. Nothing like a cruise for revealing, shall we say, suppressed. Intimacies. I carried on with the wheelchair image. It helped no end. Poor, pathetic Henrietta, wheelchair bound, confined to her cabin. It made you drop your guard, confirm what I'd really suspected. We were going to tell you. Tell me. Tell me what? That at long last you found love, accepted responsibility, grown to manhood. <laughs> oh, not that, for God's sake. Not with all the goodwill in the world can good, poor, duped Henrietta be expected to follow that. Please. Please, what? Deny the evidence of my own eyes, ears, thwarted experience of the child. Don't ask it. Not even poor, duped Henrietta can be expected to deny that. Snivelling brat. Child man. And his pathetic, washed out Please, don't. Bought, paid for. Raised from the gutter to be returned to the gutter. The un... Cuddable stud and his whinging horn. Please. Past prime, burnt out a coin. A plaything. To be taken from his shelf, patted and petted. No. Made or broken. When I decide. Never before. Only when I. I. Stop I, it. I, Stop I, it. I, Stop it. Stop it. Blanket, towel, something to cover my head. Anything. Something the captain said. It's almost as though she isn't aboard my ship at all. It was, wasn't it? Alone, kept apart, untroubled, never seen. The way she wanted it. Between us, we can still keep it like that. Business as usual. No one need ever know. Just the way we all want it. And it really is what we want, isn't it? Hmm? Hmm? Huh? Yes, yes. But eventually that bound to discover. The mortal remains? Hmm. Not so easy. And not over the side, that's for sure. She never ventured on deck. Hmm. Cripple in a bath chair, five foot high... Guardrail, no. Certainly not over the side. So only one alternative, really. Carlos? We get her back to her cabin, my love, 
and store her until we get to the other side. His pronouncement was as decisive as it was matter-of-fact, made without any feeling of self-doubt, almost in the nature of a tiresome chore that had to be effected in the best interests of all concerned. Came the next morning, and a confidence, a nonchalance, had already asserted itself when he eventually presented himself in the captain's cabin, the purpose of his visit seemed social, almost incidental. My dear Captain, how kind. <sighs> now, where was I? Uh, something concerning Miss Forsyth. Oh, yes, 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 how stupid. Well, last evening, though quite late, I think, uh, anyway, a totally impetuous whim for a breath of fresh air, sea breezes, totally unobserved, of course. Well, moon on the water, stars, and with it being in the nature of a second honeymoon, embarrassing to admit, but I am sure that a man of the world, I'm sure you understand. <laughs> of course. How kind. And needless to say, uh, I warned her about the chill of the night air. Yeah? In these latitudes, after the heat of the day. My, my very point, sir. But her determination being what it is... She's not sick. If you'd like me to send the medical officer. No, no, no. Perfectly hale and hearty. Uh, then I don't quite understand how I can help. My wife's furs, Captain. Furs? Quite idiotically, her companion labeled the trunk as not wanted on the voyage. Naturally, they were, of course, dispatched to your cold storage hold. I see. Well, in view of last night's escapade, it now appears that they are very much wanted. The odd stall, at least. And my wife requested that... But uh, normally, such a hold would be sealed and not reopened until we reached our destination. Understood? Perfectly. My very words to her. Unfortunately, the dear lady's resolve can extend to matters altogether more chilling than the night air. I see. Metal minutes, the item selected, the trunk returned from whence it came. When would it be most convenient? But, my dear Captain, the convenience is all yours. <laughs> possibly go wrong. Please don't look so tense, my dear. People will think we're something to hide. Mind if I smoke? What did keep you? Hmm? Oh, nothing in particular. The captain needed just the tiniest arm twist and it was plain sailing. And the old fool would try making amends by pouring large measures of scotch down me. Anyway, I don't sooner got back to the cabin than the steward fellow arrived with the trunk. Mm. I didn't ask him in. It might all have come as a rather nasty shock to him. And were you able to... Eventually. Tight squeeze, as a matter of fact. Poor Henrietta. A sedentary life, you know. She never did give a damn about poundage. I had to give the steward a helping hand to get it back on his little trolley thing. But he must have noticed. The faintest trace of a bushy, raised eyebrow. Some surplus stuff we found we need never have packed in the first place, I said. The large tip did the rest. And now? Now we keep the cabin door very firmly locked and behave exactly as we have always done business, as usual, just as if the dear departed were still with us. Routine. You check her share prices on the ticker tape machine, transmit her business transactions on the ship to shore, pass on her complaints about the breakfast tray, the same dull drugs. Well, you should be expert. And in three days' time, when we get to Rio? You take her place, my sweet. Heavily veiled, incognito to the very end, a tiresome complaining virago in a wheel. Gently trundled down a gangplank to a waiting private ambulance and from hence to the Baroque splendor of the Hotel Majestica. Oh, one small point. The eccentric old dear will be taking a small attache case containing her liquid assets with her, of course. Jewelry, traveler's checks, the odd little extra that makes life worth living. But what if there are problems of passport control? My dear, a country that has given sanctuary to countless Nazis 
And the poorest economy in the world is hardly going to bother about admitting a sick, eccentric millionaire. When will you join me? After I've checked that all the luggage has been unloaded. I see. I'm sure you do. The trunk will come to the hotel with the rest of the stuff. We'll simply confine the great lady to her hotel suite until we decide to take a little drive into the interior. My dear Evelyn, do you have any idea of the size of this country? Huh? There's bound to be some little corn. Three days later, they dock. Everything as planned, exactly as planned. Evelyn, alias poor Henrietta, safely away. Now just Carl, alone, waiting patiently for the unloading of the rest of the luggage. A long wait, but resigned. It seems all his life he had been waiting for the right moment. Surely he can afford to wait just a little bit longer. But such a long, long wait. Ah, Mr. Mendoza. Oh, Captain, please. Uh, what the hell is a delay? Not totally unexpected, sir. I thought you'd have known. On the voyage out, Miss Forsyth gave instructions some of the crew were to be signed off on arrival. Hmm. Well, they got themselves a bit organized. Down tools, stopped unloading until something can be worked out. Any idea how long? Not the faintest, sir. If I were you, I'd cut along to your hotel. But the luggage... You... Oh, I know you're supposed to check all luggage through customs yourself, sir. But in Miss Forsyth's case... Well, pretty sure something can be arranged. No, I'll wait. I'd better wait. It was at that moment that Carlos looked up and saw it. High overhead on a derrick hung the trunk. No mistaking it. Her initials clearly visible even at this distance. The sun, high in the sky now, asserted itself. Asserted. Until the trunk, already moist with condensation, begins to thaw from the below freezing temperature of the cold storage. It was then that the first drop of her blood dropped. It splattered the immaculate whiteness of the captain's tunic. His glance followed Carlos's as the first flies began to gather. Evelyn did not stay long at the Hotel Majestica. It was never her intention to. No one paid her the slightest attention when she took the lift down to the foyer. A helpful bellboy offered to help her with the small black traveling case. But she seemed most determined to hold on to it herself. Once outside, she was soon lost in the throng. What was it that Carlos had told her on the ship? There's bound to be some little corner. That was Not Wanted on the Voyage. Starring Margaret Courtney as Henrietta, Shando Ellis, Carlos, and Sheila Grant, Evelyn. With Henry Stamper, the ship's captain. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William... Vincent Price presents Howell Bennett, Elizabeth Proud, and John Quayle in Out of the Mouths by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. Richard Atkins was a research buffin. If you were to ask him what kind, he might tell you, I specialize in electrospectroanalysis of human enzyme and molecular structures. And when you'd look suitably blank, he'd smile and add, what makes us tick? To understand Richard Atkins, the trick was not to let his modest manner fool you. At 40, he was probably the best in his field one of a very select research team. The world seemed his oyster. But then, the same world lost sight of him. Many years later, those caring enough to remember settled for, came a bit of a cropper, all a bit hush-hush under the carpet. Few knew the cropper was entirely of his own making. David! What the hell are you still doing here? Well, I just thought I'd hang on a bit, see how it went. My confrontation with the head, much as expected, all very low-keyed, civilized. 
so. A shoulder to cry on? If you wanted one. Touching. But don't you think I'm a bit old for all that? I'm thinking more along the lines of a drink. Improvement. This shouldn't take me long. Richard, what the hell are you doing? Clearing out my desk. But why? Well, can't it wait till tomorrow? It'll save me the extra trip in. Besides, I don't think I could stand all those raised eyebrows, querying glances, told you so from the less charitably inclined. It would only be... With my best interests at heart? If you like. I don't think I could take that either. Right? Right. Truth? Truth. Final tally. One box of paper clips. Three pencils, black, for the use of. Oh, two broken, so not for the use of. Assorted elastic bands come in handy. I can make tanks out of cotton reels and matches. <laughs> that brings back memories. Doesn't it just the... Uh... Just the caper for whiling away my premature retirement. Richard. Not pulling your weight, old fellow. Reasons best known to yourself, old fellow. But the whole project falling behind, old fellow. Rest of the team down, old fellow. Dee-da, dee-da, dee-da. That was in triplicate, wasn't it? Just about. Was that all he said? Mm, just about. Really rather touching, though. What? Whatever it was, he thought he was doing, poor old sod. So stewed in scientific jargon, anything approaching the human touch is quite beyond him. Ever the scientist. Options open right to the end. Oh? Showed me the door, but still didn't have the guts to slam it hard behind me. Oh? Losing a good man. Well, that's a fact. Big step, couple of weeks leave, time to think it over. That came in triplicate, too. Why, don't you? Right. I think I've earned that drink now. By the way, how's Rachel? She's fine. Just fine. It's been ages. Kate and I were wondering if you both found... Oh, for Christ's sake. I think we can skip the social devices, don't you? There's no need, David, old mate. For what? For whatever the hell it is you think you're doing. Richard, we're not just colleagues. We're friends. No hard feelings. But I don't think friendship comes into this. Not in the long run. A sounding board, then. Some kind of explanation. You owe it to me. Do I, Charles? Yes. Yes, I do, don't I? Let's face it, friend David. I was roped in on the project because they thought I could contribute something. They obviously still do. I could almost write them my end-of-term report. Reliable, diligent, though very occasionally restive, but perfectly manageable. Well? I just reached the point where I got sick of being diligent at the expense of being only occasionally rested. I see. You don't. And I'm not much better equipped to explain it. Just that recently, I've been staring down the wrong end of the microscope. So busy manipulating or trying to, so many pieces of the jigsaw, I've lost sight of the overall pattern of things. That's all. Go on. This great secret with all laughter. Evolution. The fountainhead. Call it what you like. Because the word hasn't been coined that could do it justice. But we've always considered it a process of growth. Growth. Growth physical, growth intellectual, growth spiritual. And I'm still scientist enough to put spiritual last. Well, I simply don't think of it as growth any longer. Deterioration. That's what we should be setting our sights on. But isn't that part of the same? No, I'm not talking about the inevitable cellular deterioration, gaga, second childhood. I'm talking about something altogether more subtle. The kind of deterioration induced by the education of a child. What I'm trying to say is at the very outset, in the very early stages, in a child's preformative years, you see, I suspect it's all there. All inherent awareness, absolute knowledge, already there, encapsulated. From birth, it obsesses me. If we could only catch the child early enough, before the educating process has begun. If we could somehow tap in, contrive to communicate with a newly born on its terms, not ours. God only knows, David, what it is we might tap into. And a little child shall lead them, if you like. 
prophetic, but hardly scientific. If you like, daunting, though, isn't that? Wouldn't even know where to begin. Let alone where it might end. I told you it was too early for words. Rachel was still up when Richard got home. He could have wished it otherwise. Concerned attention was the last thing he wanted. But behind her ministering was a feeling of something deeper, unspoken. As though she too had news she was finding it difficult to put into words. More coffee? Oh, no, thanks. It's coming out of my ears. How are you feeling? Death. I hoped you'd be tucked in before I got back. David rang. Do you warning? Typical. He meant it for the best. Typical. You've been very mute about it all. I thought that's what you wanted. It speaks volumes. It's not that I'm against any decision you decide to make. Wrong tense. But? I just think... That David might be right. He is your friend. Yes. He tried that tack, too. Well, why didn't you give yourself more time? <laughs> talk about it. What the hell is there to talk about? An instinct? You don't talk about instincts, Rachel. I just know that all these years I've been facing the wrong way. That's all. It doesn't follow I know where I'm going from here. And you'd risk everything you've achieved? Your reputation, your position, your home for that? Oh, God forbid I should ever risk my home. You know what I mean. If it's the roof over your head you're worrying about, he went with the job. But a year's get out either side, all right? Richard. They'll stick to their side of the bargain. You can count on it. There's only to see if I'll back down, come to heel. So, not much risk of your having to pitch a tent, doss under the arches just yet. Oh. All right. You think I'd mind if I had to? No. No, I don't. That's one of the reasons I married you. If I found it... Over anxious, petty. No, no. Concerned, then. What the hell about? Not for my own sake. Surely not for mine. Not for yours either, particularly. Well, then? We're going to have a child. Rachel? Rachel? <laughs> Your face! <laughs> A little child shall lead them, as the prophet said. That's the second time I've heard that today. Their child was a boy. Their decision to name it David was mutual. And by the time the christening party came around, any feeling of antagonism there might have been between Richard and his one-time colleague seemed as remote as if it had never happened. So glad you could come, David. It's my own godson's christening party. It'd be a rum old do without me. Besides, you named him after me. It'd be like missing your own launching. And all that stuff about setting him a Christian example. A bit below the belt, wasn't it? Lord only knows how I'm going to live up to it. I did think... What? You might prefer to opt out. Why on earth should I? Past behavior pattern? That's it, Gordon. Now, it was only a... Temporary lapse on your part. Was it? Water under the bridge. Is it? Which is more than could be said for these champagne bubbles. Turbulence. 
caused by areas of high pressure moving in to fill corresponding areas of low. That's a theory, isn't it? Or maybe you know better, eh? <laughs> We're both fine. You're disturbing Mumsy Wumsy. If you can't sleep, we better settle for a ten minute tour of the estate. <laughs> Rachel's call to David was brief, but behind her request that he come around as soon as possible, he sensed an underlying feeling of panic and urgency. Richard was out. Together they sat in the small kitchen, David listening intently. But Rachel was distant, far off, reliving that night of the storm. The almost hypnotic trance instilled in her husband by the wide, innocent eyes of the child. I must have dropped off to sleep again, David. I've no idea for how long. It might have been minutes, hours. I only know I woke up with a start. The side of the bed was empty. No sound from the nursery, but a, a feeling of... Yes? Coldness, a, a chill. Something I'd never known before. I called his name down the stairs, but he didn't answer. When I eventually found him, he was in the study, standing at the blackboard. Ordinary enough. Yes, but there was something about it that was almost... awesome. That's a funny word to use. But as though I was in the... the presence of... Of what, Rachel? He was holding young David in the crook of one arm. I couldn't see, but I knew instinctively the baby's eyes were open, wide open, staring into Richard's with a kind of fierce intensity one doesn't associate with a child. And Richard? Oh, totally unaware of me. He was writing on the blackboard. God knows I've watched him do that at all hours. Have to get it out of my head. The only way I can get back to sleep this time. One blackboard was filled already. He was halfway down the other. With what? Equation after equation. But when I looked closer, all the characters were unrecognizable. Lacking his usual neatness. Unmethodical, sprawling, line after line. Written with a terrifying urgency. But in the handwriting of a child, David the writing of a child. It was the baby who felt me there. A whimper of recognition, part sigh, but part warning. And the writing stopped. And Richard? We went back to bed. I nestled in his arms. Didn't even refer to it. Didn't you? I never felt the need. Till now... That's why I asked you over. Oh? It hasn't stopped, you see. Night after night. Not always with a baby in his arms. Sometimes in the cot at his side. But always. This telepathy between them. I just couldn't keep it to myself any longer. I needed you to see for yourself. Then how about now? Yes. All right, then. Through here. the door. Right. No chance of us coming back. Oh, not before lunch. He's taken young David down to the park. Let's get on with it, then. Well, what do you make of it? What's on the blackboard? What can one say? A child's draw, but no kind of formula. Related to his work when he was at the centre? No, not even remotely. Scientific. A mathematical progression of some kind, and yet beginning on this board in, in, in complexity... Diminishing, simplifying to end in just two indivisible symbols. Alpha, omega. Beginning, M. The life force. Why did you say that? I don't know. Is there any chance of you making me a copy of this? Oh, yes, I suppose so. As soon as you can, Rachel. As soon as you possibly can. 
She wondered whether to tell Richard of David's visit. Wondered, too, whether he sensed some deeper significance behind the casual manner with which she finally mentioned it. But if he did, he showed no outward sign of it. We had a visitor. Oh? David. Well, you hear that, young David? Godfather comes a-calling, and only mumsy wumsy here to receive him. What did he want? Nothing special. Just dropped by to see he's got something. We see. Where did he get to? We told her the park, didn't we? Oh, had great fun, didn't we? God knows when I found myself sitting on the swing last. Richard, he did. Did? Thinking of writing to the council. Adult Discrimination Act. Twenty-year-old age limit at the very least. You still wouldn't qualify, darling. What? Oh, sorry, I've forgotten your fork. I'll manage with a spoon. Don't be silly. I'd rather manage with the spoon. <laughs> now look what he's done. Naughty, naughty, Daddy. All over his best bib and tucker. You were warned. Bib and tucker, bib and tucker, bib and tucker, bib and tucker. <laughs> what? It would be only too easy to gloss over the weeks that followed. For Rachel, the overpowering imperative desire was to convince herself that everything was normal, that nothing untoward was happening, and that even if it wasn't, the real trouble lay in her own imaginings, that nothing in their lives had really changed, that Richard's affinity, this strange extra affinity he had with his son, unspoken, undeniable, was simply part of the process, part of becoming a father. She clung to the notion like a life raft. I only have to give him time. No, give myself time. If there's anything that needs questioning, it's my attitude. My ridiculous, jealous reaction to it all. As though my own son were some kind of a stranger. An intruder. The very notion of it appalled her. And so she had to find her consolation in the belief that her husband's behavior was simply a phase again. Of one thing she felt sure, no outside help was needed, especially from the likes of David, the meddling do-gooders. In fact, to be avoided at all cost. A period of togetherness, seclusion, away from the world was what they needed. But it was Richard, this knew Richard that resisted it, resisted with all his being. There was about him now an almost animal-like capacity for living she'd never known before, as though a contest between them, mental, but at the same time primevally physical. A morning dawned when she was forced to admit she was losing, that she no longer had any choice and as before, it was to David she turned. Rachel, are you all right? Come in, then. Thanks. I got your message, but when I rang back, I didn't recognize the voice, so I hung up. Yes. Richard said he thought it was probably you. Richard said? It didn't sound like him. Well, he's either got one hell of a cold or his voice is on the change. Come on through. What's all that racket? Oh, just kids. Coffee. No, thanks. Rachel, you've been avoiding this. Yes. That stuff on the blackboard, you've run into a brick wall, haven't you? We've fed it through the computer. And? A blank, beyond computer analysis. Thought as much. Honey, it doesn't even seem important now. He knew I gave it to you. You told him? Just knew. It didn't seem to upset him. Only part of the key was what he said. All in the eyes. He was smiling at the baby at the time. And the baby seemed to know what he was saying and smiled back. And now... Look. 
What is it, Rachel? Come here to the window. Well, tell me what you see. Richard. Hardly believable, is it? The change in him. Childlike. That's it, childlike. What the hell is he up to? Oh, the boy next door kicked his ball into the garden. In the old days, Richard would have tossed it back with a picking off of his trouble. Yes, sir. Look at him now. With a father instinct coming at him. You know that, isn't it? Competitive. Like equal. Would you believe he went out and bought a train set for young David? A bit premature. Oh, wasn't it, though? He's laid it out in the attic. Most nights now I wake to find his bed empty. I see. And that ridiculous tiny train rattling overhead. He always despised comic strips. A pet hobby horse with towards the child's ability to read. Now it's the first thing he goes to when he grabs the morning paper. Idiotic, isn't it? His eating habits have changed from savory to sweet. Would you believe lemonade and peanut butter sandwiches? His dress is more slovenly, his movements more awkward, more boisterous, as though... Well, look at him, David, look at me. Yes. You see it, too. Turning back the clock. I think somehow he's achieving it. The eyes, it's all in the eyes. That's what he said. And there's the two of them have developed some kind of extraordinary telepathy between them. Young David, Richard, the child, and the man. Enabling him to project himself backwards instead of forwards. Ultimate knowledge to absolute innocence. Backwards, ever backwards. Until... Until what? Dear God, who knows? Is it in yet, They had no ready-made label to stick on Richard's sickness, so they coined one, new minted pathological regression. They went through the processes, of course, psychoanalysis, mental therapy, deep hypnosis. But Richard's tragic condition deteriorated. They tried to save face by calling it prescribed inevitable. They could also have added doomed. One bright summer's morning, if you'd been up early enough, you'd have spotted the ambulance arriving outside the house. You'd also have seen a schoolboy dressed in a neat gray worsted suit, face beaming, hair slicked, as though for an outing. The nursing home attendant opened the ambulance's back door, but young Master Richard elected to sit up in the front. The accompanying doctor saw no reason to object. As they began to pull away, the boy gave a quick backward glance to an upstairs nursery window. Beyond it, the baby... Young David stirred in his crib and gave a smile of pure innocence. It, whatever it is that has been happening to me, has stopped. I myself have no doubt of the fact I do not need their sums and figures of my height and weight, or their little knowing nods and clicks of encouragement, as though it were all their doing. My journey of discovery has come to its end. A good breeze today. Later, they will let me take my sailing boat to the little pond in the grounds. I shall watch it fighting the elements and the rough seas. A week or so ago, they brought a young boy, David, here to see me. He might have been five or six, but I can get nothing from him again. Life's manipulators have had their effect. His wearisome progress forward thanks to them, has begun. 
As a result, my return backwards towards... But I shall never know now. It's my birthday tomorrow. They have not yet decided whether I shall be 11 or 12. It doesn't really matter. I know I have stopped in time. No backwards now. No forwards either. The lessons they will give me will certainly get them nowhere. I am far, far beyond their lessons. Many years later, the young David was to ask his mother, what happened to my father? Rachel had prepared herself for that moment. He went away, a long, long way away. It was not too far from the truth. That was Out of the Mouth, starring Howell Bennett as Richard, Elizabeth Proud, Rachel, and John Quayle, David. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William Ingram, and directed by John Dyer. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Glancing through my morning paper over breakfast today, I noticed that an enterprising gentleman in the catering business has invented a musical hot dog called, would you believe, a Humburger. Isn't it amazing the things some people will eat? Food, by the way, is something of a hobby of mine. And I never cease to wonder at the incredible results that can be achieved by a good chef with a few basic ingredients. A little meat, a few vegetables, a glass of wine, a sprig of parsley, and voila. You know, there are few more interesting experiences than being allowed into the kitchen of a really first-class restaurant to watch a master chef at work. And, of course, this uh, privilege is rarely extended to anyone, which reminds me of an experience I had a few years back. And to give it the right flavor, let's call it speciality of the house. I was staying in New York at the time, and a friend of mine, Harry Laffler, knowing that I was interested in good food, invited me to dine with him one evening at his favorite restaurant. Harry was by way of being an international advertising man, and knowing the size of his expense account, I had imagined that I was in for an evening at one of New York's plushier night spots. Imagine my surprise, therefore, when I found myself being ushered towards a, a shabby brownstone building in an almost deserted downtown back street. Well, here we are. This is Bureau's. What do you think of it? Well, Harry, it's... I must say, it's not quite what I expected. It, it is rather dismal, isn't it? I'll have you know that Spiro's is the restaurant without pretensions. It is the one place in these ghastly neurotic times that has refused to compromise. Inside, you will find the same gas lights, the same service, or possibly even the same spider's webs hmm? that were remarked by patrons over half a century ago. Spider's webs? Isn't the place ever dusted? When you enter Spiro's, you leave the insanity of this hour, of this day, of this year... And you find yourself, for a brief span, restored in spirit. <laughs> you make it sound more like a cathedral than a restaurant. I wonder, I wonder if I've done the right thing in bringing you here. Oh, come on now, Harry. I, I was only joking. You see, you are the one person I know with the knowledge of good food. Thank you. Knowing about Spiro's and not having an appreciative friend to share it with is like having a unique work of art locked in a room where no one else can see it. Anyway, let's not stand here talking. Let's go in. Good evening, sir. Mr. Laffler and a guest. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, please come this way, gentlemen. Sure. The waiter led us through a mirrored foyer into a small dining room. It was no size at all, but the half dozen or so guttering gas jets which provided the only illumination threw such a deceptive light that the walls flickered and faded into uncertain distance. There were no more than eight or ten tables in the room, and all but one were occupied. 
the few waiters serving, moved amongst them with quiet efficiency. It really was very pleasant. And as soon as we were seated at the vacant table, I said as much to Harry. There. I knew you'd like it. Wait till you taste the food. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, do you wish to be served now? Uh, tell me, is the special being served tonight, waiter? Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. There is no special this evening. But it's been a month already. And I had hoped that my friend here... I'm sorry, sir, but you do understand the difficulties, sir. Oh, well, what the hell. Uh, but I was hoping, Vincent, to introduce you to the greatest treat that Spiro offers. Oh, never mind. I'm quite sure that whatever we decide upon will be delicious. Uh, shall I serve at once, sir? Uh, yes, please. Uh, very good, sir. Well, Lord Harry, have you ordered in advance? <laughs> no. No, I should have explained. Spiro offers no choice whatsoever. But suppose we don't like what we're given. Oh, don't worry. No matter how exacting your taste, you will relish every mouthful. Now, just think a moment about the advantages of such a system. For instance, instead of a hurly-burly of sweating cooks trying to prepare a hundred different dishes, here we have a chef who stands serenely alone, bringing all his culinary arts to bear on one task. Oh, then you... You've seen Spiro's kitchen. Tell me, what's it like? Unfortunately, I can't. I've never seen it. Oh. Believe me, I've tried. In fact, I admit that my desire to see the inside of this particular kitchen has become almost an obsession with me. Have you ever mentioned this to Spiro? At least a dozen times. But he just shrugs his massive shoulders and smiles. Still, I'd never given up hope. Not another word was spoken until we had both finished our main course. Nor was there any need for words in the presence of such food. It was delicious. Indeed, so much so that I confess I, I felt rather ashamed of myself, for no sooner had I swallowed a piece of that delicious meat than I found myself ferociously hungry for another piece. And it was only with a great effort that I prevented myself from wolfing the lot at one go and establishing myself as a grade-A glutton on my very first visit to this this amazing restaurant. When we had both finished eating, Harry and I smiled at each other contentedly. We were both aware that we had enjoyed an exceptional culinary experience. Harry, if I had any doubts about Spiro's, I apologize unreservedly. <laughs> In all your praise of the place, there is not a single word of exaggeration. Ah, uh, that is only part of the story. You heard me mention the special, which mm. unfortunately was not on tonight's menu. Well, what we've just eaten is as nothing when compared to the absolute delights of that special. Good Lord, what, what is it? I mean, nightingale's tongues, fillet of unicorn? Neither. It is lamb. Lamb? Oh, come on, you've got to be joking. If I were to give you, in my own unstinted words, my opinion of this dish, you would think me insane. <laughs> that is how deeply the mere thought of it affects me. It is a select portion of the rarest sheep in existence. Lamb Armistan. Armistan. A remote and almost unknown place on the border which separates Russia and Afghanistan. From chance remarks dropped by Sbiro... I gather that it's hardly more than a plateau which grazes the pitiful remnants of a flock of superb sheep. Spiro, by some means or other, has obtained exclusive rights to this flock and is therefore the only restaurateur in the world ever to have lamb Armistan on his menu. I can tell you, the appearance of this dish is a very rare occurrence indeed and nobody ever knows the exact date on which it will be served. Oh, but surely... Spira could provide some advanced knowledge of this event. Well, right? the only objection to that is simply stated. Should advanced information slip out, then the professional gluttons, in which this city abounds, would get the opportunity to taste this dish and sooner or later drive out the regular patrons. You don't mean to say that these few people present are the only ones in the entire city who know of the existence of Spiro's? In the entire world. Oh, but that's incredible. It is kept a secret by every single patron. A solemn obligation. By accepting my invitation this evening, you automatically assume that obligation. I hope you can be trusted. With it. Well, if that's the way you want it, Harry, of course I can. I only question the wisdom of a policy which keeps such magnificent food away from... 
from so many who would enjoy it. Oh, do you realize the result of the policy you favor? An influx of idiots who would nightly complain that they're never served roast duck with chocolate sauce. <laughs> yes, I, I guess you're right. I know, sir. It may sound strange to you. Indeed, it may border on eccentricity. But I'm a solitary man, and I feel to my debts that this restaurant is both family and friend. By the end of two weeks, Harry's invitations for me to join him in Spiros had become something of a, of a ritual. Every afternoon around five, the phone would ring, and it would be Harry asking me if I were free to join him. Indeed, I began to wonder whether it might not be more tactful to vary the ritual with the occasional refusal, but of course I, I never did. It was the food, the incomparable food at Spiros which kept me going back again and again. Now, I am by nature one of those people with a lean and hungry look, but I began to notice that I was rapidly putting on weight. I was, to tell the truth, becoming plump. I began to wonder whether Harry, by no means a lightweight, had also been lean before he started to dine at Spiro's. Thinking the whole thing over, I decided that I would not refuse to eat at the restaurant until I had both tasted the lamb armistan and also been introduced to the amazing Mr. Spiro. And then one night, a few weeks later, I achieved both these ambitions and both, I may say, exceeded my expectations. Ah, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Tonight is the special, sir. What? Well, this is it. Oh. Peculiar in its triumph of all times. And faced by it, you are embarrassed by the very emotion it distills. Oh, Anna, how do you know that, Anna? Oh, because I, when I first ate it, I underwent your embarrassment. Oh. Oh. I felt as you do now. Why, look at you. <laughs> You're almost trembling in anticipation. Yes. I must confess that my heart is certainly beating faster than usual. Tell me, Harry, the, the other diners, do they feel the same way? Well, of course they do. Look around you and judge for yourself. Yes, you're right. Oh, look, uh, one of our number appears to be in for disappointment. Hmm? Look, over there, at the end table, the empty seat. Oh, yes, the stout bald man. Hmm. He's not here tonight. I do believe it's the first dinner he's missed here in weeks. Rain or shine, crisis or calamity, I don't think he's missed an evening at Spiro's in ten years. Imagine his disappointment when he finds that he's missed the speciality of the house. <coughs> Oh. Mr. Latler and friend, I am so pleased. So very, very pleased. Ah, oh, Mrs. Mira. And tonight, gentlemen, the lamb armistan will be an unqualified success. I myself have been stewing in the miserable kitchen all day, prodding the foolish chef to do everything just so. The just so is the important part, eh? Uh, but I see your friend does not know me. An introduction, perhaps. The words ran in a smooth, fluid eddy. They rippled, they purred, and I found myself hypnotized and could do no more than stare as Harry performed the introduction. Spiro's mouth, the mouth that uncoiled this sinuous monologue, was alarmingly wide, with thin, mobile lips that curled and twisted with every syllable. He had a wide nose and wide set eyes. It was an amazing face, and... Somehow I had the feeling that I had seen it before. It was somehow familiar. I am so very pleased to meet you, Mr. Price. So very, very pleased. Oh, thank you. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Spiro? You uh, like my little establishment, eh? Oh, yes. You have a great treat in store for you today, I assure you. My friend is by way of being a great admirer of yours, Spiro. True. A very great compliment. You compliment me with your presence... And I return the compliment with my food, eh? <laughs> but I assure you, the lamb armistan is far superior to anything of your past experience. All the trouble obtaining it, all the difficulty of preparation is truly merited. You know, I've wondered why, with all these difficulties you mentioned, why you even bother to present lamb armistan. Surely your other dishes are excellent enough to uphold your reputation. Yeah, perhaps it is a matter of psychology. Someone discovers a wonder... And must share it with the others, eh? Mm. Or perhaps it is just a matter of good business. I'm... I'm sorry. I, I had no intention of prying. No, no, no. You are not prying. On the contrary, I invite questions. Uh, don't let's be able to intimidate you. 
I've known him for years now. I show you his bark is far worse than his bite. But before you know it, he'll be showing you all the privileges of the house, except inviting you into his precious kitchen, of course. <laughs> now, for that, you may have to wait a little while, I'm afraid. What did I tell you? Come on, Asbira. The truth. Has anyone except staff ever stepped into that kitchen of yours? You see on the wall over there the portrait of one to whom I did that honor. Hmm? A dear friend and a patron of long standing. Where? Oh, yes, there. Oh. Who is it? Oh, if it's Andrew Herring, the, the writer. You know the one, Harry. He used to write those marvelously cynical articles for the New American. And then he took himself off some to Mexico, I think it was, and, and disappeared. Of course. Here I've been sitting, staring at that picture for years without recognizing it. It must have been a blow for you when your old friend disappeared, Spira. It was, I assure you, gentlemen. But I like to think of it this way. He was probably greater in his death than in his life, eh? Hmm? Oh, a most tragic man. He often told me that his only happy hours were spent here at this table. Pathetic, is it not? And to think the only favor I could ever show him was to let him witness the mysteries of my humble kitchen. <laughs> you seem very certain of his death. I, after all, as I remember, no evidence has ever turned up to support it. None at all. Remarkable, eh? Ah, but no more talk, please, gentlemen. For here comes the speciality of the house. Lamb Armistar. Spiro served the meal himself, taking great care not to lose a single drop of gravy as he sliced the joint underdone to perfection. He filled the two plates with the chunks of dripping meat. Ah, gentlemen. Bon appetit. With great deliberation, I took a mouthful of the lamb of Armistan. It was magnificent. Good, eh? Mm. Better than you imagined? It is as impossible for the uninitiated to imagine the delights of lamb Armistan as... Uh, as... For a mortal man to look into his own soul? Perhaps. Perhaps you have just had a glimpse into your own soul, eh? <laughs> yes, perhaps. And a gratifying picture it made, too. All fang and claw. Well, I must be going. But sometimes, my friend, when you have nothing better to do, sit perhaps for a little while in a dark room and think of this world and what it is and what it is going to be. Then you must turn your thoughts to the significance of the lamb in religion. It will be so interesting. And now, gentlemen, I have interrupted your meal for too long. Au revoir, gentlemen. Au revoir. Au revoir. Hmm. He's an interesting man, Spear, a very interesting man. You know, Harry, he, he reminds me of someone I, I just can't think who... It was a month later that it finally came to me exactly who it was that Spiro reminded me of. And when it did, I, I laughed out loud. <laughs> of course, Spiro reminded me of the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. You remember, the cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked very good-natured, she thought. Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth, so she felt that it ought to be treated with respect. <laughs> I, I mentioned this to Harry that night as we were walking along that dismal street that led to Spiro's. Uh, you may be right, but I'm not a fit judge. Anyway, it's a long time since I read Alice in Wonderland. A very long time. Help! What? Help! Look, look there. Outside Spiro's. Isn't that one of the way? Yes. Looks as though he's in trouble. He's being attacked. Come on. Help! God damn it! Pickpocket! Push me, will you? Looking for a goddamn oh. spider. Well, you, you got one, Whisker. Let me go. Let me go. Not yet, you old creep. Well, what's going on here? Uh, help me, sir. Uh, this man, he's, he's drunk. He tried to stab me. Oh, drunk, am I? Oh, well, we'll... we'll hey, you... Jerry? Hey, grab him, uh, Harry. Uh, Quick. Uh, Look out for that uh, knife. Let, let, let go of him. Do you hear that? Let go. Hey, what, what, what the hell's happening here? Oh, no. I'll cut your goddamn throat, oh, Mr. Oh, no, you... you goat. Oh. Oh, is, he, is he all right, do you think? That was some fun, Charlie. Well, he, he, I think he's stunned. He banged his head as he fell. Yeah, well, in any case, it's a job for the police. Oh, 
No, sir. What? No police. Mr. Spiro does not like police. Oh, now, wait. I beg you. No police. Uh, uh, anyway, it's coming around. Uh, oh, he'll be all right. But what started all this, anyway? I, I, I pushed against him accidentally. And he accused me of robbing him. He's, he's drunk, sir. Uh, you can say that again. Well, now, you go inside and get cleaned up. We'll see to him. Thank you, sir. To you, I owe my life. If there is anything I can do to repay you. Uh, you just come along, and if Mrs. Vera has any questions, you tell him to see me. Yes, sir. You saved my life. Thank you, sir. And with that, the waiter disappeared into the restaurant. Well, after all the excitement and kerfuffle of that incident, I must confess that I found I had quite an appetite. And as soon as we were comfortably seated in the restaurant, Harry and I debated with some trepidation as to whether or not we could expect the special lamb armistan that evening. Soon our regular waiter appeared and carefully set two tumblers on the table. We almost simultaneously inquired after the special. Uh, no, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. No special tonight. Oh, hell, just my luck. And I'll probably miss out next time, too. Why, Harry? You going away? Yes, damn it. I'm off to South America for a month or two in order to mount a new campaign for some very rich clients. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. When do you leave? Tonight. I managed to wangle some reservations. And this is intended to be in the nature of a farewell celebration. Oh, and no <laughs> special. What a shame. <laughs> Just my luck. Uh, well, I I'm going to miss you, Harry. I have enjoyed our evening together, and these little dinners of ours have well, they've come to mean a great deal to me. Uh, shall I serve now? Uh, of course. I didn't realize you were waiting. Shortly afterwards, the waiter served us, and we turned our attention to our dinner. Harry finished his quickly and continued to bemoan his fate and to regret loudly the thought of missing Lamb Armistand during his trip. Then, just as I finished my meal, a waiter leaned over to take Harry's plate. It wasn't our usual waiter, but the man who we had rescued from the drunken sailor. I asked him how he was feeling, but to my surprise, he completely ignored me, and with the air of a man under great strain, he whispered to Harry, My life, I owe it to you. I can't repay you. Well, you have repaid me with your thanks. Please, let's hear no more about it. But I will help you, sir, even if you don't want me to. Do not go into the kitchen tonight. Huh? My life for yours, sir. Tonight or any night. Do not go into Spiro's kitchen. Why shouldn't I go into the kitchen? <laughs> don't be absurd. What's going on here? Is everything all right, gentlemen? Ah, oh, good evening, Spiro. Uh, this man is a little unnerved, I think. Ah, uh, yes. An unfortunate experience. He's saying something about my not visiting your kitchen. What's it all about? Do you know what he means? But of course. He was giving you good advice. It so happens that my two emotional chefs heard some rumor that I might have a guest in the kitchen tonight. He flew into a fearful rage and even threatened to give his notice on the spot. Hmm? However, have no fear. I have succeeded in showing him what a signal honor it is to have a true connoisseur observe him at his work first hand. That is all. No, Sancho, you are at the wrong table. See that it does not happen again. The waiter slunk away without daring to raise his eyes, and Spiro drew up a chair to the table. He seated himself and drew his hand lightly over his hair. My invitation for you to visit my humble kitchen, I, I had hoped, Mr. Laffler, to be a surprise, but now the surprise is gone, and all that is left is the invitation. Are you serious? Do you mean that at last we really are to witness the preparation of food in your kitchen tonight? Uh, no, Mr. Laffler, not both. I am faced with a dilemma of great proportions, gentlemen. You, Mr. Laffler, have been my guest for ten years, but our friend here... Oh, Mr. Spiro, I, I, I really understand perfectly. I, I mean, this invitation is solely to Harry here, and naturally my presence is embarrassing. Well, no, no. Wait a minute. As it happens, I, I do have another engagement for later, and I must be on my way anyhow. So, you see, there's no dilemma at all, really. Absolutely not. That wouldn't be fair at oh, all. No. Surely, Spiro, you can make an exception on this one occasion. I'm very sorry. Harry, I am not going to sit here and spoil your great adventure. Believe me. And, and then just think of that ferocious chef. I'm sure he's just dying to get his cleaver into you. <laughs> <laughs> so humorous. So, I'll just say goodbye now and leave you to Spiro. 
I'm sure he'll take pains to give you a good show. Well, that's good, dear Vincent. Thanks. I hope you continue to dine here while I'm away. Oh, and have a have a good trip, Harry. Yes. Thank you. Bye now. I will expect you, Mr. Price. Au revoir. Au revoir. And so I left them to it. The smiling Spiro and Harry Laffler, about to realize his greatest ambition. On the way out, I stopped in the foyer to collect my coat, and as I was straightening my tie, I caught a glimpse in the mirror of Harry and Spiro already at the kitchen door. Spiro was holding it open invitingly wide with one hand, while the other hand rested lightly on Harry's plump, meaty shoulder, squeezing it ever so gently, almost lovingly, rather in the way a housewife squeezes a prime fat turkey before she puts it into the oven. I've never seen or heard of Harry Laffler again. Shortly afterwards, I left New York in order to do some filming in England. I've not been back since, and therefore I have never had the opportunity of dining again at Spiro's, nor of renewing my acquaintance with its mysterious owner. In the intervening years, however, my interest in food and its preparation has increased, and I I can now create and experiment with recipes of my own. But I must confess that even in my wildest flights of culinary fancy, I, I have never yet dared to attempt lamb amistad. was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Co-starring in The Speciality of the House was Hugh Burton with Francis DeWolf, Vernon Joyner, and William Slay. The Speciality of the House was first recounted by Stanley Ellen, dramatized by Barry Campbell, and produced by John. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello, welcome. This story, which I've called Soul Music, involved me purely by chance. Due to some slight technical failure, the non-stop flight I'd been booked on for filming commitments in Rome was diverted to Paris. And there in the refreshment lounge at Orly Airport, I met up again with Marianne. I spotted her several minutes before she saw me, but the recognition was as immediate as if the intervening years had never been. The same cool, poised awareness, even in that overcrowded, bustling setting. A kind of inner apartness 
it would be difficult to describe. It made the frustrations of the flight, even the possibility of an overnight stop, only too worthwhile. The fact that her husband, the international violinist, David Clementis, was bound to be traveling with her, <laughs> in music circles they had long been nicknamed the Inseparables, offered the opportunity of a, of a double treat. Oh, my dear Vincent, it's sweet of you to say so. The cream. <laughs> Thank you. Well then, out with it. How's the maestro? Oh, uh, oh, David's fine. Well, more to the point, where's the maestro? Well, let's face it, the old crowd always referred to the two of you as the inseparables. The inseparables? Oh, yes. Yes, they did, didn't they? Now, don't tell me. You've got him lurking underneath the table. Stradivarius tuned and at the ready. Well, what's it to be, romance or a touch of ochichonia? <laughs> Well, David came on ahead, uh, an earlier flight. Oh? Well, no, no, nothing mysterious. Uh, partly business agents, an impresario. Well, you know the world. Besides, he's never appeared in this particular hall before, and in violin circles it's got a reputation as a dead house. He suddenly got a bit jittery about the acoustics. Typical David. Huh? Well, always the perfectionist. Yes. Yes, he was, wasn't he? Hello, Ann. You all right? Yeah, well, I'm fine. I'm just a bit tired, but I'm fine. Global Air agreed to announce the cancellation of their flight 108 to Rome. Uh. Passengers are requested to report to the inquiry desk mm. for details of overnight accommodation and alternative bookings for the continuation of their journey. Well, that settles it, does it? Well, what could be nicer? A night on the town in gay Paris, all courtesy of good old Global Air. To begin with, you can wangle me a ticket for the maestro's concert. Even if it does mean swinging from one of the chandeliers. Oh, but no, I... No, 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 I insist. And afterwards, I'll come backstage, whisk him away from the backslappers, and carry the pair of you off to a secret little bistro I've been saving in Montmartre. Food before decor. And just the three of us. Oh, but surely, if you've got an, an early morning flight to Marianne, catch... Marion, is anything the matter? It's, it's almost as though you'd rather I stayed well clear. No... No, it, it, it's, it's nothing, really. Nothing in the world. It's... Oh, it's really wonderful seeing you again. You think the same will go for David? David? Well, of, of course. But why should it be otherwise? My ticket for the concert was waiting for me at the box office, as promised. The attendant handed it across coolly, no? Almost contemptuously. I'd expected some kind of covering note from either Marianne or David, but there was none. I passed through the heavy velvet curtains and stood at the back of the circle. There was no usher to examine my ticket, but then there seemed little need. At a generous estimate, I reckon, the whole house could have been moved forward and still barely filled the front three rows. Their mild enthusiasm proved premature. Sufficient to say the performance was a travesty. The adverse notices completely justified. But it wasn't until the interval, grateful for my oversized cognac in the crush bar, that I tried to grasp the cause, the reason for what I'd just witnessed. I settled for one word, contempt. Contempt on the part of the soloist. It summed up his attitude and performance exactly. Even visually, the violinist at the center of this indifference was a grotesque of the David Clementis I remembered. The soloist whose charm and superlative talent had won hearts and critical acclaim in, in every major concert hall in the world. A veritable travesty of the immaculate, assured Clementis who whose famous profile even now stared out of the display cases that lined the walls. Contempt. Not only for that fast, diminishing audience, but for himself, too. But most of all, contempt for that 
supreme talent that he had nurtured and that they had adulated for so long. But why? In God's name, why? I must have spoken the thought because suddenly I was aware of Marianne standing beside me, but not the Marianne of the airport. Now she was making no attempt to hide the hurt, the need within her. I'd hoped you might not come, that they might have found you a place on an earlier flight. But now that you have... Uh, do you think I might have a cognac, too? Oh, but of course. Encore and cognac. Monsieur. How long? What, like this? Mm. A year or so after our marriage... In the early days, it seemed our love had made his talent flourish. But it wasn't until the pact had been signed and sealed, so to speak, that I began to notice the change. But what could have changed him? Why? No. Uh, look, let me ask the question. Now, before, before I came along, what would you have said was David's one love? The all-consuming passion, the... Well, the reason for his very existence. But what a strange way to put it. The reason for his very existence. Well, I suppose... No, no, no. Don't suppose. Admit it. All right. His music. His only love. It had possessed him from the very beginning, exclusively, uncompromisingly. He had no life beyond the rehearsal room or the concert platform. The demands made by this... God-given talent was all that he'd known until we met and loved. And I taught him to share my world, other interests, other people, other places, and therefore I displaced the total dedication, the exclusiveness of this talent. I broke the absolute stranglehold of whatever power had possessed him before. Possessed? Why, why do you use the word possessed? It's a strong word, isn't it? Yes. In the Dark Ages, they applied it to witches and warlocks and burned them at the stake, didn't they? Mm. You know, it's a word we hardly ever use now. We prefer to skirt the issue. But the talent David had possessed him as surely and as completely as any demon. The only difference was, in his case, there could be no exorcist. None. God knows we tried. But the talent had exclusive rights, you see. It possessed him from within, his very soul. And when I'm around, as long as I'm around, it destroys him from within and leaves him... Well, the, the broken doll that you saw standing there tonight. You know, Marianne, the ancient Egyptians believed that the soul was a very real, substantial thing that it had an actual physical location, just like any other organ, the heart, the liver, the spleen. They tried to locate it, to preserve it, to sanctify and deify it in their Coptic jars. And a couple of thousand years on, and we're only too anxious to deny its very existence. <laughs> but it's there, all right. In David's case, it's in his hands. The soul talent is locked in his two hands in the fingers that through his music can create a heaven or a hell not only for himself but for anyone who dares to interfere with it or displace it I tried but I failed failed but you've done so much for him how could you have failed well, David admits it too just now you witnessed his public admission. As surely as any warlock suffering from the tortures of the Inquisition, waiting for the fires of hell to be lit and the agonies of hell to begin. But if what you say is true... Well, I know it to be. That's why I'm leaving him, Vincent. Leaving him? Don't you understand? I have no choice. I can't watch the doll dance. Not once, but over and over again. Open to the scorn and contempt of anyone who chooses to pay the price of admission. I can't afford to pay the price of admission anymore. You'd desert him to this force? 
It's his only chance. It's a fair exchange. My misery for the price of his salvation. Well, I'd... I'd better get on... No, 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 don't go back. You needn't. He doesn't know you're here. And if he did? I know he'd not expect it. But of course I damn well expect it, my love. A straightforward case of rally round the flag, isn't it, Vincent? Old buddy. Oh, you know, David. That... <laughs> Mark you, the ralliers are lying a bit thin on the ground this season, but, but then that's only to be expected, isn't it? Well, damn you, isn't it? Oh, darling, there's no need. There's every need. Uh, oh, dear. Yeah, dear, the well seems to have run dry. I'll ring through. Oh, well, the bar will be closed, but I, I'm sure if you were to try using your personal charms... <laughs> Please, Marianne. Very well, David. Uh, you, um, you know we're splitting up, Marianne and myself... Um, she she told you we were? Yes, David, she told me. Yes, of course she did. But she probably told you it was her idea, not mine. A supreme personal sacrifice in the cause of art. Something like that. Not true. It was my idea. My decision. I see. Well, do you think I'd honestly swap a, a single moment of my life with Marianne for the existence I knew before? for what now must take its place? I... I don't know. <laughs> well, take my word for it. But, David, you still have the choice. No, no choice. For Marianne's sake, you see, living with me is... Well, it's just not... It's just not safe any longer. This... This force inside me... is just not safe. Why don't you try telling me about it? Well... <sighs> There have been several occasions, incidents. I don't think I understand. It's quite simple. A desire to to hurt, to to inflict. At first, simply with a with a gesture, a word, until Go on, David, tell me. Until in London. About a month ago. There'd been a reception after the concert. Marianne was tired and came back early to the hotel. I remember getting back myself in the early hours of the morning. I went into the bedroom. I watched her sleeping there. And then, suddenly, my hands... God! My hands... about her throat. Possessed with a will, a volition, all of their own, pressing harder, harder, until, until, just as suddenly, it stopped. No hate anymore, only remorse. Remorse and the decision that it should never happen again, ever again. But it's still there, you see, in the hands a force over which there can be no control. And the alternative, if you choose not to accept it, not to release it? Pain, certainly. And perhaps, ultimately, a hell beyond anything man has ever known. As the soul fights the body to get free and the, and the body fights back to imprison it. The pain of tearing as the soul tries to get out. For what seemed an eternal moment, my friend studied the frail eloquence of his hands holding the tumbler. Then, with an inner force that seemed totally their own, they jerked convulsively. The crystal tumbler lay in a thousand razor-edged splinters at his feet. That, as it turned out, was to be my last meeting with David. And the next day, I flew on to Rome.
but I did hear from Marianne. We just finished some location sequences at a small fishing village when her letter arrived. There'd been a long delay in its forwarding. The postmark, Paris, a good month earlier. I opened it with an almost positive conviction of what I would find. I know what a shock this will be to you. David collapsed as soon as we got back to the hotel that night. By the time we got him to the hospital, there was nothing to be done. You will see one of the clippings. The jury at the coroner's hearing recorded an open verdict. But I think we, anyway, know only too well there was a very real, if inexplicable, cause. Let it remain our secret. The price David paid for his unique talent was finally exacted in full, and in a manner so bizarre I find it impossible to embark on here. But if the final awful proof should interest you, and you are returning via Paris, please ring me at this number and I will arrange a meeting with Dr. Emile Fouchard. I have already told him he may expect to hear from us, and that he is told nothing, I repeat, nothing, back. We owe you this. Besides, to know is to share. Marianne. To know is to share. But to know what? To share what? What was it that eventually persuaded me to do exactly as Marianne asked? to ring her number, arrange an appointment, and finally find myself seated in the good doctor's surgery come consulting room, just off the Rue Madeleine. To hold nothing back. It's easily said, monsieur. But where does the knowing end and the disbelief begin? I, uh... Vincent, you have the right to know. Well... The simple facts and findings related to my friend's death. They might prove as good a sticking point as any. (laughs) The simple facts, eh? Eh bien, so be it. Ah, Here it is. As presented in testimony at the coroner's court, for which there is allowed no room for speculation or error. A summary of these facts, then. Several witnesses of your friend's collapse in the foyer of his hotel, his admission to the Hôpital de la Vierge on the Ile de la Cité, the inescapable fact that he was pronounced dead on arrival, the admitting physician diagnosed heart failure, brought about by blood clotting, brought about by an excessive consumption of alcohol. I, uh, I see. And so I thought, did I? I'm, I'm sorry? I suspect that Madame omitted to inform you that during his stay in Paris, I acted as her late husband's physician. No, it's true. I finally managed to persuade David he might benefit from, well, from some kind of treatment. My initial examination of the patient was thorough and exhaustive. I gave it as my considered opinion that the root cause of Monsieur Clementi's malady was mental rather than physical which is why I used all my influence to be allowed to assist at the post-mortem. Vindication. Vanity. Call it what you will. Eventually, it was achieved. Have you uh, ever witnessed a post-mortem, monsieur? Oh, no, no. Then, if you are not of an over-squeamish disposition, I shall attempt to enlighten you. Uh, To begin with, then, to the casual observer... It is more an object lesson in butchery than surgery, rather the slaughterhouse than the operating theater. The instruments we employ, for the most part anyway, uh, might be purchased in any cancari, uh, hardware shop, you know. The ultimate object of the exercise is to arrive at the vital organs, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the stomach and its contents, uh, with the maximum of efficiency and the minimum of subtlety. Yes, I understand. Uh, To this end, then, a hacksaw and cold chisel for the removal of the cranium cap, (coughs) the ribs and the sternum, a scoop for the removal of the brain, Mm. 
a butcher's knife for pussing out the hot sack, the stomach and lung cavities. Uh, oh. Some fresh air, perhaps. Thank you. A butcher's trade. So much offal to be removed, examined, disposed of, and then replaced with sufficient stuffing material as will persuade the bereaved relatives that their dear departed is as complete and unsullied as when he first came into our charge. And uh, as a result of this butchery... Uh, we found nothing. Positively nothing that in any way affected my original opinion that the person I'd examined in this office not so many days before was as fit as anyone of his age, constitution, and occupation could be expected to be. At all. Cause of death, inconclusive. Consequence? An open verdict. And duly recorded for anyone to read. Well, then what's the mystery? Occurrences. Yes. Let us... Let us call them occurrences. The nature and reason for which we can only speculate. Go on. The cadaver of your late friend was placed in one of the wall cabinets with which every dissecting room is equipped. A kind of uh, container, you understand. Large enough to accommodate a corpse, but otherwise similar to the kind of filing cabinet you'd find among any office furnishing. Uh, yes, I understand. I felt sure you would. Well, and then? Uh, the cabinet was locked. Locked? Is that customary? Uh, as I explained at the time to Madame, reserved mainly for celebrities, mm. in view of the current excessive curiosity of the popular press. Just a precaution, you understand. Yes. On the very next day, a complaint from Monsieur Corbeau, the artist, was delivered by hand. The very next day. Corbeau? But where does Corbeau come well, in? David had long ago agreed that Corbeau should one day be allowed to make a cast of his hands. Oh. Well, it was a long-standing, well, a long-standing agreement. When he read of David's death, he asked if I now had any reason to refuse that request. And? Well, no reason. In fact, it gave me a kind of comfort, a memento for posterity. Doctor, you said... Corbo made a complaint. Yes. Within hours of the remains being put at his disposal. I still have his letter, Vincent. Well, perhaps you'd like to read it for yourself. Macabre. Grotesque. Satanic. Defilement. But what does he mean? In that too, you must judge for yourself. But first, I must trust that at no time not right up until the locking of the cabinet, had we dissected or performed any pathological examination on the hands of the deceased. We had no reason to. They, well, they would have told us nothing. Some uh, photographs. These taken before the cabinet was yes. locked. Yes, I see. Palm to palm. Total uh -huh. repose. And these taken immediately after the complaint of Monsieur Cobo had been received. To know is to share, Vincent. You'd never have recognized them for hands. They'd been severed. No, they'd been torn away from the rest of the limb. Each joint cracked, the flesh bloated and pistulated, as though all the time, during the hell-like ritual of that post-mortem, as the surgeon butchers went about their casual ritual of carving, hacking, and scooping, the living soul captured within was screaming for escape. A living hell. To lie on a marble slab, eyes expressionless, unblinking, tongue mute, grotesquely protruding through the cavern of the larynx, simply lying there, knowing it, experiencing it, waiting only for the tortures of the hell to stop, for the chance finally to break free, and for the soul music to begin. To know is to share. I made my way back to the hotel. It was raining. At a corner, a street musician sawed forlornly away on his violin. 
He seemed surprised at the charity I dropped into his cap. But there was no joy in the tune he played. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in soul music was Coral Brown with John Graham, Roger Snowden and Michael Burlington. Soul music was first recounted and dramatised by William Ingram and produced... Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Glancing through my morning paper over breakfast today, I noticed that an enterprising gentleman in the catering business has invented a musical hot dog called, would you believe, a Humburger. Isn't it amazing the things some people will eat? Food, by the way, is something of a hobby of mine. And I never cease to wonder at the incredible results that can be achieved by a good chef with a few basic ingredients. A little meat, a few vegetables, a glass of wine, a sprig of parsley, and voila. You know, there are few more interesting experiences than being allowed into the kitchen of a really first-class restaurant to watch a master chef at work. And, of course, this uh, privilege is rarely extended to anyone, which reminds me of an experience I had a few years back. And to give it the right flavor, let's call it speciality of the house. I was staying in New York at the time, and a friend of mine, Harry Laffler, knowing that I was interested in good food, invited me to dine with him one evening at his favorite restaurant. Harry was by way of being an international advertising man, and knowing the size of his expense account, I had imagined that I was in for an evening at one of New York's plushier night spots. Imagine my surprise, therefore, when I found myself being ushered towards a, a shabby brownstone building in an almost deserted downtown back street. Well, here we are. This is Bierro's. What do you think of it? Well, Harry, it's... I must say, it's not quite what I expected. It, it is rather dismal, isn't it? And uh, have you known that Bierro's is the restaurant without pretensions? It is the one place in these ghastly neurotic times that has refused to compromise. When you enter Smeros, you leave the insanity of this hour, of this day, of this year, and you find yourself for a brief span restored in spirit. You make it sound more like a, like a cathedral than a restaurant. I wonder, I wonder if I've done the right thing in bringing you here. Oh, come on now, Harry. I, I was only joking. You see, you are the one person I know with the knowledge of good food. Thank you. Knowing about Spiros and not having an appreciative friend to share it with 
It's like having a unique work of art locked in a room where no one else can see it. Anyway, let's not stand here talking. Let's go in. Good evening, sir. Mr. Laffler and a guest. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, please come this way, gentlemen. Uh, the waiter led us through a mirrored foyer into a small dining room. It was no size at all, but the half dozen or so guttering gas jets which provided the only illumination threw such a deceptive light that the walls flickered and faded into uncertain distance. There were no more than eight or ten tables in the room, and all but one were occupied. The few waiters serving moved amongst them with quiet efficiency. It really was very pleasant. And as soon as we were seated at the vacant table, I said as much to Harry. There. I knew you'd like it. Wait till you taste the food. By the way, did you notice that there are no women present? Yes, I, I did. Isn't that rather odd? Spiro doesn't encourage them. Oh. And I can tell you his method of getting rid of them is very effective. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, do you wish to be served now? Uh, tell me, is the special being served tonight, waiter? Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. There is no special this evening. But it's been a month already. And I had hoped that my friend here... Uh, I'm sorry, sir, but you do understand the difficulties. Sir. Oh, well, what the hell. Uh, but I was hoping, Vincent, to introduce you to the greatest treat that Spiro offers. Oh, never mind. I'm quite sure that whatever we decide upon will be delicious. Uh, shall I serve at once, sir? Uh, yes, please. Mm. Very good, sir. Well, uh, Harry, have you ordered in advance? <laughs> no. No, I should have explained. Spiro offers no choice whatsoever. But suppose we don't like what we're given. Oh, don't worry. No matter how exacting your taste, you will relish every mouthful. Uh, just think a moment about the advantages of such a system. For instance, instead of a hurly-burly of sweating cooks trying to prepare a hundred different dishes, here we have a chef who stands serenely alone, bringing all his culinary arts to bear on one task. Oh, then you, you've seen Spiro's kitchen. Tell me, what's it like? Unfortunately, I can't. I've never seen it. Oh. Believe me, I've tried. In fact, I admit that my desire to see the inside of this particular kitchen has become almost an obsession with me. Well, have you ever mentioned this to Spiro? At least a dozen times. But he just shrugs his massive shoulders and smiles. Still, I'd never given up hope. At this point, the waiter reappeared, bearing two soup bowls and a small tureen, from which he slowly ladled a measure of clear, thin soup. I must confess that I tasted this soup with some curiosity. It was delicately flavored, bland to the verge of tastelessness. Automatically, I reached for the salt. Well, what do you think of the soup? Mm, excellent. If you'll pardon me for saying so, you don't. What? You do not find it excellent. <laughs> you find it flat and badly in need of salt. But how, did uh, how do I know? Yes. Because that was my reaction when I first dined here. But I'm confident that you will make the same discovery as I did. By the time you've finished your soup, your desire for salt will be non-existent. Well, Harry proved to be quite right. And before I had finished the soup, I was relishing every mouthful of it. It was really wonderful. Harry smiled at me across the table. Well, do you agree with me now? Mm. Wasn't I right? Yes, you certainly were. You will find that the absence of condiments is only one of several noteworthy characteristics which marks bureaus. I may as well prepare you for the rest. For example, no alcoholic beverages of any sort are served here. Oh, really? Harry? Also, there is a ban on the use of tobacco in any form. Oh, but good Lord, is this a restaurant or a temperance hotel? You don't understand. By alternating stimulant and narcotic, you seesaw the delicate balance of your taste so violently that it loses its most precious quality, the appreciation of fine food. Not another word was spoken until we had both finished our main course. Nor was there any need for words in the presence of such food. It was delicious. And it was only with a great effort that I prevented myself from wolfing the lot at one go and establishing myself as a grade-A glutton on my very first visit to this amazing restaurant. When we had both finished eating, Harry and I smiled at each other contentedly. We were both aware that we had enjoyed an exceptional culinary experience. 
Harry, if I had any doubts about Spiros, I apologize unreservedly. In all your praise of the place, there is not a single word of exaggeration. Ah, that is only part of the story. You heard me mention the special, which mm. unfortunately was not on tonight's menu. Well, what we've just eaten is as nothing when compared to the absolute delights of that special. Oh, good Lord, what, what is it? I mean, nightingale's tongues, fillet of unicorn? Neither. It is lamb. Lamb? Oh, you've got to be joking. If I were to give you in my own unstinted words my opinion of this dish, you would think me insane. <laughs> that is how deeply the mere thought of it affects me. It is a select portion of the rarest sheep in existence. Lamb Armistan. Armistan. A remote and almost unknown place on the border which separates Russia and Afghanistan. From chance remarks dropped by Sbiro... I gather that it's hardly more than a plateau which grazes the pitiful remnants of a flock of superb sheep. Spiro, by some means or other, has obtained exclusive rights to this flock and is therefore the only restaurateur in the world ever to have lamb armistan on his menu. I can tell you, the appearance of this dish is a very rare occurrence indeed and nobody ever knows the exact date on which it will be served. Oh. But surely Spiro could provide some advanced knowledge of this event. Well, huh? The only objection to that is simply stated. Should advanced information slip out, then the professional gluttons, in which this city abounds, would get the opportunity to taste this dish and sooner or later drive out the regular patrons. You don't mean to say that these few people present are the only ones in the entire city who know of the existence of Spiro's? In the entire world. Oh, that's incredible. It's kept a secret by every single patron. A solemn obligation. By accepting my invitation this evening, you automatically assume that obligation. I hope you can be trusted with it. Well, if that's the way you want it, Harry, of course I can. It may sound strange to you indeed. It may board on eccentricity. But I'm a solitary man. And I feel to my depths that this restaurant is both family and friend to me. I must confess that until that moment, I, I had never really thought much about Harry's private life. To me, he was a pleasant friend and dining companion, and his private affairs had never really concerned me. Now, hearing him refer to Spiro's in this manner, I almost came to feel sorry for him. By the end of two weeks, Harry's invitations for me to join him at Spiro's had become something of a, of a ritual. Now, I am by nature one of those people with a lean and hungry look, but I began to notice that I was rapidly putting on weight. I was, to tell the truth, becoming plump. I began to wonder whether Harry, by no means a lightweight, had also been lean before he started to dine at Spiro's. Thinking the whole thing over, I decided that I would not refuse to eat at the restaurant until I had both tasted the lamb Armistan and also been introduced to the amazing Mr. Spiro. And then one night, a few weeks later, I achieved both these ambitions and both, I may say, exceeded my expectations. Ah, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Tonight is the special, sir. What? Well, this is it. The culinary triumph of all times. And faced by it, you are embarrassed by the very emotion it distills. Yes, I must confess that my heart is certainly beating faster than usual. Tell me, Harry, the, the other diners, do they feel the same way? Well, of course they do. Look around you and judge for yourself. Yes, you're right. Anyway, there's comfort in numbers. It's nice to know that we all have the same basic animal feelings and can anticipate, or, or should I say, <laughs> slobber over our meat. <laughs> oh, look, one of our number appears to be in for disappointment. Hmm? Over there, at the end table, the empty seat. Oh, yes, the stout ball man. Hmm. He's not here tonight. I do believe it's the first dinner he's missed here in weeks. Rain or shine, crisis or calamity, I don't think he's missed an evening at Spiro's in ten years. Imagine his disappointment when he finds that he's missed the speciality of the house. 
Oh. Mr. Laffler and friend, I am so pleased. So very, very pleased. Ah, oh, Mrs. Mira. Uh, tonight, gentlemen, the Lamb Army stand will be an unqualified success. I myself have been stewing in the miserable kitchen all day, prodding the foolish chef to do everything just so. The just so is the important part, eh? Uh, but I see your friend does not know me. An introduction, perhaps. The words ran in a smooth, fluid eddy. They rippled, they purred, and I found myself hypnotized and could do no more than stare as Harry performed the introductions. Spiro's mouth, the mouth that uncoiled this sinuous monologue, was alarmingly wide, with thin, mobile lips that curled and twisted with every syllable. He had a wide nose and wide set eyes. It was an amazing face, and somehow I had the feeling that I had seen it before. It was somehow familiar. I am so very pleased to meet you, Mr. Price. So very, very pleased. Oh, thank you. How do you do, Mr. Spiro? You uh, like my little establishment, eh? Oh, yes. You have a great treat in store for you today, I assure you. My friend is by way of being a great admirer of yours, Spiro. True. A very great compliment. You compliment me with your presence, and I return the compliment with my food, eh? <laughs> But I assure you, the Lamb Armistan is far superior to anything of your past experience. All the trouble obtaining it, all the difficulty of preparation is truly merited. You know, I've wondered why, with all these difficulties you mentioned, why you even bothered to present Lamb Armistan. Surely your other dishes are excellent enough to uphold your reputation. Uh, perhaps it is a matter of psychology. Someone discovers a wonder and must share it with the others, eh? Mm. Or perhaps it is just a matter of good business. Well, then, in the light of all this, and considering all the conventions you impose on your customers, why don't you turn it into a private club? <laughs> so perspicacious. Ah, I will tell you. Because there is more privacy in a public eating place than in the most exclusive club in existence. Here, no one inquires into your affairs. No one desires to know the intimacies of your life. We are not curious about our guests. We welcome you when you are here. We have no regrets when you go. That is the answer, eh? Yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had no intention of prying. No, 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 you are not prying. On the contrary, I invite questions. Uh, don't let Spiro intimidate you. I've known him for years, and I assure you his bark is far worse than his bite. But before you know it, he'll be showing you all the privileges of the house, except inviting you into his... Precious kitchen, of course. <laughs> ah, for that, you may have to wait a little while, I'm afraid. What did I tell you? Come on, Asbira. The truth. Has anyone except staff ever stepped into that kitchen of yours? You see on the wall over there the portrait of one to whom I did that honor. Hmm? A dear friend and a patron of long standing. Where? Oh, yes, there. Oh. Who is it? Oh, it's, it's Andrew Herring, the, the writer. You know the one, Harry. He used to write those marvelously cynical articles for the New American. And then he took himself off some to Mexico, I think it was, and, and disappeared. Of course. Here I've been sitting, staring at that picture for years without recognizing it. It must have been a blow for you when your old friend disappeared, Spira. It was, I assure you, gentlemen. But I like to think of it this way. He was probably greater in his death than in his life, eh? Hmm? Oh, a most tragic man. He often told me that his only happy hours were spent here at this table. Pathetic, is it not? And to think the only favor I could ever show him was to let him witness the mysteries of my humble kitchen. <laughs> you seem very certain of his death. I, after all, as I remember, no evidence has ever turned up to support it. None at all. Remarkable, eh? Ah, but no more talk, please, gentlemen. For here comes the speciality of the house. Lamb Armistan. Spiro served the meal himself, taking great care not to lose a single drop of gravy as he sliced the joint, underdone to perfection. He filled the two plates with the chunks of dripping meat. Ah, gentlemen, bon appetit. With great deliberation, I took a mouthful of the lamb armistan. It was magnificent. 
Good, eh? Mm. Better than you imagined? It is as impossible for the uninitiated to imagine the delights of Lan Amistan as... Uh, as for a mortal man to look into his own soul? Perhaps. Perhaps you have just had a glimpse into your own soul, eh? <laughs> yes, perhaps. And a gratifying picture it made, too. All fang and claw. Well, I must be going. But sometimes, my friend, when you have nothing better to do, sit perhaps for a little while in a dark room and think of this world and what it is and what it is going to be. And then you must turn your thoughts to the significance of the lamb in religion. It will be so interesting. And now, gentlemen, I have interrupted your meal for too long. Au revoir, gentlemen. Au revoir. Au revoir. Hmm. He's an interesting man, Spear, a very interesting man. You know, Harry, he, he reminds me of someone I... I just can't think who... You, you don't think I offended him in any way, do you? Offended him? No. Goodness, no. He loves that sort of talk. Lan Amistan is a, a ritual with him. Get him started, and he'll just go on forever. It was a month later that it finally came to me exactly who it was that Spiro reminded me of. And when it did, I, I laughed out loud. <laughs> of course, Spiro reminded me of the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. You remember, the cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked very good-natured, she thought. Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth, so she felt that it ought to be treated with respect. <laughs> I, I mentioned this to Harry that night as we were walking along that dismal street that led to Spiro's. Uh, you may be right, but I'm not a fit judge. Anyway, it's a long time since I read Alice in Wonderland. A very long time. Help! What? Help! Look, look there. Outside Spiro's. Isn't that one of the waiters? Yes. Looks as though he's in trouble. He's being attacked. Come on. Help! God damn them. Pickpocket. Push me, would you? You're looking for a goddamn oh. fighter. Well, you, oh. you got one, mister. Let me go. Let me go. Not yet, you lousy little creep. Well, what's going on here? Help me, sir. This man, he, he drunk. He tried to stab me. Oh, drunk, am I? Oh, well, we'll... we'll hey, you drink. Hey, grab him, Harry. Uh, Quick, uh, look out for that uh, knife. Uh, let, let, let go of him. Do you hear? Let go. Hey, what, what, what the hell's happening here? Oh, I'll cut your goddamn throat, oh, mister. Oh, oh. No, you, you don't. Uh, oh. Oh, is, he, is he all right, do you think? That was some punch, Harry. Well, he, he, I think he's stunned. He banged his head as he fell. Yeah, well, in any case, it's a job for the police. No, no, sir. What? No police. Mr. Spiro does not like police. Oh, now, wait. I beg you, no police. Uh, anyway, he's coming around. Oh, he'll be all right. But what started all this anyway? I, I, I push against him accidentally, and he accused me of robbing him. He's, he's drunk, sir. Oh, you can say that again. Well, now, you go inside and get cleaned up. We'll see to him. Thank you, sir. To you, I owe my life. If there is anything I can do to repay you. Uh, you just cut along, and if Mrs. Vera has any questions, you tell him to see me. Yes, sir. You saved my life. Thank you, sir. And with that, the waiter disappeared into the restaurant. Well, after all the excitement and kerfuffle of that incident, I must confess that I found I had quite an appetite... And as soon as we were comfortably seated in the restaurant, Harry and I debated with some trepidation as to whether or not we could expect the special lamb armistan that evening. Soon our regular waiter appeared and carefully set two tumblers on the table. We almost simultaneously inquired after the special. Uh, no, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. No special tonight. Oh, hell, just my luck. And I'll probably miss out next time, too. Why, Harry? You going away? Yes, damn it. I'm off to South America for a month or two in order to mount a new campaign for some very rich clients. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. When do you leave? Tonight. I managed to wangle some reservations. This was intended to be in the nature of a farewell celebration. Oh, and no special. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> Just my luck. Uh, well, I I'm going to miss you, Harry. 
I have enjoyed our evenings together, and these little dinners of ours have well, they've come to mean a great deal to me. Uh, shall I serve now, sir? Well, of course. I didn't realize you were waiting. Shortly afterwards, the waiter served us, and we turned our attention to our dinner. Harry finished his quickly and continued to bemoan his fate and to regret loudly the thought of missing Lamb Armistan during his trip. Then, just as I finished my meal, a waiter leaned over to take Harry's plate. It wasn't our usual waiter, but the man who we had rescued from the drunken sailor. I asked him how he was feeling, but to my surprise, he completely ignored me, and with the air of a man under great strain, he whispered to Harry, My life. I owe it to you. I can't repay you. Well, you have repaid me with your thanks. Please, let's hear no more about it. But I will help you, sir, even if you don't want me to. Do not go into the kitchen tonight. Huh? My life for yours, sir. Tonight or any night. Do not go into Spiro's kitchen. Why shouldn't I go into the kitchen? <laughs> don't be absurd. What's going on here? Is everything all right, gentlemen? Ah, oh, good evening, Spiro. Uh, this man is a little unnerved, I think. Ah, yes. An unfortunate experience. He's saying something about my not visiting your kitchen. What's it all about? Do you know what he means? But of course. He was giving you good advice. It so happens that my too emotional chef heard some rumor that I might have a guest in the kitchen tonight. He flew into a fearful rage and even threatened to give his notice on the spot. Hmm? However, have no fear. I have succeeded in showing him what a signal honor it is to have a true connoisseur observe him at his work first hand. That is all. No, Sancho. You are at the wrong table. See that it does not happen again. The waiter slunk away without daring to raise his eyes, and Spiro drew up a chair to the table. He seated himself and drew his hand lightly over his hair. My invitation for you to visit my humble kitchen, I, I had hoped, Mr. Laffler, to be a surprise, but now the surprise is gone, and all that is left is the invitation. Are you serious? Do you mean that at last we really are to witness the preparation of food in your kitchen tonight? Uh, no, Mr. Laffler, not both. I am faced with a dilemma of great proportions, gentlemen. You, Mr. Laffler, have been my guest for ten years, but our friend here... Oh, Mr. Spiro, I, I, I really understand perfectly. I, I mean, this invitation is solely to Harry here, and... Naturally, my presence is embarrassing. Well, look, no, wait a minute. As it happens, I, I do have another engagement for later, and I must be on my way anyhow. So, you see, there's no dilemma at all, really. Absolutely not. That wouldn't be fair at oh, all. No. Surely, Spiro, you can make an exception on this one occasion. I'm very sorry, sir. Harry, I am not going to sit here and spoil your great adventure. Believe me. And, and then just think of that ferocious chef. I'm sure he's just dying to get his cleaver into you. <laughs> <laughs> so humorous. So I'll just say goodbye now and leave you to Spiro. I'm sure he'll take pains to give you a good show. Well, that's good, you, Vincent. Thanks. I hope you continue to dine here while I'm away. Oh, and have a have a good trip, Harry. Yes. Thank you. Bye now. I will expect you, Mr. Price. Au revoir. Au revoir. And so I left them to it, the smiling Spiro and Harry Laffler, about to realize his greatest ambition. On the way out, I stopped in the foyer to collect my coat, and as I was straightening my tie, I caught a glimpse in the mirror of Harry and Spiro already at the kitchen door. Spiro was holding it open, invitingly wide with one hand, while the other hand rested lightly on Harry's plump meaty shoulder, squeezing it ever so gently, almost lovingly, rather in the way a housewife squeezes a prime fat turkey before she puts it into the oven. I've never seen or heard of Harry Laffler again. Shortly afterwards, I left New York in order to do some filming in England. I've not been back since, and therefore I have never had the opportunity of dining again at Spiro's, nor of renewing my acquaintance with its mysterious owner. In the intervening years, however, my interest in food and its preparation has increased, and I, I can now create and experiment with recipes of my own. 
But I must confess that even in my wildest flights of culinary fancy, I I have never yet dared to attempt lamb amistad. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Co-starring in The Speciality of the House was Hugh Burton with Francis DeWolf, Vernon Joyner and William Slay. The Speciality of the House was first recounted by Stanley Ellen, dramatized by Barry Campbell and produced by John Dyers. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Do you ever wonder what life will be like in, say, 50 years' time? I know I do, especially when I find myself becoming annoyed at some piece of modern tomfoolery. You know, the sort of thing, loud, mindless music being played unnecessarily in stores and restaurants. Checks long overdue because somebody's latest computer has made a mistake. This never seems to happen with bills, I notice. Well, I suppose we all have mm, little likes and dislikes connected with various aspects of modern living, but most of us forget them after a brief flash of annoyance. That is, until the next time. The point I'm making is that we don't dwell upon them continually and become obsessed by them, for that way lies madness. Take, for example, my story this week, which I've called The Ninth Removal. It concerns the case of Amelia Sidgwick. These modern young girls, their clothes are an outrage. Short skirts, low-cut blouses, lipstick, disgusting. My first, and thank goodness, my only encounter with Miss Sidgwick occurred when I called to see an old friend of mine, Peter Jarvis, in connection with some research I was doing for a film script I hoped to write. Peter was the head of a psychiatric clinic, and as I needed some background material on psychiatry, I had arranged to call on him one day at his office. I had expected a cold, cheerless, institutional building, but when I arrived, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the clinic was more like a well-appointed country house. I was greeted by a pretty receptionist told to make myself comfortable and that my friend Peter Jarvis would be available in a few minutes. Accordingly, I settled back in an armchair and picked up a magazine. Suddenly, I became aware of someone hovering over me. Good afternoon. Are you being attended to? Uh, why, oh, yes, yes, I am. Thank you. I'm, I'm waiting to see Dr. Jarvis. Oh, that's all right, then. She was a tall, thin, scrawny woman of about 55 or so, dressed in a severely cut suit of dark grey material. She had a thin, white face with pinched lips and the most penetrating bright blue eyes that I have ever seen. Perhaps we would never have exchanged another word, but at that moment I happened to turn over the page of my magazine and in doing so revealed a full-page advertisement which showed a pretty, if overdeveloped, young lady wearing an incredibly low-cut dress. Disgusting. I beg your pardon? That girl, completely shameless. Just look at her. I must confess, that's just what I was doing, <laughs> looking at her. Now, you know, there are some people who have the happy knack of getting rid of bores and other awkward customers easily. Well, I don't. Perhaps I just don't like hurting people's feelings. 
You remember the rhyme of the ancient mariner where the old sailor stoppeth one of three in order to tell him his long and complicated tale. Well, I'm the one of three, and Miss Sidgwick, having held me with her glittering eye, just took off. Of course, you know, the men are every bit as bad. They encourage that sort of thing. Why, only the other day, I was travelling home in the underground when... God, how I hate the underground, crushed together in this awful atmosphere. I sometimes think that hell isn't a matter of fire and brimstone at all, but simply travelling forever on the underground, surrounded by awful people. Those men sitting there so smug and oily looking. Not one of them would dream of offering me his seat. <laughs> Pigs, sitting there reading their newspapers. And what newspapers? Full of salacious muck headline there. Another sex murder victim found on common. Is it any wonder the way these modern girls dress? That one over there, crossing and uncrossing her legs. Oh. And that short skirt. Disgusting. Oh, she's smiling. Oh, yes, she's noticed that young man ogling her. I'd teach her. I'd take a whip to her. My dear father would never have allowed me to carry on like that. Dear father... The devil's army is all around us, my child. Never forget it. You must fight it. Fight it with all your might. Never cease to fight for God. I have fought, Father. Oh, how I fought for your stern God. I sat there fascinated as Miss Sidgwick rambled on and on. At times she spoke clearly and precisely. At others she was almost incoherent with rage. Having at length described to me the trials and tribulations which she had suffered on the London underground system, she then went on to tell me about her work. Miss Sidgwick's employers had, it seems, been many and various. Her typing plus her sense of duty were beyond reproach. Employers might appreciate her work, but it seems to a man they were lovers of peace, taking unkindly to criticism, and at length Miss Sidgwick was cast out, and with each casting out, her hate grew. One day, however, she joined a company run by a retired brigadier who had inherited his father's tea-importing business. The atmosphere was middle-aged, quiet, and respectable, and the office staff adhered to the old ways of dress and deportment. As for the brigadier himself... You see, the brigadier was a tall, distinguished, grey-haired gentleman, with both good looks and charming manners. He was not married, he did not smoke, and he was always extremely respectful towards his female employees... He was what I should call a gentleman of the old school. From her manner, I guessed that Miss Sidgwick was not in love with the brigadier. It was just that she worshipped him. Sometimes in my dreams I saw him standing a long way off on a hill. I saw myself running towards him, but the distance never seemed to shorten. In the same way as Father's God, he was always unreachable. And so matters stood. Miss Sidgwick had at last found employment which suited her ideally and an employer whom she could more than respect. And then one morning... Miss Sidgwick? Yes, sir? Will you come in a moment, please? Uh, certainly, sir. That's right, dear lady. Just come in and shut the door, will you? That's the ticket. Now, just take a seat. Mm -hmm. I have something to say to you. Now... The point is that I've decided to expand our little team. Indeed, sir. Yes, in fact, I've engaged the young lady. Excellent character. She's to join us on Monday. Well, I was not aware, sir, that you'd interviewed any applicants or even advertised the position. Uh, no. No, no, you're quite right. But this young person was strongly recommended. Most strongly. I see, sir. Needless to say, dear lady, I will look to you to see that Miss Franklin... <laughs> that's her name, by the way. That she, uh, settles in happily... I shall do my duty, sir, as always. Of course you will, dear lady. That goes without saying. The following Monday morning began very badly for Miss Sidgwick. On the underground, a large man stood on her toe. He was rewarded by a sharp kick on the shins. But there was worse to come. 
When she arrived at the office, she found her fellow workers in a buzz of curious excitement as they awaited the arrival of the new girl. It was a tradition in the company that newcomers did not start until ten o'clock on their first morning, so there was plenty of time for speculation. Miss Sidgwick, however, refused to join in the speculations, even when approached directly by Mr. Parsons, the firm's junior filing clerk, a jovial man of about forty-five. Well, miss, what about the new girl, eh? Do you think she'll be nice? No, indeed. I shall be greatly surprised if she is nice, as you put it. Oh, dear. However, as long as she does her work efficiently, I hardly think it matters whether she is nice or not. Well, I was only wondering what she'd be like, what... What class of person, you know? At least I expect her to be tolerable. Good morning. Uh, yes, uh, miss, can I help you? I hope so. I'm Anne Franklin. I'm coming to work here. I see. Oh, look at that. It's going to be a pleasure showing her the ropes. Mr Parsons, I suggest that you get on with your work. After all, you are being paid to do it. Uh, miss Franklin, may I ask if that is your normal business attire? Attire? Oh, the gear. Well, it's all I've got. I mean, I've got lots of clothes, but they're all like this. It's all right, isn't it? My last place didn't mind. This is a respectable office. I should hope so. Otherwise, I shouldn't have come to work here. Ah, Miss Franklin, so you've arrived. Good morning, sir. My word, how fresh and smart you look. <laughs> like a breath of spring, eh, Miss Sidgwick? If you say so, sir. Yes, I do, dear lady. And now I'll leave Miss Franklin in your capable hands. Yes, sir. During the next few days, Miss Sidgwick could be likened to a lion in a cage with a succulent but stupid lamb, which the laws of creation had for some reason forbidden it to eat. Oh, that stupid girl, flaunting herself, smiling at every man who comes within range. She even took to applying her lipstick during working hours. To this day, I do not know how I managed to restrain myself. All these things might just have been bearable if it had not been for the girl's work. It was awful. There we are. How's that, then? Mm, oh, no, 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 no. This will not do, I'm afraid. There are six mistakes in this one letter alone. Oh, dear, you are fussy. And here, look. Three misspellings. And last year's date. I'm sorry, but this will also have to be done again. <laughs> God, I've certainly made a hell of a bloody mess of that one. What did you say? Well, I mean, I've made a mess of it, haven't I? Let it be understood, Miss Franklin, that foul language is not tolerated in this office. Neither is blasphemy. Do I make myself clear? Yes, miss. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, but you are a funny old stick. What? <laughs> Nutty as a fruitcake. This has gone quite far enough. I am going to see the brigadier. Suit yourself. And so Miss Sidgwick stormed into the brigadier's office and there presented him with the full catalogue of her complaints against the pretty young newcomer. His reaction, however, was not quite what she had expected. Alas, the youth of today, Miss Sidgwick, does not adhere to the principles we treasure. But you do not see, son. Blinded by your own goodness, you do not see. She bears her flesh, she paints her face, she encourages men. Why, Mr. Parsons has hardly been himself since she came here. In addition to which, she cannot type. I, too, Miss Sidgwick, deplore the lax morals and lower standards of this permissive age. But, dear lady, you and I can't fight the world. Oh, correct me, sir, if I am wrong, but surely a soldier who believes in his cause never ceases to fight. True, very true. But when defeat is certain, he changes his tactics. He pretends to surrender, infiltrates the enemy's ranks, and becomes an underground force. Oh, but that... that... She insulted me! She should be... she should be cast out! That, dear lady, would be to admit defeat. Now, I'll tell you what. Ask her to come and see me, will you? You will chastise her, sir. Appealing as the prospect is, dear lady, I fear that I shall have to content myself with a reprimand on this occasion. Uh, thank you for bringing the matter to my attention. Thank you, sir. And Miss Sidgwick? Uh, yes, sir. You are my strong right arm. Never forget that. Oh, sir. Uh, and remember, infiltrate the enemy's ranks, dear lady. 
Infiltrate the enemy's ranks. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed, sir. I'll remember. For the rest of that day, Miss Sidgwick, it seems, basked in a golden haze, remembering the brigadier's words. You are my strong right arm, dear lady. Oh, oh, I am. I am. By tea time that day, Miss Sidgwick had even unbent sufficiently to spend a few moments chatting with Mr. Parsons and Miss Franklin about the latest topics of interest. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Parsons. I don't think that sort of thing could ever happen here. We breed a much better type of politician. So much more background. Listen to this in the paper. Another of those sex murders. A girl of 19 found brutally murdered on Wimbledon Common. This is the eighth victim to be struck down in the past two years. Ugh, gives me the creeps. Whoever does it must be kinky. Poor girl. I wonder why so many of these attacks take place nowadays. I can tell you. It's because these modern girls ask for it. Short skirts, lipstick, low-cut blouses. Is it any wonder they get assaulted? <laughs> assaulted, I can understand. <laughs> but murdered. Ugh. Miss Sidgwick was about to launch herself upon a lengthy and angry tirade concerning Miss Franklin and all girls like her when she remembered the brigadier's words. Infiltrate the enemy's ranks, dear lady. Isn't it strange how great disasters often have humble beginnings? A smouldering cigarette end tossed carelessly aside and an entire building burns down. Or a, a cat runs across a busy street, a bus swerves and someone is killed. Well, that night on her way home, Miss Sidgwick suddenly realized that she had forgotten her umbrella. Now, Miss Sidgwick without her umbrella was like a d'Artagnan without his sword. Her umbrella, apart from its proper use, was also invaluable on occasions for shin-cracking or rib-poking. And so, muttering angrily to herself, she retraced her steps to the now-deserted office. But was it deserted? That's strange. A light in the brigadier's office. But I wonder, can he be working? He didn't say anything. No, no, silly of me. Perhaps he's just forgotten to turn off his light. Oh, what's that? Oh, dear... Yeah, perhaps I'd better investigate. Whoever it is has left the brigadier's door open. I wonder if I can see. <laughs> oh. Charles, this is cosy. <laughs> Just the two of us. Just the two of us. <laughs> Kiss me again, Anne. Greedy. <laughs> Miss Sidgwick stood there and stared in horror. The brigadier and Miss Franklin were far too occupied to notice the white face staring at them through the open doorway. To say that Miss Sidgwick was in a state of shock would be to put it mildly. She left the building quickly and began to walk. I walked a long way that night, through Panton Street into Leicester Square, back again into Piccadilly, through the seedy streets of Soho, and everywhere, everywhere. Everywhere the voice of corruption screamed at me from hoardings, bookshop windows, cinema posters, from the white leering faces of men and the painted faces of the women. Well, at last I, I came to a small square surrounded by iron-backed seats. I sat down. By now, the numbness I had felt since leaving the office had passed. I remember I sat there, sobbing, feeling like a lost child in a strange land, alone in a city peopled by my enemies. And I thought of my father. The devil's army! Fight it, my child! Fight it! And of the brigadier as he used to be. Infiltrate the enemy's ranks, dear lady. I heard the laughter of the men and the women, the noise of the traffic passing by. I, I cried out, why am I forsaken? Then... Then an awful thought came to me. Could it be, could it possibly be that I was mad? Hurriedly, I pushed the thought to the back of my mind. Then I, I imagined I saw rows and rows and rows of faces, laughing, leering, grinning faces. <laughs> and I wanted to smash them! Smash them! Smash them! <laughs> the next morning, I gather, saw Miss Sidgwick back at her desk as usual. She rebuked Miss Franklin for her bad typing and greeted the brigadier with reserve. 
From that time on, she watched both of them, much as a stoat watches a pair of well-fed rabbits, keeping meticulous note of their movements. Each day, she carefully examined the brigadier's desk diary. At last, her vigilance was rewarded. She discovered in the diary an entry for the following Wednesday evening. The brigadier had written A.F., followed by an exclamation mark. The question was, where would they meet? Miss Sidgwick decided to make certain. On that Wednesday evening, she followed Miss Franklin almost to her front door. Then she hid in the shadows and prepared to wait. To wait, if necessary, for hours. In fact, her vigil lasted barely half an hour. Then Miss Franklin came out of the house and began to walk towards the nearby underground station. Miss Sidgwick followed. I remember she was hurrying, but it was quite easy, really, to keep up with her. I followed her along the passage and along the tunnel that led to the ticket office. I can see her now. She was wearing a blue two-piece costume with an incredibly short skirt. She wore high-heeled shoes and she carried a white handbag, which she swung as she walked along. When she reached the platform, she almost stood at the edge doing a little impatient jigging dance as she waited for the train to arrive. The platform was fairly crowded, and I was able to get so close to her that I could smell the cheap perfume she'd obviously drenched herself with. As we waited for the train to arrive, the platform became more and more crowded. I moved closer to her. I began to feel strange, warm excitement. Then, as the train drew nearer and nearer, I leaned forward... You little slut! You have corrupted God! At the same time, I pushed her hard. <coughs> Nobody saw me do it. The platform was too crowded. And then I stepped back and was immediately lost in the crowd as it surged forward. I left the station, made my way back to the office where I knew the brigadier would be waiting. Waiting for her. So here you are at last. Miss Sidgwick, what are you doing here? Is something wrong? No. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Is there something you want to tell me? Yes, uh, yes, yes. I see. Sit down, won't you? Uh, no? Well, I'm afraid whatever it is, we'll just have to wait until morning. I have an important engagement tonight. No, sir, you have no engagement. Miss Franklin, that slut, will, will not be coming here tonight. What the devil do you mean? I saw you, both of you, that night. And since then I've watched, watched and waited. <laughs> then tonight, I struck. I see. Miss Sidgwick, I think perhaps you'd better sit down. But first, I suggest that you put down that obviously lethal weapon you've been trying to conceal beneath your coat. Oh, but, but now, please I... Please do as I say, I've... at once. I'm not accustomed to having my orders disobeyed. Thank you. Hmm. Very dangerous-looking knife, dear lady. Where did you get it? I, I bought it at the Ironmonger's. Nobody knows I've got it. Nobody saw me. I take it that you did not use it on poor Miss Franklin. No. I pushed her under a train. Ah. Did anybody see you? No. Well, that is, I don't think so. It will look like an accident. Well, I suppose we must be thankful for that. Miss Sidgwick, I'm very displeased with you. Did I not say to you in this very office not so long ago that you were to infiltrate the enemy's ranks, act as they do? Uh, Yes, sir, but... I'm not interested in your excuses. I only want to know why you took it upon yourself to make what I can only describe as managerial decisions. I am the general in this army, Miss Sidgwick, and I and I alone make the decisions. I decide who is to be removed. Do I make myself clear? I'm so sorry. I I, I don't understand. Being sorry would not have been much comfort if you had brought disaster on my entire campaign by your thoughtless and ill-conceived actions, dear lady. I had great plans for you. Great plans. In time, I might well have allowed you to work in the field with me. But now, 
How can I ever trust you again? Oh, please, please trust me. Oh, please. It's been a glorious campaign so far. Eight of them I've removed. The last one on Wimbledon Common. And the fame of my work has been proclaimed throughout the country. Front page stuff, too. <gasps> they came to me, flaunting their bodies. Young. Eager. For a while, I became as they were. Then I struck. I took them to lonely places. And then... And you, Miss Sidgwick, have interfered. You have destroyed the ninth removal. Oh, I'm so very sorry, you see. I, I didn't know. Please, please forgive me. Oh, please. I do forgive you, dear lady. For I see now that you only acted with the very best intentions. Oh. Yes, I, I forgive you. We have a great task before us, you and I. For you see, dear lady, there are so many, so very many more to be removed. I sat there in that comfortable, warm waiting room, listening to Miss Sidgwick pouring out her dreadful, monstrous, unbelievable story. I sat there stunned, not daring to look her in the face. Then, suddenly, I, I was roused from my daze by the arrival of my friend, Dr. Jarvis. Hello, Vincent. Oh, <coughs> hello, Peter. So sorry to have kept you all this time. I got held up in a difficult case. Hello, Miss Sidgwick. You here? Uh, yes, sir. I'm just going. I only looked in to see that everything was some was as it should be. Well, goodbye. It's been so nice to have someone to talk to. Well, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, g uh, goodbye. Bye-bye, dear lady. Peter, that, um, that woman, is she safe? I, I mean... Uh... <laughs> Miss Sidgwick? Yes. yes. Safe as houses. Interesting case, though. I must tell you about it sometime. Yes. Yes, you must. I say, you're all right, old man. I say, you, you do look a bit seedy. <laughs> Fancy you getting stuck with old Ma Sidgwick. <laughs> Excuse me, Dr. Jarvis. We were suddenly interrupted by the arrival of a very pretty young blonde. As she came towards us, I experienced... For a moment, a strange sense of unreality. For I saw that she was wearing a blue two-piece suit with an incredibly short skirt. She was carrying a white handbag and wore high-heeled shoes. Sorry to disturb you. Yes? I've left the papers for the Peabody case on your desk, but I wonder what you wanted to do about these two, Fredericks and Wilkinson. You did say they were urgent. Good Lord, so I did. I've forgotten all about them. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, I'm not going to have any time today. I'll tell you what. If it's all right with you, why don't we stay on late this evening? Get them cleared away. Who knows? If we get finished quickly, I might even reward you by taking you out to supper. I know a nice little restaurant out near Wimbledon Common. Hmm. That would be nice. Thank you. Right, Miss Davis. Let's settle then. Well, come along, old man. We've... You can't stay here ogling our Miss Davis all day. I'll have some coffee sent into my office. We can talk in peace there. Come on, we've got work to do. And work we did. Peter proved a mine of information concerning psychiatry, and I listened to him carefully and made copious notes. But somehow, after that visit, I didn't feel that I had the heart to carry on with my film script. I felt, <laughs> to put it mildly out of my depth. And so, having thought about the whole thing carefully, I decided that, all things considered, it might be better if I stuck to something simple. It might, I thought, be safer to write a... a, a cookery book, for example, and that's exactly what I did. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in The Ninth Removal were Frida Jackson and Richard Pearson with Claire Sutcliffe, Michael Siegel and Alan Rowe. 
The ninth removal was first recounted by R. Chetwind Hayes, dramatized by Barry Campbell, and produced by John Dyers. Vincent Price presents Edward Woodward and Annette Crosby in To My Dear, Dear Saladin by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. Cats of the family Carnivora, the domestic variety. The ancient Egyptians worshipped them. The Chinese painted and wrote poems about them. In the Middle Ages, they were considered the familiars, the soulmates of witches and sorcerers. Tabbies, Persians, Siamese, Manx. Even the naming of them can usually be guaranteed to cause a feeling of either near worship or positive aversion. But take it from me, the pampered pet is still alive and well and living at... <laughs> but you don't need me to tell you. I guarantee you won't have to look far. But what happens when the cat beloved outlives its master, mistress? What if instead of being put down, rehoused, arrangements have already been made to allow it to continue its reign in its own familiar surroundings? It can happen. In the story I'm about to tell you, it did. When her great-aunt Hester died, Emily wasn't at all surprised to come into her estate, not only as nearest living relative, Emily had always been a firm favorite ever since childhood. As for her husband, Freddie, he, not to mention an ever-growing number of creditors, had positively grown to depend on the bequest. <laughs> no, not even Aunt Hester's open hostility was going to keep him away from that will-reading. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, all in order. Well, thank God for that. Please, Freddie. Oh, very much as expected. A few somewhat eccentric charities in which your great aunt's preference for animal as opposed to human society comes well to the fore. The more I see of people, the better I like my dog, eh? Freddie. Quite. However, <clears throat> to my much-beloved great-niece, Emily Louisa Stanhope, I do give and bequeath my home, Longbridge Manor, together with contents and the remainder of my estate, real and monetary, whatsoever. Damn good. Congratulations, old girl. But, upon the following sole condition. Uh-huh, here we go. Might have known the old hag would have kept some trick up her sleeve. It stands to reason, doesn't it, eh? Not only right to the end, but beyond. Freddy. I'm sorry, Mr. Forbes. To my dear, dear Sanity. I wish you wouldn't keep going on about it, dear. All right, all right. Matter of fact, we came out of it bloody well. We were all she had. You were all she had. She hated my guts. Oh, I'm sure she didn't. Oh, come off it, love. <laughs> well, I mean, it was mutual. Let's not spill any tears. <laughs> you hear me down there, you old nutter? Mutual. <laughs> oh, come on, move over, you twit. <coughs> well, I mean, to try and push us off and saddle us with salad in a damn pussy cat. I ask you, what a name to give a cross-eyed moggy. What, what, what was it that old codger read out for the rest of its natural life? In the comfort of its present estate, in the style to which it is accustomed. <laughs> oh, bloody cheap. Doesn't seem much to ask. Not to ask, dear. Demand. I mean, let's, let's get the words right. Demand. They were very close. Oh, for God's sake, woman. I mean, how can you get close to a moggy? Will you move over? <laughs> Emily and Freddy made their move. And the first item from her dead mistress's bedroom window was Saladin. Saladin. But not the pampered Persian that Freddy had expected. Overweight from years of Aunt Hester's chockies. A silver bell on a ribbon around its fat feline neck. Oh, no. Saladin was sleek, alert, watchful. Resourceful, too. In its own right. And even at that first instant, Freddy noticed all of these things about Salad. Freddy? Freddy? 
ready. Yeah. Coffee. Oh, uh, well, great. Uh, put it down anywhere. There's a lot. Right. Well, that should do it. Oh, is it sugar? What? Oh, yes. Oh, it's good. Mmm. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Would you believe it? Twelve tea chests of junk. We haven't even started on the downstairs yet. If it's just junk, I can't see why you're bothering to create it. Oh, oh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that some of it might fetch a bob or two at some local auction. I mean, the magpies still exist. Yes. Oh, come on. I don't go all hearts and flowers on me, love. If you don't like the idea of it earning a few bob, I can always build a ruddy great bonfire. No, but... no, no. I need to blow your top about it. No, silly, I know, but yes. Well, but you're not really thanking me at all, are you, eh? Come on. Come on, out with it. I do, I do oh, no, but I do. I do, though. I do. Too damn true, I do. You've had that keeper of the holy relics expression on your face ever since you set foot through the hallowed portal, so why don't you admit it? Look, all you've got to do is give me the nod. I can have that lot uncrated back exactly where we found them. I mean, it'd be, be, be just like we've never been here. I mean, is that what you want? Is that what you want? You want an honest answer? Uh, yes. I honestly don't know what I want, Freddy, and that's a fact. Oh, I see. Oh, my God. How the old girl would have loved that, eh? Oh, she's probably up there now rubbing her hands with anticipation. I can't see why she should be. Oh, it's the thin end of the wedge, isn't it? Seeds of discontent and all of her planting. Well, I mean, just look at us. Look at us. We're not inside the place a couple of days. At each other's throats like a couple of banshees. Oh, that's a slight exaggeration. Mm hmm Mind you, I mean, I don't know why it should surprise me. Do you remember the first time you brought me around to meet the great Aunt Hester? Me and me 50 bob off the peg suit. You know, Sunday tea, wasn't it? Silver tea service, lace doilies, paper-thin china, bread and butter to match. An atmosphere you could cut with your silver cake knife. My God, talk about, talk about pre-judgment. She'd made her mind up about me even before the taxi swung into the drive. She was old, set in her way. And determined to stay that way no matter what it cost. Mind you, mind you got the worst of it. Hovering between us, keeping up the small talk. As though you actually believed any of it was going to make the slightest bit of difference. Oh, I thought it might at the time. Well, it didn't then, and it isn't now. I mean, thanks to her, we're back there again, aren't we? Right back. Choosing time all over again, is it? You know that isn't true. But do I, though? Because she's dead and gone. And you're here. I don't really have any choice, do I, Freddy? <laughs> no, no, you... You poor old thing, I'm afraid you do not. <laughs> now, come on, come on, come on. If we, we'll, never, we'll never get through, right? What next, then? Well, can you hold these, these steps for me? Okay. Okay? It is to be our damn bedroom now, you know. But I honestly don't think that either of us could stand Aunt Hester staring down at us every time we made for the matrimonial couch, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose we could. No, no. <laughs> All right, you got it? Yes, up you go. All right. No. Oh, Dad, look, pass me the screwdriver, will you? No. Here. Thank you. All right, this should do it. Saladin's fall from grace and ultimate exile did not happen overnight. As with all of Freddy's maneuverings, a certain subtlety, not to mention a fine sense of cruelty, seemed to be the order of the day. Even to Emily, the cat's original banishment from the bedroom, from the very foot of the bed it had shared over so many years, 
seem not only reasonable, but desirable. Aunt Hester's absolute attachment to her beloved Saladin was not something she felt obliged to keep up. But exile from the bedroom was only the beginning. Soon the whole of the upper floor was declared out of bounds. The reception rooms came next. Drawing room, dining room, library. Even its favorite conservatory, all denied. As for Saladin, the fall from grace seemed incomprehensible. Its world was coming to an end. Emily. Emily! Mm-hmm. Your coffee's getting cold. Yes, all right. Well, for God's sake, you've been standing at that window for ages. What the hell are you looking at? Poor old Saladin. He's been sitting there, waiting to be let in ever since I first drew the curtain. Yeah, well, poor old Saladin can just go on waiting. Freddy, could I just... No, for the umpteenth time, no. A cat in the kitchen, it's, it's, it's just not damned hygienic. It just got used to it. Well, then it can get unused to it. But... No, no, but. Besides, you see the state that thing's let itself get into? Not altogether his fault. Oh, and who else's his fault is it, I should like to know? Eh? It was. Yeah, well, come on, come on, let's be having it then. It was one of the conditions, Freddie, for our being here at all. The only one, really. Oh, I see. We're back to that again, are we? On my estate. That's what the old battle axe dictated. Well, then. And not, not in the bedroom, not in the kitchen, not even in that box you managed to smuggle into the old wash house. On the estate. And that's all it said. Right? Eddie, please. That the grounds are all part of the estate, my love. A bush to sleep under, regular diet of field mice. If it hasn't altogether lost the skill, he'll survive. Anyway, even if it doesn't... No, Freddy. No, 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 I know. Look, it doesn't bear thinking about, does it? But even if it doesn't survive, well, Auntie Hester is up there already, remember? All ready to welcome her poor little precious to her eternal cat's cradle in the sky. Get on with your coffee. <coughs> Saladin's inevitable and seemingly final departure occurred some two weeks later. Optimistically, Emily continued to leave her tidbits outside the kitchen door but they remained untouched. Freddy secretly congratulated himself that the dratted animal had got the message. Eventually, even Emily was forced to accept that the chance of Saladin's ever returning was as remote as it was forlorn. Not even in the grounds anymore. Sorry, what? Saladin. He seems to have disappeared. Oh, so I noticed. Typical, isn't it? Such base ingratitude, eh? What do you mean? Well, such tempting morsels you've been smuggling out to it, too. <laughs> oh, what pushcat could resist them? Freddy, those scraps I've been putting out, you... You wouldn't deliberately... Doctor them with something nasty from the woodshed, drop of arsenic in its steak tartare, spot a paraquat in its poisson au gratin, eh? Perish the thought. Oh, come on now. Really. I mean, I mean it. Perish the thought. <laughs> you do promise me. I don't have to, do I? Oh, dear. Oh, good. Now what? Oh, it's one... Oh, oh well, I, I suppose I've always thought of her as a distant cousin of mine. Yeah, what is it? Another... Of the Beggle Borrow Brigade? No, no, she's been very ill. Out of hospital now, but was wondering if I'd care to visit her for a few days. Please bring your scrubbing brush and act dog's body for a week or so. Tear it out there with her. I'd like to go, Freddy. Oh, come on. I'd like to go. You'd like to? You'd like to go? And while you're on this errand of mercy, how the hell do you expect me to manage her? Well, it'll just be for a few days. Oh, no. No, don't bother. Don't you bother. Emily really needn't have worried on his behalf. Now, how did the old saying go? When the cat's away... (laughs) And he'd laughed openly and loud at the aptness of his choice. 2007, 2008, 9, 3 grand, as per agreement. Oh, plus 
a percentage of anything over the odds in due course. Oh, yeah. In due course, Reddy. In, in due course. course. Just jogging the memory on that. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were pleased with that first consignment. Oh, right? prime, Freddy. Prime. Yeah. Well, it should be, old mate. Nothing of the best for dear Aunt Hester. Been in the family for generations, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> she, she's probably got the crown jewels in the Ark of the Covenant stashed away in one of those damned attics of hers. Huh? Uh, all in good time, smiley mate, all in good time. Well, as much as you can let him have, was what the man said. Oh, well, I, I'm, more, I'm more than happy to drink that. Right? <sighs> Cheers. Well, come on, get it down you then. Well, well, it's just that it is getting a bit on the late side. Oh, for God's sake, man. Yeah. You've had one eye on that damn front door ever since you set foot inside the thing. Oh, what was you always thinking of, old mate? Me? <laughs> yeah, well, not that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting your better half. Oh, but, uh... oh no, the hell with my better half. I'll tell you something, old son. Because I, t- I tell her trouble with my better half is that she's so top drawer she doesn't even realise when she's had the furniture cut out from under her. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, when I met her, impoverished but genteel. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you take it from me. They, they're the worst type. They can't afford what they think they're entitled to, and they won't put up with what they've got. Mm. I mean, God knows how she'd manage if she didn't have it off ready to set the pace. Oh, and you can certainly set the pace, my old mate. Tell <laughs> you, old son, if it had not been for me, she'd have been... Well, she'd have taken after a dear dead auntie. She'd have put down dust sheets, locked herself away up there in the attic, existed on a diet of baked beans on toast and cold cocoa. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I ought to be making a move, uh, Freddy. You do no such thing. You will sit down. I could just sit down. I mean, I invited you here, didn't I? You are my guest. I mean, if her bloody cousin is so important to her that she's got to drop everything and tear off the minute a damn summons drops on the doormat, so what does she expect me to do, eh? Eh? I mean, just sit here playing patience, twiddling me thumbs. Yeah, yeah, you've got a point there, Freddy. Too right, I've got a point. Well, I mean, she, she would like that, smile. She'd like that. I mean, she'd like to think that I was here on my own, Leo, pining away in solitary, counting the hours to her blessed return. Yeah. Yeah, it's in my God. That's dead on cue. Have you noticed? Have you noticed ever since you've been here, that damn phone's never stopped ringing. Ring, ring, yeah. ring, ring. I couldn't help wondering. It's only her, mate. It is only her. So stop check, old mate. Uh... Yeah. I mean, can't you just hear her telling that milk sock cousin of hers, I'll just give the old scoundrel a ring and check what he's been up to, eh? <laughs> ring, damn you. Go on, ring. The trick is. The tricky smiley is to keep them guessing. Yeah. Must get a bit wary, no? Oh, it's too bloody true. If it weren't for the fact... Yeah? Well, I mean, it's not forever, is it? I mean, nothing goes on forever. Here, no, 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 no. Not the way you're thinking, old man. I mean, nothing that's crude, nothing, nothing brutal. It's just, she's got no staying power, do you see? First thing I noticed about her along with her very definite worldly prospects, of course. And the old auntie, she knew that too. Now, you see, I have got staying power. And the old lady, she recognised it, Emmy. I mean, that's what we had in common. Still, I mean, as the good book says, everything comes to him who waits. But the Lord helps them who helps themselves, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I've really got to go now, Freddy. Yeah, yeah, well, all right, old son. Uh... Well, not knock the lights off as you leave, Smiley. Oh, matey. Oh, yeah. Ah. Freddy had no idea how long he'd slept. Minutes? Hours? It was of no importance. For the present, he was content to lie there. When he finally took in his surroundings, it was to note that Smiley had obviously taken him at his word and found his own way out. A dim light from the hall slanted through the half-open door. It all seemed ordinary enough, and yet... But nothing he could put a name to. An awareness. Even in the first moments between sleeping and waking, an awareness of having been disturbed. Not by someone, something. Nothing is obvious. Nothing is positive. More like something within himself part of a dream. And then he heard it. Far off and yet omnipresent. 
not be denied. You... Who's there? You're playing games with me, Smiley. Who the hell's there? It's a cellar. recognizable in the flickering candlelight. A shadow of a cat, scrawny, fur-matted, nothing of its former self. Only the eyes were the same. Watchful, opaque, unflinching. And Freddy was held by those eyes. Until the cat leapt features distorted by worm, mildew, damp. And yet... Oh, I... Still there. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Those green eyes. I just like... Freddy recognized them for what they were. The eyes were the eyes of Saladin. Watching him from beside the portrait of its dead mistress. And then closer, ever closer, until... <laughs> Months of deprivation had added hunger to the need for vengeance. Oh, there was much to savor, to explore. Until finally... It was done. It's my fault. I blame myself. Really, Mum? Well, why should you do that? I should have guessed something was the matter, Inspector. Oh? I've been away the best part of a week, nursing a distant cousin. He didn't want me to go. But anyway, I've been ringing here every day, sometimes several times a day. No reply. I even had them check the line. I should have realized then there must be something. I should have realized. Oh. Before you rang us, did you inquire at his place of work? He... He doesn't have any. Oh? Private means, then? You could say that. I see. Friends? I'm sorry? A particular friend? No. No one that could possibly concern you. You can be that positive. As anyone can be. This place, you see, it's mine. All of it's mine. Freddy enjoyed his comfort. There was too much to lose. Uh -huh. It became an understanding between us. It's nothing else. I see. Do you? And yet, not true. Understanding demands some kind of give and take, doesn't it? With Freddy, well, it always seemed to be one way. Not his fault, and I didn't mind. It was always that way, right from the start. In a perverse way, I suppose I must have got some masochistic pleasure out of it. Was always that way? 
I'm sorry. You said was always that way. Oh, did I? Yes, I did, didn't I? So I did. Well, I'd better start by checking the house. But I already have done. Oh, just to be sure. Oh! oh. <laughs> and who are we here, eh? <laughs> oh, pussycat. <laughs> Who's a pretty pussy then, eh? <laughs> they did find him, of course, in time. It, it wasn't a pretty thing they found. They decided his broken back and long exposure had caused his death. They blamed what was left of the poor fellow on the rats. Then they sealed his coffin to save Emily any further distress. Strangely enough, Emily was over her sudden tragic bereavement even sooner than she'd thought possible. In the few brief moments she ever gave Freddie a thought... She found a strange solace in her great Aunt Hester's portrait, miraculously restored, hanging exactly where it had always hung. But even more particularly, she found comfort in her cat, in the gentle, oh so comforting purr of her sleek, fat cat. Salad. Dear, dear. That was To My Dear, Dear Saladin, starring Edward Woodward as Freddie and Annette Crosby, Emily, with Steve Hodson, Smiley and the Police Inspector, and Lewis Stringer, the Solicitor. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William Ingram, and directed by John Dyer. And time now to hand you over to Peter Lee. Last night at this time, I gave some advice about locking your doors and windows to make certain that you wouldn't be disturbed. But evidently not everyone heeded my warning. It seems that quite a lot of you received rather a nasty shock when that door slowly opened with a more than ominous squeak. And those curtains started to flutter so noisily. Caused by the wind, was it? Well, if these rather frightening things did happen to you, then I trust that you've learnt your lesson. Because it's time I introduced you to our last guest, Vincent Price. The Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello. I'm so happy you're with us again. This story I've called William and Mary. I suppose that most of us have at some time or another lain awake in the early hours of the morning and thought about death and the afterlife. I know I have. Or rather, I used to, until a few years ago, when I had an experience which caused me to... uh, But let me explain. At that time, I was living in a small university town. Although I was unaware of it, I was actually living only a few hundred yards away from two old friends of mine, William and Mary Pearl. I say old friends, but in fact, I had known Mary when we were students together... And it only met William when Mary married him some years later. I had absolutely no idea that they were even in the same town as I, until one morning, to my utter surprise, a letter arrived from their solicitor informing me of William's death. He had, it seems, left me a small bequest. Before I begin the reading, I should like to extend my deepest sympathy to the widow of my late friend and client, William Pearl. Thank you. Uh, Well, ladies and gentlemen, I shall now read the last will and testament of the late William Arthur Pearl. I, uh, William Arthur Pearl, being of sound mind... As I sat in that rather dreary little office, I found myself staring at Mary. 
To say that I was shocked by the change in her appearance would be to understate the case. When I first knew her, she had been a lively, pretty girl. Now she had developed a sullen, resentful air, and her whole face gave the impression of having slowly but surely sagged to pieces through years and years of joyless marriage to her husband, William. At first, they had been happy enough, but then, as William grew older, he developed a kind of cruel, nagging irritability, which Mary had at first tried to dissuade, then to combat, and finally to accept in silence. I remembered the occasion of our last meeting. Mary and I were sitting in the Pearl flat, waiting for William to return from a lecture. We sat chatting of this and that, and I remember I had offered her a cigarette, which he had accepted and lit without thinking. Oh, what have you done? I shouldn't be smoking, you know. William disapproves. In fact, between ourselves, he disapproves of most things these days. He's changed a lot, you know. He's become almost a caricature of a peevish, pedantic don. I'm surprised you hadn't noticed it. Really, Mary, you exaggerate, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassing you. Stupid of you are also embarrassing me, my oh, dear. William. Continually refusing to obey my request concerning your smoking. William, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you coming. Well, that's blatantly obvious. Otherwise, you'd hardly be smoking a cigarette and discussing me as though I were a delinquent child. This is really my fault. I, I was asking oh, Mary... Oh, need to be gallant, old man. Mary, it seems, has developed a martyr complex, which can only be alleviated by the consumption of endless numbers of cigarettes. For God's sake, must you behave like this in front of friends? Why the hell do you object to my smoking anyway? Are you afraid I'll get cancer? No, it's not that. Then why can't I smoke? Because I disapprove, that's why. You disapprove of so many things, William. Cigarettes, lipstick, alcohol, children. Especially children. Needless to say, as soon as I could decently excuse myself, I, I left this somewhat painful domestic scene. And after that, we rather drifted apart. Indeed, I was surprised that William had remembered me at all, let alone left me something in his will. I even felt that he had begun to resent my very friendship with Mary. And finally, the voice of the so... solicitor broke in on my thoughts and brought me back to reality. I have been instructed to give you this sealed envelope. Your late husband sent it to us shortly before he uh, uh, passed away. Since it appears this might contain something of a personal nature, no doubt you prefer to take it with you and read it in private. Yes, thank you. I think I should. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the reading of the last will and testament of the late William Arthur Pearl. It remains for me to thank you for coming in uh, to wish you a good day. Good day. Mrs. Well, Mary, dear. I'm so glad you came. It's good to see you again. And I'm delighted to see you again, although I could have wished that the meeting had taken place in happier circumstances. Look, why don't you come back for a drink? Now, I mean... Well, are you sure? Wouldn't you rather be alone? No, I'd like you to come, really, I would. I'm afraid I'm not much good at being alone. And this letter worries me a little. I don't know why. But then, of course, I, I'd be delighted to come. When we arrived at the Pearl's house, Mary led me straight through to the living room. I remember she didn't even stop to remove her coat. As soon as we were settled, she took out the envelope the solicitor had given her and drew out 15 or so closely written sheets. Slowly, she reached into her handbag, took out her spectacles and put them on. Then, holding the pages high in front of her, she began to read aloud. This note, my dear Mary, is entirely for you and will be given to you shortly after I am gone. It is nothing but an attempt on my part to explain exactly what Dr. Landy is going to do to me. I knew it would be something like this. How could he? Mary, what's the matter, Matt? You, you've gone quite pale. Who is this Dr. Landy? What, what did he do to win? I'll be all right. Here, you take the letter and read it to me, please. It will make it easier somehow, hearing all this from a third person. Very well, my dear, if you want me to, but I... I... Please. Well, of course, yes. Now, let's see, where did we get to? Yes, here we are. The details of the disease that struck me down so suddenly, you know. 
No need to waste time on them. As I have lain here in hospital with somewhere between one and six months to live, I seem to be growing more melancholy every hour. And then, one Tuesday morning, six weeks ago, my friend John Landy, the neurosurgeon, burst into my room. William, my boy, this is perfect. You're just the one I want. Hello, John. Well, now, in a few weeks' time, you're going to be dead. Correct? Do you believe you'll go to heaven? I doubt it. But what's all this about? Hardly a good bedside manner. In a few weeks, you're going to be dead. Sorry. But look, would you be prepared to consider a proposition? I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. I am serious. Oh, go on. I've very little to lose by listening. On the contrary, you've a great deal to gain, especially after you're dead. This is something I've been working on quietly for some years. A long time ago, I saw a medical film brought over from Russia. It showed a dog's head, severed from the body, but with the normal blood supply being maintained. Sounds gruesome. The thing is that it was alive. The brain was functioning. Now, my idea, which grew out of seeing that film, was to remove the brain from the skull of a human being and to keep it alive, functioning as an independent unit after he is dead. For example, after you are dead. Good God. I've already completed a number of successful trials with animals, and now I'm ready to try it with a human. I don't like it's the idea of one bit. Interrupting and let me finish. Think of it, man. Your own brain. In perfect shape. It crammed full of a lifetime of learning. Yet soon it's going to have to die along with the rest of your body. It's repulsive. What possible use can there be in keeping my brain alive if I couldn't talk or see or hear or feel? I believe you would be able to communicate with us. But let me explain a bit more. At the very moment of death, I should have to be standing by so that I could step in immediately and try to keep your brain alive. Are you serious about this? Certainly. What would you do? I should immediately open your neck and locate the four arteries, the cartoids and the vertebrals. I should then stick a large hollow needle in each. These four needles would be connected by tubes to the artificial heart. Then, working quickly, I should dissect out the left and right jugular veins and hitch these also to the heart machine to complete the circuit. Now, switch on the machine, which is already primed with the right type of blood, and there you are. The circulation through your brain would be restored. You'd have a dead body and a living brain. Uh, but would it function? Oh, my dear William, how should I know? I can't even tell whether it would ever regain consciousness. And if it did? Ah, that would be fascinating. Lying there with all your thinking processes working beautifully, and your memory as well. And not being able to see, feel, hear, or smell. Uh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to leave one of your optic nerves intact as well as the eye itself. I've already constructed a small plastic case to contain the eyeball. And when the brain is in a basin submerged in ringer solution, the eyeball, in its case, will float on the surface of the liquid. Staring at the ceiling. Hilarious. But how could I communicate with you? By means of a sensitive piece of apparatus known as an encephalograph which records the brain's electrical and chemical discharges on a graph. But do you honestly believe that when my brain is in that basin, my mind will be able to function? That I shall be able to think and reason as I do now? I don't see why not. It's the same brain. It's undamaged. You'd be living in an extraordinarily pure and detached world. No worries or fears or pains or hunger, or thirst. And for you, William, a doctor of philosophy, it would be a tremendous experience. You'd be able to reflect upon the ways of the world with a, a, with a detachment and a serenity that no man has ever attained before. Great thoughts and solutions might come to you, great ideas that could revolutionize our way of life. Mm. But look here. 
I'm not asking you to make up your mind immediately. Sleep on it. Perhaps you would give me a ring tomorrow. I'll be at home. Yes. All right. I'll think it over and let you know. Hello, John Landy here. Landy, Pearl here. Uh, look, I've been thinking over your proposition. And... Yes? What have you decided? Well, my first reaction was one of revulsion, but now, well, I'm not so sure. But one thing bothers me, though. What if it were painful or I became hysterical? There'd be no escape. William, there are always risks connected with any major scientific experiment, but think of the other aspect. Suppose it succeeded. There would be your brain functioning perfectly, producing original and imaginative theories. Man, you'd be immortal. Mm, yes, that's what appealed. My brain continuing its work untrammeled by physical considerations. And though I say it myself, I'm rather proud of my brain. It's a damn good one. Well? Yes, John, I'm going to do it. I've decided to go through with it. Splendid. Now, look. I'll be over right away to discuss the... Uh, just one thing, John. Uh, Mary, should I tell her? Yes. Uh, I suggest you discuss it with her as soon as possible. Uh, uh, better, I suppose. Although she's hardly likely to realize the importance of such an experiment. It's going to be difficult. Well, why not write it all down? In a letter to be given to her when you're dead. It might be better. Less complicated all round, eh? Yes, I see your point. Well, I'll think about it. Good night for now, John. Goodbye. A letter. Why not? To be opened only after my death. Only after my death. Well, Mary, I will not say goodbye because there's just a chance that if Landy succeeds, I may actually see you again. I've tried several times to prepare you for this news, but you have constantly refused to give me a hearing. Please change your mind now and give Landy a call, your faithful husband, William. Oh, my God. There's more, Mary. P.S. Be good when I am gone. Do not drink. Do not smoke. Do not buy a television set. And incidentally, now that I have no further use for it, I suggest you have the telephone disconnected. Oh, really? Aren't I entitled to some peace after all these years? Oh, the, the whole thing is just too awful to think about. Awful and beastly. What are you going to do? Oh, what can I do? I must do as William requests, I suppose. I'd better ring Dr. Landy now, right away. Just over half an hour later, Mary and I were greeted by a somewhat apprehensive Dr. Landy at the hospital entrance. We followed him in silence through a maze of echoing corridors until finally he stopped at a door marked No Admittance. Well, here we are. I must warn you, it's bound to be a bit of a shock at first. He's not very prepossessing in his present state, I'm afraid. I didn't marry him for his looks, Doctor. Uh, uh, yeah. yes, well, take your time when you get inside. He won't know you're there until you place your face directly above his eye. Of course, he can't hear anything. We can talk as much as we like it. It's in here. I wouldn't go too close yet until you get used to it. The doctor had ushered us into a small square room. On a high white table in the center of the room was a biggish white enamel bowl about the size of a wash basin, with half a dozen or so plastic tubes coming out of it. These tubes were connected with a whole lot of glass piping, 
and I could see the blood flowing from the heart machine. It was this machine which made a soft, rhythmic, pulsing sound. He's in here, in this bowl. Come a little closer. Oh, don't be afraid. That's right. Now, you see this small oval capsule floating on liquid in the bowl? That's the eye in there. Can you see it? Yes. Oh. Take your time. As far as we can tell, it's still in perfect condition. It's his right eye, and the plastic container has a lens on it, similar to the one that he used in his own spectacles. At this moment, he's probably seen quite as well as he ever did. Oh, oh. are you feeling all right, Mrs. Pearl? I think so. Good. Then we'll go forward a little more, and you'll be able to see the whole thing. There you are. That's William. The doctor led Mary forward until she could see right down into the basin. I followed, feeling somewhat nervous, I must confess. William's brain was far larger than I had imagined it would be, and darker in color. With all the ridges and creases running over the surface, it reminded me of nothing so much as a large, pickled walnut. I could see the stubs of the four big arteries and the two veins coming out of the face and the neat way in which they were joined to the plastic tubes. With each throb of the heart machine, all the tubes gave a little jerk in unison as the blood was pushed through them. Now, Mrs. Pearl, you'll have to lean over and put your face right above the eye. He'll see you then, and you can smile. I'd say a few nice things as well. He won't actually hear them, but I'm sure he'll get the idea. It must have taken tremendous courage for Mary to lean over that basin and stare into the eye that had once been her husband. The eye itself was bright and stared at her with a peculiar fixed intensity. There was no doubt that it was watching her, and the small needle on the nearby control panel, which I took to be the encephalograph, flicked as Mary spoke, while at the same time the machine emitted a curious clicking sound. Hello, dear. It's me, Mary. How are you, dear? Are you feeling all right, William? I got your letter, dear, and came at once to see how you were. Dr. Landry says you're doing wonderfully well. They're doing everything possible to take care of you, dear. You seem fine. Really, you do. That's excellent, Mrs. Pearl, excellent. How strange. I've been trying to think what it is that's different about the eye. I see it now. There's a softness about it which William's never had. William's eyes used to glint at you, stabbing into the brain almost. This eye has a softness and a gentleness that's almost cow-like. Are you quite sure he's conscious? Oh, yes, completely. And he can see me? Perfectly. Isn't that marvelous? I expect he's wondering what's happened. Not at all. He knows perfectly well where he is and why he's here. You mean he knows he's in the basement? Of course. And if he only had the power of speech, he would probably be able to carry on a perfectly normal conversation. So far as I can see, there should be absolutely no difference mentally between this William here and the one you used to know at home. Good gracious me. You know, I'm not at all sure that I don't prefer him as he is at present. I believe I could live very comfortably with this kind of vision. I could cope with this one. Quiet, isn't he? Naturally, he's quiet. Dr. 
sir. I do believe I'm beginning to feel the most enormous affection for him. Does that sound clear? I think it's understandable. He looks so helpless, lying there in the basement. He's like a baby. Exactly like a little baby. There. From now on, Mary's going to look after you. All by herself. When can I have him back home, Doctor? Oh, uh, he couldn't possibly be moved. I don't see why not. But this is an experiment, Mrs. Bell. It's my husband, Doctor. Uh, but, uh, It is uh, my husband, you know. <laughs> That's rather a tricky point. Perhaps it would be better if we were to discuss this matter more fully in my office. I mean it. I want him back. Mary and the doctor had become so engrossed in the struggle for possession of William, or rather what remained of him, that they had forgotten my presence completely. I I watched in thrall. The doctor was studying Mary as she calmly put a cigarette between her lips and lit it. He obviously regarded her as a very queer fish indeed, even allowing for the bizarreness of the situation. Mary walked over to the window, apparently quite calm and relaxed, puffing a cigarette. Then she walked back to the table and looked into the basin once more. Mary's leaving you now, sweetheart. Don't you worry about a single thing. You understand? I'm going to get you home again. Just as soon as I possibly can. And... At this point, Mary paused and put a cigarette to her lips, intending to take a part. Instantly, the eye flashed, and the pupil contracted into a minute black point of distilled fury. At the same time, the needle on the graph jumped, alarmed. Mary didn't move for a moment. She stood looking down into the basin, holding the cigarette to her mouth and watching the eye. Then, slowly and deliberately, she put the cigarette to her lips, inhaled deeply, held the smoke, then suddenly... She released the smoke through her nostrils in two thin jets, which struck the water and billowed out over the surface in a thick blue cloud, which completely enveloped the eye. The needle on the grass machine went mad. The doctor, who had been standing with his back to Mary since she crossed to the table, turned suddenly aware that something had happened, but not knowing what. I think perhaps we'd better leave now. Now, don't look so cross, William. It isn't any good looking cross. Not anymore, dear. Because from now on, my pet, you're going to do exactly what Mary tells you. You understand, William? Exactly what Mary tells you. So don't be a naughty boy again, will you, my pet? Naughty boys are liable to get most severely punished. That's enough, Mrs. Bell. Yes, of course. Goodbye, darling. I'll be back soon. Isn't he sweet? I just can't wait to get him home again. I think it was Bernard Shaw who said, There are two tragedies in life. One is to lose one's heart's desire. The other is to gain it. Poor William, with his vain dreams of his detached brain solving the world's problems. Is he still alive in his basin, consumed with impotent rage as he views Mary's excesses of tobacco, alcohol, and television? And what of Mary? Can she still be enjoying her protracted revenge for all those years of domestic misery? 
I think she can. For Mary was taught cruelty by an expert. As for myself, nowadays my sleep is undisturbed by thoughts of death and immortality. Although I must confess I have never since been able to wash my hands in an enamel basin without thinking of William and Mary. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in William and Mary were John Barron, Gerard Green, and Hilda Schroeder with Terry Scully. William and Mary was first recounted by Roald Dahl, dramatized by Barry Campbell, and produced by John Dyer. It takes place in Bavaria, when I went to look over a medieval castle there, and the horrifying events that befell the three tourists and myself when we visited the blood-soaked torture chamber. It sounds gruesome, doesn't it? I do hope that that will tempt you to join me tomorrow. Good night. <laughs> Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello there. Do you own a cat? Or rather, I should say, does a cat own you? Doesn't it strike you as strange that despite centuries of domestication, cats have never really lost their independence, their ruthlessness? To cats, life is still the lore of the jungle. Just try taking liberties with your cat. Be he never so tame, and you'll soon be put in your place. <laughs> I've always had a healthy respect for cats, despite that one time when I was forced to... Oh, but let me tell you about it. I think I'll call the story Cat's Cradle. Several years ago, I was making a movie in Germany, and there was some sort of hold-up during shooting, a tiresome and boring state of affairs that happens all too often, and I found myself with some days on my hands, so I decided to visit some of the beautiful old castles of Bavaria. High on my itinerary was Sonderberg in Franconia, near the Württemberg border. Sonderberg tends to get overlooked by the main tourist trade. Yet it is one of the most complete examples I know of a medieval market town which has survived comparatively intact. I checked in at one of the local hotels late one afternoon, and while they were getting my room ready, I sat down at one of the little tables near the door and ordered a drink, a large tankard of their local beer, actually. At the next table sat a young couple, whispering intently, but their voices were angry and out of control, and as I sat enjoying my beer, it was impossible not to overhear that they were deep in some childish tip. Beth, for God's sake, stop talking nonsense. How dare you say it's nonsense? It is nonsense, and you know it. I never even looked at the damn woman. I don't know how you can be so callous. Did you see how disgustingly fat she was? I tell you, I didn't notice her at all. Liar. Oh, shut up. Oh, God, what a start to married life. Oh, look, Beth, you're tired. I'm tired. It, it's all been a strain. Let's not say things we'll be sorry for. Let's have an early night. The next best thing to your German housefrau. Oh, for the last time, I didn't fancy her. 
If you're going to carry on like this every time I look at another woman, you'd better tear my ruddy eyes out. Ah, so now you admit you looked at her. Oh, for heaven's sake. The young man glanced uneasily in my direction, obviously wondering if I'd become an involuntary eavesdropper. Of course I had. And I certainly had no intention of making myself scarce. Isn't this a charming town? Yes, charming. Delightful. Are you on vacation? No. Yes. <laughs> that is, we... Uh... We're on our honeymoon. Oh, are you? Are you indeed? Well, what an ideal place to spend it. We haven't exactly succumbed to its charms yet. We've only just arrived. Well, give it time. Sonderberg is a step back into the past. It takes a while before its, its charm begins to work. It's certainly quiet enough. Mm, I was here once years ago, and I always promised myself a return visit. Then it seemed like an oasis in a desert of insanity. Yes, I suppose so. Except, of course, that Sonderberg has had its own fair share of horrors, you know. Mmm. Whoa, oh, that's good. Oh, what delightful beer this is. So refreshing. Uh, do go on, please. But the castle, do you see it up on that rock? Yeah. Look through the window there, see? Oh, yes. yes. Well, that was taken over as a headquarters for the Inquisition. Oh, the poor wretches who were incarcerated and tortured up there. I saw the castle as we drove in. It was beautiful, but it made me shudder. Well, it's not surprising. The Inquisition left several pleasant little mementos, all in as good a state of preservation as Sonderberg itself. You must visit the place while you're here. Well, that is, if you're not squeamish. Squeamish? Look, I've got an idea. Why don't we join up and go round the castle together tomorrow? Well... Uh, Please do. Oh, unless that is you're already busy. Well, no, but... Uh... We'd love it. Wouldn't we, Beth? Yes. Yes, of course we would. At first, I couldn't understand the young man's enthusiasm. Uh, I mean, after all, a honeymoon is a, a honeymoon. <laughs> then it struck me that he needed a a defense mechanism, and I would be there to guard him from the kind of row that I'd stumbled upon just now. <laughs> well, at any rate, we agreed to meet in the hotel lobby at ten o'clock in the morning. As events turned out, I needn't have worried about breaking the idyllic atmosphere, because as we were about to set off... Good God, it can't be! <laughs> Price, it's you. It really is. Hello, Malcolm. <laughs> now, what are you doing in this neck of the woods? Uh, don't tell me they forced you out of the rat race at last. Malcolm Rivers was one of the world's prize boars. If the first prize in a competition were a part in one of Malcolm's movies, the second prize would have been a part in two of Malcolm's movies. Scouting locations, old son. You see that castle up there? That's just right for a new horror picture we've got. I'd love you to read it. It's a great script. Now, come on. I'm on vacation. Can't we discuss this later? Or, or better still see my agent, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. But look, just let me tell you... At this point, our taxi arrived. It was as battered as its driver, but we had all agreed to leave our own transport behind. Trouble was, when Malcolm heard the driver announce that he had come for the castle party, he insisted on coming with us. Castle? Oh, well, you don't mean to say you're actually going there? Yes. Oh, well, that's great. I can actually show you where it all takes place while I'm telling you about it. Now, come I... No, oh, come on, don't be so coy. You're worse than a virgin on a wedding night. <laughs> I just couldn't shake him off. You never could with Malcolm. That's how he'd hustled his way to the top. Now he attached himself to us like an incubus. The film's all about the Sonderbergs. You know, the family, a sort of pageant of atrocity. I want to step back and look objectively at what each one did. Uh, take Elisa, for instance. Well, I can't speak for the others. I was doing my best not to listen. The castle, for those who don't know it, is built on an immensely steep rock dominating the town. And on its northern side is surrounded by a moat, which has long since been filled in. At the foot of the wall is a very pleasant garden with little sheltered seats. Sitting there is a good way of recovering from the rather overpowering tour round the castle. The girl was right. There still was a sinister aura clinging to the place, 
which even a hot and cheerful summer's morning couldn't entirely dissipate. And they broke in and found the girl strung up by the wrists over the hot coals. Incredible story. Of course, we can't actually put all that into the picture, but we can imply a hell of a lot. You've got to admit, it's a damn good commercial plot line. Now, that's why it's so important to get the feel of the place where it happened. We want to get right away from the studio look. Well, they can go out and shoot a police picture in real locations, or why not a horror picture? Now, the seventh count was a real character. This, this you've got to hear. They say Mr. Rivers, uh, do you mind if we change the subject? Huh? My wife is feeling a bit faint. Uh Oh, oh that, that's too bad, Mrs. Uh, and we haven't even seen the torture tower yet. Uh, now, sir, would your lady wife like to wait for us out here? She could sit down there in the garden. Oh, no, I, I don't want to miss anything. I'm quite all right. I think it was probably just that steep hill uh, and the heat. You go on, Malcolm. Hmm? We'll catch up with you later. Uh, oh, no, no, I wouldn't dream of it. Stick together through thick and thin. That's my motto. <laughs> oh, I know. Look at that. Oh, isn't it sweet? It, it can't be more than six weeks old. It was a tiny black kitten, which was playing with its mother near one of the seats in the garden just below us. The cat, a great sleek creature whose coat shone in the sun, lay stretched on the grass and the kitten romped around nearer. The mother would wave her tail for the kitten to try to clutch with its paw or raise her feet to push the little one away as an encouragement to further efforts. It was a charming sight. Beth has been on to me to buy her a cat as soon as we were married. Now I'll get no peace. Oh, Jack, I'd like to take them both. I wonder who they belong to. Oh, they're not strays, and that's for sure. Look at the condition of the mother's coat. Well, they probably belong to the castle. It'd be great for the picture. Had a touch of atmosphere. Here, here. Here, puss. Oh, oh puss. Malcolm, leave them alone. <laughs> they can't get up the wall anyway. It's far too steep. <laughs> yes, yes, you're right. Oh, look at the size of the mother. We don't grow cats like that in England. No, wait just a minute. Ah, uh, ah, uh, here we are. What are you doing? Well, I'll just throw this stone to attract their attention. No, don't do that. Don't do that. You might hit the kitten. Oh, not a chance. What do you take me for? I may produce uh, movies, but I'm not all that bad. I'll just aim it so it lands near them. Make them look up. You ever seen the expression on a cat's face when it's startled? Well, well, watch. Oh, no! Oh, good God, God, oh, God, man, no. look what you've done. Uh, I, I, I never, meant, never meant to do that. Maybe the wall wasn't as sheer as it looked. Maybe there was a concealed angle at its base which we couldn't see. Whatever the reason, Malcolm's aim wasn't as true as he thought. I truly believe that he only intended to startle those cats. But when he leaned over the wall and threw the stone, it landed with a sickening thud right on the kitten's head and shattered out its little brains there and then. Oh, poor thing. The mother cast a swift upward glance, and I saw her eyes flash like green fire as she stared for an instant at Malcolm Rivers. Then her attention was given to the kitten. After one quiver, it lay still, while a thin red trickle oozed from a gaping wound. Oh, the poor, poor thing. Well, I, oh. I wouldn't have had this happen for the world. I, I, I can't understand it. Yes, darling. The cat was assiduously licking the kitten's wound, and then suddenly she stopped. She must have realized that it was dead and that her ministrations were useless. For all at once, she appeared to lose all interest in the pathetic little body. Instead, she looked again at Rivers, and in that look was all the concentration of primitive hate. Her green eyes blazed, and the blood which dabbled her mouth and whiskers made her look for all the world like an avenging fury. There, Malcolm, I hope you're satisfied. That's something for your horror film. And you have the consolation of knowing it's real blood and not vegetable dye. Oh, don't rub it in. I feel bad enough as it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Of course you do. I, I love cats. I really do. Although my outburst was a relief, I I felt slightly ashamed. I, I realized how painfully vulnerable the man really was. I turned my attention to the cat. 
she was now attempting to claw her way up the wall. When this failed, she tried to launch herself into the air, eyes blazing, claws distended, and then she fell back. Let's go on. I can't bear any more. Do you want to go home? We can come back tomorrow. I, um, I think a brandy would do you good. I think a brandy would do us all good. No, I don't want to go back to the hotel. I want to see the castle. Let's go on. In face of her obvious determination, there was nothing else we could do. At least the tour would divert her mind, or so we hoped. And we also hoped that Malcolm would be deterred from prattling on about his inane script. But no. I really expect to pick up some great vibrations in the torture tower. It's just over there. You see, you see, you, you can't expect to involve your audience unless you're involved yourself. Now, that's... That's the basic rule. You've got to be convinced. And that's why so many movies are just laughable. Nobody is convinced, least of all the makers. <laughs> I remember one crazy scene. <laughs> this will kill you. <laughs> there, there was this As Malcolm laughed, I looked back at the cat. She too had heard, and her whole demeanor seemed to change. She no longer tried to jump or run up the wall but instead began to lick and fondle the dead kitten as if it were alive. Then she took it in her mouth and began to follow us until we reached the limit of the wall's boundary. I thought I was the only one who noticed, but I was wrong. Mr. Rivers, I know this may sound silly, but I think that cat means to do you harm. <laughs> Oh, now that I love. Oh, let's keep a sense of proportion about this. Well, I'm terribly sorry about what happened, but I refuse to avoid dark alleys over a damn cat. <laughs> Besides, she probably has a litter of others under some bush. Yes, Beth, I think you're being melodramatic. Do you? Look, Beth, are you sure you wouldn't rather call it a day? Oh, for heaven's sake, stop fussing. I said I was all right, didn't I? Or are you trying to get rid of me? Oh, now, don't start that again. All I was trying to do was to give Mr. Rivers a perfectly reasonable warning. I think all are afraid. Well, here's the tower entrance. Shall we go in? I tried to sound unconcerned, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I had a sneaking feeling that the girl was probably right. first we could see nothing. The darkness seemed incarnate, surrounding, stifling us like a blanket. The four of us just stood there, waiting for the use of our eyes to return. We were in the lower chamber. The thin sunlight, filtering in through a tiny window, seemed to lose itself in the thickness of the walls, which were coated with the dust of centuries. Here and there were patches of dark stain... Only rivers, naturally, remain comparatively unmoved. Not much room for cameras down here. Still, I suppose we could manage. Uh, excuse me, but you are English? Yes. Uh, no. Well, three of us are. I think you are English are interested in tortures, yes? Yes. yes. Uh, you would like to see our collection? Yes. The yes. best in Germany. Well, thank you very much. Perhaps you could show us around. You will uh, follow me, please. You are my first party of the day. The main collection is on the floor above. I think you will find them interesting. I remembered the wealth of stories about the legendary cruelty of the Counts of Sonderberg and, of course, their ladies. It was said that they had found a legitimate outlet for their bloodlusts by channeling them into the service of the officers of the Inquisition. None of your half-measures here. Wow! Look at all that. Oh, oh, Jack. We found ourselves in a room full of torture instruments. Chairs full of spikes which gave instant and excruciating pain. Steel cages in which the head could slowly be crushed into a pulp. Racks, belts, boots, gloves, collars, and all around the walls great headsmen's swords evil, keen-edged weapons that would decapitate with one slash and nearby blocks where the victim's necks had lain with deep notches where the steel had bitten through the guard of flesh and shored into the wood. 
we all found ourselves speechless in the face of this bestial evidence of man's inhumanity to man. All that is except Malcolm Rivers. Believable. Just what we need. It's too good to be true. It really is. Do you see? It's perfect for a setup just here. It's a question of getting permission to use this stuff, but well, I wonder what the formalities are. Hey, let me just sit in that chair a moment. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Rivers was behaving with his usual insensitivity, but there was something more. I think the others shared the feeling with me that it was sacrilegious. An odd word to use, I know, but there was something sacred about the place. It was a, a temple, but a temple to evil. Now, over here, uh, sirs and madam, uh, is a famous instrument of the Inquisition. Uh, one might almost say the most famous and still in perfect working order. The old man pointed to the main object in this chamber of horrors, the Iron Virgin, a copy of the famous one at Nuremberg. The contraption was covered in rust and dust except for the face, which was oddly fresh-looking, as if the custodian had scrubbed it. While the figure was curved in the shape of a woman, it was just broad enough for a man to fit inside, as we could see when the door was opened. The door itself was enormously thick and was worked open and shut by a thick chain running through a pulley attached to a heavy beam in the roof. When the weight was released, the door would slam shut. The devilish nature of the Iron Virgin was truly revealed when you examined the inside of the door. A number of iron spikes were fixed there, and when the victim was placed inside it and the door closed, the upper spikes would pierce his eyes and the lower ones his heart and vitals. What a charming toy. Oh, God, look at the blood stains. <laughs> it's hard to wash out blood completely, man. And there are some who say it comes back anyway. I think I can believe this place is haunted. And on that happy note, I vote that we make a hurried exit. That suits me. Well, let's go and have that drink we promised ourselves, shall we? Right now. No, 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 wait. What's up this time, for God's sake? Hey, you, old man. Now, how big is that space? What, sir? Uh, the space inside. I want to see if I can get in. Oh, well, I told you, I'd like sampling your experiences. Now, Malcolm, realism is one thing. Nonsense. Courage of your convictions and all that. Now, come on, Squire. I need your help on this. Very good, sir, if you insist. You're not serious. Well, sure I am. Yeah. That's a <coughs> tight fit. We've <coughs> grown some since those days. But I'll manage. Here. See? You are not really allowed to do this, sir. If anyone found out, I might get into trouble. Why should anyone find out? I might even lose my job. Okay, okay, I get you. A price, uh, give him something, will you? Oh, well, I'll... I'll settle with you later. I think this is all very silly. All in the cause of art. Well, I, for one, won't go and see his beastly film. That, my dear, makes two of us. Hey, what's all the whispering about? Oh, here you are. Two, four... Six. <laughs> thank you, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Do you think that will square your conscience? Oh, yes, sir. I, I think it squares it very nicely. And now that you've had your little game, can we all go? Go if you like. I'm not stopping you. I'm, I'm staying here. Oh, come on, Malcolm. Malcolm, nothing. I'm really enjoying this. Live dangerously. That's my motto. <laughs> Oh, right, Charlie, now unfasten the door. But, sir... Can't somebody stop me? Malcolm, you've had your little joke, but enough is enough. Enough hell. You, Charlie, do as I tell you. Now start letting that door down. But slowly. Very, very slowly. Despite his reluctance, the old man did as he was told. He worked the machine with a deliberate and excruciating slowness in which the outer edge of the door hadn't moved half five inches in as many minutes. The whole ridiculous charade had a kind of macabre thrill about it. <laughs> it was a scene from Malcolm's horror film played exclusively for our benefit. And then I saw her. The cat. I don't think the others noticed at first. 
They were too intent on watching the progress of that door. Even rivers had ceased to chatter. In the far corner of the chamber, dark, untamable forces were gathering. Her green, baleful eyes shone like danger lamps. And as I peered at her, I could see that their color was heightened by the blood which still smeared her coat and reddened her mouth. And still, slowly, inexorably, with the precision of an expert, the old man went on working that door. Even then, I wasn't sure what the animal intended to do, or even if she intended to do anything, until suddenly... The cat! Look out for the cat! The cat launched herself, not at Malcolm, but at the luckless custodian. Her eyes blazed with ferocity. Her hair bristled till she seemed twice her normal size. Her tail lashed out like a tiger's when the quarry is before it. The cat's claws found one of his eyes, and I actually saw her tear through it and down his cheek, leaving wide bands of red where the blood seemed to spurt from every vein. Oh, Jack! Oh, God! Look out! He can't hold it! With a yell of agony and terror, the man leapt back, dropping the chain which held back the door. It ran like lightning through the pulley block, and the massive door slammed shut! In the instant before the door had closed, I saw Malcolm's face. His eyes stared as if dazed, and for once in his life, he was speechless. Jack, help me get the door open. For God's sake, help me. I'm coming. Beth, stay where you are. For God's sake, don't look. The end must have been quick, for when we managed to wrench the door open, the spikes had done their work. They had pierced right through the skull, so that as the door opened, the body came with it, and he fell to the floor, face turned upwards. Get your wife out of here. She needs air. I'll attend to the old man. Right. Uh, oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> the old custodian was leaning against the wooden pillar, holding his reddening handkerchief to his eyes, while on the face of poor rivers, there sat the cat purring loudly as she licked the blood which trickled through the gashed sockets of his eyes. I pushed her away from her ghoulish meal and, well, I hope no one will call me cruel because I seized one of the old executioner's swords from its rack on the wall and with one slash, shore her in two on the spot. Poor Malcolm. He'd had his total experience, a good deal more total than he'd bargained for. Cozy, wasn't it? You see what I mean about cats? You never can tell. That was Vincent Price, bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in this story, Cat's Cradle, were Kenneth J. Warren and Frederick Schrecker, with John Sampson and Bonnie Harron. Cat's Cradle was first recounted as The Score by Bram Stoker, dramatized by Richard Davis and produced by John Dyas. <laughs>